Essays by Henry David Thoreau Biographical Sketch Henry David Thoreau was the last male descendant of a French ancestor who came to this country from the Isle of Guernsey. His character exhibited occasional traits drawn from this blood in singular combination with a very strong Saxon genius. He was born in Concord, Massachusetts, on 12 July 1817. He was graduated at Harvard College in 1837, but without any literary distinction. An iconoclast in literature, he seldom thanked colleges for their service to him, holding them in small esteem, whilst yet his debt to them was important. After leaving the university, he joined his brother in teaching a private school, which he soon renounced. His father was a manufacturer of lead pencils, and Henry applied himself for a time to this craft, believing he could make a better pencil than was then in use. After completing his experiments, he exhibited his work to chemists and artists in Boston. And having obtained their certificates to its excellence and to its equality with the best London manufacturer, he returned home contented. His friends congratulated him that he had now opened his way to fortune. But he replied, that he should never make another pencil. Why should I? I would not do again what I have done once. He resumed his endless walks and miscellaneous studies, making every day some new acquaintance with nature, though as yet never speaking of zoology or botany, since. Though very studious of natural facts, he was incurious of technical and textual science. At this time, a strong, healthy youth, fresh from college, whilst all his companions were choosing their profession, or eager to begin some lucrative employment. It was inevitable that his thoughts should be exercised on the same question, and it required rare decision to refuse all the accustomed paths. And keep his solitary freedom at the cost of disappointing the natural expectations of his family and friends, all the more difficult that he had a perfect probity. Was exact in securing his own independence, and in holding every man to the like duty. But Thoreau never faltered. He was a born Protestant. He declined to give up his large ambition of knowledge and action for any narrow craft or profession, aiming at a much more comprehensive calling, the art of living well. If he slighted and defied the opinions of others, it was only that he was more intent to reconcile his practice with his own belief. Never idle or self-indulgent, he preferred, when he wanted money, earning it by some piece of manual labor agreeable to him, as building a boat or a fence, planting, grafting, surveying, or other short work, to any long engagements. With his hardy habits and few wants, his skill in woodcraft, and his powerful arithmetic, he was very competent to live in any part of the world. It would cost him less time to supply his wants than another. He was therefore secure of his leisure. A natural skill for mensuration, growing out of his mathematical knowledge, and his habit of ascertaining the measures and distances of objects which interested him, the size of trees. The depth and extent of ponds and rivers, the height of mountains, and the airline distance of his favorite summits, this, and his intimate knowledge of the territory about Concord, made him drift into the profession of land surveyor. It had the advantage for him that it led him continually into new and secluded grounds, and helped his studies of nature. His accuracy and skill in this work were readily appreciated, and he found all the employment he wanted. He could easily solve the problems of the surveyor, but he was daily beset with graver questions, which he manfully confronted. He interrogated every custom, and wished to settle all his practice on an ideal foundation. He was a Protestant à l'outrance, and few lives contained so many renunciations. He was bred to no profession, he never married, he lived alone, he never went to church, he never voted. He refused to pay a tax to the state, he ate no flesh, he drank no wine, he never knew the use of tobacco, and, though a naturalist, he used neither trap nor gun. He chose, wisely, no doubt, for himself, to be the bachelor of thought and nature. He had no talent for wealth, and knew how to be poor without the least hint of squalor or inelegance. Perhaps he fell into his way of living without forecasting it much, but approved it with later wisdom. I am often reminded, he wrote in his journal, that, 
if I had bestowed on me the wealth of Croesus, my aims must be still the same, and my means essentially the same. He had no temptations to fight against, no appetites, no passions, no taste for elegant trifles. A fine house, dress, the manners and talk of highly cultivated people were all thrown away on him. He much preferred a good Indian and considered these refinements as impediments to conversation, wishing to meet his companion on the simplest terms. He declined invitations to dinner parties, because their each was in every one's way, and he could not meet the individuals to any purpose. They make their pride, he said, in making their dinner cost much, I make my pride in making my dinner cost little. When asked at table what dish he preferred, he answered, the nearest. He did not like the taste of wine, and never had a vice in his life. He said, I have a faint recollection of pleasure derived from smoking dried lily stems, before I was a man. I had commonly a supply of these. I have never smoked anything more noxious. He chose to be rich by making his wants few, and supplying them himself. In his travels, he used the railroad only to get over so much country as was unimportant to the present purpose, walking hundreds of miles, avoiding taverns. Buying a lodging in farmers and fishermen's houses, as cheaper, and more agreeable to him, and because there he could better find the men and the information he wanted. There was somewhat military in his nature not to be subdued, always manly and able, but rarely tender, as if he did not feel himself except in opposition. He wanted a fallacy to expose, a blunder to pillory, I may say required a little sense of victory, a roll of the drum, to call his powers into full exercise. It cost him nothing to say no. Indeed, he found it much easier than to say yes. It seemed as if his first instinct on hearing a proposition was to controvert it, so impatient was he of the limitations of our daily thought. This habit, of course, is a little chilling to the social affections, and though the companion would in the end acquit him of any malice or untruth, yet it mars conversation. Hence, no equal companion stood in affectionate relations with one so pure and guileless. I love Henry, said one of his friends, but I cannot like him. And as for taking his arm, I should as soon think of taking the arm of an elm tree. Yet, hermit and stoic as he was, he was really fond of sympathy, and threw himself heartily and childlike into the company of young people whom he loved, and whom he delighted to entertain. As he only could, with the varied and endless anecdotes of his experiences by field and river. And he was always ready to lead a huckleberry party or a search for chestnuts or grapes. Talking, one day, of a public discourse, Henry remarked, that whatever succeeded with the audience was bad. I said, who would not like to write something which all can read, like Robinson Crusoe? And who does not see with regret that his page is not solid with a right materialistic treatment, which delights everybody? Henry objected, of course, and vaunted the better lectures which reached only a few persons. But, at supper, a young girl, understanding that he was to lecture at the Lyceum, sharply asked him, whether his lecture would be a nice, interesting story, such as she wished to hear. Or whether it was one of those old philosophical things that she did not care about. Henry turned to her, and bethought himself, and, I saw, was trying to believe that he had matter that might fit her and her brother, who were to sit up and go to the lecture. If it was a good one for them. He was a speaker and actor of the truth, born such, and was ever running into dramatic situations from this cause. In any circumstance, it interested all bystanders to know what part Henry would take, and what he would say, and he did not disappoint expectation, but used an original judgment on each emergency. In 1845 he built himself a small framed house on the shores of Walden Pond, and lived there two years alone, a life of labor and study. This action was quite native and fit for him. No one who knew him would tax him with affectation. He was more unlike his neighbors in his thought than in his action. As soon as he had exhausted the advantages of that solitude, he abandoned it. In 1847, not approving some uses to which the public expenditure was applied, he refused to pay his town tax, and was put in jail. A friend paid the tax for him, and he was released. The like annoyance was threatened the next year. 
But, as his friends paid the tax, notwithstanding his protest, I believe he ceased to resist. No opposition or ridicule had any weight with him. He coldly and fully stated his opinion without affecting to believe that it was the opinion of the company. It was of no consequence, if every one present held the opposite opinion. On one occasion he went to the university library to procure some books. The librarian refused to lend them. Mr. Thoreau repaired to the president, who stated to him the rules and usages, which permitted the loan of books to resident graduates, to clergymen who were alumni, and to some others resident within a circle of ten miles radius from the college. Mr. Thoreau explained to the president that the railroad had destroyed the old scale of distances, that the library was useless, yes, and president and college useless. On the terms of his rules, that the one benefit he owed to the college was its library, that, at this moment, not only his want of books was imperative, but he wanted a large number of books. And assured him that he, Thoreau, and not the librarian, was the proper custodian of these. In short, the president found the petitioner so formidable, and the rules getting to look so ridiculous, that he ended by giving him a privilege which in his hands proved unlimited thereafter. No truer American existed than Thoreau. His preference of his country and condition was genuine, and his aversation from English and European manners and tastes almost reached contempt. He listened impatiently to news or bon mots gleaned from London circles, and though he tried to be civil, these anecdotes fatigued him. The men were all imitating each other, and on a small mould. Why can they not live as far apart as possible, and each be a man by himself? What he sought was the most energetic nature, and he wished to go to Oregon, not to London. In every part of Great Britain, he wrote in his diary, are discovered traces of the Romans, their funereal urns, their camps, their roads, their dwellings. But New England, at least, is not based on any Roman ruins. We have not to lay the foundations of our houses on the ashes of a former civilization. But, idealist as he was, standing for abolition of slavery, abolition of tariffs, almost for abolition of government. It is needless to say he found himself not only unrepresented in actual politics, but almost equally opposed to every class of reformers. Yet he paid the tribute of his uniform respect to the anti-slavery party. One man, whose personal acquaintance he had formed, he honored with exceptional regard. Before the first friendly word had been spoken for Captain John Brown, after the arrest, he sent notices to most houses in Concord. That he would speak in a public hall on the condition and character of John Brown, on Sunday evening, and invited all people to come. The Republican Committee, the Abolitionist Committee, sent him word that it was premature and not advisable. He replied, I did not send to you for advice, but to announce that I am to speak. The hall was filled at an early hour by people of all parties, and his earnest eulogy of the hero was heard by all respectfully, by many with a sympathy that surprised themselves. It was said of Plotinus that he was ashamed of his body, and tis very likely he had good reason for it, that his body was a bad servant, and he had not skill in dealing with the material world. As happens often to men of abstract intellect. But Mr. Thoreau was equipped with a most adapted and serviceable body. He was of short stature, firmly built, of light complexion, with strong, serious blue eyes, and a grave aspect, his face covered in the late years with a becoming beard. His senses were acute, his frame well-knit and hardy, his hand strong and skillful in the use of tools. And there was a wonderful fitness of body and mind. He could pay sixteen rods more accurately than another man could measure them with rod and chain. He could find his path in the woods at night, he said, better by his feet than his eyes. He could estimate the measure of a tree very well by his eyes, he could estimate the weight of a calf or a pig, like a dealer. From a box containing a bushel or more of loose pencils, he could take up with his hands fast enough just a dozen pencils at every grasp. He was a good swimmer, runner, skater, boatman, and would probably outwalk most countrymen in a day's journey. And the relation of body to mind was still finer than we have indicated. He said he wanted every stride his legs made. 
the length of his walk uniformly made the length of his writing. If shut up in the house, he did not write at all. He had a strong common sense, like that which Rose Flamach, the weaver's daughter, in Scott's romance, commends in her father, as resembling a yardstick, which, whilst it measures dowlas and diaper, can equally well measure tapestry and cloth of gold. He had always a new resource. When I was planting forest trees, and had procured half a peck of acorns, he said that only a small portion of them would be sound, and proceeded to examine them, and select the sound ones. But finding this took time, he said, I think, if you put them all into water, the good ones will sink, which experiment we tried with success. He could plan a garden, or a house, or a barn. Would have been competent to lead a Pacific exploring expedition, could give judicious counsel in the gravest private or public affairs. He lived for the day, not cumbered and mortified by his memory. If he brought you yesterday a new proposition, he would bring you today another not less revolutionary. A very industrious man, and setting, like all highly organized men, a high value on his time, he seemed the only man of leisure in town, always ready for any excursion that promised well. Or for conversation prolonged into late hours. His trenchant sense was never stopped by his rules of daily prudence, but was always up to the new occasion. He liked and used the simplest food, yet, when some one urged a vegetable diet, Thoreau thought all diets a very small matter. Saying that, the man who shoots the buffalo lives better than the man who boards at the Graham house. He said, you can sleep near the railroad, and never be disturbed, nature knows very well what sounds are worth attending to, and has made up her mind not to hear the railroad whistle. But things respect the devout mind, and a mental ecstasy was never interrupted. He noted, what repeatedly befell him, that, after receiving from a distance a rare plant, he would presently find the same in his own haunts. And those pieces of luck which happen only to good players happen to him. One day, walking with a stranger, who inquired where Indian arrowheads could he found, he replied, everywhere, and, stooping forward, picked one on the instant from the ground. At Mount Washington, in Tuckerman's Ravine, Thoreau had a bad fall, and sprained his foot. As he was in the act of getting up from his fall, he saw for the first time the leaves of the Arnica mollies. His robust common sense, armed with stout hands, keen perceptions, and strong will, cannot yet account for the superiority which shone in his simple and hidden life. I must add the cardinal fact, that there was an excellent wisdom in him, proper to a rare class of men, which showed him the material world as a means and symbol. This discovery, which sometimes yields to poets a certain casual and interrupted light, serving for the ornament of their writing, was in him an unsleeping insight. And whatever faults or obstructions of temperament might cloud it, he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. In his youth, he said, one day, the other world is all my art, my pencils will draw no other, my jackknife will cut nothing else, I do not use it as a means. This was the muse and genius that ruled his opinions, conversation, studies, work, and course of life. This made him a searching judge of men. At first glance he measured his companion, and, though insensible to some fine traits of culture, could very well report his weight and caliber. And this made the impression of genius which his conversation often gave. He understood the matter in hand at a glance, and saw the limitations and poverty of those he talked with, so that nothing seemed concealed from such terrible eyes. I have repeatedly known young men of sensibility converted in a moment to the belief that this was the man they were in search of, the man of men, who could tell them all they should do. His own dealing with them was never affectionate, but superior, didactic, scorning their petty ways, very slowly conceding, or not conceding at all, the promise of his society at their houses. Or even at his own. Would he not walk with them? He did not know. There was nothing so important to him as his walk, he had no walks to throw away on company. Visits were offered him from respectful parties, but he declined them. Admiring friends offered to carry him at their own cost to the Yellowstone River, to the West Indies, to South America. But though nothing could be more grave or considered than his refusals, 
they remind one in quite new relations of that fop Brummel's reply to the gentleman who offered him his carriage in a shower. But where will you ride, then? And what accusing silences, and what searching and irresistible speeches, battering down all defenses, his companions can remember. Mr. Thoreau dedicated his genius with such entire love to the fields, hills, and waters of his native town, that he made them known and interesting to all reading Americans, and to people over the sea. The river on whose banks he was born and died he knew from its springs to its confluence with the Merrimack. He had made summer and winter observations on it for many years, and at every hour of the day and the night. The result of the recent survey of the water commissioners appointed by the state of Massachusetts he had reached by his private experiments, several years earlier. Every fact which occurs in the bed, on the banks, or in the air over it, the fishes, and their spawning and nests, their manners, their food. The shadflies which fill the air on a certain evening once a year, and which are snapped at by the fishes so ravenously that many of these die of repletion. The conical heaps of small stones on the river shallows, one of which heaps will sometimes overfill a cart, these heaps the huge nests of small fishes. The birds which frequent the stream, heron, duck, sheldrake, loon, osprey. The snake, muskrat, otter, woodchuck, and fox, on the banks. The turtle, frog, hyla, and cricket, which make the banks vocal, were all known to him, and, as it were, townsmen and fellow creatures. So that he felt an absurdity or violence in any narrative of one of these by itself apart, and still more of its dimensions on an inch rule, or in the exhibition of its skeleton. Or the specimen of a squirrel or a bird in brandy. He liked to speak of the manners of the river, as itself a lawful creature, yet with exactness, and always to an observed fact. As he knew the river, so the ponds in this region. One of the weapons he used, more important than microscope or alcohol receiver to other investigators, was a whim which grew on him by indulgence, yet appeared in gravest statement, namely, of extolling his own town and neighborhood as the most favored center for natural observation. He remarked that the flora of Massachusetts embraced almost all the important plants of America, most of the oaks, most of the willows, the best pines, the ash, the maple, the beech, the nuts. He returned Kane's Arctic voyage to a friend of whom he had borrowed it, with the remark, that most of the phenomena noted might be observed in Concord. He seemed a little envious of the pole, for the coincident sunrise and sunset, or five minutes day after six months, a splendid fact, which a nurse nuck had never afforded him. He found red snow in one of his walks, and told me that he expected to find yet the Victoria Regia in Concord. He was the attorney of the indigenous plants, and owned to a preference of the weeds to the imported plants, as of the Indian to the civilized man, and noticed, with pleasure, that the willow bean poles of his neighbor had grown more than his beans. See these weeds, he said, which have been hoed at by a million farmers all spring and summer, and yet have prevailed, and just now come out triumphant over all lanes, pastures, fields, and gardens, such is their vigor. We have insulted them with low names, too, as pigweed, wormwood, chickweed, shad blossom. He says, they have brave names, too, ambrosia, stellaria, amelanchia, amaranth, etc. I think his fancy for referring everything to the meridian of Concord did not grow out of any ignorance or depreciation of other longitudes or latitudes. But was rather a playful expression of his conviction of the indifferency of all places, and that the best place for each is where he stands. He expressed it once in this wise, I think nothing is to be hoped from you, if this bit of mold under your feet is not sweeter to you to eat than any other in this world, or in any world. The other weapon with which he conquered all obstacles in science was patience. He knew how to sit immovable, a part of the rock he rested on, until the bird, the reptile, the fish, which had retired from him, should come back, and resume its habits, nay, moved by curiosity, should come to him and watch him. It was a pleasure and a privilege to walk with him. He knew the country like a fox or a bird, and passed through it as freely by paths of his own. He knew every track in the snow or on the ground, 
and what creature had taken this path before him. One must submit abjectly to such a guide, and the reward was great. Under his arm he carried an old music book to press plants, in his pocket, his diary and pencil, a spyglass for birds, microscope, jackknife, and twine. He wore straw hat, stout shoes, strong gray trousers, to brave shrub oaks and smilax, and to climb a tree for a hawk's or a squirrel's nest. He waded into the pool for the water plants, and his strong legs were no insignificant part of his armor. On the day I speak of he looked for the Menyanthes, detected it across the wide pool, and, on examination of the florets, decided that it had been in flower five days. He drew out of his breast pocket his diary, and read the names of all the plants that should bloom on this day, whereof he kept account as a banker when his notes fall due. The cypripedium may not due till tomorrow. He thought, that, if waked up from a trance, in this swamp, he could tell by the plants what time of the year it was within two days. The red start was flying about, and presently the fine grosbeaks, whose brilliant scarlet makes the rash gazer wipe his eye, and whose fine clear note thorough compared to that of a tanager which has got rid of its hoarseness. Presently he heard a note which he called that of the night warbler, a bird he had never identified, had been in search of twelve years, which always, when he saw it, was in the act of diving down into a tree or bush, and which it was vain to seek. The only bird that sings indifferently by night and by day. I told him he must beware of finding and booking it, lest life should have nothing more to show him. He said, What you seek in vain for, half your life, one day you come full upon all the family at dinner. You seek it like a dream, and as soon as you find it you become its prey. His interest in the flower or the bird lay very deep in his mind, was connected with nature, and the meaning of nature was never attempted to be defined by him. He would not offer a memoir of his observations to the Natural History Society. Why should I? To detach the description from its connections in my mind would make it no longer true or valuable to me, and they do not wish what belongs to it. His power of observation seemed to indicate additional senses. He saw as with microscope, heard as with ear trumpet, and his memory was a photographic register of all he saw and heard. And yet none knew better than he that it is not the fact that imports, but the impression or effect of the fact on your mind. Every fact lay in glory in his mind, a type of the order and beauty of the whole. His determination on natural history was organic. He confessed that he sometimes felt like a hound or a panther, and, if born among Indians, would have been a fell hunter. But, restrained by his Massachusetts culture, he played out the game in this mild form of botany and ichthyology. His intimacy with animals suggested what Thomas Fuller records of Butler the apiologist, that either he had told the bees things or the bees had told him. Snakes coiled round his leg. The fishes swam into his hand, and he took them out of the water, he pulled the woodchuck out of its hole by the tail, and took the foxes under his protection from the hunters. Our naturalist had perfect magnanimity. He had no secrets, he would carry you to the heron's haunt, or even to his most prized botanical swamp, possibly knowing that you could never find it again, yet willing to take his risks. No college ever offered him a diploma, or a professor's chair, no academy made him its corresponding secretary, its discoverer, or even its member. Whether these learned bodies feared the satire of his presence. Yet so much knowledge of nature's secret and genius few others possessed, none in a more large and religious synthesis. For not a particle of respect had he to the opinions of any man or body of men, but homage solely to the truth itself. And as he discovered everywhere among doctors some leaning of courtesy, it discredited them. He grew to be revered and admired by his townsmen, who had at first known him only as an oddity. The farmers who employed him as a surveyor soon discovered his rare accuracy and skill, his knowledge of their lands, of trees, of birds, of Indian remains, and the like. Which enabled him to tell every farmer more than he knew before of his own farm. So that he began to feel as if Mr. Thoreau had better rights in his land than he. They felt, too, the superiority of character which addressed all men with a native authority. Indian relics abound in Concord, arrowheads, 
stone chisels, pestles, and fragments of pottery, and on the riverbank, large heaps of clamshells and ashes mark spots which the savages frequented. These, and every circumstance touching the Indian, were important in his eyes. His visits to Maine were chiefly for love of the Indian. He had the satisfaction of seeing the manufacture of the bark canoe, as well as of trying his hand in its management on the rapids. He was inquisitive about the making of the stone arrowhead. And in his last days charged a youth setting out for the Rocky Mountains to find an Indian who could tell him that, it was well worth a visit to California to learn it. Occasionally, a small party of Penobscot Indians would visit Concord, and pitch their tents for a few weeks in summer on the riverbank. He failed not to make acquaintance with the best of them. Though he well knew that asking questions of Indians is like catechizing beavers and rabbits. In his last visit to Maine he had great satisfaction from Joseph Polis, an intelligent Indian of Old Town, who was his guide for some weeks. He was equally interested in every natural fact. The depth of his perception found likeness of law throughout nature, and I know not any genius who so swiftly inferred universal law from the single fact. He was no pedant of a department. His eye was open to beauty, and his ear to music. He found these, not in rare conditions, but wheresoever he went. He thought the best of music was in single strains. And he found poetic suggestion in the humming of the telegraph wire. His poetry might be bad or good, he no doubt wanted a lyric facility and technical skill. But he had the source of poetry in his spiritual perception. He was a good reader and critic, and his judgment on poetry was to the ground of it. He could not be deceived as to the presence or absence of the poetic element in any composition, and his thirst for this made him negligent and perhaps scornful of superficial graces. He would pass by many delicate rhythms, but he would have detected every live stanza or line in a volume, and knew very well where to find an equal poetic charm in prose. He was so enamored of the spiritual beauty that he held all actual written poems in very light esteem in the comparison. He admired Aeschylus and Pindar. But, when someone was commending them, he said that Aeschylus and the Greeks, in describing Apollo and Orpheus, had given no song, or no good one. They ought not to have moved trees, but to have chanted to the god such a hymn as would have sung all their old ideas out of their heads, and new ones in. His own verses are often rude and defective. The gold does not yet run pure, is drossy and crude. The thyme and marjoram are not yet honey. But if he want lyric fineness and technical merits, if he have not the poetic temperament, he never lacks the causal thought, showing that his genius was better than his talent. He knew the worth of the imagination for the uplifting and consolation of human life, and liked to throw every thought into a symbol. The fact you tell is of no value, but only the impression. For this reason his presence was poetic, always piqued the curiosity to know more deeply the secrets of his mind. He had many reserves, an unwillingness to exhibit to profane eyes what was still sacred in his own, and knew well how to throw a poetic veil over his experience. All readers of Walden will remember his mythical record of his disappointments. I long ago lost a hound, a bay horse, and a turtle dove, and am still on their trail. Many are the travelers I have spoken concerning them, describing their tracks, and what calls they answered to. I have met one or two who had heard the hound, and the tramp of the horse, and even seen the dove disappear behind a cloud. And they seemed as anxious to recover them as if they had lost them themselves. 1. His riddles were worth the reading, and I confide, that, if at any time I do not understand the expression, it is yet just. Such was the wealth of his truth that it was not worth his while to use words in vain. His poem entitled, Sympathy, reveals the tenderness under that triple steel of stoicism, and the intellectual subtlety it could animate. His classic poem on, Smoke, suggests Simonides, but is better than any poem of Simonides. His biography is in his verses. His habitual thought makes all his poetry a hymn to the cause of causes, the spirit which vivifies and controls his own. I hearing get, who had but ears. And sight, who had but eyes before. I moments live, 
who lived but years. And truth discern, who knew but learning's lore. And still more in these religious lines. Now chiefly is my natal hour. And only now my prime of life. I will not doubt the love untold. Which not my worth or want hath bought. Which wooed me young, and woos me old. And to this evening hath me brought. Whilst he used in his writings a certain petulance of remark in reference to churches or churchmen, he was a person of a rare, tender, and absolute religion. A person incapable of any profanation, by act or by thought. Of course, the same isolation which belonged to his original thinking and living detached him from the social religious forms. This is neither to be censured nor regretted. Aristotle long ago explained it, when he said, one who surpasses his fellow citizens in virtue is no longer a part of the city. Their law is not for him, since he is a law to himself. Thoreau was sincerity itself, and might fortify the convictions of prophets in the ethical laws by his holy living. It was an affirmative experience which refused to be set aside. A truth speaker he, capable of the most deep and strict conversation, a physician to the wounds of any soul. A friend, knowing not only the secret of friendship, but almost worshipped by those few persons who resorted to him as their confessor and prophet. And knew the deep value of his mind and great heart. He thought that without religion or devotion of some kind nothing great was ever accomplished, and he thought that the bigoted sectarian had better bear this in mind. His virtues, of course, sometimes ran into extremes. It was easy to trace to the inexorable demand on all for exact truth that austerity which made this willing hermit more solitary even than he wished. Himself of a perfect probity, he required a not less of others. He had a disgust at crime, and no worldly success could cover it. He detected paltering as readily in dignified and prosperous persons as in beggars, and with equal scorn. Such dangerous frankness was in his dealing that his admirers called him, that terrible Thoreau, as if he spoke when silent, and was still present when he had departed. I think the severity of his ideal interfered to deprive him of a healthy sufficiency of human society. The habit of a realist to find things the reverse of their appearance inclined him to put every statement in a paradox. A certain habit of antagonism defaced his earlier writings, a trick of rhetoric not quite outgrown in his later, of substituting for the obvious word and thought its diametrical opposite. He praised wild mountains and winter forests for their domestic air, in snow and ice he would find sultriness, and commended the wilderness for resembling Rome and Paris. It was so dry, that you might call it wet. The tendency to magnify the moment, to read all the laws of nature in the one object or one combination under your eye is of course comic to those who do not share the philosopher's perception of identity. To him there was no such thing as size. The pond was a small ocean, the Atlantic, a large Walden pond. He referred every minute fact to cosmical laws. Though he meant to be just, he seemed haunted by a certain chronic assumption that the science of the day pretended completeness. And he had just found out that the savins had neglected to discriminate a particular botanical variety, had failed to describe the seeds or count the sepals. That is to say, we replied, the blockheads were not born in Concord, but who said they were? It was their unspeakable misfortune to be born in London, or Paris, or Rome. But, poor fellows, they did what they could, considering that they never saw Bateman's Pond, or Nine Acre Corner, or Becky Stowe's Swamp. Besides, what were you sent into the world for, but to add this observation? Had his genius been only contemplative, he had been fitted to his life, but with his energy and practical ability he seemed born for great enterprise and for command. And I so much regret the loss of his rare powers of action, that I cannot help counting it a fault in him that he had no ambition. Wanting this, instead of engineering for all America, he was the captain of a huckleberry party. Pounding beans is good to the end of pounding empires one of these days. But if, at the end of years, it is still only beans. But these foibles, real or apparent, were fast vanishing in the incessant growth of a spirit so robust and wise, and which effaced its defeats with new triumphs. 
His study of nature was a perpetual ornament to him, and inspired his friends with curiosity to see the world through his eyes, and to hear his adventures. They possessed every kind of interest. He had many elegances of his own, whilst he scoffed at conventional elegance. Thus, he could not bear to hear the sound of his own steps, the grit of gravel. And therefore never willingly walked in the road, but in the grass, on mountains, and in woods. His senses were acute, and he remarked that by night every dwelling house gives out bad air, like a slaughterhouse. He liked the pure fragrance of melilot. He honored certain plants with special regard, and, over all, the pond lily, then, the gentian, and the mecania scandens, and life everlasting. And a base tree which he visited every year when it bloomed, in the middle of July. He thought the scent a more oracular inquisition than the sight, more oracular and trustworthy. The scent, of course, reveals what is concealed from the other senses. By it he detected earthiness. He delighted in echoes, and said they were almost the only kind of kindred voices that he heard. He loved nature so well, was so happy in her solitude, that he became very jealous of cities, and the sad work which their refinements and artifices made with man and his dwelling. The axe was always destroying his forest. Thank God, he said, they cannot cut down the clouds. All kinds of figures are drawn on the blue ground with this fibrous white paint. I subjoin a few sentences taken from his unpublished manuscripts, not only as records of his thought and feeling, but for their power of description and literary excellence. Some circumstantial evidence is very strong, as when you find a trout in the milk. The chub is a soft fish, and tastes like boiled brown paper salted. The youth gets together his materials to build a bridge to the moon, or, perchance, a palace or temple on the earth, and at length the middle-aged man concludes to build a woodshed with them. The locust zenji. Devil's needles zigzagging along the nut meadow brook. Sugar is not so sweet to the palate as sound to the healthy ear. I put on some hemlock boughs, and the rich salt crackling of their leaves was like mustard to the ear, the crackling of uncountable regiments. Dead trees love the fire. The bluebird carries the sky on his back. The tanager flies through the green foliage as if it would ignite the leaves. If I wish for a horsehair for my compass sight, I must go to the stable, but the hairbird, with her sharp eyes, goes to the road. Immortal water, alive even to the superficies. Fire is the most tolerable third party. Nature made ferns for pure leaves, to show what she could do in that line. No tree has so fair a bowl and so handsome an instep as the beech. How did these beautiful rainbow tints get into the shell of the freshwater clam, buried in the mud at the bottom of our dark river? Hard are the times when the infant's shoes are second foot. We are strictly confined to our men to whom we give liberty. Nothing is so much to be feared as fear. Atheism may comparatively be popular with God himself. Of what significance the things you can forget? A little thought is sexton to all the world. How can we expect a harvest of thought who have not had a seed time of character? Only he can be trusted with gifts who can present a face of bronze to expectations. I ask to be melted. You can only ask of the metals that they be tender to the fire that melts them. To naught else can they be tender. There is a flower known to botanists, one of the same genus with our summer plant called life everlasting, a nephalium like that. Which grows on the most inaccessible cliffs of the Tyrolese mountains, where the chamois dare hardly venture and which the hunter, tempted by its beauty, and by his love, for it is immensely valued by the Swiss maidens, climbs the cliffs to gather, and is sometimes found dead at the foot, with the flower in his hand. It is called by botanists the Nephalium leontopodium, but by the Swiss Edelweiss, which signifies noble purity. Thoreau seemed to me living in the hope to gather this plant, which belonged to him of right. The scale on which his studies proceeded was so large as to require longevity, and we were the less prepared for his sudden disappearance. The country knows not yet, or in the least part, how great a son it has lost. It seems an injury that he should leave in the midst his broken task, which none else can finish, 
a kind of indignity to so noble a soul. That it should depart out of nature before yet he has been really shown to his peers for what he is. But he, at least, is content. His soul was made for the noblest society, he had in a short life exhausted the capabilities of this world. Wherever there is knowledge, wherever there is virtue, wherever there is beauty, he will find a home. R. W. Emerson How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Essays The Service Written around 1840 for the dial, it was rejected and remained unpublished until 1902. Chapter 1 Qualities of the Recruit Spes Sibi Quisk Virgil Each one his own hope The brave man is the elder son of creation, who has stepped buoyantly into his inheritance, while the coward, who is the younger, waiteth patiently till he decease. He rides as wide of this earth's gravity as a star, and by yielding incessantly to all the impulses of the soul, is constantly drawn upward and becomes a fixed star. His bravery deals not so much in resolute action, as healthy and assured rest, its palmy state is a staying at home and compelling alliance in all directions. So stands his life to heaven, as some fair sunlit tree against the western horizon, and by sunrise is planted on some eastern hill, to glisten in the first rays of the dawn. The brave man braves nothing, nor knows he of his bravery. He is that sixth champion against Thebes, whom, when the proud devices of the rest have been recorded, the poet describes as, bearing a full-orbed shield of solid brass. But there was no device upon its circle. For not to seem just but to be is his wish. He does not present a gleaming edge to ward off harm, for that will oftenest attract the lightning, but rather is the all-pervading ether, which the lightning does not strike but purify. So is the profanity of his companion as a flash across the face of his sky, which lights up and reveals its serene depths. Earth cannot shock the heavens, but its dull vapor and foul smoke make a bright cloud spot in the ether, and anon the sun, like a cunning artificer, will cut and paint it, and set it for a jewel in the breast of the sky. His greatness is not measurable. Not such a greatness as when we would erect a stupendous piece of art, and send far and near for materials, intending to lay the foundations deeper, and rear the structure higher than ever. For hence results only a remarkable bulkiness without grandeur, lacking those true and simple proportions which are independent of size. He was not builded by that unwise generation that would fain have reached the heavens by piling one brick upon another. But by a far wiser, that builded inward and not outward, having found out a shorter way, through the observance of a higher art. The pyramid some artisan may measure with his line. But if he gives you the dimensions of the Parthenon in feet and inches, the figures will not embrace it like a cord, but dangle from its entablature like an elastic drapery. His eye is the focus in which all the rays, from whatever side, are collected, for, itself being within and central, the entire circumference is revealed to it. Just as we scan the whole concave of the heavens at a glance, but can compass only one side of the pebble at our feet. So does his discretion give prevalence to his valor. Discretion is the wise man's soul, says the poet. His prudence may safely go many strides beyond the utmost rashness of the coward. For, while he observes strictly the golden mean, he seems to run through all extremes with impunity. Like the sun, which, to the poor worldling, now appears in the zenith, now in the horizon, and again is faintly reflected from the moon's disk and has the credit of describing an entire great circle, crossing the equinoctial and solstitial colours, without detriment to his steadfastness or mediocrity. The golden mean, in ethics, as in physics, is the centre of the system, and that about which all revolve. And, though to a distant and plodding planet it be the uttermost extreme, yet one day, when that planet's year is complete, it will be found to be central. 
They who are alarmed lest virtue should so far demean herself as to be extremely good, have not yet wholly embraced her, but described only a slight arc of a few seconds about her. And from so small and ill-defined a curvature, you can calculate no centre whatever, but their mean is no better than meanness, nor their medium than mediocrity. The coward wants resolution, which the brave man can do without. He recognises no faith but a creed, thinking this straw, by which he is moored, does him good service, because his sheet anchor does not drag. The house roof fights with the rain. He who is under shelter does not know it. In his religion the ligature, which should be muscle and sinew, is rather like that thread which the accomplices of Silen held in their hands. When they went abroad from the temple of Minerva, the other end being attached to the statue of the goddess. But frequently, as in their case, the thread breaks, being stretched, and he is left without an asylum. The divinity in man is the true vestal fire of the temple, which is never permitted to go out, but burns as steadily, and with as pure a flame. On the obscure provincial altars as in Numa's temple at Rome. In the meanest are all the materials of manhood, only they are not rightly disposed. We say, justly, that the weak person is flat, for, like all flat substances, he does not stand in the direction of his strength, that is, on his edge, but affords a convenient surface to put upon. He slides all the way through life. Most things are strong in one direction, a straw longitudinally, a board in the direction of its edge, a knee transversely to its grain. But the brave man is a perfect sphere, which cannot fall on its flat side, and is equally strong every way. The coward is wretchedly spheroidal at best, too much educated or drawn out on one side, and depressed on the other. Or may be likened to a hollow sphere, whose disposition of matter is best when the greatest bulk is intended. We shall not attain to be spherical by lying on one or the other side for an eternity, but only by resigning ourselves implicitly to the law of gravity in us. Shall we find our axis coincident with the celestial axis, and by revolving incessantly through all circles, acquire a perfect sphericity? Mankind, like the earth, revolve mainly from west to east, and so are flattened at the pole. But does not philosophy give hint of a movement commencing to be rotary at the poles too, which in a millennium will have acquired increased rapidity, and help restore an equilibrium? And when at length every star in the nebulae in Milky Way has looked down with mild radiance for a season, exerting its whole influence as the polar star. The demands of science will in some degree be satisfied. The grand and majestic have always somewhat of the undulatoriness of the sphere. It is the secret of majesty in the rolling gait of the elephant, and of all grace in action and in art. Always the line of beauty is a curve. When with pomp a huge sphere is drawn along the streets, by the efforts of a hundred men, I seem to discover each striving to imitate its gait. And keep step with it, if possible to swell to its own diameter. But onward it moves, and conquers the multitude with its majesty. What shame, then, that our lives, which might so well be the source of planetary motion, and sanction the order of the spheres, should be full of abruptness and angularity so as not to roll nor move majestically. The Romans made fortune surname to fortitude, for fortitude is that alchemy that turns all things to good fortune. The man of fortitude, whom the Latins called fortis is no other than that lucky person whom furs favors, or veer some may fortis. If we will, every bark may carry Caesar and Caesar's fortune. For an impenetrable shield, stand inside yourself, he was no artist, but an artisan, who first made shields of brass. For armor of proof, may a virtut me in volvo, I wrap myself in my virtue. Tumble me down, and I will sit. Upon my ruins, smiling yet. If you let a single ray of light through the shutter, it will go on diffusing itself without limit till it enlighten the world. But the shadow that was never so wide at first, as rapidly contracts till it comes to naught. The shadow of the moon, when it passes nearest the sun, is lost in space ere it can reach our earth to eclipse it. Always the system shines with uninterrupted light. For as the sun is so much larger than any planet, no shadow can travel far into space. 
We may bask always in the light of the system, always may step back out of the shade. No man's shadow is as large as his body, if the rays make a right angle with the reflecting surface. Let our lives be passed under the equator, with the sun and the meridian. There is no ill which may not be dissipated like the dark, if you let in a stronger light upon it. Overcome evil with good. Practice no such narrow economy as they, whose bravery amounts to no more light than a farthing candle, before which most objects cast a shadow wider than themselves. Nature refuses to sympathize with our sorrow. She has not provided for, but by a thousand contrivances against it, she has beveled the margin of the eyelids, that the tears may not overflow on the cheeks. It was a conceit of Plutarch, accounting for the preference given to signs observed on the left hand. That men may have thought things terrestrial and mortal directly over against heavenly and divine things, and do conjecture that the things which to us are on the left hand. The gods send down from their right hand. If we are not blind, we shall see how a right hand is stretched over all, as well the unlucky as the lucky, and that the ordering soul is only right-handed, distributing with one palm all our fates. What first suggested that necessity was grim, and made fate to be so fatal? The strongest is always the least violent. Necessity is my eastern cushion on which I recline. My eye revels in its prospect as in the summer haze. I ask no more but to be left alone with it. It is the bosom of time and the lap of eternity. To be necessary is to be needful, and necessity is only another name for inflexibility of good. How I welcome my grim fellow, and walk arm in arm with him. Let me too be such a necessity as he. I love him, he is so flexile, and yields to me as the air to my body. I leap and dance in his midst, and play with his beard till he smiles. I greet thee, my elder brother. Who with thy touch ennoblest all things. Then is holiday when naught intervenes betwixt me and thee. Must it be so, then is it good. The stars are thy interpreters to me. Over Greece hangs the divine necessity, ever a mellower heaven of itself, whose light gilds the Acropolis and a thousand fanes and groves. Chapter 2. What music shall we have? Each more melodious note I hear. Brings this reproach to me. That I alone afford the ear. Who would the music be? The brave man is the sole patron of music. He recognizes it for his mother tongue, a more mellifluous and articulate language than words, in comparison with which, speech is recent and temporary. It is his voice. His language must have the same majestic movement and cadence that philosophy assigns to the heavenly bodies. The steady flux of his thought constitutes time in music. The universe falls in and keeps pace with it, which before proceeded singly and discordant. Hence our poetry and song. When bravery first grew afraid and went to war, it took music along with it. The soul is delighted still to hear the echo of her own voice. Especially the soldier insists on agreement and harmony always. To secure these he falls out. Indeed, it is that friendship there is in war that makes it chivalrous and heroic. It was the dim sentiment of a noble friendship for the purest soul the world has seen, that gave to Europe a crusading era. War is but the compelling of peace. If the soldier marches to the sack of a town, he must be preceded by drum and trumpet, which shall identify his cause with the accordant universe. All things thus echo back his own spirit, and thus the hostile territory is preoccupied for him. He is no longer insulated, but infinitely related and familiar. The roll call musters for him all the forces of nature. There is as much music in the world as virtue. In a world of peace and love music would be the universal language, and men greet each other in the fields in such accents as a Beethoven now utters at rare intervals from a distance. All things obey music as they obey virtue. It is the herald of virtue. It is God's voice. In it are the centripetal and centrifugal forces. The universe needed only to hear a divine melody, that every star might fall into its proper place, and assume its true sphericity. 
it entails a surpassing affluence on the meanest thing. Riding over the heads of sages, and soothing the din of philosophy. When we listen to it we are so wise that we need not to know. All sounds, and more than all, silence, do fife and drum for us. The least creaking doth wet all our senses, and emit a tremulous light, like the aurora borealis, over things. As polishing expresses the vein in marble, and the grain in wood, so music brings out what of heroic lurks anywhere. It is either a sedative or a tonic to the soul. I read that, Plato thinks the gods never gave men music, the science of melody and harmony, for mere delectation or to tickle the ear. But that the discordant parts of the circulations and beauteous fabric of the soul, and that of it that roves about the body, and many times for want of tune and air, breaks forth into many extravagances and excesses, might be sweetly recalled and artfully wound up to their former consent and agreement. A sudden burst from a horn startles us, as if one had rashly provoked a wild beast. We admire his boldness, he dares wake the echoes which he cannot put to rest. The sound of a bugle in the stillness of the night sends forth its voice to the farthest stars, and marshals them in new order and harmony. Instantly it finds a fit sounding board in the heavens. The notes flash out on the horizon like heat lightning, quickening the pulse of creation. The heavens say, Now is this my own earth. To the sensitive soul the universe has her own fixed measure, which is its measure also, and as this, expressed in the regularity of its pulse, is inseparable from a healthy body. So is its healthiness dependent on the regularity of its rhythm. In all sounds the soul recognizes its own rhythm, and seeks to express its sympathy by a correspondent movement of the limbs. When the body marches to the measure of the soul, then is true courage and invincible strength. The coward would reduce this thrilling sphere music to a universal wail, this melodious chant to a nasal cant. He thinks to conciliate all hostile influences by compelling his neighborhood into a partial concord with himself. But his music is no better than a jingle, which is akin to a jar, jars regularly recurring. He blows a feeble blast of slender melody, because nature can have no more sympathy with such a soul than it has of cheerful melody in itself. Hence hears he no accordant note in the universe, and is a coward, or consciously outcast and deserted man. But the brave man, without drum or trumpet, compels concord everywhere, by the universality and tunefulness of his soul. Let not the faithful sorrow that he has no ear for the more fickle and subtle harmonies of creation, if he be awake to the slower measure of virtue and truth. If his pulse does not beat in unison with the musician's quips and turns, it accords with the pulse beat of the ages. A man's life should be a stately march to an unheard music. And when to his fellows it may seem irregular and inharmonious, he will be stepping to a livelier measure, which only his nicer ear can detect. There will be no halt, ever, but at most a marching on his post, or such a pause as is richer than any sound, when the deeper melody is no longer heard. But implicitly consented to with the whole life and being. He will take a false step never, even in the most arduous circumstances, for then the music will not fail to swell into greater volume, and rule the movement it inspired. Chapter 3 Not how many, but where the enemy are. What's brave, what's noble? Let's do it after the high Roman fashion. Shakespeare When my eye falls on the stupendous masses of the clouds, tossed into such irregular greatness across the cope of my sky, I feel that their grandeur is thrown away on the meanness of my employments. In vain the sun, through morning and noon rolls defiance to man, and, as he sinks behind his cloudy fortress in the west, challenges him to equal greatness in his career. But, from his humbleness he looks up to the domes and minarets and gilded battlements of the eternal city, and is content to be a suburban dweller outside the walls. We look in vain over earth for a Roman greatness, to take up the gauntlet which the heavens throw down. Idomeneus would not have demurred at the freshness of the last morning that rose to us, as unfit occasion to display his valor in. And of some such evening as this, methinks, that Grecian fleet came to anchor in the Bay of Aulis. Would that it were to us the eve of a more than ten years' war, 
a tithe of whose exploits, and Achillean withdrawals, and godly interferences, would stock a library of Iliads. Better that we have some of that testy spirit of knight errantry, and if we are so blind as to think the world is not rich enough nowadays to afford a real foe to combat. With our trusty swords and double-handed maces, H.E.W., and mangle some unreal phantom of the brain. In the pale and shivering fogs of the morning, gathering them up betimes, and withdrawing sluggishly to their daylight haunts, I see falsehood sneaking from the full blaze of truth. And with good relish could do execution on their rearward ranks, with the first brand that came to hand. We too are such puny creatures as to be put to flight by the sun, and suffer our ardor to grow cool in proportion as his increases. Our own short-lived chivalry sounds a retreat with the fumes and vapors of the night. And we turn to meet mankind, with its meek face preaching peace, and such non-resistance as the chaff that rides before the whirlwind. Let not our peace be proclaimed by the rust on our swords, or our inability to draw them from their scabbards. But let her at least have so much work on her hands as to keep those swords bright and sharp. The very dogs that bay the moon from farmyards, oh, these knights, do evince more heroism than is tamely barked forth in all the civil exhortations and war sermons of the age. And that day and night, which should be set down indelibly in men's hearts, must be learned from the pages of our almanac. One cannot wonder at the oulish habits of the race, which does not distinguish when its day ends and night begins. For, as night is the season of rest, it would be hard to say when its toil ended and its rest began. Not to it. Returns. Day, or the sweet approach of even or morn. Or sight of vernal bloom, or summer's rose. Or flocks or herds, or human face divine. But cloud instead, and ever during dark surrounds. And so the time lapses without epoch or era, and we know some half-score of mornings and evenings by tradition only. Almost the night is grieved and leaves her tears on the forelock of day, that men will not rush to her embrace, and fulfill at length the pledge so forwardly given in the youth of time. Men are a circumstance to themselves, instead of causing the universe to stand around, the mute witness of their manhood, and the stars to forget their sphere music and chant an elegiac strain. That heroism should have departed out of their ranks and gone over to humanity. It is not enough that our life is an easy one. We must live on the stretch, retiring to our rest like soldiers on the eve of a battle, looking forward with ardor to the strenuous sortie of the morrow. Sit not down in the popular seats and common level of virtues, but endeavor to make them heroical. Offer not only peace offerings but holocausts unto God. To the brave soldier the rust and leisure of peace are harder than the fatigues of war. As our bodies court physical encounters, and languish in the mild and even climate of the tropics, so our souls thrive best on unrest and discontent. The soul is a sterner master than any King Frederick, for a true bravery would subject our bodies to rougher usage than even a grenadier could withstand. We too are dwellers within the purlieus of the camp. When the sun breaks through the morning mist, I seem to hear the din of war louder than when his chariot thundered on the plains of Troy. The thin fields of vapor, spread like gauze over the woods, form extended lawns whereon high tournament is held. Before each van. Prick forth the airy knights, and couch their spears. Till thickest legions close. It behoves us to make life a steady progression, and not be defeated by its opportunities. The stream which first fell a drop from heaven, should be filtered by events till it burst out into springs of greater purity, and extract a diviner flavor from the accidents through which it passes. Shall man wear out sooner than the sun? And not rather dawn as freshly, and with such native dignity stalk down the hills of the east into the bustling vale of life, with as lofty and serene a countenance to roll onward through midday to a yet fairer and more promising setting? In the crimson colors of the west I discover the budding hues of dawn. To my western brother it is rising pure and bright as it did to me. But only the evening exhibits in the still rear of day, the beauty which through morning and noon escaped me. Is not that which we call the gross atmosphere of evening the accumulated deed of the day, which absorbs the rays of beauty, 
and shows more richly than the naked promise of the dawn. Let us look to it that by earnest toil in the heat of the noon, we get ready a rich western blaze against the evening. Nor need we fear that the time will hang heavy when our toil is done. For our task is not such a piece of day labor, that a man must be thinking what he shall do next for a livelihood, but such, that as it began in endeavor. So will it end only when no more in heaven or on earth remains to be endeavored. Effort is the prerogative of virtue. Let not death be the sole task of life, the moment when we are rescued from death to life, and set to work, if indeed that can be called a task which all things do but alleviate. Nor will we suffer our hands to lose one jot of their handiness by looking behind to a mean recompense. Knowing that our endeavor cannot be thwarted, nor we be cheated of our earnings unless by not earning them. It concerns us, rather, to be somewhat here present, than to leave something behind us. For, if that were to be considered, it is never the deed men praise, but some marble or canvas, which are only a staging to the real work. The hugest and most effective deed may have no sensible result at all on earth, but may paint itself in the heavens with new stars and constellations. When in rare moments our whole being strives with one consent, which we name a yearning, we may not hope that our work will stand in any artist's gallery on earth. The bravest deed, which for the most part is left quite out of history, which alone wants the staleness of a deed done, and the uncertainty of a deed doing, is the life of a great man. To perform exploits is to be temporarily bold, as becomes a courage that ebbs and flows, the soul, quite vanquished by its own deed, subsiding into indifference and cowardice. But the exploit of a brave life consists in its momentary completeness. Every stroke of the chisel must enter our own flesh and bone. He is a mere idolater and apprentice to art who suffers it to grate dully on marble. For the true art is not merely a sublime consolation in holiday labor, which the gods have given to sickly mortals. But such a masterpiece as you may imagine a dweller on the tablelands of Central Asia might produce, with threescore and ten years for canvas, and the faculties of a man for tools, a human life. Wherein you might hope to discover more than the freshness of Guido's aurora, or the mild light of Titian's landscapes, no bald imitation nor even rival of nature. But rather the restored original of which she is the reflection. For such a masterpiece as this, whole galleries of Greece and Italy are a mere mixing of colors and preparatory quarrying of marble. Of such sort, then, be our crusade, which, while it inclines chiefly to the hearty goodwill and activity of war, rather than the insincerity and sloth of peace, will set an example to both of calmness and energy. As unconcerned for victory as careless of defeat, not seeking to lengthen our term of service, nor to cut it short by a reprieve, but earnestly applying ourselves to the campaign before us. Nor let our warfare be a boorish and uncourteous one, but a higher courtesy attend its higher chivalry, though not to the slackening of its tougher duties and severer discipline. That so our camp may be a palestra, wherein the dormant energies and affections of men may tug and wrestle, not to their discomfiture, but to their mutual exercise and development. What were Godfrey and Gonsalvo unless we breathed a life into them and enacted their exploits as a prelude to our own? The past is the canvas on which our idea is painted, the dim prospectus of our future field. We are dreaming of what we are to do. Methinks I hear the clarion sound, and clang of corslet and buckler, from many a silent hamlet of the soul. The signal gun has long since sounded, and we are not yet on our posts. Let us make such haste as the morning, and such delay as the evening. Henry D. Thoreau. July, 1840. Aulus Perseus Flaccus. First published in the Dial, Volume 1, No. 1, July, 1840. If you have imagined what a divine work is spread out for the poet, and approach this author too, in the hope of finding the field at length fairly entered on. You will hardly dissent from the words of the prologue. Ipsi semipaganus. Ad sacra vadum carmen afro nostrum. Here is none of the interior dignity of Virgil, nor the elegance and fire of Horace, nor will any sibyl be needed to remind you, that from those older Greek poets. 
there is a sad descent to Perseus. Scarcely can you distinguish one harmonious sound, amid this unmusical bickering with the follies of men. One sees how music has its place in thought, but hardly as yet in language. When the muse arrives, we wait for her to remold language, and impart to it her own rhythm. Hitherto the verse groans and labors with its load, but goes not forward blithely, singing by the way. The best ode may be parodied, indeed is itself a parody, and has a poor and trivial sound, like a man stepping on the rounds of a ladder. Homer, and Shakespeare, and Milton, and Marvel, and Wordsworth, are but the rustling of leaves and crackling of twigs in the forest, and not yet the sound of any bird. The muse has never lifted up her voice to sing. Most of all satire will not be sung. A juvenile or Perseus do not marry music to their verse, but are measured fault-finders at best. Stand but just outside the faults they condemn, and so are concerned rather about the monster they have escaped, than the fair prospect before them. Let them live on an age, not a secular one, and they will have travelled out of his shadow and harm's way, and found other objects to ponder. As long as there is nature, the poet is, as it were, particeps criminis. One sees not but he had best let bad take care of itself, and have to do only with what is beyond suspicion. If you light on the least vestige of truth, and it is the weight of the whole body still which stamps the faintest trace, an eternity will not suffice to extol it, while no evil is so huge. But you grudge to bestow on it a moment of hate. Truth never turns to rebuke falsehood, her own straightforwardness is the severest correction. Horace would not have written satire so well, if he had not been inspired by it, as by a passion, and fondly cherished his vein. In his odes, the love always exceeds the hate, so that the severest satire still sings itself, and the poet is satisfied, though the folly be not corrected. A sort of necessary order in the development of genius is, first, complaint, second, plaint, third, love. Complaint, which is the condition of Perseus, lies not in the province of poetry. Ere long the enjoyment of a superior good would have changed his disgust into regret. We can never have much sympathy with the complainer. For after searching nature through, we conclude he must be both plaintiff and defendant too, and so had best come to a settlement without a hearing. I know not but it would be truer to say, that the highest strain of the muse is essentially plaintive. The saints are still tears of joy. But the divinest poem, or the life of a great man, is the severest satire. As impersonal as nature herself, and like the size of her winds in the woods, which convey ever a slight reproof to the hearer. The greater the genius, the keener the edge of the satire. Hence have we to do only with the rare and fragmentary traits, which least belong to Perseus, or, rather, are the properest utterance of his muse. Since that which he says best at any time is what he can best say at all times. The spectators and ramblers have not failed to cull some quotable sentences from this garden too, so pleasant is it to meet even the most familiar truths in a new dress, when, if our neighbor had said it, we should have passed it by as hackneyed. Out of these six satires, you may perhaps select some twenty lines, which fit so well as many thoughts, that they will recur to the scholar almost as readily as a natural image. Though when translated into familiar language, they lose that insular emphasis, which fitted them for quotation. Such lines as the following no translation can render commonplace. Contrasting the man of true religion with those, that, with jealous privacy, would fain carry on a secret commerce with the gods, he says. Hod quivis promptum est. Murmur que humilesque. Tolera suceros de templis. Etia perto vivera voto. To the virtuous man, the universe is the only sanctum sanctorum, and the penetralia of the temple are the broad noon of his existence. Why should he betake himself to a subterranean crypt, as if it were the only holy ground in all the world he had left unprofaned? The obedient soul would only the more discover and familiarize things, and escape more and more into light and air, as having henceforth done with secrecy. So that the universe shall not seem open enough for it. At length, is it neglectful even of that silence which is consistent with true modesty, 
but by its independence of all confidence in its disclosures. Makes that which it imparts so private to the hearer, that it becomes the care of the whole world that modesty be not infringed. To the man who cherishes a secret in his breast, there is a still greater secret unexplored. Our most indifferent acts may be matter for secrecy, but whatever we do with the utmost truthfulness and integrity, by virtue of its pureness, must be transparent as light. In the third satire he asks. Est aliquid quo tendis, etian quat dirigis arcum? An passum sequeris corvos, testave, lutove. Securis quo perferat, atc ex tempore vivis? Language seems to have justice done it, but is obviously cramped and narrowed in its significance, when any meanness is described. The truest construction is not put upon it. What may readily be fashioned into a rule of wisdom, is here thrown in the teeth of the sluggard, and constitutes the front of his offense. Universally, the innocent man will come forth from the sharpest inquisition and lecturings, the combined din of reproof and commendation, with a faint sound of eulogy in his ears. Our vices lie ever in the direction of our virtues, and in their best estate are but plausible imitations of the latter. Falsehood never attains to the dignity of entire falseness, but is only an inferior sort of truth, if it were more thoroughly false, it would incur danger of becoming true. Securus quo pes ferat, atc ex tempore vivit. Is then the motto of a wise man. For first, as the subtle discernment of the language would have taught us, with all his negligence he is still secure, but the sluggard, notwithstanding his heedlessness, is insecure. The life of a wise man is most of all extemporaneous, for he lives out of an eternity that includes all time. He is a child each moment and reflects wisdom. The far-darting thought of the child's mind tarries not for the development of manhood, it lightens itself, and needs not draw down lightning from the clouds. When we bask in a single ray from the mind of Zoroaster, we see how all subsequent time has been an idler, and has no apology for itself. But the cunning mind travels farther back than Zoroaster each instant, and comes quite down to the present with its revelation. All the thrift and industry of thinking give no man any stock in life. His credit with the inner world is no better, his capital no larger. He must try his fortune again today as yesterday. All questions rely on the present for their solution. Time measures nothing but itself. The word that is written may be postponed, but not that on the life. If this is what the occasion says, let the occasion say it. From a real sympathy, all the world is forward to prompt him who gets up to live without his creed in his pocket. In the fifth satire, which is the best, I find. Stat contra ratio, et recretum garret in orum. Nelisiat facera id, quat cas vitiabit agendo. Only they who do not see how anything might be better done are forward to try their hand on it. Even the master workman must be encouraged by the reflection, that his awkwardness will be incompetent to do that harm, to which his skill may fail to do justice. Here is no apology for neglecting to do many things from a sense of our incapacity, for what deed does not fall maimed and imperfect from our hands, but only a warning to bungle less. The satires of Perseus are the farthest possible from inspired, evidently a chosen, not imposed subject. Perhaps I have given him credit for more earnestness than is apparent. But certain it is, that that which alone we can call Perseus, which is forever independent and consistent, was in earnest, and so sanctions the sober consideration of all. The artist and his work are not to be separated. The most willfully foolish man cannot stand aloof from his folly, but the deed and the doer together make ever one sober fact. The buffoon may not bribe you to laugh always at his grimaces, they shall sculpture themselves in Egyptian granite, to stand heavy as the pyramids on the ground of his character. A walk to Wachusett. The needles of the pine. All to the west incline. Written in Concord, July 19, 1842, first published in the Boston Miscellany Vol. 3, No. 3, January, 1843. Summer and winter our eyes had rested on the dim outline of the mountains in our horizon, to which distance and indistinctness lent a grandeur not their own. 
so that they served equally to interpret all the illusions of poets and travelers. Whether with Homer, on a spring morning, we sat down on the many-peaked Olympus, or, with Virgil and his compeers, roamed the Etrurian and Thessalian hills. Or with Humboldt measured the more modern Andes and Tenerife. With frontier strength ye stand your ground. With grand content ye circle round. Tumultuous silence for all sound. Ye distant nursery of rills. Monadnock. And the Peterborough hills. Like some vast fleet. Sailing through rain and sleet. Through winter's cold and summer's heat. Still holding on, upon your high emprise. Until ye find a shore amid the skies. Not skulking close to land. With cargo contraband. For they who sent a venture out by ye. Have set the sun to sea. Their honesty. Ships of the line, each one. Ye to the westward run. Always before the gale. Under a press of sail. With weight of metal all untold. I seem to feel ye, in my firm seat here. Immeasurable depth of hold. And breadth of beam, and length of running gear. Methinks ye take luxurious pleasure. In your novel western leisure. So cool your brows, and freshly blue. As time had not for ye to do. For ye lie at your length. An unappropriated strength. Unhewn primeval timber. For knees so stiff, for masts so limber. The stock of which new earths are made. One day to be our western trade. Fit for the stanchions of a world. Which through the seas of space is hurled. While we enjoy a lingering ray. Ye still o'ertop the western day. Reposing yonder, on God's croft. Like solid stacks of hay. Edged with silver, and with gold. The clouds hang o'er in damask fold. And with such depth of amber light. The west is dight. Where still a few rays slant. That even heaven seems extravagant. On the earth's edge mountains and trees. Stand as they were on air graven. Or as the vessels in a haven. Await the morning breeze. I fancy even. Through your defile windeth the way to heaven. And yonder still, in spite of history's page. Linger the golden and the silver age. Upon the laboring gale. The news of future centuries is brought. And of new dynasties of thought. From your remotest vale. But special I remember thee. What you said, who like me. Standest alone without society. Thy far blue eye. A remnant of the sky. Seen through the clearing or the gorge. Or from the windows on the forge. Doth leaven all it passes by. Nothing is true. But stands, tween me and you. Thou western pioneer. Who knowst not shame nor fear. By venturous spirit driven. Under the eaves of heaven. And canst expand thee there. And breathe enough of air. Upholding heaven, holding down earth. Thy pastime from thy birth. Not steadied by the one, nor leaning on the other. May I approve myself thy worthy brother. At length, like Rasselas, and other inhabitants of happy valleys, we resolved to scale the blue wall which bound the western horizon, though not without misgivings. That thereafter no visible fairy land would exist for us. But we will not leap at once to our journey's end, though near, but imitate Homer, who conducts his reader over the plain, and along the resounding sea, though it be but to the tent of Achilles. In the spaces of thought are the reaches of land and water, where men go and come. The landscape lies far and fair within, and the deepest thinker is the farthest travelled. Taking advantage of the early hour on a pleasant morning in July, my companion and I passed rapidly through Acton and Stowe, stopping to rest and refresh us on the bank of a small stream. A tributary of the Assabet, in the latter town. As we traversed the cool woods of Acton, with stout staves in our hands, we were cheered by the song of the red eye, the thrushes, the phoebe, and the cuckoo. And as we passed through the open country, 
we inhaled the fresh scent of every field, and all nature lay passive, to be viewed and traveled. Every rail, every farmhouse, seen dimly in the twilight, every tinkling sound told of peace and purity, and we moved happily along the dank roads. Enjoying not such privacy as the day leaves when it withdraws, but such as it has not profaned. It was solitude with light, which is better than darkness. But anon, the sound of the mower's rifle was heard in the fields, and this, too, mingled with the herd of days. This part of our route lay through the country of hops. Perhaps there is no plan which so well supplies the want of the vine in American scenery, and may remind the traveller so often of Italy, and the south of France. Whether he traverses the country when the hop fields, as then, present solid and regular masses of verdure, hanging in graceful festoons from pole to pole. The cool coverts where fresh gales are born to refresh the wayfarer. Or in September, when the women and children, and the neighbors from far and near, are gathered to pick the hops into long troughs. Or later still, when the poles stand piled in immense pyramids in the yards, or lie in heaps by the roadside. The culture of the hop, with the processes of picking, drying in the kiln, and packing for the market, as well as the uses to which it is applied, so analogous to the culture and uses of the grape, may afford a theme for future poets. The mower in the adjacent meadow could not tell us the name of the brook on whose banks we had rested, or whether it had any, but his younger companion, perhaps his brother, knew that it was Great Brook. Though they stood very near together in the field, the things they knew were very far apart, nor did they suspect each other's reserved knowledge, till the stranger came by. In Bolton, while we rested on the rails of a cottage fence, the strains of music which issued from within, probably in compliment to us sojourners, reminded us that thus far men were fed by the accustomed pleasures. So soon did we begin to learn that man's life is rounded with the same few facts, the same simple relations everywhere, and it is vain to travel to find it new. The flowers grow more various ways than he. But coming soon to higher land, which afforded a prospect of the mountains, we thought we had not traveled in vain, if it were only to hear a truer and wilder pronunciation of their names. From the lips of the inhabitants. Not Waitatic, Waitchuset, but Wartatic, Wartchuset. It made us ashamed of our tame and civil pronunciation, and we looked upon them as born and bred farther west than we. His tongue had a more generous accent than ours, as if breath was cheaper when it wagged. A countryman, who speaks but seldom, talks copiously, as it were, as his wife sets cream and cheese before you without stint. Before noon we had reached the highlands in the western part of Bolton, overlooking the valley of Lancaster, and affording the first fair and open prospect into the west, and here. On the top of a hill, in the shade of some oaks, near to where a spring bubbled out from a leaden pipe, we rested during the heat of the day, reading Virgil, and enjoying the scenery. It was such a place as one feels to be on the outside of the earth, for from it we could, in some measure, see the form and structure of the globe. There lay the object of our journey, coming upon us with unchanged proportions, though with a less ethereal aspect than had greeted our morning gaze, while further north, in successive order, slumbered the sister mountains along the horizon. We could get no further into the Aeneid than at Galti Moenia Romi and the wall of High Rome. Before we were constrained to reflect by what myriad tests a work of genius has to be tried. That Virgil, away in Rome, two thousand years off, should have to unfold his meaning, the inspiration of Italian valets, to the pilgrim on New England hills. This life so raw and modern, that so civil and ancient. And yet we read Virgil, mainly to be reminded of the identity of human nature in all ages, and by the poet's own account, we are both the children of a late age. And live equally under the reign of Jupiter. He shook honey from the leaves, and removed fire. And stayed the wine, everywhere flowing in rivers. That experience, by meditating, might invent various arts. By degrees, and seek the blade of corn in furrows. And strike out hidden fire from the veins of the flint. The old world stands serenely behind the new, as one mountain yonder towers behind another, more dim and distant. 
Rome imposes her story still upon this late generation. The very children in the school we had that morning passed, had gone through her wars, and recited her alarms, ere they had heard of the wars of neighboring Lancaster. The roving eye still rests inevitably on her hills. She still holds up the skirts of the sky, and makes the past remote. The lay of the land hereabouts is well worthy the attention of the traveller. The hill on which we were resting makes part of an extensive range, running from southwest to northeast, across the country, and separating the waters of the Nashua from those of the Concord, whose banks we had left in the morning. And by bearing in mind this fact, we could easily determine whither each brook was bound that crossed our path. Parallel to this, and fifteen miles further west, beyond the deep and broad valley in which lie Groton, Shirley, Lancaster, and Boylston, runs the Wachusett Range, in the same general direction. The descent into the valley on the Nashua side, is by far the most sudden. And a couple of miles brought us to the southern branch of that river, a shallow but rapid stream, flowing between high and gravelly banks. But we soon learned that there were no gelidy valles into which we had descended, and missing the coolness of the morning air, feared it had become the sun's turn to try his power upon us. The sultry sun had gained the middle sky. And not a tree, and not an herb was nigh. And with melancholy pleasure we echoed the melodious plaint of our fellow traveller, Haman, in the desert. Sad was the hour, and luckless was the day. When first from China's walls I bent my way. The air lay lifeless between the hills, as in a seething cauldron, with no leaf stirring, and instead of the fresh odour of grass and clover, with which we had before been regaled. The dry scent of every herb seemed merely medicinal. Yielding, therefore, to the heat, we strolled into the woods, and along the course of a rivulet, on whose banks we loitered, observing at our leisure the products of these new fields. He who traverses the woodland paths, at this season, will have occasion to remember the small drooping bell-like flowers and slender red stem of the dog's bane. And the coarser stem and berry of the poke, which are both common in remoter and wilder scenes. And if, the sun casts such a reflecting heat from the sweet fern, as makes him faint, when he is climbing the bare hills, as they complained who first penetrated into these parts. The cool fragrance of the swamp pink restores him again, when traversing the valleys between. On we went, late in the afternoon refreshed ourselves by bathing our feet in every rill that crossed the road, and anon, as we were able to walk in the shadows of the hills. Recovered our morning elasticity. Passing through Stirling, we reached the banks of the Stillwater, in the western part of the town, at evening, where is a small village collected. We fancied that there was already a certain western look about this place, a smell of pines and roar of water, recently confined by dams, belying its name, which were exceedingly grateful. When the first inroad has been made, a few acres leveled, and a few houses erected, the forest looks wilder than ever. Left to herself, nature is always more or less civilized, and delights in a certain refinement. But where the axe has encroached upon the edge of the forest, the dead and unsightly limbs of the pine, which she had concealed with green banks of verdure, are exposed to sight. This village had, as yet, no post office, nor any settled name. As we entered upon its street, the villagers gazed after us, with a complacent, almost compassionate look, as if we were just making our debut in the world at a late hour. Nevertheless, did they seem to say, come and study us, and learn men and manners. So is each one's world but a clearing in the forest, so much open and enclosed ground. The landlord had not yet returned from the field with his men, and the cows had yet to be milked. But though we met with no very hospitable reception here at first, we remembered the inscription on the wall of the Swedish inn, and were comforted, you will find at Trollhate excellent bread, meat, and wine, provided you bring them with you. But I must confess it did somewhat disturb our pleasure, in this withdrawn spot, to have our own village newspaper handed us by our host. As if the greatest charm the country offered to the traveller was the facility of communication with the town. Let it recline on its own everlasting hills, and not be looking out from their summits for some petty Boston or New York in the horizon. At intervals we heard the murmuring of water, 
and the slumberous breathing of crickets throughout the night. And left the inn the next morning in the grey twilight, after it had been hallowed by the night air, and when only the innocent cows were stirring, with a kind of regret. It was only four miles to the base of the mountain, and the scenery was already more picturesque. Our road lay along the course of the still water, which was brawling at the bottom of a deep ravine, filled with pines and rocks, tumbling fresh from the mountains, so soon, alas! to commence its career of usefulness. At first, a cloud hung between us and the summit, but it was soon blown away. As we gathered the raspberries, which grew abundantly by the roadside, that action seemed consistent with a lofty prudence, as well as agreeable to the palate. As if the traveller who ascends into a mountainous region should fortify himself by eating of such light ambrosial fruits as grow there, and drinking of the springs which gush out from the mountain sides, as he gradually inhales the subtler and purer atmosphere of those elevated places, thus propitiating the mountain gods. By a sacrifice of their own fruits. The gross products of the plains and valleys are for such as dwell therein, but surely the juices of this berry had relation to the thin air of the mountain tops. In due time we began to ascend the mountain, passing, first, through a maple wood, then a denser forest, which gradually became dwarfed, till there were no trees whatever. We at length pitched our tent on the summit. It is but nineteen hundred feet above the village of Princeton, and three thousand above the level of the sea. But by this slight elevation it is infinitely removed from the plain, and when we have reached it, we feel a sense of remoteness, as if we had travelled into distant regions, to Arabia Petria. Or the farthest east, so withdrawn and solitary it seems. A robin upon a staff, was the highest object in sight, thus easily triumphing over the height of nature. Swallows were flying about us, and the chewink and cuckoos were heard near at hand. The summit consists of a few acres, destitute of trees, covered with bare rocks, interspersed with blueberry bushes, raspberries, gooseberries, strawberries, moss, and a fine wiry grass. The common yellow lily, and dwarf cornel, grow abundantly in the crevices of the rocks. This clear space, which is gently rounded, is bounded a few feet lower by a thick shrubbery of oaks, with maples, aspens, beeches, cherries, and occasionally a mountain ash intermingled. Among which we found the bright blueberries of the Solomon seal, and the fruit of the pirola. From the foundation of a wooden observatory, which was formerly erected on the highest point, forming a rude hollow structure of stone, a dozen feet in diameter, and five or six in height. We could see Monadnock, rising in simple grandeur, in the northwest, nearly a thousand feet higher, still the far blue mountain, though with an altered profile. But the first day the weather was so hazy that it was in vain we endeavored to unravel the obscurity. It was like looking into the sky again, and the patches of forest here and there seemed to flit like clouds over a lower heaven. As to voyagers of an aerial Polynesia, the earth seemed like a larger island in the ether, on every side, even as low as we, the sky shutting down, like an unfathomable deep, around it. A blue Pacific island, where who knows what islanders inhabit. And as we sail near its shores we see the waving of trees, and hear the lowing of kine. We read Virgil and Wordsworth in our tent, with new pleasure there, while waiting for a clearer atmosphere. Nor did the weather prevent our appreciating the simple truth and beauty of Peter Bell. And he had lain beside his asses. On lofty Cheviot hills. And he had trudged through Yorkshire dales. Among the rocks and winding scars. Where deep and low the hamlets lie. Beneath their little patch of sky. And little lot of stars. Who knows but this hill may one day be a Helvellyn, or even a Parnassus, and the muses haunt here, and other homers frequent the neighboring plains. Not unconcerned Wachusett rears his head. Above the field, so late from nature one. With patient brow reserved, as one who read. New annals in the history of man. The blueberries which the mountain afforded, added to the milk we had brought, made our frugal supper, while for entertainment the even song of the wood thrush rung along the ridge. Our eyes rested on no painted ceiling nor carpeted hall, but on skies of nature's painting, and hills and forests of her embroidery. 
Before sunset, we rambled along the ridge to the north, while a hawk soared still above us. It was a place where gods might wander, so solemn and solitary, and removed from all contagion with the plain. As the evening came on, the haze was condensed in vapor, and the landscape became more distinctly visible, and numerous sheets of water were brought to light. Et jam summa procul villarum culmina fument. Majoresque cadunt altus de montibus umbri. And now the tops of the villas smoke afar off. And the shadows fall longer from the high mountains. As we stood on the stone tower while the sun was setting, we saw the shades of night creep gradually over the valleys of the east, and the inhabitants withdrew to their houses. And shut their doors, while the moon silently rose up, and took possession of that part. And then the same scene was repeated on the west side, as far as the Connecticut and the Green Mountains, and the sun's rays fell on us two alone, of all New England men. It was the night but one before the full of the moon, so that we enjoyed uninterrupted light, so bright that we could see to read Wordsworth distinctly. And when in the evening we strolled on the summit, there was a fire blazing on Monadnock, which lighted up the whole western horizon, and by making us aware of a community of mountains made our position seem less solitary. But at length the wind drove us to the shelter of our tent, and we closed its door for the night, and fell asleep. It was a rich treat to hear the wind roar over the rocks, at intervals when we waked, for it had grown quite cold and windy. The night was in its elements, simple even to majesty in that bleak place, a bright moonlight and a piercing wind. It was at no time darker than twilight within the tent, and we could easily see the moon through its transparent roof as we lay. For there was the moon still above us, with Jupiter and Saturn on either hand, looking down on Wachusett, and it was a satisfaction to know that they were our fellow travelers still. As high and out of our reach as our own destiny. Truly the stars were given for a consolation to man. We should not know but our life were fated to be always groveling, but it is permitted to behold them, and surely they are deserving of a fair destiny. We see laws which never fail, of whose failure we never conceived. And their lamps burn all the night, too, as well as all day, so rich and lavish is that nature which can afford this superfluity of light. The morning twilight began as soon as the moon had set, and we arose and kindled our fire, whose blaze might have been seen for thirty miles around. As the daylight increased, it was remarkable how rapidly the wind went down. There was no dew on the summit, but coldness supplied its place. When the dawn had reached its prime, we enjoyed the view of a distinct horizon line, and could fancy ourselves at sea, and the distant hills the waves in the horizon. As seen from the deck of a vessel. The cherry birds flitted around us, the nest hatch and flicker were heard among the bushes, the titmouse perched within a few feet, and the song of the wood thrush again rung along the ridge. At length we saw the sun rise up out of the sea, and shine on Massachusetts. And from this moment the atmosphere grew more and more transparent till the time of our departure, and we began to realize the extent of the view, and how the earth, in some degree, answered to the heavens in breadth, the white villages to the constellations in the sky. There was little of the sublimity and grandeur which belonged to mountain scenery, but an immense landscape to ponder on a summer's day. We could see how ample and roomy is nature. As far as the eye could reach, there was little life in the landscape, the few birds that flitted past did not crowd. The travelers on the remote highways, which intersect the country on every side, had no fellow travelers for miles, before or behind. On every side, the eye ranged over successive circles of towns, rising one above another, like the terraces of a vineyard, till they were lost in the horizon. Wachusett is, in fact, the observatory of the state. There lay Massachusetts, spread out before us in its length and breadth, like a map. There was the level horizon, which told of the sea on the east and south, the well-known hills of New Hampshire on the north, and the misty summits of the Hoosick and Green Mountains. First made visible to us the evening before, blue and unsubstantial, like some bank of clouds which the morning wind would dissipate, on the northwest and west. These last distant ranges, on which the eye rests unwearied, commence with an abrupt boulder in the north, 
beyond the Connecticut, and travel southward, with three or four peaks dimly seen. But Monadnock, rearing its masculine front in the northwest, is the grandest feature. As we beheld it, we knew that it was the height of land between the two rivers, on this side the valley of the Merrimack, or that of the Connecticut, fluctuating with their blue seas of air. These rival valets, gradually extending their population and commerce along their respective streams, to what destiny who shall tell. Watatic and the neighboring hills in this state and in New Hampshire, are a continuation of the same elevated range on which we were standing. But that New Hampshire bluff, that promontory of a state, causing day and night on this our state of Massachusetts, will longest haunt our dreams. We could, at length, realize the place mountains occupy on the land, and how they come into the general scheme of the universe. When first we climb their summits and observe their lesser irregularities, we do not give credit to the comprehensive intelligence which shaped them. But when afterward we behold their outlines in the horizon, we confess that the hand which molded their opposite slopes, making one to balance the other, worked round a deep center. And was privy to the plan of the universe. So is the least part of nature in its bearings referred to all space. These lesser mountain ranges, as well as the Alleghenies, run from northeast to southwest, and parallel with these mountain streams are the more fluent rivers. Answering to the general direction of the coast, the bank of the great ocean stream itself. Even the clouds, with their thin bars, fall into the same direction by preference, and such is the course of the prevailing winds, and the migration of men and birds. A mountain chain determines many things for the statesman and philosopher. The improvements of civilization rather creep along its sides than cross its summit. How often is it a barrier to prejudice and fanaticism? In passing over these heights of land, through their thin atmosphere, the follies of the plain are refined and purified. As many species of plants do not scale their summits, so many species of folly no doubt do not cross the Alleghenies. It is only the hardy mountain plant that creeps quite over the ridge, and descends into the valley beyond. It adds not a little grandeur to our conception of the flight of birds, especially of the duck tribe, and such as fly high in the air, to have ascended a mountain. We can now see what landmarks they are to their migrations, how the Catskills and Highlands have hardly sunk to them, when Wachusett and Monadnock open a passage to the northeast. How they are guided, too, in their course by the rivers and valleys, and who knows but by the stars, as well as the mountain ranges, and not by the petty landmarks which we use. The bird whose eye takes in the green mountains on the one side, and the ocean on the other, need not be at a loss to find its way. At noon we descended the mountain, and having returned to the abodes of men, turned our faces to the east again. Measuring our progress, from time to time, by the more ethereal hues which the mountain assumed. Passing swiftly through Stillwater and Stirling, as with a downward impetus, the reader will excuse the abruptness of the descent. We found ourselves almost at home again in the green meadows of Lancaster, so like our own Concord, for both are watered by two streams which unite near their centers. And have many other features in common. There is an unexpected refinement about this scenery, level prairies of great extent, interspersed with elms and hop fields and groves of trees, give it almost a classic appearance. This, it will be remembered, was the scene of Mrs. Rowlandson's capture, and of other events in the Indian Wars, but from this July afternoon, and under that mild exterior, those times seemed as remote as the eruption of the Goths. They were the dark age of New England. On beholding a picture of a New England village as it then appeared, with a fair open prospect, and a light on trees and river, as if it were broad noon. We find we had not thought the sun shone in those days, or that men lived in broad daylight then. We do not imagine the sun shining on hill and valley during Philip's war, nor on the warpath of Paugus, or Standish, or Church, or Lovell, with serene summer weather. But a dim twilight or night did those events transpire in. They must have fought in the shade of their own dusky deeds. At length, as we plodded along the dusty roads, our thoughts became as dusty as they. All thought indeed stopped, thinking broke down, 
or proceeded only passively in a sort of rhythmical cadence of the confused material of thought. And we found ourselves mechanically repeating some familiar measure which timed with our tread. Some verse of the Robin Hood ballads, for instance, which one can recommend to travel by. Swearers are swift, said Little John. As the wind blows over the hill. For if it be never so loud this night. Tomorrow it may be still. And so it went up hill and down till a stone interrupted the line, when a new verse was chosen. His should it was but loosely shot. Yet flew not the arrow in vain. For it met one of the Sharif's men. And William Trent was slain. There is, however, this consolation to the most wayworn traveller, upon the dustiest road, that the path his feet describe is so perfectly symbolical of human life, now climbing the hills. Now descending into the valleys. From the summits he beholds the heavens and the horizon, from the valleys he looks up to the heights again. He is treading his old lessons still, and though he may be very weary and travel-worn, it is yet sincere experience. Leaving the Nashua, we changed our route a little, and arrived at Still River Village, in the western part of Harvard, just as the sun was setting. From this place, which lies to the northward, upon the western slope of the same range of hills on which we had spent the noon before, in the adjacent town, the prospect is beautiful. And the grandeur of the mountain outlines unsurpassed. There was such a repose and quiet here at this hour, as if the very hillsides were enjoying the scene, and we passed slowly along, looking back over the country we had traversed. And listening to the evening song of the robin, we could not help contrasting the equanimity of nature with the bustle and impatience of man. His words and actions presume always a crisis near at hand, but she is forever silent and unpretending. We rested that night at Harvard, and the next morning, while one bent his steps to the nearer village of Groton, the other took his separate and solitary way to the peaceful meadows of Concord. But let him not forget to record the brave hospitality of a farmer and his wife, who generously entertained him at their board. Though the poor wayfarer could only congratulate the one on the continuance of hay weather, and silently accept the kindness of the other. Refreshed by this instance of generosity, no less than by the substantial viands set before him, he pushed forward with new vigor and reached the banks of the Concord before the sun had climbed many degrees into the heavens. And now that we have returned to the desultory life of the plain, let us endeavor to import a little of that mountain grandeur into it. We will remember within what walls we lie, and understand that this level life too has its summit, and why from the mountain top the deepest valleys have a tinge of blue. That there is elevation in every hour, as no part of the earth is so low that the heavens may not be seen from. And we have only to stand on the summit of our hour to command an uninterrupted horizon. Natural History of Massachusetts 2. First published in the Dial, Volume 2, No. 1, July, 1842. Books of natural history make the most cheerful winter reading. I read in Audubon with a thrill of delight, when the snow covers the ground, of the Magnolia, and the Florida Keys, and their warm sea breezes. Of the fence rail, and the cotton tree, and the migrations of the rice bird, of the breaking up of winter in Labrador, and the melting of the snow on the forks of the Missouri. And owe oh, an accession of health to these reminiscences of luxuriant nature. Within the circuit of this plodding life, there enter moments of an azure hue, untarnished fair as is the violet, or anemone, when the spring strews them, by some meandering rivulet, which make the best philosophy untrue that aims. But to console man for his grievances. I have remembered when the winter came. High in my chamber in the frosty nights. When in the still light of the cheerful moon. On every twig and rail and jutting spout. The icy spears were adding to their length. Against the arrows of the coming sun. How in the shimmering noon of summer past. Some unrecorded beam slanted across the upland pastures where the jauntswort grew, or heard, amid the verdure of my mind, the bee's long smothered hum on the blue flag, loitering amidst the mead, or busy rill, 
which now through all its course stands still and dumb. Its own memorial, purling at its play. Along the slopes, and through the meadows next. Until its youthful sound was hushed at last. In the staid current of the lowland stream. Or seen the furrows shine but late upturned. And where the fieldfare followed in the rear. When all the fields around lay bound and hoar. Beneath a thick integument of snow. So by God's cheap economy made rich. To go upon my winter's task again. I am singularly refreshed in winter when I hear of serviceberries, pokeweed, juniper. Is not heaven made up of these cheap summer glories? There is a singular health in those words, Labrador and East Maine, which no desponding creed recognizes. How much more than federal are these states? If there were no other vicissitudes than the seasons, our interest would never tire. Much more is a doing than Congress what's of. What journal do the persimmon and the buckeye keep, and the sharp-shinned hawk? What is transpiring from summer to winter in the Carolinas, and the great pine forest, and the valley of the Mohawk? The merely political aspect of the land is never very cheering, men are degraded when considered as the members of a political organization. On this side all lands present only the symptoms of decay. I see but Bunker Hill and Sing Sing, the District of Columbia and Sullivan's Island, with a few avenues connecting them. But paltry are they all beside one blast of the east or the south wind which blows over them. In society you will not find health, but in nature. Unless our feet at least stood in the midst of nature, all our faces would be pale and livid. Society is always diseased, and the best is the most so. There is no scent in it so wholesome as that of the pines, nor any fragrance so penetrating and restorative as the life everlasting in high pastures. I would keep some book of natural history always by me as a sort of elixir, the reading of which should restore the tone of the system. To the sick, indeed, nature is sick, but to the well, a fountain of health. To him who contemplates a trait of natural beauty no harm nor disappointment can come. The doctrines of despair, of spiritual or political tyranny or servitude, were never taught by such as shared the serenity of nature. Surely good courage will not flag here on the Atlantic border, as long as we are flanked by the fur countries. There is enough in that sound to cheer one under any circumstances. The spruce, the hemlock, and the pine will not countenance despair. Methinks some creeds in vestries and churches do forget the hunter wrapped in furs by the great slave lake, and that the Eskimo sledges are drawn by dogs, and in the twilight of the northern night. The hunter does not give over to follow the seal and walrus on the ice. They are of sick and diseased imaginations who would toll the world's knell so soon. Cannot these sedentary sects do better than prepare the shrouds and write the epitaphs of those other busy living men? The practical faith of all men belies the preacher's consolation. What is any man's discourse to me, if I am not sensible of something in it as steady and cheery as the creak of crickets? In it the woods must be relieved against the sky. Men tire me when I am not constantly greeted and refreshed as by the flux of sparkling streams. Surely joy is the condition of life. Think of the young fry that leap in ponds, the myriads of insects ushered into being on a summer evening, the incessant note of the hyla with which the woods ring in the spring. The nonchalance of the butterfly carrying accident and change painted in a thousand hues upon its wings, or the brook minnow stoutly stemming the current. The luster of whose scales worn bright by the attrition is reflected upon the bank. We fancy that this din of religion, literature, and philosophy, which is heard in pulpits, lyceums, and parlors, vibrates through the universe. And is as Catholic a sound as the creaking of the earth's axle. But if a man sleeps soundly, he will forget it all between sunset and dawn. It is the three-inch swing of a pendulum in a cupboard, which the great pulse of nature vibrates by and through each instant. When we lift our eyelids and open our ears, it disappears with smoke and rattle like the cars on a railroad. When I detect a beauty in any of the recesses of nature, I am reminded, by the serene and retired spirit in which it requires to be contemplated. Of the inexpressible privacy of a life, 
how silent and unambitious it is. The beauty there is in mosses must be considered from the holiest, quietest nook. What an admirable training is science for the more active warfare of life. Indeed, the unchallenged bravery, which these studies imply, is far more impressive than the trumpeted valor of the warrior. I am pleased to learn that Thales was up and stirring by night not unfrequently, as his astronomical discoveries prove. Linnaeus, setting out for Lapland, surveys his comb and spare shirt, leathern breeches, and gauze cap to keep off gnats. With as much complacency as Bonaparte a park of artillery for the Russian campaign. The quiet bravery of the man is admirable. His eye is to take in fish, flower, and bird, quadruped and biped. Science is always brave, for to know, is to know good. Doubt and danger quail before her eye. What the coward overlooks in his hurry, she calmly scrutinizes, breaking ground like a pioneer for the array of arts that follow in her train. But cowardice is unscientific, for there cannot be a science of ignorance. There may be a science of bravery, for that advances, but a retreat is rarely well conducted. If it is, then is it an orderly advance in the face of circumstances. But to draw a little nearer to our promised topics. Entomology extends the limits of being in a new direction, so that I walk in nature with a sense of greater space and freedom. It suggests besides, that the universe is not rough-hewn, but perfect in its details. Nature will bear the closest inspection. She invites us to lay our eye level with the smallest leaf, and take an insect view of its plane. She has no interstices, every part is full of life. I explore, too, with pleasure, the sources of the myriad sounds which crowd the summer noon, and which seem the very grain and stuff of which eternity is made. Who does not remember the shrill roll call of the harvest fly? There were ears for these sounds in Greece long ago, as Anacreon's ode will show. We pronounce the happy, cicada. Four on the tops of the trees. Drinking a little dew. Like any king thou singest. For thine are they all. Whatever thou sayest in the fields. And whatever the woods bear. Thou art the friend of the husbandman. In no respect injuring any one. And thou art honored among men. Sweet prophet of summer. The muses love thee. And Phoebus himself loves thee. And has given thee a shrill song. Age does not rack thee. Thou skillful, earth-born, song-loving. Unsuffering, bloodless one. Almost thou art like the gods. In the autumn days, the creaking of crickets is heard at noon over all the land, and as in summer they are heard chiefly at nightfall. So then by their incessant chirp they usher in the evening of the year. Nor can all the vanities that vex the world alter one with the measure that night has chosen. Every pulse beat is in exact time with the cricket's chant and the tickings of the death watch in the wall. Alternate with these if you can. About 280 birds either reside permanently in the state, or spend the summer only, or make us a passing visit. Those which spend the winter with us have obtained our warmest sympathy. The nuthatch and chickadee flitting in company through the dells of the wood, the one harshly scolding at the intruder, the other with a faint lisping note enticing him on. The jay screaming in the orchard, the crow cawing in unison with the storm, the partridge, like a russet link extended over from autumn to spring, preserving unbroken the chain of summers. The hawk with warrior-like firmness abiding the blasts of winter, the robin three and lark lurking by warm springs in the woods. The familiar snowbird culling a few seeds in the garden, or a few crumbs in the yard, and occasionally the shrike, with heedless and unfrozen melody bringing back summer again. His steady sails he never furls. At any time o' oh, year. And perching now on winter's curls. He whistles in his ear. As the spring advances, and the ice is melting in the river, our earliest and straggling visitors make their appearance. Again does the old Tyan poet sing, as well for New England as for Greece, in the Return of Spring. Behold, how spring appearing. The graces send forth roses. Behold, how the wave of the sea. 
is made smooth by the calm. Behold, how the duck dives! Behold, how the crane travels! And Titan shines constantly bright. The shadows of the clouds are moving. The works of man shine. The earth puts forth fruits. The fruit of the olive puts forth. The cup of Bacchus is crowned. Along the leaves, along the branches. The fruit, bending them down, flourishes. The ducks alight at this season in the still water, in company with the gulls, which do not fail to improve an east wind to visit our meadows, and swim about by twos and threes. Pluming themselves, and diving to peck at the root of the lily, and the cranberries which the frost has not loosened. The first flock of geese is seen beating to north, in long harrows and waving lines, the gingle of the song sparrow salutes us from the shrubs and fences. The plaintive note of the lark comes clear and sweet from the meadow, and the bluebird, like an azure ray, glances past us in our walk. The fishhawk, too, is occasionally seen at this season sailing majestically over the water, and he who has once observed it will not soon forget the majesty of its flight. It sails the air like a ship of the line, worthy to struggle with the elements, falling back from time to time like a ship on its beam ends, and holding its talons up as if ready for the arrows. In the attitude of the national bird. It is a great presence, as of the master of river and forest. Its eye would not quail before the owner of the soil, but make him feel like an intruder on its domains. And then its retreat, sailing so steadily away, is a kind of advance. I have by me one of a pair of ospreys, which have for some years fished in this vicinity, shot by a neighboring pond, measuring more than two feet in length, and six in the stretch of its wings. Nuttall mentions that, the ancients, particularly Aristotle, pretended that the ospreys taught their young to gaze at the sun, and those who were unable to do so were destroyed. Linnaeus even believed, on ancient authority, that one of the feet of this bird had all the toes divided, while the other was partly webbed, so that it could swim with one foot. And grasp a fish with the other. But that educated eye is now dim, and those talons are nerveless. Its shrill scream seems yet to linger in its throat, and the roar of the sea in its wings. There is the tyranny of Jove in its claws, and his wrath in the erectile feathers of the head and neck. It reminds me of the Argonautic expedition, and would inspire the dullest to take flight over Parnassus. The booming of the bittern, described by Goldsmith and Nuttall, is frequently heard in our fens, in the morning and evening, sounding like a pump. Or the chopping of wood in a frosty morning in some distant farmyard. The manner in which this sound is produced I have not seen anywhere described. On one occasion, the bird has been seen by one of my neighbors to thrust its bill into the water, and suck up as much as it could hold, then raising its head. It pumped it out again with four or five heaves of the neck, throwing it two or three feet, and making the sound each time. At length the summer's eternity is ushered in by the cackle of the flicker among the oaks on the hillside, and a new dynasty begins with calm security. In May and June the woodland choir is in full tune, and given the immense spaces of hollow air, and this curious human ear, one does not see how the void could be better filled. Each summer sound is a summer round. As the season advances, and those birds which make us but a passing visit depart, the woods become silent again, and but few feathers ruffle the drowsy air. But the solitary rambler may still find a response and expression for every mood in the depths of the wood. Sometimes I hear the very S4 clarion. Or brazen trump of the impatient jay. And in secluded woods the chickadee. Doles out her scanty notes, which sing the praise. Of heroes. And set forth the loveliness of virtue evermore. The Phoebe still sings in harmony with the sultry weather by the brink of the pond, nor are the desultory hours of noon in the midst of the village without their minstrel. Upon the lofty elm tree sprays. The vireo rings the changes sweet. During the trivial summer days. Striving to lift our thoughts above the street. With the autumn begins in some measure a new spring. The plover is heard whistling high in the air over the dry pastures, the finches flit from tree to tree, 
the bobolinks and flickers fly in flocks, and the goldfinch rides on the earliest blast. Like a winged hyla peeping amid the rustle of the leaves. The crows, too, begin now to congregate. You may stand and count them as they fly low and straggling over the landscape, singly or by twos and threes, at intervals of half a mile, until a hundred have passed. I have seen it suggested somewhere that the crow was brought to this country by the white man, but I shall as soon believe that the white man planted these pines and hemlocks. He is no spaniel to follow our steps, but rather flits about the clearings like the dusky spirit of the Indian, reminding me oftener of Philip and Powhatan, than of Winthrop and Smith. He is a relic of the Dark Ages. By just so slight, by just so lasting a tenure does superstition hold the world ever, there is the rook in England, and the crow in New England. Thou dusky spirit of the wood! Bird of an ancient brood! Flitting thy lonely way! A meteor in the summer's day! From wood to wood, from hill to hill! Low over forest, field! And rill! What wouldst thou say? Why shouldst thou haunt the day? What makes thy melancholy float? What bravery inspires thy throat? And bears thee up above the clouds? Over desponding human crowds? Which far below? Lay thy haunts low? The late walker or sailor, in the October evenings, may hear the murmurings of the snipe, circling over the meadows, the most spirit-like sound in nature. And still later in the autumn, when the frosts have tinged the leaves, a solitary loon pays a visit to our retired ponds, where he may lurk undisturbed till the season of molting is past. Making the woods ring with his wild laughter. This bird, the great northern diver, well deserves its name. For when pursued with a boat, it will dive, and swim like a fish under water, for sixty rods or more, as fast as a boat can be paddled, and its pursuer, if he would discover his game again must put his ear to the surface to hear where it comes up. When it comes to the surface, it throws the water off with one shake of its wings, and calmly swims about until again disturbed. These are the sights and sounds which reach our senses oftenest during the year. But sometimes one hears a quite new note, which has for background other Carolinas and Mexicos than the books describe, and learns that his ornithology has done him no service. It appears from the report that there are about forty quadrupeds belonging to the state, and among these one is glad to hear of a few bears, wolves, lynxes, and wildcats. When our river overflows its banks in the spring, the wind from the meadows is laden with a strong scent of musk, and by its freshness advertises me of an unexplored wildness. Those backwoods are not far off then. I am affected by the sight of the cabins of the muskrat, made of mud and grass, and raised three or four feet along the river, as when I read of the barrows of Asia. The muskrat is the beaver of the settled states. Their number has even increased within a few years in this vicinity. Among the rivers which empty into the Merrimack, the Concord is known to the boatmen as a dead stream. The Indians are said to have called it Musketaquid, or Prairie River. Its current being much more sluggish, and its water more muddy than the rest, it abounds more in fish and game of every kind. According to the history of the town, the fur trade was here once very important. As early as 1641, a company was formed in the colony, of which Major Willard of Concord was superintendent, and had the exclusive right to trade with the Indians in furs and other articles. And for this right they were obliged to pay into the public treasury one-twentieth of all the furs they obtained. There are trappers in our midst still, as well as on the streams of the far west, who night and morning go the round of their traps, without fear of the Indian. One of these takes from 150 to 200 muskrats in a year, and even 36 have been shot by one man in a day. Their fur, which is not nearly as valuable as formerly, is in good condition in the winter and spring only. And upon the breaking up of the ice, when they are driven out of their holes by the water, the greatest number is shot from boats, either swimming or resting on their stools. Or slight supports of grass and reeds, by the side of the stream. Though they exhibit considerable cunning at other times, they are easily taken in a trap, which has only to be placed in their holes, 
or wherever they frequent, without any bait being used. Though it is sometimes rubbed with their musk. In the winter the hunter cuts holes in the ice, and shoots them when they come to the surface. Their burrows are usually in the high banks of the river, with the entrance under water, and rising within to above the level of high water. Sometimes their nests, composed of dried meadow grass and flags, may be discovered where the bank is low and spongy, by the yielding of the ground under the feet. They have from three to seven or eight young in the spring. Frequently, in the morning or evening, a long ripple is seen in the still water, where a muskrat is crossing the stream, with only its nose above the surface. And sometimes a green bough in its mouth to build its house with. When it finds itself observed, it will dive and swim five or six rods under water, and at length conceal itself in its hole, or the weeds. It will remain under water for ten minutes at a time, and on one occasion has been seen, when undisturbed, to form an air bubble under the ice, which contracted and expanded as it breathed at leisure. When it suspects danger on shore, it will stand erect like a squirrel, and survey its neighborhood for several minutes, without moving. In the fall, if a meadow intervene between their burrows and the stream, they erect cabins of mud and grass, three or four feet high, near its edge. These are not their breeding places, though young are sometimes found in them in late freshets, but rather their hunting lodges, to which they resort in the winter with their food, and for shelter. Their food consists chiefly of flags and freshwater mussels, the shells of the latter being left in large quantities around their lodges in the spring. The Penobscot Indian wears the entire skin of a muskrat, with the legs and tail dangling, and the head caught under his girdle, for a pouch, into which he puts his fishing tackle. And essences to scent his traps with. The bear, wolf, lynx, wildcat, deer, beaver, and marten, have disappeared, the otter is rarely if ever seen here at present, and the mink is less common than formerly. Perhaps of all our untamed quadrupeds, the fox has obtained the widest and most familiar reputation, from the time of Pilpe and Aesop to the present day. His recent tracks still give variety to a winter's walk. I tread in the steps of the fox that has gone before me by some hours, or which perhaps I have started, with such a tiptoe of expectation. As if I were on the trail of the spirit itself which resides in the wood, and expected soon to catch it in its lair. I am curious to know what has determined its graceful curvatures, and how surely they were coincident with the fluctuations of some mind. I know which way a mind wended, what horizon it faced, by the setting of these tracks, and whether it moved slowly or rapidly, by their greater or less intervals and distinctness. For the swiftest step leaves yet a lasting trace. Sometimes you will see the trails of many together, and where they have gambled and gone through a hundred evolutions, which testify to a singular listlessness and leisure in nature. When I see a fox run across the pond on the snow, with the carelessness of freedom, or at intervals trace his course in the sunshine along the ridge of a hill. I give up to him sun and earth as to their true proprietor. He does not go in the sun, but it seems to follow him, and there is a visible sympathy between him and it. Sometimes, when the snow lies light, and but five or six inches deep, you may give chase and come up with one on foot. In such a case he will show a remarkable presence of mind, choosing only the safest direction, though he may lose ground by it. Notwithstanding his fright, he will take no step which is not beautiful. His pace is a sort of leopard canter, as if he were in no wise impeded by the snow, but were husbanding his strength all the while. When the ground is uneven, the course is a series of graceful curves, conforming to the shape of the surface. He runs as though there were not a bone in his back. Occasionally dropping his muzzle to the ground for a rod or two, and then tossing his head aloft, when satisfied of his course. When he comes to a declivity, he will put his four feet together, and slide swiftly down it, shoving the snow before him. He treads so softly that you would hardly hear it from any nearness, and yet with such expression that it would not be quite inaudible at any distance. Of fishes, seventy-five genera and one hundred and seven species are described in the report. The fishermen will be startled to learn that there are but about a dozen kinds in the ponds and streams of any inland town, 
and almost nothing is known of their habits. Only their names and residence make one love fishes. I would know even the number of their fin rays, and how many scales compose the lateral line. I am the wiser in respect to all knowledges, and the better qualified for all fortunes, for knowing that there is a minnow in the brook. Methinks I have need even of his sympathy, and to be his fellow in a degree. I have experienced such simple delight in the trivial matters of fishing and sporting, formerly, as might have inspired the muse of Homer or Shakespeare. And now, when I turn the pages and ponder the plates of the angler's souvenir, I am fain to exclaim. Can these things be? And overcome us like a summer's cloud? Next to nature, it seems as if man's actions were the most natural, they so gently accord with her. The small seines of flax stretched across the shallow and transparent parts of our river, are no more intrusion than the cobweb in the sun. I stay my boat in mid-current, and look down in the sunny water to see the civil meshes of his nets, and wonder how the blustering people of the town could have done this elvish work. The twine looks like a new river weed, and is to the river as a beautiful memento of man's presence in nature, discovered as silently and delicately as a footprint in the sand. When the ice is covered with snow, I do not suspect the wealth under my feet, that there is as good as a mine under me wherever I go. How many pickerel are poised on easy fin fathoms below the loaded wain? The revolution of the seasons must be a curious phenomenon to them. At length the sun and wind brush aside their curtain, and they see the heavens again. Early in the spring, after the ice has melted, is the time for spearing fish. Suddenly the wind shifts from northeast and east to west and south, and every icicle, which has tinkled on the meadow grass so long, trickles down its stem. And seeks its level unerringly with a million comrades. The steam curls up from every roof and fence. I see the civil sun drying earth's tears. Her tears of joy, which only faster flow. In the brooks is heard the slight grating sound of small cakes of ice, floating with various speed, full of content and promise, and where the water gurgles under a natural bridge. You may hear these hasty rafts hold conversation in an undertone. Every rill is a channel for the juices of the meadow. In the ponds the ice cracks with a merry and inspiriting din, and down the larger streams is whirled grating hoarsely, and crashing its way along. Which was so lately a highway for the woodman's team and the fox, sometimes with the tracks of the skaters still fresh upon it, and the holes cut for pickerel. Town committees anxiously inspect the bridges and causeways, as if by mere eye force to intercede with the ice, and save the treasury. The river swelleth more and more. Like some sweet influence stealing o'er. The passive town. And for a while. Each tussock makes a tiny isle. Where, on some friendly Ararat. Resteth the weary water rat. No ripple shows musketiquid. Her very current e'en is hid. As deepest souls do calmest rest. When thoughts are swelling in the breast. And she that in the summer's drought. Doth make a rippling and a rout. Sleeps from Nabshoduck to the cliff. Unruffled by a single skiff. But by a thousand distant hills. The louder roar a thousand rills. And many a spring which now is dumb. And many a stream with smothered hum. Doth swifter well and faster glide. Though buried deep beneath the tide. Our village shows a rural Venice. Its broad lagoons where yonder fun is. As lovely as the bay of Naples. Yon placid cove amid the maples. And in my neighbor's field of corn. I recognize the golden horn. Here nature taught from year to year. When only red men came to hear. Methinks t'was in this school of art. Venice and Naples learned their part. But still their mistress, to my mind. Her young disciples leaves behind. The fisherman now repairs and launches his boat. The best time for spearing is at this season, before the weeds have begun to grow, and while the fishes lie in the shallow water, for in summer they prefer the cool depths. And in the autumn they are still more or less concealed by the grass. The first requisite is fuel for your crate, 
and for this purpose the roots of the pitch pine are commonly used, found under decayed stumps, where the trees have been felled eight or ten years. With a crate, or jack, made of iron hoops, to contain your fire, and attached to the bow of your boat about three feet from the water, a fish spear with seven tines, and fourteen feet long. A large basket, or barrow, to carry your fuel and bring back your fish, and a thick outer garment, you are equipped for a cruise. It should be a warm and still evening, and then with a fire crackling merrily at the prow, you may launch forth like a cuckullo into the night. The dullest soul cannot go upon such an expedition without some of the spirit of adventure. As if he had stolen the boat of Sharon and gone down the Styx on a midnight expedition into the realms of Pluto. And much speculation does this wandering star afford to the musing nightwalker, leading him on and on, jack-o'-lantern-like, over the meadows. Or, if he is wiser, he amuses himself with imagining what of human life, far in the silent night, is flitting moth-like round its candle. The silent navigator shoves his craft gently over the water, with a smothered pride and sense of benefaction, as if he were the phosphor, or light-bringer, to these dusky realms, or some sister moon. Blessing the spaces with her light. The waters, for a rod or two on either hand and several feet in depth, are lit up with more than noonday distinctness, and he enjoys the opportunity which so many have desired. For the roofs of a city are indeed raised, and he surveys the midnight economy of the fishes. There they lie in every variety of posture. Some on their backs, with their white bellies uppermost, some suspended in mid-water, some sculling gently along with a dreamy motion of the fins. And others quite active and wide awake, a scene not unlike what the human city would present. Occasionally he will encounter a turtle selecting the choicest morsels, or a muskrat resting on a tussock. He may exercise his dexterity, if he sees fit, on the more distant and active fish, or fork the nearer into his boat, as potatoes out of a pot, or even take the sound sleepers with his hands. But these last accomplishments he will soon learn to dispense with, distinguishing the real object of his pursuit, and find compensation in the beauty and never-ending novelty of his position. The pines growing down to the water's edge will show newly as in the glare of a conflagration. And as he floats under the willows with his light, the song sparrow will often wake on her perch, and sing that strain at midnight, which she had meditated for the morning. And when he has done, he may have to steer his way home through the dark by the north star, and he will feel himself some degrees nearer to it for having lost his way on the earth. The fishes commonly taken in this way are pickerel, suckers, perch, eels, pouts, breams, and shiners, from thirty to sixty weight in a night. Some are hard to be recognized in the unnatural light, especially the perch, which, his dark bands being exaggerated, acquires a ferocious aspect. The number of these transverse bands, which the report states to be seven, is, however, very variable, for in some of our ponds they have nine and ten even. It appears that we have eight kinds of tortoises, twelve snakes, but one of which is venomous, nine frogs and toads, nine salamanders, and one lizard, for our neighbors. I am particularly attracted by the motions of the serpent tribe. They make our hands and feet, the wings of the bird, and the fins of the fish seems very superfluous, as if nature had only indulged her fancy in making them. The black snake will dart into a bush when pursued, and circle round and round with an easy and graceful motion, amid the thin and bare twigs, five or six feet from the ground. As a bird flits from bough to bough, or hang in festoons between the forks. Elasticity and flexibleness in the simpler forms of animal life are equivalent to a complex system of limbs in the higher. And we have only to be as wise and wily as the serpent, to perform as difficult feats without the vulgar assistance of hands and feet. In May, the snapping turtle, Emisaurus serpentina, is frequently taken on the meadows and in the river. The fisherman, taking sight over the calm surface, discovers its snout projecting above the water, at the distance of many rods. And easily secures his prey through its unwillingness to disturb the water by swimming hastily away, for, gradually drawing its head under, it remains resting on some limb or clump of grass. Its eggs, which are buried at a distance from the water, in some soft place, 
as a pigeon bed, are frequently devoured by the skunk. It will catch fish by daylight, as a toad catches flies, and is said to emit a transparent fluid from its mouth to attract them. Nature has taken more care than the fondest parent for the education and refinement of her children. Consider the silent influence which flowers exert, no less upon the ditcher in the meadow than the lady in the bower. When I walk in the woods, I am reminded that a wise purveyor has been there before me, my most delicate experience is typified there. I am struck with the pleasing friendships and unanimities of nature, as when the lichen on the trees takes the form of their leaves. In the most stupendous scenes you will see delicate and fragile features, as slight wreaths of vapor, dewlines, feathery sprays, which suggest a high refinement, a noble blood and breeding. As it were. It is not hard to account for elves and fairies, they represent this light grace, this ethereal gentility. Bring a spray from the wood, or a crystal from the brook, and place it on your mantle, and your household ornaments will seem plebeian beside its nobler fashion and bearing. It will wave superior there, as if used to a more refined and polished circle. It has a salute and a response to all your enthusiasm and heroism. In the winter, I stop short in the path to admire how the trees grow up without forethought, regardless of the time and circumstances. They do not wait as man does, but now is the golden age of the sapling. Earth, air, sun, and rain, are occasion enough, they were no better in primeval centuries. The winter of their discontent never comes. Witness the buds of the native poplar standing gaily out to the frost on the sides of its bare switches. They express a naked confidence. With cheerful heart one could be a sojourner in the wilderness, if he were sure to find there the catkins of the willow or the alder. When I read of them in the accounts of northern adventurers, by Baffin's Bay or Mackenzie's River, I see how even there too I could dwell. They are our little vegetable redeemers. Methinks our virtue will hold out till they come again. They are worthy to have had a greater than Minerva or Ceres for their inventor. Who was the benignant goddess that bestowed them on mankind? Nature is mythical and mystical always, and works with the license and extravagance of genius. She has her luxurious and florid style as well as art. Having a pilgrim's cup to make, she gives to the whole, stem, bowl, handle, and nose, some fantastic shape, as if it were to be the car of some fabulous marine deity, a Nereus or Triton. In the winter, the botanist needs not confine himself to his books and herbarium, and give over his outdoor pursuits, but may study a new department of vegetable physiology what may be called crystalline botany, then. The winter of 1837 was unusually favorable for this. In December of that year, the genius of vegetation seemed to hover by night over its summer haunts with unusual persistency. Such a hoarfrost, as is very uncommon here or anywhere, and whose full effects can never be witnessed after sunrise, occurred several times. As I went forth early on a still and frosty morning, the trees looked like airy creatures of darkness caught napping. On this side huddled together with their gray hairs streaming in a secluded valley, which the sun had not penetrated. On that hurrying off in Indian file along some watercourse, while the shrubs and grasses, like elves and fairies of the night, sought to hide their diminished heads in the snow. The river, viewed from the high bank, appeared of a yellowish-green color, though all the landscape was white. Every tree, shrub, and spire of grass, that could raise its head above the snow, was covered with a dense ice foliage, answering, as it were, leaf for leaf to its summer dress. Even the fences had put forth leaves in the night. The center, diverging, and more minute fibers were perfectly distinct, and the edges regularly indented. These leaves were on the side of the twig or stubble opposite to the sun, meeting it for the most part at right angles and there were others standing out at all possible angles upon these and upon one another, with no twig or stubble supporting them. When the first rays of the sun slanted over the scene, the grasses seemed hung with innumerable jewels, which jingled merrily as they were brushed by the foot of the traveller, and reflected all the hues of the rainbow as he moved from side to side. It struck me that these ghost leaves, and the green ones whose forms they assume, were the creatures of but one law. 
that in obedience to the same law the vegetable juices swell gradually into the perfect leaf, on the one hand, and the crystalline particles troop to their standard in the same order, on the other. As if the material were indifferent, but the law one and invariable, and every plant in the spring but pushed up into and filled a permanent and eternal mold, which, summer and winter forever, is waiting to be filled. This foliate structure is common to the coral and the plumage of birds, and to how large a part of animate and inanimate nature. The same independence of law on matter is observable in many other instances, as in the natural rhymes, when some animal form, color, or odor, has its counterpart in some vegetable. As, indeed, all rhymes imply an eternal melody, independent of any particular sense. As confirmation of the fact, that vegetation is but a kind of crystallization, everyone may observe how, upon the edge of the melting frost on the window, the needle-shaped particles are bundled together so as to resemble fields waving with grain, or shocks rising here and there from the stubble. On one side the vegetation of the torrid zone, high-towering palms and widespread banyans, such as are seen in pictures of oriental scenery. On the other, arctic pines stiff frozen, with downcast branches. Vegetation has been made the type of all growth. But as in crystals the law is more obvious, their material being more simple, and for the most part more transient and fleeting, would it not be as philosophical as convenient to consider all growth? All filling up within the limits of nature, but a crystallization more or less rapid? On this occasion, in the side of the high bank of the river, wherever the water or other cause had formed a cavity, its throat and outer edge, like the entrance to a citadel, bristled with a glistening ice armor. In one place you might see minute ostrich feathers, which seemed the waving plumes of the warriors filing into the fortress, in another, the glancing, fan-shaped banners of the Lilliputian host. And in another, the needle-shaped particles collected into bundles, resembling the plumes of the pine, might pass for a phalanx of spears. From the underside of the ice in the brooks, where there was a thicker ice below, depended a mass of crystallization, four or five inches deep, in the form of prisms, with their lower ends open. Which, when the ice was laid on its smooth side, resembled the roofs and steeples of a Gothic city, or the vessels of a crowded haven under a press of canvas. The very mud in the road, where the ice had melted, was crystallized with deep rectilinear fissures. And the crystalline masses in the sides of the ruts resembled exactly asbestos in the disposition of their needles. Around the roots of the stubble and flower stalks, the frost was gathered into the form of irregular conical shells, or fairy rings. In some places the ice crystals were lying upon granite rocks, directly over crystals of quartz, the frostwork of a longer night, crystals of a longer period. But to some I unprejudiced by the short term of human life, melting as fast as the former. In the report on the invertebrate animals, this singular fact is recorded, which teaches us to put a new value on time and space. The distribution of the marine shells is well worthy of notice as a geological fact. Cape Cod, the right arm of the Commonwealth, reaches out into the ocean, some fifty or sixty miles. It is nowhere many miles wide, but this narrow point of land has hitherto proved a barrier to the migrations of many species of mollusca. Several genera and numerous species, which are separated by the intervention of only a few miles of land, are effectually prevented from mingling by the Cape. And do not pass from one side to the other. Of the 197 marine species, 83 do not pass to the south shore, and 50 are not found on the north shore of the Cape. That common mussel, the uniocomplanulus, or more properly fluviatilis, left in the spring by the muskrat upon rocks and stumps, appears to have been an important article of food with the Indians. In one place, where they are said to have feasted, they are found in large quantities, at an elevation of thirty feet above the river, filling the soil to the depth of a foot, and mingled with ashes and Indian remains. The works we have placed at the head of our chapter, with as much license, as the preacher selects his text, are such as imply more labor than enthusiasm. The state wanted complete catalogues of its natural riches, with such additional facts merely as would be directly useful. The reports on fishes, reptiles, insects, 
and invertebrate animals, however, indicate labor and research, and have a value independent of the object of the legislature. Those on herbaceous plants and birds cannot be of much value, as long as Bigelow and Nuttall are accessible. They serve but to indicate, with more or less exactness, what species are found in the state. We detect several errors ourselves, and a more practiced I would no doubt expand the list. The quadrupeds deserved a more final and instructive report than they have obtained. These volumes deal much in measurements and minute descriptions, not interesting to the general reader, with only here and there a colored sentence to allure him. Like those plants growing in dark forests, which bear only leaves without blossoms. But the ground was comparatively unbroken, and we will not complain of the pioneer, if he raises no flowers with his first crop. Let us not underrate the value of a fact. It will one day flower in a truth. It is astonishing how few facts of importance are added in a century to the natural history of any animal. The natural history of man himself is still being gradually written. Men are knowing enough after their fashion. Every countryman and dairymaid knows that the coats of the fourth stomach of the calf will curdle milk, and what particular mushroom is a safe and nutritious diet. You cannot go into any field or wood, but it will seem as if every stone had been turned, and the bark on every tree ripped up. But, after all, it is much easier to discover than to see when the cover is off. It has been well said that, the attitude of inspection is prone. Wisdom does not inspect, but behold. We must look a long time before we can see. Slow are the beginnings of philosophy. He has something demoniacal in him, who can discern a law or couple two facts. We can imagine a time when, water runs downhill, may have been taught in the schools. The true man of science will know nature better by his finer organization. He will smell, taste, see, hear, feel, better than other men. His will be a deeper and finer experience. We do not learn by inference and deduction, and the application of mathematics to philosophy, but by direct intercourse and sympathy. It is with science as with ethics, we cannot know truth by contrivance and method. The Baconian is as false as any other, and with all the helps of machinery and the arts, the most scientific will still be the healthiest and friendliest man. And possess a more perfect Indian wisdom. Dark Ages First published in the Dial, Volume 3, Number 4, April 1843 We should read history as little critically as we consider the landscape, and be more interested by the atmospheric tints, and various lights and shades which the intervening spaces create, than by its groundwork and composition. It is the morning now turned evening and seen in the west, the same sun, but a new light and atmosphere. Its beauty is like the sunset. Not a fresco painting on a wall, flat and bounded, but atmospheric and roving or free. In reality history fluctuates as the face of the landscape from morning to evening. What is of moment is its hue and color. Time hides no treasures, we want not its then but its now. We do not complain that the mountains in the horizon are blue and indistinct. They are the more like the heavens. Of what moment are facts that can be lost, which need to be commemorated? The monument of death will outlast the memory of the dead. The pyramids do not tell the tale that was confided to them, the living fact commemorates itself. Why look in the dark for light? Strictly speaking, the historical societies have not recovered one fact from oblivion, but are themselves instead of the fact that is lost. The researcher is more memorable than the researched. The crowd stood admiring the mist, and the dim outlines of the trees seen through it, when one of their number advanced to explore the phenomenon, and with fresh admiration. All eyes were turned on his dimly retreating figure. It is astonishing with how little cooperation of the societies, the past is remembered. Its story has indeed had a different muse than has been assigned it. There is a good instance of the manner in which all history began, in al wakidis Arabian Chronicle. I was informed by Ahmed Almaton al Jarami, who had it from Rifa ibn Qais al Amiri, who had it from Saif ibn Fabala al Kakwarmi, who had it from the Bet ibn Alkama. 
who said he was present at the action. These fathers of history were not anxious to preserve, but to learn the fact, and hence it was not forgotten. Critical acumen is exerted in vain to uncover the past, the past cannot be presented. We cannot know what we are not. But one veil hangs over past, present, and future, and it is the province of the historian to find out not what was, but what is. Where a battle has been fought, you will find nothing but the bones of men and beasts, where a battle is being fought there are hearts beating. We will sit on a mound and muse, and not try to make these skeletons stand on their legs again. Does nature remember, think you, that they were men, or not rather that they are bones? Ancient history has an air of antiquity, it should be more modern. It is written as if the spectator should be thinking of the backside of the picture on the wall, or as if the author expected the dead would be his readers. And wished to detail to them their own experience. Men seem anxious to accomplish an orderly retreat through the centuries, earnestly rebuilding the works behind, as they are battered down by the encroachments of time. But while they loiter, they and their works both fall a prey to the arch enemy. It has neither the venerableness of antiquity, nor the freshness of the modern. It does as if it would go to the beginning of things, which natural history might with reason assume to do. But consider the universal history, and then tell us, when did burdock and plantain sprout first? It has been so written for the most part, that the times it describes are with remarkable propriety called dark ages. They are dark, as one has observed, because we are so in the dark about them. The sun rarely shines in history, what with the dust and confusion, and when we meet with any cheering fact which implies the presence of this luminary, we excerpt and modernize it. As when we read in the history of the Saxons, that Edwin of Northumbria caused stakes to be fixed in the highways where he had seen a clear spring, and brazen dishes were chained to them. To refresh the weary sojourner, whose fatigues Edwin had himself experienced. This is worth all Arthur's twelve battles. But it is fit the past should be dark, though the darkness is not so much a quality of the past, as of tradition. It is not a distance of time but a distance of relation, which makes thus dusky its memorials. What is near to the heart of this generation is fair and bright still. Greece lies outspread fair and sunshiny in floods of light, for there is the sun and daylight in her literature and art, Homer does not allow us to forget that the sun shone, nor Phidias. Nor the Parthenon. Yet no era has been wholly dark, nor will we too hastily submit to the historian, and congratulate ourselves on a blaze of light. If we could pierce the obscurity of those remote years we should find it light enough, only there is not our day, some creatures are made to see in the dark. There has always been the same amount of light in the world. The new and missing stars, the comets and eclipses do not affect the general illumination, for only our glasses appreciate them. The eyes of the oldest fossil remains, they tell us, indicate that the same laws of light prevailed then as now. Always the laws of light are the same, but the modes and degrees of seeing vary. The gods are partial to no era but steadily shines their light in the heavens, while the eye of the beholder is turned to stone. There was but the eye and the sun from the first. The ages have not added a new ray to the one, nor altered a fibre of the other. A Winter Walk First published in the Dial, Volume 4, Number 2, October 1843. The wind has gently murmured through the blinds, or puffed with feathery softness against the windows, and occasionally sighed like a summer zephyr lifting the leaves along, the live-long night. The meadow mouse has slept in his snug gallery in the sod, the owl has sat in a hollow tree in the depth of the swamp, the rabbit, the squirrel, and the fox have all been housed. The watchdog has lain quiet on the hearth, and the cattle have stood silent in their stalls. The earth itself has slept, as it were its first, not its last sleep, save when some street sign or woodhouse door has faintly creaked upon its hinge. Cheering forlorn nature at her midnight work, the only sound awake twixt Venus and Mars, advertising us of a remote inward warmth, a divine cheer and fellowship, where gods are met together. But where it is very bleak for men to stand. But while the earth has slumbered, all the air has been alive with feathery flakes descending, 
as if some northern series reigned, showering her silvery grain over all the fields. We sleep, and at length awake to the still reality of a winter morning. The snow lies warm as cotton or down upon the windowsill. The broadened sash and frosted panes admit a dim and private light, which enhances the snug cheer within. The stillness of the morning is impressive. The floor creaks under our feet as we move toward the window to look abroad through some clear space over the fields. We see the roof stand under their snow burden. From the eaves and fences hang stalactites of snow, and in the yard stand stalagmites covering some concealed core. The trees and shrubs rear white arms to the sky on every side. And where were walls and fences, we see fantastic forms stretching in frolic gambols across the dusky landscape. As if nature had strewn her fresh designs over the fields by night as models for man's art. Silently we unlatch the door, letting the drift fall in and step abroad to face the cutting air. Already the stars have lost some of their sparkle, and a dull, leaden mist skirts the horizon. A lurid brazen light in the east proclaims the approach of day, while the western landscape is dim and spectral still, and clothed in a somber Tartarian light, like the shadowy realms. They are infernal sounds only that you hear, the crowing of cocks, the barking of dogs, the chopping of wood, the lowing of kine, all seem to come from Pluto's barnyard and beyond the sticks. Not for any melancholy they suggest, but their twilight bustle is too solemn and mysterious for earth. The recent tracks of the fox or otter, in the yard, remind us that each hour of the night is crowded with events, and the primeval nature is still working and making tracks in the snow. Opening the gate, we tread briskly along the lone country road, crunching the dry and crisp snow under our feet, or aroused by the sharp clear creak of the wood sled. Just starting for the distant market, from the early farmer's door, where it has lain the summer long, dreaming amid the chips and stubble. While far through the drifts and powdered windows we see the farmer's early candle, like a paled star, emitting a lonely beam, as if some severe virtue were at its maddens there. And one by one the smokes begin to ascend from the chimneys amidst the trees and snows. The sluggish smoke curls up from some deep dell. The stiffened air exploring in the dawn. And making slow acquaintance with the day. Delaying now upon its heavenward course. In wreathed loiterings dallying with itself. With as uncertain purpose and slow deed. As its half-wakened master by the hearth. Whose mind still slumbering and sluggish thoughts. Have not yet swept into the onward current of the new day. And now it streams afar. The while the chopper goes with step direct. And mind intent to swing the early axe. First in the dusky dawn he sends abroad. His early scout, his emissary, smoke. The earliest, latest pilgrim from the roof. To feel the frosty air, inform the day. And while he crouches still beside the hearth nor musters courage to unbar the door. It has gone down the glen with the light wind. And o'er the plain unfurled its venturous wreath. Draped the treetops, loitered upon the hill. And warmed the pinions of the early bird. And now, perchance, high in the crispy air. Has caught sight of the day o'er the earth's edge. And greets its master's eye at his low door. As some refulgent cloud in the upper sky. We hear the sound of wood chopping at the farmer's doors, far over the frozen earth, the baying of the house dog, and the distant clarion of the cock. Though the thin and frosty air conveys only the finer particles of sound to our ears, with short and sweet vibrations, as the waves subside soonest on the purest and lightest liquids, in which gross substances sink to the bottom. They come clear and bell like, and from a greater distance in the horizon as if there were fewer impediments than in summer to make them faint and ragged. The ground is sonorous, like seasoned wood, and even the ordinary rural sounds are melodious, and the jingling of the ice on the trees is sweet and liquid. There is the least possible moisture in the atmosphere, all being dried up, or congealed, and it is of such extreme tenuity and elasticity, that it becomes a source of delight. The withdrawn and tense sky seems groined like the aisles of a cathedral, 
and the polished air sparkles as if there were crystals of ice floating in it. As they who have resided in Greenland tell us, that, when it freezes, the sea smokes like burning turf land, and a fog or mist arises, called frost smoke. Which, cutting smoke frequently raises blisters on the face and hands, and is very pernicious to the health. But this pure stinging cold is an elixir to the lungs, and not so much a frozen mist, as a crystallized midsummer haze, refined and purified by cold. The sun at length rises through the distant woods, as if with the faint clashing swinging sound of cymbals, melting the air with his beams, and with such rapid steps the morning travels. That already his rays are gilding the distant western mountains. We step hastily along through the powdery snow, warmed by an inward heat, enjoying an Indian summer still, in the increased glow of thought and feeling. Probably if our lives were more conformed to nature, we should not need to defend ourselves against her heats and colds, but find her our constant nurse and friend, as do plants and quadrupeds. If our bodies were fed with pure and simple elements, and not with a stimulating and heating diet, they would afford no more pasture for cold than a leafless twig, but thrive like the trees. Which find even winter genial to their expansion. The wonderful purity of nature at this season is a most pleasing fact. Every decayed stump and moss-grown stone and rail, and the dead leaves of autumn, are concealed by a clean napkin of snow. In the bare fields and tinkling woods, see what virtue survives. In the coldest and bleakest places, the warmest charities still maintain a foothold. A cold and searching wind drives away all contagion, and nothing can withstand it but what has a virtue in it. And accordingly, whatever we meet with in cold and bleak places, as the tops of mountains, we respect for a sort of sturdy innocence, a Puritan toughness. All things besides seem to be called in for shelter, and what stays out must be part of the original frame of the universe, and of such valor as God himself. It is invigorating to breathe the cleansed air. Its greater fineness and purity are visible to the eye, and we would fain stay out long and late, that the gales may sigh through us, too, as through the leafless trees. And fit us for the winter, as if we hoped so to borrow some pure and steadfast virtue, which will stead us in all seasons. At length we have reached the edge of the woods, and shut out the gaddying town. We enter within their covert as we go under the roof of a cottage, and cross its threshold, all sealed and banked up with snow. They are glad and warm still, and as genial and cheery in winter as in summer. As we stand in the midst of the pines, in the flickering and checkered light which straggles but little way into their maze, we wonder if the towns have ever heard their simple story. It seems to us that no traveller has ever explored them, and notwithstanding the wonders which science is elsewhere revealing every day, who would not like to hear their annals? Our humble villages in the plain are their contribution. We borrow from the forest the boards which shelter, and the sticks which warm us. How important is their evergreen to the winter, that portion of the summer which does not face, the permanent year, the unwithered grass. Thus simply, and with little expense of altitude, is the surface of the earth diversified. What would human life be without forests, those natural cities? From the tops of mountains they appear like smooth-shaven lanes, yet whither shall we walk but in this taller grass? There is a slumbering subterranean fire in nature which never goes out, and which no cold can chill. It finally melts the great snow, and in January or July is only buried under a thicker or thinner covering. In the coldest day it flows somewhere, and the snow melts around every tree. This field of winter rye, which sprouted late in the fall, and now speedily dissolves the snow, is where the fire is very thinly covered. We feel warmed by it. In the winter, warmth stands for all virtue, and we resort in thought to a trickling rill, with its bare stones shining in the sun, and to warm springs in the woods. With as much eagerness as rabbits and robins. The steam which rises from swamps and pools, is as dear and domestic as that of our own kettle. What fire could ever equal the sunshine of a winter's day, when the meadow mice come out by the wall sides, and the chickadee lisps in the defile of the wood? The warmth comes directly from the sun, and is not radiated from the earth, as in summer. 
and when we feel his beams on our backs as we are treading some snowy dell, we are grateful as for a special kindness, and bless the sun which has followed us into that by-place. This subterranean fire has its altar in each man's breast, for in the coldest day, and on the bleakest hill. The traveller cherishes a warmer fire within the folds of his cloak than is kindled on any hearth. A healthy man, indeed, is the complement of the seasons, and in winter, summer is in his heart. There is the south. Thither have all birds and insects migrated, and around the warm springs in his breast are gathered the robin and the lark. In this glade covered with bushes of a year's growth, see how the silvery dust lies on every seared leaf and twig. Deposited in such infinite and luxurious forms as by their very variety atone for the absence of color. Observe the tiny tracks of mice around every stem, and the triangular tracks of the rabbit. A pure elastic heaven hangs over all, as if the impurities of the summer sky, refined and shrunk by the chaste winter's cold, had been winnowed from the heavens upon the earth. Nature confounds her summer distinctions at this season. The heavens seem to be nearer the earth. The elements are less reserved and distinct. Water turns to ice, rain to snow. The day is but a Scandinavian night. The winter is an Arctic summer. How much more living is the life that is in nature, the furred life which still survives the stinging nights, and, from amidst fields and woods covered with frost and snow, sees the sun rise. The foodless wilds pour forth their brown inhabitants. The gray squirrel and rabbit are brisk and playful in the remote glens, even on the morning of the cold Friday. Here is our Lapland and Labrador, and for our Eskimo and Nistinox, dog-ribbed Indians, Navazemblates, and Spitzbergeners, are there not the ice-cutter and wood-chopper, the fox, muskrat, and mink? Still, in the midst of the Arctic day, we may trace the summer to its retreats, and sympathize with some contemporary life. Stretched over the brooks, in the midst of the frost-bound meadows, we may observe the submarine cottages of the caddis-worms, the larvae of the plissipens. Their small cylindrical cases built around themselves, composed of flags, sticks, grass, and withered leaves, shells, and pebbles. In form and color like the wrecks which strew the bottom, now drifting along over the pebbly bottom, now whirling in tiny eddies and dashing down steep falls or sweeping rapidly along with the current, or else swaying to and fro at the end of some grass blade or root. Anon they will leave their sunken habitations, and, crawling up the stems of plants, or to the surface, like gnats, as perfect insects henceforth, flutter over the surface of the water. Or sacrifice their short lives in the flame of our candles at evening. Down yonder little glen the shrubs are drooping under their burden, and the red alderberries contrast with the white ground. Here are the marks of a myriad feet which have already been abroad. The sun rises as proudly over such a glen, as over the valley of the Seine or the Tiber, and it seems the residence of a pure and self-subsistent valor, such as they never witnessed. Which never knew defeat nor fear. Here reign the simplicity and purity of a primitive age, and a health and hope far remote from towns and cities. Standing quite alone, far in the forest, while the wind is shaking down snow from the trees, and leaving the only human tracks behind us. We find our reflections of a richer variety than the life of cities. The chickadee and nuthatch are more inspiring society than statesmen and philosophers, and we shall return to these last, as to more vulgar companions. In this lonely glen, with its brook draining the slopes, its creased ice and crystals of all hues, where the spruces and hemlocks stand up on either side. And the rush and sear wild oats in the rivulet itself, our lives are more serene and worthy to contemplate. As the day advances, the heat of the sun is reflected by the hillsides, and we hear a faint but sweet music, where flows the rill released from its fetters, and the icicles are melting on the trees. And the nuthatch and partridge are heard and seen. The south wind melts the snow at noon, and the bare ground appears with its withered grass and leaves, and we are invigorated by the perfume which exhales from it, as by the scent of strong meats. Let us go into this deserted woodman's hut, and see how he has passed the long winter nights and the short and stormy days. 
For here man has lived under this south hillside, and it seems a civilized and public spot. We have such associations as when the traveller stands by the ruins of Palmyra or Hecatompolis. Singing birds and flowers perchance have begun to appear here, for flowers as well as weeds follow in the footsteps of man. These hemlocks whispered over his head, these hickory logs were his fuel, and these pitch-pine roots kindled his fire. Yonder fuming rill in the hollow, whose thin and airy vapour still ascends as busily as ever, though he is far off now, was his well. These hemlock boughs, and the straw upon this raised platform, were his bed, and this broken dish held his drink. But he has not been here this season, for the Phoebes built their nest upon this shelf last summer. I find some embers left, as if he had but just gone out, where he baked his pot of beans. And while at evening he smoked his pipe, whose stemless bowl lies in the ashes, chatted with his only companion, if perchance he had any, about the depth of the snow on the morrow. Already falling fast and thick without, or disputed whether the last sound was the screech of an owl, or the creak of a bough, or imagination only. And through this broad chimney throat, in the late winter evening, ere he stretched himself upon the straw, he looked up to learn the progress of the storm, and, seeing the bright stars of Cassiopeia's chair shining brightly down upon him, fell contentedly asleep. See how many traces from which we may learn the chopper's history. From this stump we may guess the sharpness of his axe, and, from the slope of the stroke, on which side he stood, and whether he cut down the tree without going round it or changing hands. And, from the flexure of the splinters, we may know which way it fell. This one chip contains inscribed on it the whole history of the woodchopper and of the world. On this scrap of paper, which held his sugar or salt, perchance, or was the wadding of his gun, sitting on a log in the forest, with what interest we read the tattle of cities, of those larger huts. Empty and to let, like this, in high streets and broadways. The eaves are dripping on the south side of this simple roof, while the titmouse lisps in the pine, and the genial warmth of the sun around the door is somewhat kind and human. After two seasons, this rude dwelling does not deform the scene. Already the birds resort to it, to build their nests, and you may track to its door the feet of many quadrupeds. Thus, for a long time, nature overlooks the encroachment and profanity of man. The wood still cheerfully and unsuspiciously echoes the strokes of the axe that fells it, and while they are few and seldom, they enhance its wildness. And all the elements strive to naturalize the sound. Now our path begins to ascend gradually to the top of this high hill, from whose precipitous south side we can look over the broad country, of forest and field and river. To the distant snowy mountains. See yonder thin column of smoke curling up through the woods from some invisible farmhouse, the standard raised over some rural homestead. There must be a warmer and more genial spot there below, as where we detect the vapor from a spring forming a cloud above the trees. What fine relations are established between the traveler who discovers this airy column from some eminence in the forest, and him who sits below. Up goes the smoke as silently and naturally as the vapor exhales from the leaves, and as busy disposing itself in wreaths as the housewife on the hearth below. It is a hieroglyphic of man's life, and suggests more intimate and important things than the boiling of a pot. Where its fine column rises above the forest, like an ensign, some human life has planted itself, and such is the beginning of Rome, the establishment of the arts, and the foundation of empires. Whether on the prairies of America, or the steppes of Asia. And now we descend again to the brink of this woodland lake, which lies in a hollow of the hills, as if it were their expressed juice, and that of the leaves, which are annually steeped in it. Without outlet or inlet to the eye, it has still its history, in the lapse of its waves, in the rounded pebbles on its shore, and in the pines which grow down to its brink. It has not been idle, though sedentary, but, like Abu Musa, teaches that, sitting still at home is the heavenly way, the going out is the way of the world. Yet in its evaporation it travels as far as any. In summer it is the earth's liquid eye, a mirror in the breast of nature. The sins of the wood are washed out in it. See how the woods form an amphitheater about it, and it is an arena for all the genialness of nature. 
All trees direct the traveler to its brink, all paths seek it out, birds fly to it, quadrupeds flee to it, and the very ground inclines toward it. It is nature's saloon, where she has sat down to her toilet. Consider her silent economy and tidiness. How the sun comes with his evaporation to sweep the dust from its surface each morning, and a fresh surface is constantly welling up. And annually, after whatever impurities have accumulated herein, its liquid transparency appears again in the spring. In summer a hushed music seems to sweep across its surface. But now a plain sheet of snow conceals it from our eyes, except where the wind has swept the ice bare, and the sere leaves are gliding from side to side, tacking and veering on their tiny voyages. Here is one just keeled up against a pebble on shove, a dry beech leaf, rocking still, as if it would start again. A skillful engineer, methinks, might project its course since it fell from the parent stem. Here are all the elements for such a calculation. Its present position, the direction of the wind, the level of the pond, and how much more is given. In its scarred edges and veins is its log rolled up. We fancy ourselves in the interior of a larger house. The surface of the pond is our deal table or sanded floor, and the woods rise abruptly from its edge, like the walls of a cottage. The line set to catch pickerel through the ice look like a larger culinary preparation, and the men stand about on the white ground like pieces of forest furniture. The actions of these men, at the distance of half a mile over the ice and snow, impress us as when we read the exploits of Alexander in history. They seem not unworthy of the scenery, and as momentous as the conquest of kingdoms. Again we have wandered through the arches of the wood, until from its skirts we hear the distant booming of ice from yonder bay of the river. As if it were moved by some other and subtler tide than oceans know. To me it has a strange sound of home, thrilling as the voice of one's distant and noble kindred. A mild summer sun shines over forest and lake, and though there is but one green leaf for many rods, yet nature enjoys a serene health. Every sound is fraught with the same mysterious assurance of health, as well now the creaking of the boughs in January, as the soft suff of the wind in July. When winter fringes every bough. With his fantastic wreath. And puts the seal of silence now. Upon the leaves beneath. When every stream in its penthouse. Goes gurgling on its way. And in his gallery the mouse. Nibbleth the meadow hay. Methinks the summer still is nigh. And lurketh underneath. As that same meadow mouse doth lie. Snug in that last year's heath. And if perchance the chickadee. Lisp a faint note anon. The snow is summer's canopy. Which she herself put on. Fair blossoms deck the cheerful trees. And dazzling fruits depend. The north wind sighs a summer breeze. The nipping frosts defend. Bringing glad tidings unto me. The while I stand all ear. Of a serene eternity. Which need not winter fear. Out on the silent pond straightway. The restless ice doth crack. And pond sprites merry gambols play. Amid the deafening rack. Eager I hasten to the vale. As if I heard brave news. How nature held high festival. Which it were hard to lose. I gamble with my neighbor ice. And sympathizing quake. As each new crack darts in a trice. Across the gladsome lake. One with the cricket in the ground. And faggot on the hearth. Resounds the rare domestic sound. Along the forest path. Before night we will take a journey on skates along the course of this meandering river, as full of novelty to one who sits by the cottage fire all the winter's day. As if it were over the polar ice, with Captain Perry or Franklin. Following the winding of the stream, now flowing amid hills, now spreading out into fair meadows, and forming a myriad coves and bays where the pine and hemlock overarch. The river flows in the rear of the towns, and we see all things from a new and wilder side. The fields and gardens come down to it with a frankness, and freedom from pretension, which they do not wear on the highway. It is the outside and edge of the earth. 
Our eyes are not offended by violent contrasts. The last rail of the farmer's fence is some swaying willow bough, which still preserves its freshness, and here at length all fences stop, and we no longer cross any road. We may go far up within the country now by the most retired and level road, never climbing a hill, but by broad levels ascending to the upland meadows. It is a beautiful illustration of the law of obedience, the flow of a river, the path for a sick man, a highway down which an acorn cup may float secure with its freight. Its slight occasional falls, whose precipices would not diversify the landscape, are celebrated by mist and spray, and attract the traveler from far and near. From the remote interior, its current conducts him by broad and easy steps, or by one gentle inclined plane, to the sea. Thus by an early and constant yielding to the inequalities of the ground, it secures itself the easiest passage. No domain of nature is quite closed to man at all times, and now we draw near to the empire of the fishes. Our feet glide swiftly over unfathomed depths, where in summer our line tempted the pout and perch, and where the stately pickerel lurked in the long corridors formed by the bulrushes. The deep, impenetrable marsh, where the heron waited, and bittern squatted, is made pervious to our swift shoes, as if a thousand railroads had been made into it. With one impulse we are carried to the cabin of the muskrat, that earliest settler, and see him dart away under the transparent ice, like a furred fish, to his hole in the bank. And we glide rapidly over meadows where lately the mower wet his scythe, through beds of frozen cranberries mixed with meadow grass. We skate near to where the blackbird, the peewee, and the kingbird hung their nests over the water, and the hornets builded from the maple in the swamp. How many gay warblers following the sun, have radiated from this nest of silver birch and thistledown. On the swamp's outer edge was hung the supermarine village, where no foot penetrated. In this hollow tree the wood duck reared her brood, and slid away each day to forage in yonder fun. In winter, nature is a cabinet of curiosities, full of dried specimens, in their natural order and position. The meadows and forests are a hortus siccus. The leaves and grasses stand perfectly pressed by the air without screw or gum, and the birds' nests are not hung on an artificial twig, but where they builded them. We go about Drishad to inspect the summer's work in the rank swamp, and see what a growth have got the alders, the willows, and the maples. Testifying to how many warm suns, and fertilizing dews and showers. See what strides their boughs took in the luxuriant summer, and anon these dormant buds will carry them onward and upward another span into the heavens. Occasionally we wade through fields of snow, under whose depths the river is lost for many rods, to appear again to the right or left, where we least expected. Still holding on its way underneath, with a faint, stertorous, rumbling sound, as if, like the bear and marmot, it too had hibernated. And we had followed its faint summer trail to where it earthed itself in snow and ice. At first we should have thought that rivers would be empty and dry in midwinter, or else frozen solid till the spring thawed them. But their volume is not diminished even, for only a superficial cold bridges their surface. The thousand springs which feed the lakes and streams are flowing still. The issues of a few surface springs only are closed, and they go to swell the deep reservoirs. Nature's wells are below the frost. The summer brooks are not filled with snow water, nor does the mower quench his thirst with that alone. The streams are swollen when the snow melts in the spring, because nature's work has been delayed, the water being turned into ice and snow, whose particles are less smooth and round. And do not find their level so soon. Far over the ice, between the hemlock woods and snow-clad hills, stands the pickerel fisher, his lines set in some retired cove, like a Finlander. With his arms thrust into the pouches of his dreadnought. With dull, snowy, fishy thoughts, himself a finless fish, separated a few inches from his race, dumb, erect, and made to be enveloped in clouds and snows, like the pines on shore. In these wild scenes, men stand about in the scenery, or move deliberately and heavily, having sacrificed the sprightliness and vivacity of towns to the dumb sobriety of nature. He does not make the scenery less wild, more than the jays and muskrats, but stands there as a part of it, 
as the natives are represented in the voyages of early navigators, at Nuka Sound. And on the northwest coast, with their furs about them, before they were tempted to loquacity by a scrap of iron. He belongs to the natural family of man, and is planted deeper in nature and has more root than the inhabitants of towns. Go to him, ask what luck, and you will learn that he too is a worshipper of the unseen. Here with what sincere deference and waving gesture in his tone, he speaks of the lake pickerel, which he has never seen, his primitive and ideal race of pickerel. He is connected with the shore still, as by a fish line, and yet remembers the season when he took fish through the ice on the pond, while the peas were up in his garden at home. But now, while we have loitered, the clouds have gathered again, and a few straggling snowflakes are beginning to descend. Faster and faster they fall, shutting out the distant objects from sight. The snow falls on every wood and field, and no crevice is forgotten, by the river and the pond, on the hill and in the valley. Quadrupeds are confined to their coverts, and the birds sit upon their perches this peaceful hour. There is not so much sound as in fair weather, but silently and gradually every slope, and the grey walls and fences, and the polished ice, and the sere leaves, which were not buried before, are concealed, and the tracks of men and beasts are lost. With so little effort does nature reassert her rule and blot out the traces of men. Hear how Homer has described the same. The snowflakes fall thick and fast on a winter's day. The winds are lulled, and the snow falls incessant, covering the tops of the mountains, and the hills, and the plains where the lotus tree grows, and the cultivated fields. And they are falling by the inlets and shores of the foaming sea, but are silently dissolved by the waves. The snow levels all things, and enfolds them deeper in the bosom of nature, as, in the slow summer, vegetation creeps up to the entablature of the temple, and the turrets of the castle. And helps her to prevail over art. The surly night wind rustles through the wood, and warns us to retrace our steps, while the sun goes down behind the thickening storm, and birds seek their roosts, and cattle their stalls. Drooping the lab rare ox. Stands covered o'er with snow, and now demands. The fruit of all his toil. Though winter is represented in the almanac as an old man, facing the wind and sleet, and drawing his cloak about him, we rather think of him as a merry woodchopper, and warm-blooded youth. As blithe as summer. The unexplored grandeur of the storm keeps up the spirits of the traveller. It does not trifle with us, but has a sweet earnestness. In winter we lead a more inward life. Our hearts are warm and cheery, like cottages under drifts, whose windows and doors are half concealed, but from whose chimneys the smoke cheerfully ascends. The imprisoning drifts increase the sense of comfort which the house affords, and in the coldest days we are content to sit over the hearth and see the sky through the chimney top. Enjoying the quiet and serene life that may be had in a warm corner by the chimney side, or feeling our pulse by listening to the low of cattle in the street. Or the sound of the flail in distant barns all the long afternoon. No doubt a skillful physician could determine our health by observing how these simple and natural sounds affected us. We enjoy now, not an oriental, but a boreal leisure, around warm stoves and fireplaces, and watch the shadow of motes in the sunbeams. Sometimes our fate grows too homely and familiarly serious ever to be cruel. Consider how for three months the human destiny is wrapped in furs. The good Hebrew revelation takes no cognizance of all this cheerful snow. Is there no religion for the temperate and frigid zones? We know of no scripture which records the pure benignity of the gods on a New England winter night. Their praises have never been sung, only their wrath deprecated. The best scripture, after all, records but a meager faith. Its saints live reserved and austere. Let a brave devout man spend the year in the woods of Maine or Labrador, and see if the Hebrew scriptures speak adequately to his condition and experience. From the setting in of winter to the breaking up of the ice. Now commences the long winter evening around the farmer's hearth, when the thoughts of the indwellers travel far abroad, and men are by nature and necessity charitable and liberal to all creatures. Now is the happy resistance to cold, when the farmer reaps his reward, 
and thinks of his preparedness for winter, and, through the glittering panes, sees with equanimity the mansion of the northern bear, for now the storm is over. The full ethereal round. Infinite worlds disclosing to the view. Shines out intensely keen. And all one cope. Of starry glitter glows from pole to pole. H.D.T. The Landlord. First published in Democratic Review Vol. 13, October 1843. Under the one word, house, are included the schoolhouse, the almshouse, the jail, the tavern, the dwelling house. And the meanest shed or cave in which men live contains the elements of all these. But nowhere on the earth stands the entire and perfect house. The Parthenon, St. Peter's, the Gothic Minster, the Palace, the Hovel, are but imperfect executions of an imperfect idea. Who would dwell in them? Perhaps to the eye of the gods, the cottage is more holy than the Parthenon, for they look down with no especial favor upon the shrines formally dedicated to them. And that should be the most sacred roof which shelters most of humanity. Surely, then, the gods who are most interested in the human race preside over the tavern, where especially men congregate. Methinks I see the thousand shrines erected to hospitality shining afar in all countries, as well Mohammedan and Jewish, as Christian, Khans, and caravansaries, and inns whither all pilgrims without distinction resort. Likewise we look in vain, east or west over the earth, to find the perfect man, but each represents only some particular excellence. The landlord is a man of more open and general sympathies, who possesses a spirit of hospitality which is its own reward, and feeds and shelters men from pure love of the creatures. To be sure, this profession is as often filled by imperfect characters, and such as have sought it from unworthy motives, as any other. But so much the more should we prize the true and honest landlord when we meet with him. Who has not imagined to himself a country inn, where the traveller shall really feel in, and at home, and at his public house, who was before at his private house. Whose host is indeed a host, and a lord of the land, a self-appointed brother of his race. Called to his place, beside, by all the winds of heaven in his good genius, as truly as the preacher is called to preach. A man of such universal sympathies, and so broad and genial a human nature, that he would fain sacrifice the tender but narrow ties of private friendship, to a broad, sunshiny, fair weather and foul friendship for his race. Who loves men, not as a philosopher, with philanthropy, nor as an overseer of the poor, with charity, but by a necessity of his nature, as he loves dogs and horses. And standing at his open door from morning till night, would fain see more and more of them come along the highway, and is never satiated. To him the sun and moon are but travellers, the one by day and the other by night, and they too patronize his house. To his imagination all things travel save his signpost and himself. And though you may be his neighbour for years, he will show you only the civilities of the road. But on the other hand, while nations and individuals are alike selfish and exclusive, he loves all men equally. And if he treats his nearest neighbor as a stranger, since he has invited all nations to share his hospitality, the farthest traveled is in some measure kindred to him who takes him into the bosom of his family. He keeps a house of entertainment at the sign of the black horse or the spread eagle, and is known far and wide, and his fame travels with increasing radius every year. All the neighborhood is in his interest, and if the traveller asks how far to a tavern, he receives some such answer as this, Well, sir, there's a house about three miles from here. Where they haven't taken down their sign yet. But it's only ten miles to Slocum's, and that's a capital house, both for man and beast. At three miles he passes a cheerless barrack, standing desolate behind its signpost, neither public nor private, and has glimpses of a discontented couple who have mistaken their calling. At ten miles see where the tavern stands, really an entertaining prospect, so public and inviting that only the rain and snow do not enter. It is no gay pavilion, made of bright stuffs, and furnished with nuts and gingerbread, but as plain and sincere as a caravansary. Located in no tarry town, where you receive only the civilities of commerce, 
but far in the fields it exercises a primitive hospitality, amid the fresh scent of new hay and raspberries. If it be summer time, and the tinkling of cowbells from invisible pastures. For it is a land flowing with milk and honey, and the newest milk courses in a broad, deep stream across the premises. In these retired places the tavern is first of all a house, elsewhere, last of all, or never, and warms and shelters its inhabitants. It is as simple and sincere in its essentials as the caves in which the first men dwelt, but it is also as open and public. The traveller steps across the threshold, and lo! He too is master, for he only can be called proprietor of the house here who behaves with most propriety in it. The landlord stands clear back in nature, to my imagination, with his axe and spade felling trees and raising potatoes with the vigour of a pioneer. With Promethean energy making nature yield her increase to supply the wants of so many. And he is not so exhausted, nor of so short a stride, but that he comes forward even to the highway to this wide hospitality and publicity. Surely, he has solved some of the problems of life. He comes in at his back door, holding a log fresh cut for the hearth upon his shoulder with one hand, while he greets the newly arrived traveller with the other. Here at length we have free range, as not in palaces, nor cottages, nor temples, and intrude nowhere. All the secrets of housekeeping are exhibited to the eyes of men, above and below, before and behind. This is the necessary way to live, men have confessed, in these days, and shall he skulk and hide? And why should we have any serious disgust at kitchens? Perhaps they are the holiest recess of the house. There is the hearth, after all, and the settle, and the faggots, and the kettle, and the crickets. We have pleasant reminiscences of these. They are the heart, the left ventricle, the very vital part of the house. Here the real and sincere life which we meet in the streets was actually fed and sheltered. Here burns the taper that cheers the lonely traveller by night, and from this hearth ascend the smokes that populate the valley to his eyes by day. On the whole, a man may not be so little ashamed of any other part of his house, for here is his sincerity in earnest, at least. It may not be here that the besoms are plied most, it is not here that they need to be, for dust will not settle on the kitchen floor more than in nature. Hence it will not do for the landlord to possess too fine a nature. He must have health above the common accidents of life, subject to no modern fashionable diseases. But no taste, rather a vast relish or appetite. His sentiments on all subjects will be delivered as freely as the wind blows. There is nothing private or individual in them, though still original, but they are public. And of the hue of the heavens over his house, a certain out-of-door obviousness and transparency not to be disputed. What he does, his manners are not to be complained of, though abstractly offensive, for it is what man does, and in him the race is exhibited. When he eats, he is liver and bowels, and the whole digestive apparatus to the company, and so all admit the thing is done. He must have no idiosyncrasies, no particular bents or tendencies to this or that, but a general, uniform, and healthy development, such as his portly person indicates. Offering himself equally on all sides to men. He is not one of your peaked and inhospitable men of genius, with particular tastes, but, as we said before, has one uniform relish and taste which never aspires higher than a tavern sign. Or the cut of a weathercock. The man of genius, like a dog with a bone, or the slave who has swallowed a diamond, or a patient with the gravel, sits afar and retired, off the road. Hangs out no sign of refreshment for man and beast, but says, by all possible hints and signs, I wish to be alone, goodbye, farewell. But the landlord can afford to live without privacy. He entertains no private thought, he cherishes no solitary hour, no Sabbath day, but thinks, enough to assert the dignity of reason, and talks, and reads the newspaper. What he does not tell to one traveller, he tells to another. He never wants to be alone, but sleeps, wakes, eats, drinks, sociably, still remembering his race. He walks abroad through the thoughts of men, and the Iliad and Shakespeare are tame to him, who hears the rude but homely incidents of the road from every traveller. 
the male might drive through his brain in the midst of his most lonely soliloquy, without disturbing his equanimity, provided it brought plenty of news and passengers. There can be no profanity where there is no fane behind, and the whole world may see quite round him. Perchance his lines have fallen to him in dustier places, and he has heroically sat down where two roads meet, or at the four corners, or the five points. And his life is sublimely trivial for the good of men. The dust of travel blows ever in his eyes, and they preserve their clear, complacent look. The hourlies and half-hourlies, the dailies and weeklies, whirl on well-worn tracks, round and round his house, as if it were the goal in the stadium, and still he sits within in unruffled serenity. With no show of retreat. His neighbor dwells timidly behind a screen of poplars and willows, and a fence with sheaves of spears at regular intervals. Or defended against the tender palms of visitors by sharp spikes, but the traveler's wheels rattle over the doorstep of the tavern, and he cracks his whip in the entry. He is truly glad to see you, and sincere as the bullseye over his door. The traveler seeks to find, wherever he goes, someone who will stand in this broad and Catholic relation to him, who will be an inhabitant of the land to him a stranger. And represent its human nature, as the rock stands for its inanimate nature. And this is he. As his crib furnishes provender for the traveler's horse, and his larder provisions for his appetite, so his conversation furnishes the necessary aliment to his spirits. He knows very well what a man wants, for he is a man himself, and as it were the farthest traveled, though he has never stirred from his door. He understands his needs and destiny. He would be well fed and lodged, there can be no doubt, and have the transient sympathy of a cheerful companion, and of a heart which always prophesies fair weather. And after all the greatest men, even, want much more the sympathy which every honest fellow can give, than that which the great only can impart. If he is not the most upright, let us allow him this praise, that he is the most downright of men. He has a hand to shake and to be shaken, and takes a sturdy and unquestionable interest in you, as if he had assumed the care of you, but if you will break your neck. He will even give you the best advice as to the method. The great poets have not been ungrateful to their landlords. Mine host of the Tabard Inn, in the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, was an honor to his profession. A Sameli man our host was, with Allah. For to Han bin and Marshall in an Halley. A large man he was, with eye and steep. A fairer burgies is their new in cheap. Bold of his spech, and wise, and well a-taught. And of manhood him lacked right naught. Eke thereto, was he right a merry man. And after super playin' he began. And spake of Mirtha amongst other things. One that we hadn't made our reckonings. He is the true house band, and center of the company of greater fellowship and practical social talent than any. He it is that proposes that each shall tell a tale to while away the time to Canterbury, and leads them himself, and concludes with his own tale. Now, by my fader's soul that is dead. But ye be merry, smitteth of my head. Hold up your hands withouten more spech. If we do not look up to the landlord, we look round for him on all emergencies, for he is a man of infinite experience, who unites hands with wit. He is a more public character than a statesman, a publican, and not consequently a sinner, and surely, he, if any, should be exempted from taxation and military duty. Talking with our host is next best and instructive to talking with one's self. It is a more conscious soliloquy. As it were, to speak generally, and try what we would say provided we had an audience. He has indulgent and open ears, and does not require petty and particular statements. Hey go! exclaims the traveller. Thumps my sentiments, thinks mine host, and stands ready for what may come next, expressing the purest sympathy by his demeanour. Hot as blazes! says the other, hard weather, sir, not much stirring nowadays, says he. He is wiser than to contradict his guest in any case, he lets him go on, he lets him travel. The latest sitter leaves him standing far in the night, prepared to live right on, while suns rise and set, and his good night has as brisk a sound as his good morning. 
and the earliest riser finds him tasting his liquors in the bar air flies begin to buzz. With a countenance fresh as the morning star over the sanded floor, and not as one who had watched all night for travelers. And yet, if beds be the subject of conversation, it will appear that no man has been a sounder sleeper in his time. Finally, as for his moral character, we do not hesitate to say, that he has no grain of vice or meanness in him. But represents just that degree of virtue which all men relish without being obliged to respect. He is a good man, as his bitters are good, an unquestionable goodness. Not what is called a good man, good to be considered, as a work of art in galleries and museums, but a good fellow, that is, good to be associated with. Who ever thought of the religion of an innkeeper, whether he was joined to the church, partook of the sacrament, said his prayers, feared God, or the like? No doubt he has had his experiences, has felt a change, and is a firm believer in the perseverance of the saints. In this last, we suspect, does the peculiarity of his religion consist. But he keeps an inn, and not a conscience. How many fragrant charities and sincere social virtues are implied in this daily offering of himself to the public? He cherishes goodwill to all, and gives the wayfarer as good and honest advice to direct him on his road as the priest. To conclude, the tavern will compare favorably with the church. The church is the place where prayers and sermons are delivered, but the tavern is where they are to take effect, and if the former are good, the latter cannot be bad. Paradise, to be, regained 5. First published in Democratic Review, Volume 13, November, 1843. We learn that Mr. Etzler is a native of Germany, and originally published his book in Pennsylvania, ten or twelve years ago. And now a second English edition, from the original American one, is demanded by his readers across the water, owing, we suppose, to the recent spread of Fourier's doctrines. It is one of the signs of the times. We confess that we have risen from reading this book with enlarged ideas, and grander conceptions of our duties in this world. It did expand us a little. It is worth attending to, if only that it entertains large questions. Consider what Mr. Etzler proposes. Fellow men. I promise to show the means of creating a paradise within ten years, where everything desirable for human life may be had by every man in superabundance, without labor, and without pay. Where the whole face of nature shall be changed into the most beautiful forms, and man may live in the most magnificent palaces, in all imaginable refinements of luxury. And in the most delightful gardens. Where he may accomplish, without labor, in one year, more than hitherto could be done in thousands of years. May level mountains, sink valleys, create lakes, drain lakes and swamps, and intersect the land everywhere with beautiful canals, and roads for transporting heavy loads of many thousand tons. And for traveling one thousand miles in twenty-four hours. May cover the ocean with floating islands movable in any desired direction with immense power and celerity, in perfect security, and with all comforts and luxuries, bearing gardens and palaces. With thousands of families, and provided with rivulets of sweet water. May explore the interior of the globe, and travel from pole to pole in a fortnight, provide himself with means, unheard of yet, for increasing his knowledge of the world, and so his intelligence. Lead a life of continual happiness, of enjoyments yet unknown. Free himself from almost all the evils that afflict mankind, except death, and even put death far beyond the common period of human life, and finally render it less afflicting. Mankind may thus live in and enjoy a new world, far superior to the present, and raise themselves far higher in the scale of being. It would seem from this and various indications beside, that there is a transcendentalism in mechanics as well as in ethics. While the whole field of the one reformer lies beyond the boundaries of space, the other is pushing his schemes for the elevation of the race to its utmost limits. While one scours the heavens, the other sweeps the earth. One says he will reform himself, and then nature and circumstances will be right. Let us not obstruct ourselves, for that is the greatest friction. It is of little importance though a cloud obstruct the view of the astronomer compared with his own blindness. 
the other will reform nature and circumstances, and then man will be right. Talk no more vaguely, says he, of reforming the world, I will reform the globe itself. What matters it whether I remove this humor out of my flesh, or this pestilent humor from the fleshy part of the globe? Nay, is not the latter the more generous course? At present the globe goes with a shattered constitution in its orbit. Has it not asthma, and ague, and fever, and dropsy, and flatulence, and pleurisy, and is it not afflicted with vermin? Has it not its healthful laws counteracted, and its vital energy which will yet redeem it? No doubt the simple powers of nature, properly directed by man, would make it healthy in a paradise. As the laws of man's own constitution but wait to be obeyed, to restore him to health and happiness. Our panaceas cure but few ails, our general hospitals are private and exclusive. We must set up another hygiene than is now worshipped. Do not the quacks even direct small doses for children, larger for adults, and larger still for oxen and horses? Let us remember that we are to prescribe for the globe itself. This fair homestead has fallen to us, and how little have we done to improve it, how little have we cleared and hedged and ditched. We are too inclined to go hence to a better land, without lifting a finger, as our farmers are moving to the Ohio soil. But would it not be more heroic and faithful to till and redeem this New England soil of the world? The still youthful energies of the globe have only to be directed in their proper channel. Every gazette brings accounts of the untutored freaks of the wind, shipwrecks and hurricanes which the mariner and planter accept as special or general providences. But they touch our consciences, they remind us of our sins. Another deluge would disgrace mankind. We confess we never had much respect for that antediluvian race. A thoroughbred businessman cannot enter heartily upon the business of life without first looking into his accounts. How many things are now at loose ends? Who knows which way the wind will blow tomorrow? Let us not succumb to nature. We will marshal the clouds and restrain the tempests. We will bottle up pestilent exhalations, we will probe for earthquakes, grub them up, and give vent to the dangerous gases, we will disembowel the volcano, and extract its poison, take its seed out. We will wash water, and warm fire, and cool ice, and underprop the earth. We will teach birds to fly, and fishes to swim, and ruminants to chew the cud. It is time we had looked into these things. And it becomes the moralist, too, to inquire what man might do to improve and beautify the system. What to make the stars shine more brightly, the sun more cheery and joyous, the moon more placid and content. Could he not heighten the tints of flowers and the melody of birds? Does he perform his duty to the inferior races? Should he not be a god to them? What is the part of magnanimity to the whale and the beaver? Should we not fear to exchange places with them for a day, lest by their behavior they should shame us? Might we not treat with magnanimity the shark and the tiger, not descend to meet there on their own level, with spears of shark's teeth and bucklers of tiger's skin? We slander the hyena. Man is the fiercest and cruelest animal. Ah! He is of little faith, even the erring comets and meteors would thank him, and return his kindness in their kind. How meanly and grossly do we deal with nature! Could we not have a less gross labor? What else do these fine inventions suggest, magnetism, the daguerreotype, electricity? Can we not do more than cut and trim the forest, can we not assist in its interior economy, in the circulation of the sap? Now we work superficially and violently. We do not suspect how much might be done to improve our relation to animated nature, what kindness and refined courtesy there might be. There are certain pursuits which, if not wholly poetic and true, do at least suggest a nobler and finer relation to nature than we know. The keeping of bees, for instance, is a very slight interference. It is like directing the sunbeams. All nations, from the remotest antiquity, have thus fingered nature. There are Hymetus and Hybla, and how many beer-renowned spots beside. There is nothing gross in the idea of these little herds, their hum like the faintest low of kine in the meads. 
a pleasant reviewer has lately reminded us that in some places they are led out to pasture where the flowers are most abundant. Columella tells us, says he, that the inhabitants of Arabia sent their hives into Attica to benefit by the later blowing flowers. Annually are the hives, in immense pyramids, carried up the Nile in boats, and suffered to float slowly down the stream by night, resting by day, as the flowers put forth along the banks. And they determine the richness of any locality, and so the profitableness of delay, by the sinking of the boat in the water. We are told, by the same reviewer, of a man in Germany, whose bees yielded more honey than those of his neighbors, with no apparent advantage. But at length he informed them that he had turned his hives one degree more to the east, and so his bees, having two hours the start in the morning, got the first sip of honey. Here, there is treachery and selfishness behind all this, but these things suggest to the poetic mind what might be done. Many examples there are of a grosser interference, yet not without their apology. We saw last summer, on the side of a mountain, a dog employed to churn for a farmer's family, traveling upon a horizontal wheel, and though he had sore eyes, an alarming cough. And with all a demure aspect, yet their bread did get buttered for all that. Undoubtedly, in the most brilliant successes, the first rank is always sacrificed. Much useless traveling of horses, in extenso, has of late years been improved for man's behoof, only two forces being taken advantage of, the gravity of the horse, which is the centripetal, and his centrifugal inclination to go ahead. Only these two elements in the calculation. And is not the creature's whole economy better economized thus? Are not all finite beings better pleased with motions relative than absolute? And what is the great globe itself but such a wheel, a larger treadmill, so that our horses' freest steps over prairies are oftentimes balked and rendered of no avail by the earth's motion on its axis? But here he is the central agent and motive power. And, for variety of scenery, being provided with a window in front. Do not the ever-varying activity and fluctuating energy of the creature himself work the effect of the most varied scenery on a country road? It must be confessed that horses at present work too exclusively for men, rarely men for horses, and the brute degenerates in man's society. It will be seen that we contemplate a time when man's will shall be law to the physical world, and he shall no longer be deterred by such abstractions as time and space, height and depth weight and hardness, but shall indeed be the Lord of creation. Well, says the faithless reader, life is short, but art is long, where is the power that will effect all these changes? This it is the very object of Mr. Etzler's volume to show. At present, he would merely remind us that there are innumerable and immeasurable powers already existing in nature, unimproved on a large scale, or for generous and universal ends. Amply sufficient for these purposes. He would only indicate their existence, as a surveyor makes known the existence of a water power on any stream. But for their application he refers us to a sequel to this book, called The Mechanical System. A few of the most obvious and familiar of these powers are the wind, the tide, the waves, the sunshine. Let us consider their value. First, there is the power of the wind, constantly exerted over the globe. It appears from observation of a sailing vessel, and from scientific tables, that the average power of the wind is equal to that of one horse for every 100 square feet. We know, says our author, that ships of the first class carry sails 200 feet high, we may, therefore, equally, on land, oppose to the wind surfaces of the same height. Imagine a line of such surfaces one mile, or about 5,000 feet, long, they would then contain one million square feet. Let these surfaces intersect the direction of the wind at right angles, by some contrivance, and receive, consequently, its full power at all times. Its average power being equal to one horse for every 100 square feet, the total power would be equal to one million divided by 100, or 10,000 horses power. Allowing the power of one horse to equal that of 10 men, the power of 10,000 horses is equal to 100,000 men. But as men cannot work uninterruptedly, but want about half the time for sleep and repose, the same power would be equal to 200,000 men. 
we are not limited to the height of 200 feet. We might extend, if required, the application of this power to the height of the clouds, by means of kites. But we will have one such fence for every square mile of the globe's surface, for, as the wind usually strikes the earth at an angle of more than two degrees, which is evident from observing its effect on the high sea, it admits of even a closer approach. As the surface of the globe contains about 200 million square miles, the whole power of the wind on these surfaces would equal 40 trillion men's power, and would perform 80. 000 times as much work as all the men on earth could affect with their nerves. If it should be objected that this computation includes the surface of the ocean and uninhabitable regions of the earth, where this power could not be applied for our purposes, Mr. Etzler is quick with his reply, but, you will recollect, says he, that I have promised to show the means for rendering the ocean as inhabitable as the most fruitful dry land and I do not exclude even the polar regions. The reader will observe that our author uses the fence only as a convenient formula for expressing the power of the wind, and does not consider it a necessary method of its application. We do not attach much value to this statement of the comparative power of the wind and horse, for no common ground is mentioned on which they can be compared. Undoubtedly, each is incomparably excellent in its way, and every general comparison made for such practical purposes as are contemplated, which gives a preference to the one, must be made with some unfairness to the other. The scientific tables are, for the most part, true only in a tabular sense. We suspect that a loaded wagon, with a light sail, ten feet square, would not have been blown so far by the end of the year, under equal circumstances. As a common racer or dray horse would have drawn it. And how many crazy structures on our globe's surface, of the same dimensions, would wait for dry rot if the traces of one horse were hitched to them, even to their windward side? Plainly, this is not the principle of comparison. But even the steady and constant force of the horse may be rated as equal to his weight at least. Yet we should prefer to let the zephyrs and gales bear, with all their weight, upon our fences, than that Dobbin, with feet braced, should lean ominously against them for a season. Nevertheless, here is an almost incalculable power at our disposal, yet how trifling the use we make of it. It only serves to turn a few mills, blow a few vessels across the ocean, and a few trivial ends besides. What a poor compliment do we pay to our indefatigable and energetic servant! If you ask, perhaps, why this power is not used, if the statement be true, I have to ask in return, why is the power of steam so lately come to application? So many millions of men boiled water every day for many thousand years. They must have frequently seen that boiling water, in tightly closed pots or kettles, would lift the cover or burst the vessel with great violence. The power of steam was, therefore, as commonly known down to the least kitchen or washwoman, as the power of wind. But close observation and reflection were bestowed neither on the one nor the other. Men having discovered the power of falling water, which after all is comparatively slight, how eagerly do they seek out and improve these privileges. Let a difference of but a few feet in level be discovered on some stream near a populous town, some slight occasion for gravity to act, and the whole economy of the neighborhood is changed at once. Men do indeed speculate about and with this power as if it were the only privilege. But meanwhile this aerial stream is falling from far greater heights with more constant flow, never shrunk by drought, offering mill sites wherever the wind blows. A Niagara in the air, with no Canada side, only the application is hard. There are the powers too of the tide and waves, constantly ebbing and flowing, lapsing and relapsing, but they serve man in but few ways. They turn a few tide mills, and perform a few other insignificant and accidental services only. We all perceive the effect of the tide. How imperceptibly it creeps up into our harbors and rivers, and raises the heaviest navies as easily as the lightest chip. Everything that floats must yield to it. But man, slow to take nature's constant hint of assistance, makes slight and irregular use of this power, in careening ships and getting them afloat when aground. The following is Mr. Etzler's calculation on this head, 
To form a conception of the power which the tide affords, let us imagine a surface of 100 miles square, or 10,000 square miles, where the tide rises and sinks. On an average, 10 feet. How many men would it require to empty a basin of 10,000 square miles area, and 10 feet deep, filled with seawater, in six and a quarter hours and fill it again in the same time? As one man can raise eight cubic feet of seawater per minute, and in six and a quarter hours 3,000, it would take 1,200,000,000 men, or as they could work only half the time, 2,400,000,000, to raise 3 billion. Zero, zero, zero cubic feet, or the whole quantity required in the given time. This power may be applied in various ways. A large body, of the heaviest materials that will float, may first be raised by it, and being attached to the end of a balance reaching from the land, or from a stationary support. Fastened to the bottom, when the tide falls, the whole weight will be brought to bear upon the end of the balance. Also when the tide rises it may be made to exert a nearly equal force in the opposite direction. It can be employed wherever a point de puy can be obtained. However, the application of the tide being by establishments fixed on the ground, it is natural to begin with them near the shores in shallow water, and upon sands. Which may be extended gradually further into the sea. The shores of the continent, islands, and sands, being generally surrounded by shallow water, not exceeding from 50 to 100 fathoms in depth, for 20, 50, or 100 miles and upward. The coasts of North America, with their extensive sandbanks, islands, and rocks, may easily afford, for this purpose, a ground about 3,000 miles long, and, on an average, 100 miles broad, or 300. 000 square miles, which, with a power of 240,000 men per square mile, as stated, at 10 feet tide, will be equal to 72,000 millions of men, or for every mile of coast, a power of 24 million men. Rafts, of any extent, fastened on the ground of the sea, along the shore, and stretching far into the sea, may be covered with fertile soil, bearing vegetables and trees, of every description. The finest gardens, equal to those the firm land may admit of, and buildings and machineries, which may operate, not only on the sea, where they are, but which also, by means of mechanical connections, may extend their operations for many miles into the continent. Etzler's Mechanical System, page 24. Thus this power may cultivate the artificial soil for many miles upon the surface of the sea, near the shores, and, for several miles, the dry land, along the shore. In the most superior manner imaginable. It may build cities along the shore, consisting of the most magnificent palaces, every one surrounded by gardens and the most delightful sceneries. It may level the hills and unevennesses, or raise eminences for enjoying open prospect into the country and upon the sea. It may cover the barren shore with fertile soil, and beautify the same in various ways. It may clear the sea of shallows, and make easy the approach to the land, not merely of vessels, but of large floating islands, which may come from, and go to distant parts of the world. Islands that have every commodity and security for their inhabitants which the firm land affords. Thus may a power, derived from the gravity of the moon and the ocean, hitherto but the objects of idle curiosity to the studious man. Be made eminently subservient for creating the most delightful abodes along the coasts, where men may enjoy at the same time all the advantages of sea and dry land. The coasts may hereafter be continuous paradisiacal skirts between land and sea, everywhere crowded with the densest population. The shores and the sea along them will be no more as raw nature presents them now, but everywhere of easy and charming access, not even molested by the roar of waves shaped as it may suit the purposes of their inhabitants. The sea will be cleared of every obstruction to free passage everywhere, and its productions in fishes, etc. will be gathered in large, appropriate receptacles, to present them to the inhabitants of the shores and of the sea. Verily, the land would wear a busy aspect at the spring and neap tide, and these island ships, these terra infirma, which realized the fables of antiquity, affect our imagination. We have often thought that the fittest locality for a human dwelling was on the edge of the land. 
that there the constant lesson and impression of the sea might sink deep into the life and character of the landsman, and perhaps impart a marine tint to his imagination. It is a noble word, that mariner, one who is conversant with the sea. There should be more of what it signifies in each of us. It is a worthy country to belong to, we look to see him not disgrace it. Perhaps we should be equally mariners and terriners, and even our green mountains need some of that sea green to be mixed with them. The computation of the power of the waves is less satisfactory. While only the average power of the wind and the average height of the tide were taken before, now the extreme height of the waves is used. For they are made to rise ten feet above the level of the sea, to which, adding ten more for depression, we have twenty feet, or the extreme height of a wave. Indeed, the power of the waves, which is produced by the wind blowing obliquely and at disadvantage upon the water, is made to be, not only three thousand times greater than that of the tide, but one hundred times greater than that of the wind itself, meeting its object at right angles. Moreover, this power is measured by the area of the vessel, and not by its length mainly, and it seems to be forgotten that the motion of the waves is chiefly undulatory and exerts a power only within the limits of a vibration, else the very continents, with their extensive coasts, would soon be set adrift. Finally, there is the power to be derived from sunshine, by the principle on which Archimedes contrived his burning mirrors. A multiplication of mirrors reflecting the rays of the sun upon the same spot, till the requisite degree of heat is obtained. The principal application of this power will be to the boiling of water and production of steam. How to create rivulets of sweet and wholesome water, on floating islands, in the midst of the ocean, will be no riddle now. Sea water changed into steam, will distill into sweet water, leaving the salt on the bottom. Thus the steam engines on floating islands, for their propulsion and other mechanical purposes, will serve, at the same time, for the distillery of sweet water, which, collected in basins, may be led through channels over the island, while, where required, it may be refrigerated by artificial means, and changed into cool water, surpassing, in salubrity, the best spring water. Because nature hardly ever distills water so purely, and without admixture of less wholesome matter. So much for these few and more obvious powers, already used to a trifling extent. But there are innumerable others in nature, not described nor discovered. These, however, will do for the present. This would be to make the sun and the moon equally our satellites. For, as the moon is the cause of the tides, and the sun the cause of the wind, which, in turn, is the cause of the waves, all the work of this planet would be performed by these far influences. But as these powers are very irregular and subject to interruptions, the next object is to show how they may be converted into powers that operate continually and uniformly forever, until the machinery be worn out, or, in other words, into perpetual motions. Hitherto the power of the wind has been applied immediately upon the machinery for use, and we have had to wait the chances of the winds blowing. While the operation was stopped as soon as the wind ceased to blow. But the manner, which I shall state hereafter, of applying this power, is to make it operate only for collecting or storing up power, and then to take out of this store, at any time as much as may be wanted for final operation upon the machines. The power stored up is to react as required, and may do so long after the original power of the wind has ceased. And though the wind should cease for intervals of many months, we may have by the same power a uniform perpetual motion in a very simple way. The weight of a clock being wound up gives us an image of reaction. The sinking of this weight is the reaction of winding it up. It is not necessary to wait till it has run down before we wind up the weight, but it may be wound up at any time, partly or totally. And if done always before the weight reaches the bottom, the clock will be going perpetually. In a similar, though not in the same way, we may cause a reaction on a larger scale. We may raise, for instance, water by the immediate application of wind or steam to a pond upon some eminence, out of which, through an outlet. It may fall upon some wheel or other contrivance for setting machinery a-going. Thus we may store up water in some eminent pond, and take out of this store, 
at any time, as much water through the outlet as we want to employ. By which means the original power may react for many days after it has ceased. Such reservoirs of moderate elevation or size need not be made artificially, but will be found made by nature very frequently, requiring but little aid for their completion. They require no regularity of form. Any valley, with lower grounds in its vicinity, would answer the purpose. Small crevices may be filled up. Such places may be eligible for the beginning of enterprises of this kind. The greater the height, of course, the less water required. But suppose a level and dry country. Then hill and valley, and eminent pond, are to be constructed by main force. Or, if the springs are unusually low, then dirt and stones may be used, and the disadvantage arising from friction will be counterbalanced by their greater gravity. Nor shall a single root of dry land be sunk in such artificial ponds as may be wanted, but their surfaces may be covered with rafts decked with fertile earth. And all kinds of vegetables which may grow there as well as anywhere else. And, finally, by the use of thick envelopes retaining the heat, and other contrivances, the power of steam caused by sunshine may react at will, and thus be rendered perpetual. No matter how often or how long the sunshine may be interrupted. Etzler's Mechanical System Here is power enough, one would think, to accomplish somewhat. These are the powers below. O oh, ye millwrights, ye engineers, ye operatives, and speculators of every class, never again complain of a want of power, it is the grossest form of infidelity. The question is not how we shall execute, but what. Let us not use in a niggardly manner what is thus generously offered. Consider what revolutions are to be effected in agriculture. First, in the new country a machine is to move along, taking out trees and stones to any required depth, and piling them up in convenient heaps. Then the same machine, with a little alteration, is to plane the ground perfectly, till there shall be no hills nor valleys, making the requisite canals, ditches, and roads as it goes along. The same machine, with some other little alterations, is then to sift the ground thoroughly, supply fertile soil from other places if wanted, and plant it. And finally the same machine, with a little addition, is to reap and gather in the crop, thresh and grind it, or press it to oil, or prepare it any way for final use. For the description of these machines we are referred to Etzler's Mechanical System, pages 11 to 27. We should be pleased to see that, mechanical system, though we have not been able to ascertain whether it has been published, or only exists as yet in the design of the author. We have great faith in it. But we cannot stop for applications now. Any wilderness, even the most hideous and sterile, may be converted into the most fertile and delightful gardens. The most dismal swamps may be cleared of all their spontaneous growth, filled up and leveled, and intersected by canals, ditches and aqueducts, for draining them entirely. The soil, if required, may be meliorated, by covering or mixing it with rich soil taken from distant places, and the same be moldered to fine dust, leveled, sifted from all roots, weeds and stones. And sowed and planted in the most beautiful order and symmetry, with fruit trees and vegetables of every kind that may stand the climate. New facilities for transportation and locomotion are to be adopted. Large and commodious vehicles, for carrying many thousand tons, running over peculiarly adapted level roads. At the rate of 40 miles per hour, or 1,000 miles per day, may transport men and things, small houses, and whatever may serve for comfort and ease, by land. Floating islands, constructed of logs, or of wooden stuff prepared in a similar manner, as is to be done with stone, and of live trees, which may be reared so as to interlace one another. And strengthen the whole, may be covered with gardens and palaces, and propelled by powerful engines, so as to run at an equal rate those seas and oceans. Thus, man may move, with the celerity of a bird's flight, in terrestrial paradises, from one climate to another, and see the world in all its variety, exchanging, with distant nations. The Surplus of Productions The journey from one pole to another may be performed in a fortnight, the visit to a transmarine country in a week or two, 
or a journey round the world in one or two months by land and water. And why pass a dreary winter every year while there is yet room enough on the globe where nature is blessed with a perpetual summer, and with a far greater variety and luxuriance of vegetation? More than one half the surface of the globe has no winter. Men will have it in their power to remove and prevent all bad influences of climate, and to enjoy, perpetually, only that temperature which suits their constitution and feeling best. Who knows but by accumulating the power until the end of the present century, using meanwhile only the smallest allowance, reserving all that blows, all that shines, all that ebbs and flows. All that dashes, we may have got such a reserved accumulated power as to run the earth off its track into a new orbit, some summer, and so change the tedious vicissitude of the seasons? Or, perchance, coming generations will not abide the dissolution of the globe, but, availing themselves of future inventions in aerial locomotion, and the navigation of space. The entire race may migrate from the earth, to settle some vacant and more western planet, it may be still healthy, perchance unearthy, not composed of dirt and stones. Whose primary strata only are strewn, and where no weeds are sown. It took but little art, a simple application of natural laws, a canoe, a paddle, and a sail of matting, to people the isles of the Pacific, and a little more will people the shining isles of space. Do we not see in the firmament the lights carried along the shore by night, as Columbus did? Let us not despair nor mutiny. The dwellings also ought to be very different from what is known, if the full benefit of our means is to be enjoyed. They are to be of a structure for which we have no name yet. They are to be neither palaces, nor temples, nor cities, but a combination of all, superior to whatever is known. Earth may be baked into bricks, or even vitrified stone by heat, we may bake large masses of any size and form, into stone and vitrified substance of the greatest durability. Lasting even thousands of years, out of clay earth, or of stones ground to dust, by the application of burning mirrors. This is to be done in the open air without other preparation than gathering the substance, grinding and mixing it with water and cement, molding or casting it, and bringing the focus of the burning mirrors of proper size upon the same. The character of the architecture is to be quite different from what it ever has been hitherto, large solid masses are to be baked or cast in one piece, ready shaped in any form that may be desired. The building may, therefore, consist of columns two hundred feet high and upwards, of proportionate thickness, and of one entire piece of vitrified substance. Huge pieces are to be molded so as to join and hook on to each other firmly, by proper joints and folds, and not to yield in any way without breaking. Foundries, of any description, are to be heated by burning mirrors, and will require no labor. Except the making of the first molds and the superintendents for gathering the metal and taking the finished articles away. Alas! In the present state of science, we must take the finished articles away, but think not that man will always be a victim of circumstances. The countryman who visited the city and found the streets cluttered with bricks and lumber, reported that it was not yet finished. And one who considers the endless repairs and reforming of our houses, might well wonder when they will be done. But why may not the dwellings of men on this earth be built once for all of some durable material, some Roman or Etruscan masonry which will stand, so that time shall only adorn and beautify them? Why may we not finish the outward world for posterity, and leave them leisure to attend to the inner? Surely, all the gross necessities and economies might be cared for in a few years. All might be built and baked and stored up, during this, the term time of the world, against the vacant eternity, and the globe go provisioned and furnished like our public vessels. For its voyage through space, as through some Pacific ocean, while we would, tie up the rudder and sleep before the wind, as those who sail from Lima to Manila. But, to go back a few years in imagination, think not that life in these crystal palaces is to bear any analogy to life in our present humble cottages. Far from it. Clothed, once for all, in some, flexible stuff, more durable than George Fox's suit of leather, composed of, fibers of vegetables, glutinated, together by some, cohesive substances. And made into sheets, like paper, 
of any size or form, man will put far from him corroding care and the whole host of ills. The twenty-five halls in the inside of the square are to be each two hundred feet square and high, the forty corridors, each one hundred feet long and twenty wide. The eighty galleries, each from one thousand to one thousand two hundred and fifty feet long, about seven thousand private rooms, the whole surrounded and intersected by the grandest and most splendid colonnades imaginable. Floors, ceilings, columns with their various beautiful and fanciful intervals, all shining, and reflecting to infinity all objects and persons, with splendid luster of all beautiful colors. And fanciful shapes and pictures. All galleries, outside and within the halls, are to be provided with many thousand commodious and most elegant vehicles, in which persons may move up and down like birds, in perfect security. And without exertion. Any member may procure himself all the common articles of his daily wants, by a short turn of some crank, without leaving his apartment. He may, at any time, bathe himself in cold or warm water, or in steam, or in some artificially prepared liquor for invigorating health. He may, at any time, give to the air in his apartment that temperature that suits his feeling best. He may cause, at any time, an agreeable scent of various kinds. He may, at any time, meliorate his breathing air, that main vehicle of vital power. Thus, by a proper application of the physical knowledge of our days, man may be kept in a perpetual serenity of mind, and if there is no incurable disease or defect in his organism. In constant vigor of health, and his life be prolonged beyond any parallel which present times afford. One or two persons are sufficient to direct the kitchen business. They have nothing else to do but to superintend the cookery, and to watch the time of the victuals being done, and then to remove them, with the table and vessels, into the dining hall. Or to the respective private apartments, by a slight motion of the hand at some crank. Any extraordinary desire of any person may be satisfied by going to the place where the thing is to be had. And anything that requires a particular preparation in cooking or baking may be done by the person who desires it. This is one of those instances in which the individual genius is found to consent, as indeed it always does, at last, with the universal. These last sentences have a certain sad and sober truth, which reminds us of the scripture of all nations. All expression of truth does at length take the deep ethical form. Here is hint of a place the most eligible of any in space, and of a servitor, in comparison with whom, all other helps dwindle into insignificance. We hope to hear more of him anon, for even a crystal palace would be deficient without his invaluable services. And as for the environs of the establishment, there will be afforded the most enrapturing views to be fancied, out of the private apartments, from the galleries, from the roof. From its turrets and cupolas, gardens as far as the eye can see, full of fruits and flowers, arranged in the most beautiful order, with walks, colonnades, aqueducts, canals, ponds, plains. Amphitheaters, terraces, fountains, sculptural works, pavilions, gondolas, places for public amusement, etc. To delight the eye and fancy, the taste and smell. The walks and roads are to be paved with hard vitrified, large plates, so as to be always clean from all dirt in any weather or season. The channels being of vitrified substance, and the water perfectly clear, and filtrated or distilled if required, may afford the most beautiful scenes imaginable. While a variety of fishes is seen clear down to the bottom playing about, and the canals may afford at the same time, the means of gliding smoothly along between various sceneries of art and nature. In beautiful gondolas, while their surface and borders may be covered with fine land and aquatic birds. The walks may be covered with porticos adorned with magnificent columns, statues, and sculptural works. All of vitrified substance, and lasting forever, while the beauties of nature around heighten the magnificence and deliciousness. The night affords no less delight to fancy and feelings. An infinite variety of grand, beautiful and fanciful objects and sceneries, radiating with crystalline brilliancy, by the illumination of gaslight. The human figures themselves, arrayed in the most beautiful pomp fancy may suggest, or the eye desire, 
shining even with brilliancy of stuffs and diamonds, like stones of various colors. Elegantly shaped and arranged around the body. All reflected a thousandfold in huge mirrors and reflectors of various forms. Theatrical scenes of a grandeur and magnificence, and enrapturing illusions, unknown yet, in which any person may be either a spectator or an actor. The speech and the songs reverberating with increased sound, rendered more sonorous and harmonious than by nature, by vaultings that are movable into any shape at any time. The sweetest and most impressive harmony of music, produced by song and instruments partly not known yet, may thrill through the nerves and vary with other amusements and delights. At night the roof, and the inside and outside of the whole square, are illuminated by gaslight, which in the mazes of many-colored crystal-like colonnades and vaultings is reflected with a brilliancy that gives to the whole a luster of precious stones, as far as the eye can see, such are the future abodes of men. Such is the life reserved to true intelligence, but withheld from ignorance, prejudice, and stupid adherence to custom. Such is the domestic life to be enjoyed by every human individual that will partake of it. Love and affection may there be fostered and enjoyed without any of the obstructions that oppose, diminish, and destroy them in the present state of men. It would be as ridiculous, then, to dispute and quarrel about the means of life, as it would be now about water to drink along mighty rivers. Or about the permission to breathe air in the atmosphere, or about sticks in our extensive woods. Thus is paradise to be regained, and that old and stern decree at length reversed. Man shall no more earn his living by the sweat of his brow. All labor shall be reduced to a short turn of some crank, and taking the finished article away. But there is a crank, oh, how hard to be turned. Could there not be a crank upon a crank, an infinitely small crank, we would fain inquire. No, alas. Not. But there is a certain divine energy in every man, but sparingly employed as yet. Which may be called the crank within, the crank after all, the prime mover in all machinery, quite indispensable to all work. Would that we might get our hands on its handle. In fact no work can be shirked. It may be postponed indefinitely, but not infinitely. Nor can any really important work be made easier by cooperation or machinery. Not one particle of labor now threatening any man can be routed without being performed. It cannot be hunted out of the vicinity like jackals and hyenas. It will not run. You may begin by sawing the little sticks, or you may saw the great sticks first, but sooner or later you must saw them both. We will not be imposed upon by this vast application of forces. We believe that most things will have to be accomplished still by the application called industry. We are rather pleased after all to consider the small private, but both constant and accumulated force, which stands behind every spade in the field. This it is that makes the valleys shine, and the deserts really bloom. Sometimes, we confess, we are so degenerate as to reflect with pleasure on the days when men were yoked like cattle, and drew a crooked stick for a plough. After all, the great interests and methods were the same. It is a rather serious objection to Mr. Etzler's schemes, that they require time, men, and money, three very superfluous and inconvenient things for an honest and well-disposed man to deal with. The whole world, he tells us, might therefore be really changed into a paradise, within less than ten years. Commencing from the first year of an association for the purpose of constructing and applying the machinery. We are sensible of a startling incongruity when time and money are mentioned in this connection. The ten years which are proposed would be a tedious while to wait, if every man were at his post and did his duty, but quite too short a period, if we are to take time for it. But this fault is by no means peculiar to Mr. Etzler's schemes. There is far too much hurry and bustle, and too little patience and privacy, in all our methods, as if something were to be accomplished in centuries. The true reformer does not want time, nor money, nor cooperation, nor advice. What is time but the stuff delay is made of? And depend upon it, our virtue will not live on the interest of our money. He expects no income, but our outgoes, 
so soon as we begin to count the cost the cost begins. And as for advice, the information floating in the atmosphere of society is as evanescent and unserviceable to him as gossamer for clubs of Hercules. There is absolutely no common sense. It is common nonsense. If we are to risk a cent or a drop of our blood, who then shall advise us? For ourselves, we are too young for experience. Who is old enough? We are older by faith than by experience. In the unbending of the arm to do the deed there is experience worth all the maxims in the world. It will now be plainly seen that the execution of the proposals is not proper for individuals. Whether it be proper for government at this time, before the subject has become popular, is a question to be decided. All that is to be done, is to step forth, after mature reflection, to confess loudly one's conviction, and to constitute societies. Man is powerful but in union with many. Nothing great, for the improvement of his own condition, or that of his fellow men, can ever be effected by individual enterprise. Alas! This is the crying sin of the age, this want of faith in the prevalence of a man. Nothing can be effected but by one man. He who wants help wants everything. True, this is the condition of our weakness, but it can never be the means of our recovery. We must first succeed alone, that we may enjoy our success together. We trust that the social movements which we witness indicate an aspiration not to be thus cheaply satisfied. In this matter of reforming the world, we have little faith in corporations. Not thus was it first formed. But our author is wise enough to say that the raw materials for the accomplishment of his purposes are iron, copper, wood, earth chiefly. And a union of men whose eyes and understanding are not shut up by preconceptions. I, this last may be what we want mainly, a company of odd fellows, indeed. Small shares of twenty dollars will be sufficient, in all, from two hundred thousand to three hundred zero zero zero, to create the first establishment for a whole community of from three thousand to four zero 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 individuals, at the end of five years we shall have a principal of two hundred millions of dollars, and so paradise will be wholly regained at the end of the tenth year. But, alas, the ten years have already elapsed, and there are no signs of Eden yet, for want of the requisite funds to begin the enterprise in a hopeful manner. Yet it seems a safe investment. Perchance they could be hired at a low rate, the property being mortgaged for security, and, if necessary, it could be given up in any stage of the enterprise, without loss, with the fixtures. Mr. Etzler considers this address as a touchstone, to try whether our nation is in any way accessible to these great truths, for raising the human creature to a superior state of existence. In accordance with the knowledge and the spirit of the most cultivated minds of the present time. He has prepared a constitution, short and concise, consisting of twenty-one articles, so that wherever an association may spring up, it may go into operation without delay. And the editor informs us that, communications on the subject of this book may be addressed to C. F. Stolmeyer, No. 6, Upper Charles Street, Northampton Square, London. But we see two main difficulties in the way. First, the successful application of the powers by machinery, we have not yet seen the mechanical system, and, secondly, which is infinitely harder, the application of man to the work by faith. This it is, we fear, which will prolong the ten years to ten thousand at least. It will take a power more than eighty thousand times greater than all the men on earth could effect with their nerves, to persuade men to use that which is already offered them. Even a greater than this physical power must be brought to bear upon that moral power. Faith, indeed, is all the reform that is needed, it is itself a reform. Doubtless, we are as slow to conceive of paradise as of heaven, of a perfect natural as of a perfect spiritual world. We see how past ages have loitered and erred. Is perhaps our generation free from irrationality and error? Have we perhaps reached now the summit of human wisdom, and need no more to look out for mental or physical improvement? Undoubtedly, we are never so visionary as to be prepared for what the next hour may bring forth. Mu lambda lambda epsilon iota tau theta epsilon omicron nu delta, 
sigma tau iota tau omicron iota omicron tau omicron nu phi sigma epsilon iota. The divine is about to be, and such is its nature. In our wisest moments we are secreting a matter, which, like the lime of the shell fish, encrusts us quite over, and well for us if, like it, we cast our shells from time to time. Though they be pearl and of fairest tint. Let us consider under what disadvantages science has hitherto labored before we pronounce thus confidently on her progress. There was never any system in the productions of human labor. But they came into existence and fashion as chance directed men. Only a few professional men of learning occupy themselves with teaching natural philosophy, chemistry, and the other branches of the sciences of nature, to a very limited extent. For very limited purposes, with very limited means. The science of mechanics is but in a state of infancy. It is true, improvements are made upon improvements, instigated by patents of government, but they are made accidentally or at haphazard. There is no general system of this science, mathematical as it is, which develops its principles in their full extent, and the outlines of the application to which they lead. There is no idea of comparison between what is explored and what is yet to be explored in this science. The ancient Greeks placed mathematics at the head of their education. But we are glad to have filled our memory with notions, without troubling ourselves much with reasoning about them. Mr. Etzler is not one of the enlightened practical men, the pioneers of the actual, who move with the slow deliberate tread of science, conserving the world who execute the dreams of the last century, though they have no dreams of their own, yet he deals in the very raw but still solid material of all inventions. He has more of the practical than usually belongs to so bold a schemer, so resolute a dreamer. Yet his success is in theory, and not in practice, and he feeds our faith rather than contents our understanding. His book wants order, serenity, dignity, everything but it does not fail to impart what only man can impart to man of much importance, his own faith. It is true his dreams are not thrilling nor bright enough, and he leaves off to dream where he who dreams just before the dawn begins. His castles in the air fall to the ground, because they are not built lofty enough, they should be secured to heaven's roof. After all, the theories and speculations of men concern us more than their puny execution. It is with a certain coldness and languor that we loiter about the actual and so-called practical. How little do the most wonderful inventions of modern times detain us. They insult nature. Every machine, or particular application, seems a slight outrage against universal laws. How many fine inventions are there which do not clutter the ground? We think that those only succeed which minister to our sensible and animal wants, which bake or brew, wash or warm, or the like. But are those of no account which are patented by fancy and imagination, and succeed so admirably in our dreams that they give the tone still to our waking thoughts? Already nature is serving all those uses which science slowly derives on a much higher and grander scale to him that will be served by her. When the sunshine falls on the path of the poet, he enjoys all those pure benefits and pleasures which the arts slowly and partially realize from age to age. The winds which fan his cheek waft him the sum of that profit and happiness which their lagging inventions supply. The chief fault of this book is that it aims to secure the greatest degree of gross comfort and pleasure merely. It paints a Mohammedan's heaven. And stops short with singular abruptness when we think it is drawing near to the precincts of the Christians, and we trust we have not made here a distinction without a difference. Undoubtedly if we were to reform this outward life truly and thoroughly, we should find no duty of the inner omitted. It would be employment for our whole nature. And what we should do thereafter would be as vain a question as to ask the bird what it will do when its nest is built and its brood reared. But a moral reform must take place first, and then the necessity of the other will be superseded, and we shall sail and plow by its force alone. There is a speedier way than the mechanical system can show to fill up marshes, to drown the roar of the waves, to tame hyenas, secure agreeable environs, diversify the land. And refresh it with rivulets of sweet water, and that is by the power of rectitude and true behavior. It is only for a little while, only occasionally, methinks, 
that we want a garden. Surely a good man need not be at the labor to level a hill for the sake of a prospect, or raise fruits and flowers, and construct floating islands, for the sake of a paradise. He enjoys better prospects than lie behind any hill. Where an angel travels it will be paradise all the way, but where Satan travels it will be burning marl and cinders. What says Vishnu Sarma? He whose mind is at ease is possessed of all riches. Is it not the same to one whose foot is enclosed in a shoe, as if the whole surface of the earth were covered with leather? He who is conversant with the supernal powers will not worship these inferior deities of the wind, waves, tide, and sunshine. But we would not disparage the importance of such calculations as we have described. They are truths in physics, because they are true in ethics. The moral powers no one would presume to calculate. Suppose we could compare the moral with the physical, and say how many horsepower the force of love, for instance, blowing on every square foot of a man's soul, would equal. No doubt we are well aware of this force, figures would not increase our respect for it, the sunshine is equal to but one ray of its heat. The light of the sun is but the shadow of love. The souls of men loving and fearing God, says Raleigh, receive influence from that divine light itself, whereof the sun's clarity, and that of the stars, is by Plato called but a shadow. Lumen est umbra dei, Deus est lumen luminus. Light is the shadow of God's brightness, who is the light of light, and, we may add, the heat of heat. Love is the wind, the tide, the waves, the sunshine. Its power is incalculable, it is many horsepower. It never ceases, it never slacks, it can move the globe without a resting place. It can warm without fire, it can feed without meat, it can clothe without garments, it can shelter without roof, it can make a paradise within which will dispense with a paradise without. But though the wisest men in all ages have labored to publish this force, and every human heart is, sooner or later, more or less, made to feel it, yet how little is actually applied to social ends. True, it is the motive power of all successful social machinery. But, as in physics we have made the elements do only a little drudgery for us, steam to take the place of a few horses, wind of a few oars, water of a few cranks and hand mills, as the mechanical forces have not yet been generously and largely applied to make the physical world answer to the ideal. So the power of love has been but meanly and sparingly applied, as yet. It has patented only such machines as the almshouses, the hospital, and the Bible society, while its infinite wind is still blowing, and blowing down these very structures too, from time to time. Still less are we accumulating its power, and preparing to act with greater energy at a future time. Shall we not contribute our shares to this enterprise, then? T. Homer, Ossian, Chaucer. Extracts from a lecture on poetry, read before the Concord Lyceum, November 29, 1843. First published in the Dial, Volume 4, Number 3, January, 1844. Homer. The wisest definition of poetry the poet will instantly prove false by setting aside its requisitions. We can therefore publish only our advertisement of it. There is no doubt that the loftiest written wisdom is rhymed or measured, is in form as well as substance poetry. And a volume, which should contain the condensed wisdom of mankind, need not have one rhythmless line. Yet poetry, though the last and finest result, is a natural fruit. As naturally as the oak bears an acorn, and the vine a gourd, man bears a poem either spoken or done. It is the chief and most memorable success, for history is but a prose narrative of poetic deeds. What else have the Hindus, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, done that can be told? It is the simplest relation of phenomena, and describes the commonest sensations with more truth than science does, and the latter at a distance slowly mimics its style and methods. The poet sings how the blood flows in his veins. He performs his functions, and is so well that he needs such stimulus to sing only as plants to put forth leaves and blossoms. He would strive in vain to modulate the remote and transient music which he sometimes hears, since his song is a vital function like breathing, 
and an integral result like weight. It is not the overflowing of life but its subsidence rather, and is drawn from under the feet of the poet. It is enough if Homer but say the sun sets. He is as serene as nature, and we can hardly detect the enthusiasm of the bard. It is as if nature spoke. He presents to us the simplest pictures of human life, so that childhood itself can understand them, and the man must not think twice to appreciate his naturalness. Each reader discovers for himself, that succeeding poets have done little else than copy his similes. His more memorable passages are as naturally bright, as gleams of sunlight in misty weather. Nature furnishes him not only with words, but with stereotyped lines and sentences from her mint. As from the clouds appear the full moon. All shining, and then again it goes behind the shadowy clouds. So Hector, at one time appeared among the foremost. And at another in the rear, commanding. And all with brass. He shone, like to the lightning of Aegis bearing Zeus. He conveys the least information, even the hour of the day, with such magnificence, and vast expense of natural imagery, as if it were a message from the gods. While it was dawn, and sacred day was advancing. For that space the weapons of both flew fast, and the people fell. But when now the woodcutter was preparing his morning meal. In the recesses of the mountains, and had wearied his hands. With cutting lofty trees, and satiety came to his mind. And the desire of sweet food took possession of his thoughts. Then the Danans by their valor broke the phalanxes. Shouting to their companions from rank to rank. When the army of the Trojans passed the night under arms, keeping watch lest the enemy should re embark under cover of the dark. They, thinking great things, upon the neutral ground of war, sat all the night. And many fires burned for them. As when in the heavens the stars round the bright moon appear beautiful, and the air is without wind. And all the heights, and the extreme summits. And the shady valleys appear. And the shepherd rejoices in his. So between the ships and the streams of Xanthus. Appeared the fires of the Trojans before Ilium. The white-armed goddess Juno, sent by the father of gods and men for Iris and Apollo. Went down the Idean mountains to far Olympus. As when the mind of a man. Who has come over much earth. Sallies forth, and he reflects with rapid thoughts. There was I, and there, and remembers many things. So swiftly the August Juno hastening flew through the air. And came to high Olympus. There are few books which are fit to be remembered in our wisest hours, but the Iliad is brightest in the serenest days, and embodies still all the sunlight that fell on Asia Minor. No modern joy or ecstasy of ours can lower its height or dim its luster, but there it lies in the last of literature, as it were the earliest, latest production of the mind. The ruins of Egypt oppress and stifle us with their dust, foulness preserved in cassia and pitch, and swathed in linen, the death of that which ever lived. But the rays of Greek poetry struggle down to us, and mingle with the sunbeams of the recent day. The statue of Memnon is cast down, but the shaft of the Iliad still meets the sun in his rising. So too, no doubt, Homer had his Homer, and Orpheus his Orpheus, in the dim antiquity which preceded them. The mythological system of the ancients, and it is still the only mythology of the moderns, the poem of mankind, interwoven so wonderfully with their astronomy. And matching in grandeur and harmony with the architecture of the heavens themselves, seems to point to a time when a mightier genius inhabited the earth. But man is the great poet, and not Homer nor Shakespeare, and our language itself, and the common arts of life are his work. Poetry is so universally true and independent of experience, that it does not need any particular biography to illustrate it, but we refer it sooner or later to some Orpheus or Linus. And after ages to the genius of humanity, and the gods themselves. Ashen. The genuine remains of Ashen, though of less fame and extent, are in many respects of the same stamp with the Iliad itself. He asserts the dignity of the bard no less than Homer, and in his era we hear of no other priest than he. 
it will not avail to call him a heathen because he personifies the sun and addresses it. And what if his heroes did worship the ghosts of their father, their thin, airy, and unsubstantial forms? We but worship the ghosts of our fathers in more substantial forms. We cannot but respect the vigorous faith of those heathen, who sternly believed somewhat, and are inclined to say to the critics, who are offended by their superstitious rites. Don't interrupt these men's prayers. As if we knew more about human life and a god, than the heathen and ancients. Does English theology contain the recent discoveries? Ashen reminds us of the most refined and rudest eras, of Homer, Pindar, Isaiah, and the American Indian. In his poetry, as in Homer's, only the simplest and most enduring features of humanity are seen, such essential parts of a man as Stonehenge exhibits of a temple. We see the circles of stone, and the upright shaft alone. The phenomena of life acquire almost an unreal and gigantic size seen through his mists. Like all older and grander poetry, it is distinguished by the few elements in the lives of its heroes. They stand on the heath, between the stars and the earth, shrunk to the bones and sinews. The earth is a boundless plain for their deeds. They lead such a simple, dry, and everlasting life, as hardly needs to part with the flesh, but is transmitted entire from age to age. There are but few objects to distract their sight, and their life is as unencumbered as the course of the stars they gaze at. The wrathful kings, on cairns apart, look forward from behind their shields, and mark the wandering stars. That brilliant westward move. It does not cost much for these heroes to live. They want not much furniture. They are such forms of men only as can be seen afar through the mist, and have no costume nor dialect, but for language there is the tongue itself. And for costume there are always the skins of beasts and the bark of trees to be had. They live out their years by the vigor of their constitutions. They survive storms and the spears of their foes, and perform a few heroic deeds, and then. Mounds will answer questions of them. For many future years. Blind and infirm, they spend the remnant of their days listening to the lays of the bards, and feeling the weapons which laid their enemies low, and when at length they die. By a convulsion of nature, the bard allows a short misty glance into futurity, yet as clear, perchance, as their lives had been. When Macroin was slain, his soul departed to his warlike sires. To follow misty forms of boars. In tempestuous islands bleak. The hero's cairn is erected, and the bard sings a brief significant strain, which will suffice for epitaph and biography. The weak will find his bow in the dwelling. The feeble will attempt to bend it. Compared with this simple, fibrous life, our civilized history appears the chronicle of debility, of fashion, and the arts of luxury. But the civilized man misses no real refinement in the poetry of the rudest era. It reminds him that civilization does but dress men. It makes shoes, but it does not toughen the soles of the feet. It makes cloth of finer texture, but it does not touch the skin. Inside the civilized man stands the savage still in the place of honor. We are those blue-eyed, yellow-haired Saxons, those slender, dark-haired Normans. The profession of the bard attracted more respect in those days from the importance attached to fame. It was his province to record the deeds of heroes. When Ashen hears the traditions of inferior bards, he exclaims. I straightway seize the unfutile tales. And send them down in faithful verse. His philosophy of life is expressed in the opening of the third duan of C.A. Loden. Whence have sprung the things that are? And whither roll the passing years? Where does time conceal its two heads? In dense impenetrable gloom. Its surface marked with heroes' deeds alone? I view the generations gone. The past appears but dim. As objects by the moon's faint beams. Reflected from a distant lake. I see, indeed, the thunderbolts of war. But there the unmighty joyless dwell. All those who send not down their deeds. To far, succeeding times. 
The ignoble warriors die and are forgotten. Strangers come to build a tower. And throw their ashes overhand. Somo rusted swords appear in dust. One, bending forward, says. The arms belonged to heroes gone. We never heard their praise in song. The grandeur of the similes is another feature which characterizes great poetry. Ashen seems to speak a gigantic and universal language. The images and pictures occupy even much space in the landscape, as if they could be seen only from the sides of mountains, and plains with a wide horizon, or across arms of the sea. The machinery is so massive that it cannot be less than natural. Oivana says to the spirit of her father, Guyherd Torkil of Torna, seen in the skies. Thou glidest away like receding ships. So when the hosts of Fingal and Starn approached to battle. With murmurs loud, like rivers far. The race of Torna hither moved. And when compelled to retire. Dragging his spear behind. Cugelin sank in the distang wood. Like a fi upblazing ere it dies. Nor did Fingal want a proper audience when he spoke. A thousand orators inclined. To hear the lay of Fingal. The threats too would have deterred a man. Vengeance and terror were real. Trenmore threatens the young warrior, whom he meets on a foreign strand. Thy mother shall find thee pale on the shore. While lessening on the waves she spies. The sails of him who slew her son. If Oshin's heroes weep, it is from excess of strength, and not from weakness, a sacrifice or libation of fertile natures, like the perspiration of stone in summer's heat. We hardly know that tears have been shed, and it seems as if weeping were proper only for babes and heroes. Their joy and their sorrow are made of one stuff, like rain and snow, the rainbow and the mist. When Philon was worsted in fight, and ashamed in the presence of Fingal, he strode away forthwith, and bent in grief above a stream, his cheeks bedewed with tears. From time to time the thistles gray. He lopped with his inverted lance. Crodar, blind and old, receives Oshin, son of Fingal, who comes to aid him in war. My eyes have failed, says he, Crodar is blind. Is thy strength like that of thy father's? Stretch, Oshin, thine arm to the hoary-haired. I gave my arm to the king. The aged hero seized my hand. He heaved a heavy sigh. Tears flowed incessant down his cheek. Strong art thou, son of the mighty. Though not so dreadful as Morvan's prince. Vertical ellipsis. Let my feast be spread in the hall. Let every sweet-voiced minstrel sing. Great is he who is within my wall. Sons of wave-echoing Chroma. Even Oshin himself, the hero bard, pays tribute to the superior strength of his father Fingal. How beauteous, mighty man, was thy mind! Why succeeded Oshin without its strength? Chaucer. What a contrast between the stern and desolate poetry of Oshin, and that of Chaucer, and even of Shakespeare and Milton, much more of Dryden, and Pope, and Gray. Our summer of English poetry, like the Greek and Latin before it, seems well advanced toward its fall, and laden with the fruit and foliage of the season, with bright autumnal tints. But soon the winter will scatter its myriad clustering and shading leaves, and leave only a few desolate and fibrous boughs to sustain the snow and rime, and creak in the blasts of ages. We cannot escape the impression, that the muse has stooped a little in her flight, when we come to the literature of civilized eras. Now first we hear of various ages and styles of poetry, but the poetry of runic monuments is for every age. The bard has lost the dignity and sacredness of his office. He has no more bardic rage, and only conceives the deed, which he formerly stood ready to perform. Hosts of warriors, earnest for battle, could not mistake nor dispense with the ancient bard. His lays were heard in the pauses of the fight. There was no danger of his being overlooked by his contemporaries. But now the hero and the bard are of different professions. When we come to the pleasant English verse, it seems as if the storms had all cleared away, and it would never thunder and lighten more. 
The poet has come within doors, and exchanged the forest and crag for the fireside, the hut of the gale, and Stonehenge with its circles of stones, for the house of the Englishman. No hero stands at the door prepared to break forth into song or heroic action, but we have instead a homely Englishman, who cultivates the art of poetry. We see the pleasant fireside, and hear the crackling faggots in all the verse. The towering and misty imagination of the bard has descended into the plain, and become a lowlander, and keeps flocks and herds. Poetry is one man's trade, and not all men's religion, and is split into many styles. It is pastoral, and lyric, and narrative, and didactic. Notwithstanding the broad humanity of Chaucer, and the many social and domestic comforts which we meet with in his verse, we have to narrow our vision somewhat to consider him. As if he occupied less space in the landscape, and did not stretch over hill and valley as Ossian does. Yet, seen from the side of posterity, as the father of English poetry, preceded by a long silence of confusion in history, unenlivened by any strain of pure melody, we easily come to reverence him. Passing over the earlier continental poets, since we are bound to the pleasant archipelago of English poetry, Chaucer's is the first name after that misty weather in which Ossian lived. Which can detain us long. Indeed, though he represents so different a culture and society, he may be regarded as in many respects the Homer of the English poets. Perhaps he is the youthfulest of them all. We return to him as to the purest well, the fountain furthest removed from the highway of desultory life. He is so natural and cheerful, compared with later poets, that we might almost regard him as a personification of spring. To the faithful reader his muse has even given an aspect to his times, and when he is fresh from perusing him, they seem related to the golden age. It is still the poetry of youth and life, rather than of thought. And though the moral vein is obvious and constant, it has not yet banished the sun and daylight from his verse the loftiest strains of the muse are, for the most part, sublimely plaintive. And not a carol as free as nature's. The content which the sun shines to celebrate from morning to evening is unsung. The muse solaces herself, and is not ravished but consoled. There is a catastrophe implied, and a tragic element in all our verse, and less of the lark and morning dews, than of the nightingale and evening shades. But in Homer and Chaucer there is more of the innocence and serenity of youth, than in the more modern and moral poets. The Iliad is not Sabbath but morning reading, and men cling to this old song, because they have still moments of unbaptized and uncommitted life, which give them an appetite for more. He represents no creed nor opinion, and we read him with a rare sense of freedom and irresponsibility, as if we trod on native ground, and were autochthonies of the soil. Chaucer had eminently the habits of a literary man and a scholar. We do not enough allow for the prevalence of this class. There were never any time so stirring, that there were not to be found some sedentary still. Through all those outwardly active ages, there were still monks in cloisters writing or copying folios. He was surrounded by the din of arms. The battles of Halidon Hill and Neville's Cross, and the still more memorable battles of Cressy and Poitiers, were fought in his youth, but these did not concern our poet much, Wycliffe much more. He seems to have regarded himself always as one privileged to sit and converse with books. He helped to establish the literary class. His character, as one of the fathers of the English language, would alone make his works important, even those which have little poetical merit. A great philosophical and moral poet gives permanence to the language he uses, by making the best sound convey the best sense. He was as simple as Wordsworth in preferring his homely but vigorous Saxon tongue, when it was neglected by the court, and had not yet attained to the dignity of a literature. And rendered a similar service to his country to that which Dante rendered to Italy. If Greek sufficeth for Greek, and Arabic for Arabian, and Hebrew for Jew, and Latin for Latin, then English shall suffice for him. For any of these will serve to teach truth, right as diverse paths leaden divers folky the right way to Rome. In the testament of love he writes, Let then clerks enditon in Latin, for they have the proper tick of science, and the knowinga in that faculty. And let Frenchmen in their French also enditon their quaint terms, for it is kindly to their mouths, 
and let us show our fantasies in Soch wards as we learn it in of our dame's tange. He will know how to appreciate Chaucer best, who has come down to him the natural way, through the meagre pastures of Saxon and anti Chaucerian poetry. And yet so human and wise he seems after such diet, that he is liable to misjudge him still. In the Saxon poetry extant, in the earliest English, and the contemporary Scottish poetry, there is less to remind the reader of the rudeness and vigor of youth. Than of the feebleness of a declining age. It is for the most part translation or imitation merely, with only an occasional and slight tinge of poetry, and oftentimes the falsehood and exaggeration of fable. Without its imagination to redeem it. It is astonishing to how few thoughts so many sincere efforts give utterance. But as they never sprang out of nature, so they will never root themselves in nature. There are few traces of original genius, and we look in vain to find antiquity restored, humanized, and made blithe again, by the discovery of some natural sympathy between it and the present. But when we come to Chaucer we are relieved of many a load. He is fresh and modern still, and no dust settles on his true passages. It lightens along the line, and we are reminded that flowers have bloomed, and birds sung, and hearts beaten, in England. Before the earnest gaze of the reader the rust and moss of time gradually drop off, and the original green life is revealed. He was a homely and domestic man, and did breathe quite as modern men do. Only one trait, one little incident of human biography needs to be truly recorded, that all the world may think the author fit to wear the laurel crown. In the earth we have described, and at this distance of time, the bare processes of living read like poetry, for all of human good or ill, heroic or vulgar, lies very near to them. All that is truly great and interesting to men, runs thus as level a course, and is as unaspiring, as the plough in the furrow. There is no wisdom which can take place of humanity, and we find that in Chaucer. We can expand in his breadth and think we could be that man's acquaintance. He was worthy to be a citizen of England, while Petrarch and Boccaccio lived in Italy, and Tell and Tamerlane in Switzerland and in Asia, and Bruce in Scotland, and Wycliffe and Gower. And Edward III, and John of Gaunt, and the Black Prince, were his own countrymen. All stout and stirring names. The fame of Roger Bacon came down from the preceding century, and the name of Dante still exerted the influence of a living presence. On the whole, Chaucer impresses us, as greater than his reputation, and not a little like Homer and Shakespeare, for he would have held up his head in their company. Among early English poets he is the landlord and host, and has the authority of such. The affectionate mention, which succeeding early poets make of him, coupling him with Homer and Virgil, is to be taken into the account in estimating his character and influence. King James and Dunbar of Scotland speak with more love and reverence of him, than any modern author of his predecessors of the last century. The same childlike relation is without parallel now. We read him without criticism for the most part, for he pleads not his own cause, but speaks for his readers, and has that greatness of trust and reliance which compels popularity. He confides in the reader, and speaks privily with him, keeping nothing back. And in return his reader has great confidence in him, that he tells no lies, and reads his story with indulgence, as if it were the circumlocution of a child. But discovers afterwards that he has spoken with more directness and economy of words than a sage. He is never heartless. For first the thing is thought within the heart. Ere any word out from the mouth a start. And so new was all his theme in those days, that he had not to invent, but only to call. We admire Chaucer for his sturdy English wit. The easy height he speaks from in his prologue to the Canterbury Tales, as if he were equal to any of the company there assembled, is as good as any particular excellence in it. But though it is full of good sense and humanity, it is not transcendent poetry. For picturesque description of persons it is, perhaps, without a parallel in English poetry. Yet it is essentially humorous, as the loftiest genius never is. Humor, however broad and genial, takes a narrower view than enthusiasm. The whole story of Chanticleer and Dame Partlet, in the Nons Priest's Tale, is genuine humanity. 
I know of nothing better in its kind, no more successful fabling of birds and beasts. If it is said of Shakespeare, that he is now Hamlet, and then Falstaff, it may be said of Chaucer that he sympathizes with brutes as well as men, and assumes their nature that he may speak from it. In this tale he puts on the very feathers and stature of the cock. To his own finer vein he added all the common wit and wisdom of his time, and everywhere in his works his remarkable knowledge of the world, and nice perception of character. His rare common sense and proverbial wisdom, are apparent. His genius does not soar like Milton's, but is genial and familiar. It shows great tenderness and delicacy, but not the heroic sentiment. It is only a greater portion of humanity with all its weakness. It is not heroic, as Raleigh's, nor pious, as Herbert's, nor philosophical, as Shakespeare's, but is the child of the English muse, that child which is the father of the man. It is for the most part only an exceeding naturalness, perfect sincerity, with the behavior of a child rather than of a man. Gentleness and delicacy of character is everywhere apparent in his verse. The simplest and humblest words come readily to his lips. No one can read the prior's tale, understanding the spirit in which it was written, and in which the child sings, O Alma Redemptoris Mater. Or the account of the departure of Constance with her child upon the sea, in the man of law's tale, without feeling the native innocence and refinement of the author. Nor can we be mistaken respecting the essential purity of his character, disregarding the apology of the manners of the age. His sincere sorrow in his later days for the grossness of his earlier works, and that he cannot recall and annul much that he had written, but, alas, they are now continued from man to man. And I cannot do what I desire, is not to be forgotten. A simple pathos and feminine gentleness, which Wordsworth occasionally approaches, but does not equal, are peculiar to him. We are tempted to say, that his genius was feminine, not masculine. It was such a feminineness, however, as is rarest of find in woman, though not the appreciation of it. Perhaps it is not to be found at all in woman, but is only the feminine in man. Such pure, childlike love of nature is not easily to be matched. Nor is it strange, that the poetry of so rude an age should contain such sweet and polished praise of nature, for her charms are not enhanced by civilization, as societies are. But by her own original and permanent refinement she at last subdues and educates man. Chaucer's remarkably trustful and affectionate character appears in his familiar, yet innocent and reverent, manner of speaking of his God. He comes into his thought without any false reverence, and with no more parade than the zephyr to his ear. If nature is our mother, then God is our father. There is less love and simple practical trust in Shakespeare and Milton. How rarely in our English tongue do we find expressed any affection for God. There is no sentiment so rare as the love of God. Herbert almost alone expresses it, Ah, my dear God! Our poet uses similar words, and whenever he sees a beautiful person, or other object, prides himself on the mastery of his God. He reverently recommends Dido to be his bride. If that God that heaven and earth made would have a love for beauty and goodness, and womanheed, trouth, and semeliness, he supplies the place to his imagination of the saints of the Catholic calendar, and has none of the attributes of a Scandinavian deity. But, in justification of our praise, we must refer the hearer to his works themselves, to the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, the account of gentleness, the flower and the leaf. The stories of Griselda, Virginia, Ariadne, and Blanche the Duchess, and much more of less distinguished merit. There are many poets of more taste and better manners, who knew how to leave out their dullness, but such negative genius cannot detain us long, we shall return to Chaucer still with love. Even the clown has taste, whose dictates, though he disregards them, are higher and purer than those which the artist obeys. And some natures, which are rude and ill-developed, have yet a higher standard of perfection, than others which are refined and well-balanced. Though the peasant's cot is dark, it has the evening star for taper, while the nobleman's saloon is meanly lighted. If we have to wander through many dull and prosaic passages in Chaucer, 
we have at least the satisfaction of knowing that it is not an artificial dullness. But too easily matched by many passages in life, and it is, perhaps more pleasing, after all, to meet with a fine thought in its natural setting. We confess we feel a disposition commonly to concentrate sweets, and accumulate pleasures, but the poet may be presumed always to speak as a traveller, who leads us through a varied scenery. From one eminence to another, and, from time to time, a single casual thought rises naturally and inevitably, with such majesty and escort only as the first stars at evening. And surely fate has enshrined it in these circumstances for some end. Nature strews her nuts and flowers broadcast, and never collects them into heaps. This was the soil it grew in, and this the hour it bloomed in, if sun, wind, and rain, came here to cherish and expand the flower, shall not we come here to pluck it? Poetry. A true poem is distinguished, not so much by a felicitous expression or any thought it suggests, as by the atmosphere which surrounds it. Most have beauty of outline merely, and are striking as the form and bearing of a stranger, but true verses come toward us indistinctly, as the very kernel of all friendliness. And envelope us in their spirit and fragrance. Much of our poetry has the very best manners, but no character. It is only an unusual precision and elasticity of speech, as if its author had taken, not an intoxicating draught, but an electuary. It has the distinct outline of sculpture, and chronicles an early hour. Under the influence of passion all men speak thus distinctly, but wrath is not always divine. There are two classes of men called poets. The one cultivates life, the other art, one seeks food for nutriment, the other for flavor, one satisfies hunger, the other gratifies the palate. There are two kinds of writing, both great and rare, one that of genius, or the inspired, the other of intellect and taste, in the intervals of inspiration. The former is above criticism, always correct, giving the law to criticism. It vibrates and pulsates with life forever. It is sacred, and to be read with reverence, as the works of nature are studied. There are few instances of a sustained style of this kind. Perhaps every man has spoken words, but the speaker is then careless of the record. Such a style removes us out of personal relations with its author, we do not take his words on our lips, but his sense into our hearts. It is the stream of inspiration, which bubbles out, now here, now there, now in this man, now in that. It matters not through what ice crystals it is seen, now a fountain, now the ocean stream running underground. It is in Shakespeare, Alpheus, in Burns, Arethus, but ever the same. The other is self-possessed and wise. It is reverent of genius, and greedy of inspiration. It is conscious in the highest and the least degree. It consists with the most perfect command of the faculties. It dwells in a repose as of the desert, and objects are as distinct in it as oases or palms in the horizon of sand. The train of thought moves with subdued and measured step like a caravan. But the pen is only an instrument in its hand, and not instinct with life, like a longer arm. It leaves a thin varnish or glaze over all its work. The works of Goethe furnish remarkable instances of the latter. There is no just and serene criticism as yet. Our taste is too delicate and particular. It says nay to the poet's work, but never yet to his hope. It invites him to adorn his deformities, and not to cast them off by expansion, as the tree its bark. We are a people who live in a bright light, in houses of pearl and porcelain, and drink only light wines, whose teeth are easily set on edge by the least natural sour. If we had been consulted, the backbone of the earth would have been made, not of granite, but of Bristol spar. A modern author would have died in infancy in a ruder age. But the poet is something more than a scald, a smoother and polisher of language. He is a Cincinnatus in literature, and occupies no west end of the world, but, like the sun, indifferently selects his rhymes. And with a liberal taste weaves into his verse the planet and the stubble. In these old books the stucco has long since crumbled away, and we read what was sculptured in the granite. They are rude and massive in their proportions, rather than smooth and delicate in their finish. 
The workers in stone polish only their chimney ornaments, but their pyramids are roughly done. There is a soberness in a rough aspect, as of unhewn granite, which addresses a depth in us, but a polished surface hits only the ball of the eye. The true finish is the work of time and the use to which a thing is put. The elements are still polishing the pyramids. Art may varnish and gild, but it can do no more. A work of genius is rough-hewn from the first, because it anticipates the lapse of time, and has an ingrained polish, which still appears when fragments are broken off. An essential quality of its substance. Its beauty is at the same time its strength, and it breaks with a luster. The great poem must have the stamp of greatness as well as its essence. The reader easily goes within the shallowest contemporary poetry, and informs it with all the life and promise of the day, as the pilgrim goes within the temple. And hears the faintest strains of the worshippers. But it will have to speak to posterity, traversing these deserts through the ruins of its outmost walls, by the grandeur and beauty of its proportions. Herald of Freedom 6. First published in the Dial, Volume 4, No. 4, April, 1844. We have occasionally, for several years, met with a number of this spirited journal, edited, as abolitionists need not to be informed, by Nathaniel P. Rogers, once a counselor at law in Plymouth, still farther up the Merrimack, but now, in his riper years, come down the hills thus far, to be the herald of freedom to these parts. We have been refreshed not a little by the cheap cordial of his editorials, flowing like his own mountain torrents, now clear and sparkling, now foaming and gritty. And always spiced with the essence of the fir and the Norway pine. But never dark nor muddy, nor threatening with smothered murmurs, like the rivers of the plain. The effect of one of his effusions reminds us of what the hydropathists say about the electricity in fresh spring water, compared with that which has stood overnight to suit weak nerves. We do not know of another notable and public instance of such pure, youthful, and hearty indignation at all wrong. The church itself must love it, if it have any heart, though he is said to have dealt rudely with its sanctity. His clean attachment to the right, however, sanctions the severest rebuke we have read. We have neither room, nor inclination, to criticize this paper, or its cause, at length, but would speak of it in the free and uncalculating spirit of its author. Mr. Rogers seems to us to have occupied an honorable and manly position in these days, and in this country, making the press a living and breathing organ to reach the hearts of men. And not merely, fine paper and good type, with its civil pilot sitting aft, and magnanimously waiting for the news to arrive, the vehicle of the earliest news. But the latest intelligence, recording the indubitable and last results, the marriages and deaths, alone. The present editor is wide awake, and standing on the beak of his ship. Not as a scientific explorer under government, but a Yankee sealer rather, who makes those unexplored continents his harbors in which to refit for more adventurous cruises. He is a fund of news and freshness in himself, has the gift of speech, and the knack of writing. And if anything important takes place in the granite state, we may be sure that we shall hear of it in good season. No other paper that we know of keeps pace so well with one forward wave of the restless public thought and sentiment of New England. And asserts so faithfully and ingenuously the largest liberty in all things. There is, beside, more unpledged poetry in his prose than in the verses of many an accepted rhymer. And we are occasionally advertised by a mellow hunter's note from his trumpet, that, unlike most reformers, his feet are still where they should be, on the turf. And that he looks out from a serener natural life into the turbid arena of politics. Nor is slavery always a somber theme with him, but invested with the colors of his wit and fancy, and an evil to be abolished by other means than sorrow and bitterness of complaint. He will fight this fight with what cheer may be. But to speak of his composition. It is a genuine Yankee style, without fiction, real guessing and calculating to some purpose, and reminds us occasionally, as does all free, brave, and original writing. Of its great master in these days, Thomas Carlyle. It has a life above grammar, and a meaning which need not be parsed to be understood. But like those same mountain torrents, 
there is rather too much slope to his channel, and the rainbow sprays and evaporations go double quick time to heaven. While the body of his water falls headlong to the plain. We would have more pause and deliberation, occasionally, if only to bring his tide to a head, more frequent expansions of the stream, still, bottomless mountain tarns, perchance inland seas. And at length the deep ocean itself. We cannot do better than enrich our pages with a few extracts from such articles as we have at hand. Who can help sympathizing with his righteous impatience, when invited to hold his peace or endeavor to convince the understandings of the people by well-ordered arguments? Bandy compliments and arguments with the somnambulist, on Table Rock, when all the waters of Lake Superior are thundering in the great horseshoe, and deafening the very war of the elements. Would you not shout to him with a clap of thunder through a speaking trumpet, if you could command it, if possible to reach his senses in his appalling extremity? Did Jonah argufy with the city of Nineveh, yet forty days, cried the vagabond prophet, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was his salutation. And did the property and standing turn up their noses at him, and set the mob on to him? Did the clergy discountenance him, and call him extravagant, misguided, a divider of churches, a disturber of parishes? What would have become of that city, if they had done this? Did they approve his principles but dislike his measures and his spirit? Slavery must be cried down, denounced down, ridiculed down, and pro-slavery with it, or rather before it. Slavery will go when pro-slavery starts. The sheep will follow when the bellwether leads. Down, then, with the bloody system, out of the land with it, and out of the world with it, into the Red Sea with it. Men shy and tea be enslaved in this country any longer. Women and children shy and tea be flogged here any longer. If you undertake to hinder us, the worst is your own. But this is all fanaticism. Wait and see. He thus raises the anti slavery war whoop in New Hampshire, when an important convention is to be held, sending the summons. To none but the whole hearted, fully committed. Cross the Rubicon spirits. From rich old Cheshire, from Rockingham, with her horizon setting down away to the salt sea. From where the sun sets behind Kearsarge, even to where he rises gloriously over Moses Norris's own town of Pittsfield, and from Amiskeg to Ragged Mountains, Coos, Upper Coos. Home of the everlasting hills, send out your bold advocates of human rights, wherever they lay, scattered by lonely lake, or Indian stream. Or, grant or location, from the trout-haunted brooks of the Amoriskagan, and where the adventurous streamlet takes up its mountain march for the Esti. Lawrence. Scattered and insulated men, wherever the light of philanthropy and liberty has beamed in upon your solitary spirits, come down to us like your streams and clouds, and our own Grafton. All about among your dear hills, and your mountain-flanked valleys, whether you home along the swift Ammonusuk, the cold Pemigewasset, or the oxbowed Connecticut. We are slow, brethren, dishonorably slow, in a cause like ours. Our feet should be as, Heinz, feet. Liberty lies bleeding. The leaden-colored wing of slavery obscures the land with its baleful shadow. Let us come together, and inquire at the hand of the Lord, what is to be done. And again. On occasion of a New England convention, in the Second Advent Tabernacle, in Boston, he desires to try one more blast, as it were, on Fabian's white mountain horn. Ho, then, people of the Bay State, men, women, and children. Children, women, and men, scattered friends of the friendless, wheresoever ye inhabit, if habitations ye have. As such friends have not always, along the sea-beat border of old Essex and the Puritan landing, and up beyond sight of the sea-cloud, among the inland hills. Where the sun rises and sets upon the dry land, in that vale of the Connecticut, too fair for human content and too fertile for virtuous industry, where deepens that haughtiest of earth's streams. On its seaward way, proud with the pride of old Massachusetts. Are there any friends of the friendless Negro haunting such a valley as this? In God's name, I fear there are none, or few, for the very scene looks apathy and oblivion to the genius of humanity. I blow you the summons, though. 
Come, if any of you are there. And gallant little Rhode Island, transcendent abolitionists of the tiny commonwealth. I need not call you. You are called the year round, and, instead of sleeping in your tents, stand harnessed, and with trumpets in your hands, every one. Connecticut. Yonder, the home of the Burleys, the Monroes, and the Hudsons, and the native land of old George Benson. Are you ready? All ready. Maine here, off east, looking for my mountain post like an everglade. Where is your Sam? Fessenden, who stood stormproof against new organization in 38? Has he too much name as a jurist and orator to be found at a New England convention in 43? God forbid. Come one and all of you from down east to Boston on the 30th, and let the sails of your coasters whiten all the sea road. Alas! There are scarce enough of you to man a fishing boat. Come up, mighty in your fewness. And green Vermont, what has become of your anti slavery host, thick as your mountain maples, mastering your very politics, not by balance of power, but by sturdy majority? Where are you now? Will you be at the Advent meeting on the 30th of May? Has anti slavery waxed too trying for your offhand, how are ye, humanity? Have you heard the voice of freedom of late? Next week we'll answer. Poor, cold, winter-ridden New Hampshire, winter-killed, I like to have said, she will be there, barefoot, and barelegged, making tracks like her old bloody-footed volunteers at Trenton. She will be there, if she can work her passage. I guess her minstrelsy will, for birds can go independently of car or tardy stagecoach. Let them come as Macaulay says they did to the siege of Rome, when they did not leave old men and women enough to begin the harvests. Oh how few we should be, if every soul of us were there! How few, and yet it is the entire muster roll of freedom for all the land. We should have to beat up for recruits to complete the army of Gideon, or the platoon at the Spartan Straits. The foe are like the grasshoppers for multitude, as for moral power. Thick grass mows the easier, as the goth said of the enervated millions of falling Rome. They can't stand too thick, nor too tall for the anti-slavery scythe. Only be there at the mowing. In noticing the doings of another convention. He thus congratulates himself on the liberty of speech which anti-slavery concedes to all, even to the Folsoms and Lamsons. Denied a chance to speak elsewhere. Because they are not mad after the fashion, they all flock to the anti-slavery boards as a kind of asylum. And so the poor old enterprise has to father all the oddity of the times. It is a glory to anti-slavery that she can allow the poor friends the right of speech. I hope she will always keep herself able to afford it. Let the constables wait on the state house, and jail, and the meeting houses. Let the doorkeeper at the anti-slavery hall be that tall, celestial-faced woman, that carries the flag on the national standard, and says, without concealment, as well as, without compromise. Let everybody in who has sanity enough to see the beauty of brotherly kindness, and let them say their fantasies, and magnanimously bear with them, seeing unkind pro-slavery drives them in upon us. We shall have saner and sensibler meetings then, than all others in the land put together. More recently, Speaking of the use which some of the clergy have made of Webster's plea in the Gerard case, as a seasonable aid to the church, he proceeds. Webster is a great man. And the clergy run under his wing. They had better employ him as counsel against the come-outers. He wouldn't trust the defense on the Gerard will plea though, if they did. He would not risk his fame on it, as a religious argument. He would go and consult William Bassett, of Lynn, on the principles of the come-outers, to learn their strength. And he would get him a testament, and go into it as he does into the Constitution. And after a year's study of it he would hardly come off in the argument as he did from the conflict with Carolina Hayne. On looking into the case, he would advise the clergy not to go to trial, to settle, or, if they couldn't, to leave it out, to a reference of orthodox deacons. We will quote from the same sheet his indignant and touching satire on the funeral of those public officers who were killed by the explosion on board the Princeton. Together with the President's slave. 
an accident which reminds us how closely slavery is linked with the government of this nation. The president coming to preside over a nation of free men, and the man who stands next to him a slave. I saw a count, says he, of the burial of those slaughtered politicians. The hearses passed along, of Upshur, Gilmer, Kennan, Maxey, and Gardner, but the dead slave, who fell in company with them on the deck of the Princeton, was not there. He was held there equal by the impartial gunburst, but not allowed by the bereaved nation a share in the funeral. Out upon their funeral, and upon the paltry procession that went in its train. Why didn't they inquire for the body of the other man who fell on that deck? And why hasn't the nation inquired, and its press? I saw a count of the scene in a barbarian print, called the Boston Atlas, and it was dumb on the absence of that body, as if no such man had fallen. Why, I demand in the name of human nature, was that sixth man of the game brought down by that great shot? Left unburied and above ground, for there is no account yet that his body has been allowed the right of sepulture. They didn't bury him even as a slave. They didn't assign him a Jim Crow place in that solemn procession, that he might follow to wait upon his enslavers in the land of spirits. They have gone there without slaves or waiters. The poor black man, they enslaved and embruted him all his life, and now he is dead, they have, for aught appears, left him to decay in waste above ground. Let the civilized world take note of the circumstance. We deem such timely, pure, and unpremeditated expressions of a public sentiment, such publicity of genuine indignation and humanity, as abound everywhere in this journal. The most generous gifts which a man can make, and should be glad to see the scraps from which we have quoted, and the others which we have not seen, collected into a volume. It might, perchance, penetrate into some quarters which the unpopular cause of freedom has not reached. Long may we hear the voice of this herald. H. D. T. Wendell Phillips before the Concord Lyceum. Letter to the Editor of the Liberator, March 28, 1845. Mr. Editor. We have now, for the third winter, had our spirits refreshed, and our faith in the destiny of the Commonwealth strengthened, by the presence and the eloquence of Wendell Phillips. And we wish to tender to him our thanks and our sympathy. The admission of this gentleman into the Lyceum has been strenuously opposed by a respectable portion of our fellow citizens, who themselves, we trust, whose descendants, at least. We know, will be as faithful conservers of the true order, whenever that shall be the order of the day, and in each instance the people have voted that they would hear him. By coming themselves and bringing their friends to the lecture room, and being very silent that they might hear. We saw some men and women, who had long ago come out, going in once more through the free and hospitable portals of the Lyceum. And many of our neighbors confessed, that they had had a sound season this once. It was the speaker's aim to show what the state, and above all the church, had to do, and now, alas, have done, with Texas and slavery, and how much, on the other hand, the individual should have to do with church and state. These were fair themes, and not mistimed. And his words were addressed to, fit audience, and not few. We must give Mr. Phillips the credit of being a clean, erect, and what was once called a consistent man. He at least is not responsible for slavery, nor for American independence, for the hypocrisy and superstition of the church, nor the timidity and selfishness of the state. Nor for the indifference and willing ignorance of any. He stands so distinctly, so firmly, and so effectively alone, and one honest man is so much more than a host. That we cannot but feel that he does himself injustice when he reminds us of the American society, which he represents. It is rare that we have the pleasure of listening to so clear and orthodox a speaker, who obviously has so few cracks or flaws in his moral nature, who, having words at his command in a remarkable degree, has much more than words, if these should fail, in his unquestionable earnestness and integrity, and, aside from their admiration at his rhetoric, secures the genuine respect of his audience. He unconsciously tells his biography as he proceeds, and we see him early and earnestly deliberating on these subjects, and wisely and bravely, without counsel or consent of any. 
occupying a ground at first from which the varying tides of public opinion cannot drive him. No one could mistake the genuine modesty and truth with which he affirmed, when speaking of the framers of the Constitution, I am wiser than they. Who with him has improved these sixty years' experience of its working? Or the uncompromising consistency and frankness of the prayer which concluded, not like the Thanksgiving proclamations, with, God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But, God dash it into a thousand pieces, till there shall not remain a fragment on which a man can stand, and dare not tell his name, referring to the case of Frederick. To our disgrace we know not what to call him, unless Scotland will lend us the spoils of one of her Douglases, out of history or fiction, for a season. Till we be hospitable and brave enough to hear his proper name, a fugitive slave in one more sense than we who has proved himself the possessor of a fair intellect, and has won a colorless reputation in these parts. And who, we trust, will be as superior to degradation from the sympathies of freedom, as from the antipathies of slavery. When, said Mr. Phillips, he communicated to a new Bedford audience, the other day, his purpose of writing his life, and telling his name, and the name of his master, and the place he ran from. The murmur ran round the room, and was anxiously whispered by the sons of the pilgrims, he had better not. And it was echoed under the shadow of Concord Monument, he had better not. We would fain express our appreciation of the freedom and steady wisdom, so rare in the reformer, with which he declared that he was not born to abolish slavery, but to do right. We have heard a few, a very few, good political speakers, who afforded us the pleasure of great intellectual power and acuteness, of soldier-like steadiness, and of a graceful and natural oratory. But in this man the audience might detect a sort of moral principle and integrity, which was more stable than their firmness, more discriminating than his own intellect, and more graceful than his rhetoric, which was not working for temporary or trivial ends. It is so rare and encouraging to listen to an orator who is content with another alliance than with the popular party, or even with the sympathizing school of the martyrs. Who can afford sometimes to be his own auditor if the mob stay away, and hears himself without reproof, that we feel ourselves in danger of slandering all mankind by affirming, that here is one. Who is at the same time an eloquent speaker and a righteous man. Perhaps, on the whole, the most interesting fact elicited by these addresses, is the readiness of the people at large, of whatever sect or party, to entertain, with good will and hospitality. The most revolutionary and heretical opinions, when frankly and adequately, and in some sort cheerfully, expressed. Such clear and candid declaration of opinion served like an electuary to wet and clarify the intellect of all parties, and furnished each one with an additional argument for that right he asserted. We consider Mr. Phillips one of the most conspicuous and efficient champions of a true church and state now in the field, and would say to him, and such as are like him, God speed you. If you know of any champion in the ranks of his opponents, who has the valor and courtesy even of Paynim chivalry, if not the Christian graces and refinement of this knight, you will do us a service by directing him to these fields forthwith, where the lists are now open, and he shall be hospitably entertained. For as yet the Red Cross Knight has shown us only the gallant device upon his shield, and his admirable command of his steed, prancing and curvetting in the empty lists. But we wait to see who, in the actual breaking of lances, will come tumbling upon the plain. Thomas Carlyle and His Works First published in Graham's Magazine, Volume 30, No. 3, 4, March, April, 1847. Thomas Carlyle is a Scotchman, born about fifty years ago, at Ecclefechan, Annandale, according to one authority. His parents, good farmer people, his father an elder in the secession church there, and a man of strong native sense, whose words were said to nail a subject to the wall. We also hear of his excellent mother, still alive, and of her fine old covenanting accents, concerting with his transcendental tones. He seems to have gone to school at Annan, on the shore of the Solway Frith, and there, as he himself writes, heard of famed professors, of high matters classical, mathematical. A whole wonderland of knowledge, from Edward Irving, then a young man, fresh from Edinburgh, with college prizes, etc. Come to see our schoolmaster, 
who had also been his. From this place, they say, you can look over into Wordsworth's country. Here first he may have become acquainted with nature, with woods, such as are there, and rivers and brooks, some of whose names we have heard, and the last lapses of Atlantic billows. He got some of his education, too, more or less liberal, out of the University of Edinburgh, where, according to the same authority, he had to support himself, partly by private tuition. Translations for the booksellers, etc. And afterward, as we are glad to hear, taught an academy in Dysart, at the same time that Irving was teaching in Kirkaldy, the usual middle passage of a literary life. He was destined for the church, but not by the powers that rule man's life, made his literary debut in Fraser's magazine, long ago. Read here and there in English and French, with more or less profit, we may suppose, such of us at least as are not particularly informed. And at length found some words which spoke to his condition in the German language, and set himself earnestly to unravel that mystery, with what success many readers know. After his marriage he resided partly at Cumley Bank, Edinburgh. And for a year or two at Crajan Puttock, a wild and solitary farmhouse in the upper part of Dumfrieshire, at which last place, amid barren heather hills, he was visited by our countryman, Emerson. With Emerson he still corresponds. He was early intimate with Edward Irving, and continued to be his friend until the latter's death. Concerning this, freest, brotherliest, bravest human soul, and Carlyle's relation to him, those whom it concerns will do well to consult a notice of his death in Fraser's magazine for 1835. Reprinted in the Miscellanies. He also corresponded with Goethe. Latterly, we hear, the poet Sterling was his only intimate acquaintance in England. He has spent the last quarter of his life in London, writing books. Has the fame, as all readers know, of having made England acquainted with Germany, in late years, and done much else that is novel and remarkable in literature. He especially is the literary man of those parts. You may imagine him living in altogether a retired and simple way, with small family, in a quiet part of London, called Chelsea, a little out of the din of commerce, in Shane Row, there. Not far from the Chelsea Hospital. A little past this, and an old ivy-clad church, with its buried generations lying around it, writes one traveller, you come to an antique street running at right angles with the Thames, and a few steps from the river, you find Carlyle's name on the door. A Scotch lass ushers you into the second-story front chamber, which is the spacious workshop of the world maker. Here he sits a long time together, with many books and papers about him. Many new books, we have been told, on the upper shelves, uncut, with the author's respects, in them. In late months, with many manuscripts in an old English hand, and innumerable pamphlets, from the public libraries, relating to the Cromwellian period. Now, perhaps, looking out into the street on brick and pavement, for a change, and now upon some rod of grass ground in the rear. Or, perchance, he steps over to the British Museum, and makes that his studio for the time. This is the fore part of the day, that is the way with literary men commonly. And then in the afternoon, we presume, he takes a short run of a mile or so through the suburbs out into the country. We think he would run that way, though so short a trip might not take him to very sylvan or rustic places. In the meanwhile, people are calling to see him, from various quarters, few very worthy of being seen by him, distinguished travellers from America, not a few. To all and sundry of whom he gives freely of his yet unwritten rich and flashing soliloquy, in exchange for whatever they may have to offer. Speaking his English, as they say, with a broad Scotch accent, talking, to their astonishment and to ours, very much as he writes, a sort of Carlylese, his discourse, coming to its climaxes. Ever and anon, in long, deep, chest-shaking bursts of laughter. He goes to Scotland sometimes to visit his native heath-clad hills, having some interest still in the earth there. Such names as Crajan Puttock and Ecclefechan, which we have already quoted, stand for habitable places there to him. Or he rides to the seacoast of England in his vacations, upon his horse Yankee, bought by the sale of his books here, as we have been told. How, after all, 
he gets his living. What proportion of his daily bread he earns by day labor or job work with his pen, what he inherits, what steals, questions whose answers are so significant. And not to be omitted in his biography, we, alas, are unable to answer here. It may be worth the while to state that he is not a reformer in our sense of the term, eats, drinks, and sleeps, thinks and believes, professes and practices. Not according to the New England standard, nor to the Old English holy. Nevertheless, we are told that he is a sort of lion in certain quarters there, an amicable center for men of the most opposite opinions, and listened to as an oracle. Smoking his perpetual pipe. A rather tall, gaunt figure, with intent face, dark hair and complexion, and the air of a student. Not altogether well in body, from sitting too long in his workhouse, he, born in the border country and descended from moss troopers, it may be. We have seen several pictures of him here. One, a full-length portrait, with hat and overall, if it did not tell us much, told the fewest lies, another, we remember, was well said to have, too combed a look. One other also we have seen in which we discern some features of the man we are thinking of, but the only ones worth remembering, after all, are those which he has unconsciously drawn of himself. When we remember how these volumes came over to us, with their encouragement and provocation from month to month, and what commotion they created in many private breasts. We wonder that the country did not ring, from shore to shore, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, with its greeting. And the boons and crockets of the West make haste to hail him, whose wide humanity embraces them too. Of all that the packets have brought over to us, has there been any richer cargo than this? What else has been English news for so long a season? What else, of late years, has been England to us, to us who read books, we mean? Unless we remembered it as the scene where the age of Wordsworth was spending itself, and a few younger muses were trying their wings, and from time to time, as the residents of Landon. Carlyle alone, since the death of Coleridge, has kept the promise of England. It is the best apology for all the bustle and the sin of commerce, that it has made us acquainted with the thoughts of this man. Commerce would not concern us much if it were not for such results as this. New England owes him a debt which she will be slow to recognize. His earlier essays reached us at a time when Coleridge's were the only recent words which had made any notable impression so far, and they found a field unoccupied by him. Before yet any words of moment had been uttered in our midst. He had this advantage, too, in a teacher, that he stood near to his pupils, and he has no doubt afforded reasonable encouragement and sympathy to many an independent but solitary thinker. Through him, as usher, we have been latterly, in a great measure, made acquainted with what philosophy and criticism the nineteenth century had to offer, admitted, so to speak, to the privileges of the century. And what he may yet have to say, is still expected here with more interest than anything else from that quarter. It is remarkable, but on the whole, perhaps, not to be lamented, that the world is so unkind to a new book. Any distinguished traveller who comes to our shores is likely to get more dinners and speeches of welcome than he can well dispose of, but the best books, if noticed at all, meet with coldness and suspicion, or, what is worse, gratuitous, offhand criticism. It is plain that the reviewers, both here and abroad, do not know how to dispose of this man. They approach him too easily, as if he were one of the men of letters about town, who grace Mr. Somebody's administration, merely, but he already belongs to literature, and depends neither on the favor of reviewers, nor the honesty of booksellers, nor the pleasure of readers for his success. He has more to impart than to receive from his generation. He is another such a strong and finished workman in his craft as Samuel Johnson was, and, like him, makes the literary class respectable. As few are yet out of their apprenticeship, or, even if they learn to be able writers, are at the same time able and valuable thinkers. The aged and critical eye, especially, is incapacitated to appreciate the works of this author. To such their meaning is impalpable and evanescent, and they seem to abound only in obstinate mannerisms, germanisms, and whimsical ravings of all kinds with now and then an unaccountably true and sensible remark. 
On the strength of this last, Carlyle is admitted to have what is called genius. We hardly know an old man to whom these volumes are not hopelessly sealed. The language, they say, is foolishness and a stumbling block to them, but to many a clear-headed boy, they are plainest English, and dispatched with such hasty relish as his bread and milk. The fathers wonder how it is that the children take to this diet so readily, and digest it with so little difficulty. They shake their heads with mistrust at their free and easy delight, and remark that, Mr. Carlyle is a very learned man. For they, too, not to be out of fashion, have got grammar and dictionary, if the truth were known, and with the best faith cudgeled their brains to get a little way into the jungle. And they could not but confess, as often as they found the clue, that it was as intricate as Blackstone to follow, if you read it honestly. But merely reading, even with the best intentions, is not enough, you must almost have written these books yourself. Only he who has had the good fortune to read them in the nick of time, in the most perceptive and recipient season of life, can give any adequate account of them. Many have tasted of this well with an odd suspicion, as if it were some fountain Erethus which had flowed under the sea from Germany, as if the materials of his books had lain in some garret there. In danger of being appropriated for waste paper. Over what German ocean, from what Hercynian forest, he has been imported, piecemeal, into England, or whether he has now all arrived, we are not informed. This article is not invoiced in Hamburg nor in London. Perhaps it was contraband. However, we suspect that this sort of goods cannot be imported in this way. No matter how skillful the stevedore, all things being got into sailing trim, wait for a Sunday, and aft wind, and then weigh anchor. And run up the main sheet, straightway what of transcendent and permanent value is there resists the aft wind, and will doggedly stay behind that Sunday, it does not travel Sundays. While biscuit and pork make headway, and sailors cry heavio. It must part company, if it open a seam. It is not quite safe to send out a venture in this kind, unless yourself go supercargo. Where a man goes, there he is, but the slightest virtue is immovable, it is real estate, not personal, who would keep it, must consent to be bought and sold with it. However, we need not dwell on this charge of a German extraction, it being generally admitted, by this time, that Carlyle is English, and an inhabitant of London. He has the English for his mother tongue, though with a Scotch accent, or never so many accents, and thoughts also, which are the legitimate growth of native soil, to utter therewith. His style is eminently colloquial, and no wonder it is strange to meet with in a book. It is not literary or classical. It has not the music of poetry, nor the pomp of philosophy, but the rhythms and cadences of conversation endlessly repeated. It resounds with emphatic, natural, lively, stirring tones, muttering, rattling, exploding, like shells and shot, and with like execution. So far as it is a merit in composition, that the written answer to the spoken word, and the spoken word to a fresh and pertinent thought in the mind, as well as to the half-thoughts. The tumultuary misgivings and expectancies, this author is, perhaps, not to be matched in literature. In the streets men laugh and cry, but in books, never, they, whine, put finter eye the eye, and sob only. One would think that all books of late had adopted the falling inflection. A mother, if she wishes to sing her child to sleep, say the musical men, will always adopt the falling inflection. Would they but choose the rising inflection, and wake the child up for once? He is no mystic, either, more than Newton or Arkwright or Davy, and tolerates none. Not one obscure line, or half-line, did he ever write. His meaning lies plain as the daylight, and he who runs may read, indeed, only he who runs can read, and keep up with the meaning. It has the distinctness of picture to his mind, and he tells us only what he sees printed in largest English type upon the face of things. He utters substantial English thoughts in plainest English dialects, for it must be confessed, he speaks more than one of these. All the shires of England, and all the shires of Europe, are laid under contribution to his genius. For to be English does not mean to be exclusive and narrow, and adapt oneself to the apprehension of his nearest neighbor only. 
and yet no writer is more thoroughly Saxon. In the translation of those fragments of Saxon poetry, we have met with the same rhythm that occurs so often in his poem on the French Revolution. And if you would know where many of those obnoxious Carlylisms and Germanisms came from, read the best of Milton's prose, read those speeches of Cromwell which he has brought to light. Or go and listen once more to your mother's tongue. So much for his German extraction. Indeed, for fluency and skill in the use of the English tongue, he is a master unrivaled. His felicity and power of expression surpass even his special merits as historian and critic. Therein his experience has not failed him, but furnished him with such a store of winged, eye in legged words, as only a London life, perchance, could give account of. We had not understood the wealth of the language before. Nature is ransacked, and all the resorts and prose of humanity are taxed, to furnish the fittest symbol for his thought. He does not go to the dictionary, the wordbook, but to the word manufactory itself, and has made endless work for the lexicographers, yes. He has that same English for his mother tongue that you have, but with him it is no dumb, muttering, mumbling faculty, concealing the thoughts, but a keen, unwearied, resistless weapon. He has such command of it as neither you nor I have. And it would be well for any who have a lost horse to advertise, or a town meeting warrant, or a sermon, or a letter to write, to study this universal letter writer. For he knows more than the grammar or the dictionary. The style is worth attending to, as one of the most important features of the man which we at this distance can discern. It is for once quite equal to the matter. It can carry all its load, and never breaks down nor staggers. His books are solid and workmanlike, as all that England does, and they are graceful and readable also. They tell of huge labor done, well done, and all the rubbish swept away, like the bright cutlery which glitters in shop windows, while the coke and ashes, the turnings, filings, dust, and borings lie far away at Birmingham, unheard of. He is a masterly clerk, scribe, reporter, writer. He can reduce to writing most things, gestures, winks, nods, significant looks, patois, brogue, accent, pantomime, and how much that had passed for silence before, does he represent by written words. The countryman who puzzled the city lawyer, requiring him to write, among other things, his call to his horses, would hardly have puzzled him. He would have found a word for it, all right and classical, that would have started his team for him. Consider the ceaseless tide of speech forever flowing in countless cellars, garrets, parlors. That of the French, says Carlyle, only ebbs toward the short hours of night, and what a drop in the bucket is the printed word. Feeling, thought, speech, writing, and, we might add, poetry, inspiration, for so the circle is completed. How they gradually dwindle at length, passing through successive colanders, into your history and classics, from the roar of the ocean, the murmur of the forest, to the squeak of a mouse. So much only parsed and spelt out, and punctuated, at last. The few who can talk like a book, they only get reported commonly. But this writer reports a new leaferung. One wonders how so much, after all, was expressed in the old way, so much here depends upon the emphasis, tone, pronunciation, style, and spirit of the reading. No writer uses so profusely all the aids to intelligibility which the printer's art affords. You wonder how others had contrived to write so many pages without emphatic or italicized words, they are so expressive, so natural, so indispensable here. As if none had ever used the demonstrative pronouns demonstratively before. In another sentences the thought, though it may be immortal, is, as it were embalmed, and does not strike you, but here it is so freshly living. Even the body of it not having passed through the ordeal of death, that it stirs in the very extremities, and the smallest particles and pronouns are all alive with it. It is not simple dictionary it, yours or mine, but it. The words did not come at the command of grammar, but of a tyrannous, inexorable meaning. Not like standing soldiers, by vote of parliament, but any able-bodied countryman pressed into the service, for, sire, it is not a revolt, it is a revolution. We have never heard him speak, 
but we should say that Carlyle was a rare talker. He has broken the ice, and streams freely forth like a spring torrent. He does not trace back the stream of his thought, silently adventurous, up to its fountainhead, but is borne away with it, as it rushes through his brain like a torrent to overwhelm and fertilize. He holds a talk with you. His audience is such a tumultuous mob of thirty thousand, as assembled at the University of Paris, before printing was invented. Philosophy, on the other hand, does not talk, but write, or, when it comes personally before an audience, lecture or read, and therefore it must be read tomorrow or a thousand years hence. But the talker must naturally be attended to at once, he does not talk on without an audience, the winds do not long bear the sound of his voice. Think of Carlyle reading his French Revolution to any audience. One might say it was never written, but spoken. And thereafter reported and printed, that those not within sound of his voice might know something about it. Some men read to you something which they have written, in a dead language, of course, but it may be in a living letter, in a Syriac, or Roman, or runic character. Men must speak English who can write Sanskrit, and they must speak a modern language who write, perchance, an ancient and universal one. We do not live in those days when the learned used a learned language. There is no writing of Latin with Carlyle. But as Chaucer, with all reverence to Homer, and Virgil, and Messrs the Normans, sung his poetry in the homely Saxon tongue. And Locke has at least the merit of having done philosophy into English, so Carlyle has done a different philosophy still further into English. And thrown open the doors of literature and criticism to the populace. Such a style, so diversified and variegated. It is like the face of a country. It is like a New England landscape, with farmhouses and villages, and cultivated spots, and belts of forests and blueberry swamps round about. With the fragrance of shad blossoms and violets on certain winds. And as for the reading of it, it is novel enough to the reader who has used only the diligence, and old line mail coach. It is like traveling, sometimes on foot, sometimes in a gig tandem. Sometimes in a full coach, over highways, mended and unmended, for which you will prosecute the town. On level roads, through French departments, by Simplon roads over the Alps, and now and then he hauls up for a relay, and yokes in an unbroken colt of a Pegasus for a leader. Driving off by cart paths, and across lots, by corduroy roads and gridiron bridges. And where the bridges are gone, not even a string piece left, and the reader has to set his breast and swim. You have got an expert driver this time, who has driven ten thousand miles, and was never known to upset. Can drive six in hand on the edge of a precipice, and touch the leaders anywhere with his snapper. With wonderful art he grinds into paint for his picture all his moods and experiences, so that all his forces may be brought to the encounter. Apparently writing without a particular design or responsibility, setting down his soliloquies from time to time, taking advantage of all his humors, when at length the hour comes to declare himself. He puts down in plain English, without quotation marks, what he, Thomas Carlyle, is ready to defend in the face of the world, and fathers the rest, often quite as defensible, only more modest. Or plain spoken, or insinuating, upon, Sourtag, or some other gentleman long employed on the subject. Rolling his subject how many ways in his mind, he meets it now face to face, wrestling with it at arm's length, and striving to get it down, or throws it over his head. And if that will not do, or whether it will do or not, tries the backstitch and side hug with it, and downs it again, scalps it, draws and quarters it, hangs it in chains. And leaves it to the winds and dogs. With his brows knit, his mind made up, his will resolved and resistless, he advances, crashing his way through the host of weak, half-formed, dilettante opinions. Honest and dishonest ways of thinking, with their standards raised, sentimentalities and conjectures, and tramples them all into dust. See how he prevails, you don't even hear the groans of the wounded and dying. Certainly it is not so well worth the while to look through any man's eyes at history, for the time, as through his. And his way of looking at things is fastest getting adopted by his generation. It is not in man to determine what his style shall be. 
he might as well determine what his thoughts shall be. We would not have had him write always as in the chapter on Burns, and the life of Schiller, and elsewhere. No, his thoughts were ever irregular and impetuous. Perhaps as he grows older and writes more he acquires a truer expression, it is in some respects manlier, freer, struggling up to a level with its fountainhead. We think it is the richest prose style we know of. Who cares what a man's style is, so it is intelligible, as intelligible as his thought. Literally and really, the style is no more than the stylus, the pen he writes with, and it is not worth scraping and polishing, and gilding, unless it will write his thoughts the better for it. It is something for use, and not to look at. The question for us is not whether Pope had a fine style, wrote with a peacock's feather, but whether he uttered useful thoughts. Translate a book a dozen times from one language to another, and what becomes of its style? Most books would be worn out and disappear in this ordeal. The pen which wrote it is soon destroyed, but the poem survives. We believe that Carlyle has, after all, more readers, and is better known today for this very originality of style, and that posterity will have reason to thank him for emancipating the language. In some measure, from the fetters which a merely conservative, aimless, and pedantic literary class had imposed upon it, and setting an example of greater freedom and naturalness. No man's thoughts are new, but the style of their expression is the never-failing novelty which cheers and refreshes men. If we were to answer the question, whether the mass of men, as we know them, talk as the standard authors and reviewers write, or rather as this man writes. We should say that he alone begins to write their language at all, and that the former is, for the most part, the mere effigies of a language, not the best method of concealing one's thoughts even. But frequently a method of doing without thoughts at all. In his graphic description of Richter's style, Carlyle describes his own pretty nearly. And no doubt he first got his own tongue loosened at that fountain, and was inspired by it to equal freedom and originality. The language, as he says of Richter, groans with indescribable metaphors and allusions to all things, human and divine, flowing onward, not like a river, but like an inundation. Circling in complex eddies, chafing and gurgling, now this way, now that, but in Carlyle, the proper current, never, sinks out of sight amid the boundless uproar. Again, his very language is Titanian, deep, strong, tumultuous, shining with a thousand hues, fused from a thousand elements, and winding in labyrinthic mazes. In short, if it is desirable that a man be eloquent, that he talk much, and address himself to his own age mainly, then this is not a bad style of doing it. But if it is desired rather that he pioneer into unexplored regions of thought, and speak to silent centuries to come, then, indeed, we could wish that he had cultivated the style of Goethe more. That of Richter less. Not that Goethe's is the kind of utterance most to be prized by mankind, but it will serve for a model of the best that can be successfully cultivated. But for style, and fine writing, and Augustan ages, that is but a poor style, and vulgar writing, and a degenerate age, which allows us to remember these things. This man has something to communicate. Carlyle's are not, in the common sense, works of art in their origin and aim, and yet, perhaps, no living English writer evinces an equal literary talent. They are such works of art only as the plough and cornmill and steam engine, not as pictures and statues. Others speak with greater emphasis to scholars, as such, but none so earnestly and effectually to all who can read. Others give their advice, he gives his sympathy also. It is no small praise that he does not take upon himself the airs, has none of the whims, none of the pride, the nice vulgarities, the starched, impoverished isolation. And cold glitter of the spoiled children of genius. He does not need to husband his pearl, but excels by a greater humanity and sincerity. He is singularly serious and untrivial. We are everywhere impressed by the rugged, unwearied, and rich sincerity of the man. We are sure that he never sacrificed one jot of his honest thought to art or whim, but to utter himself in the most direct and effectual way, that is the endeavor. These are merits which will wear well. When time has worn deeper into the substance of these books, this grain will appear. 
No such sermons have come to us here out of England, in late years, as those of this preacher, sermons to kings, and sermons to peasants, and sermons to all intermediate classes. It is in vain that John Bull, or any of his cousins, turns a deaf ear, and pretends not to hear them, nature will not soon be weary of repeating them. There are words less obviously true, more for the ages to hear, perhaps, but none so impossible for this age not to hear. What a cutting scimitar was that, past and present, going through heaps of silken stuffs, and glibly through the necks of men, too, without their knowing it, leaving no trace. He has the earnestness of a prophet. In an age of pedantry and dilettantism, he has no grain of these in his composition. There is nowhere else, surely, in recent readable English, or other books, such direct and effectual teaching, reproving, encouraging, stimulating, earnestly, vehemently, almost like Muhammad. Like Luther. Not looking behind him to see how his opera Omnia will look, but forward to other work to be done. His writings are a gospel to the young of this generation. They will hear his manly, brotherly speech with responsive joy, and press forward to older or newer gospels. We should omit a main attraction in these books, if we said nothing of their humor. Of this indispensable pledge of sanity, without some leaven, of which the abstruse thinker may justly be suspected of mysticism, fanaticism, or insanity, there is a superabundance in Carlyle. Especially the transcendental philosophy needs the leaven of humor to render it light and digestible. In his later and longer works it is an unfailing accompaniment, reverberating through pages and chapters, long sustained without effort. The very punctuation, the italics, the quotation marks, the blank spaces and dashes, and the capitals, each and all are pressed into its service. Every man, of course, has his fane, from which even the most innocent conscious humor is excluded. But in proportion as the writer's position is high above his fellows, the range of his humor is extended. To the thinker, all the institutions of men, as all imperfection, viewed from the point of equanimity, are legitimate subjects of humor. Whatever is not necessary, no matter how sad or personal, or universal a grievance, is, indeed, a jest more or less sublime. Carlyle's humor is vigorous and titanic, and has more sense in it than the sober philosophy of many another. It is not to be disposed of by laughter and smiles merely. It gets to be too serious for that, only they may laugh who are not hit by it. For those who love a merry jest, this is a strange kind of fun, rather too practical joking, if they understand it. The pleasant humor which the public loves is but the innocent pranks of the ballroom, harmless flow of animal spirits, the light plushy pressure of dandy pumps, in comparison. But when an elephant takes to treading on your corns, why then you are lucky if you sit high, or wear cowhide. His humor is always subordinate to a serious purpose, though often the real charm for the reader is not so much in the essential progress and final upshot of the chapter. As in this indirect sidelight illustration of every hue. He sketches first, with strong, practical English pencil, the essential features in outline, black on white, more faithfully than dry as dust would have done, telling us wisely whom and what to mark. To save time, and then with brush of camel's hair, or sometimes with more expeditious swab, he lays on the bright and fast colors of his humor everywhere. One piece of solid work, be it known, we have determined to do, about which let there be no jesting, but all things else under the heavens, to the right and left of that, are for the time fair game. To us this humor is not wearisome, as almost every other is. Rabelais, for instance, is intolerable, one chapter is better than a volume, it may be sport to him, but it is death to us. A mere humorist, indeed, is a most unhappy man, and his readers are most unhappy also. Humor is not so distinct a quality as, for the purposes of criticism, it is commonly regarded, but allied to every, even the divinest faculty. The familiar and cheerful conversation about every hearthside, if it be analyzed, will be found to be sweetened by this principle. There is not only a never-failing, pleasant, and earnest humor kept up there, embracing the domestic affairs, the dinner, and the scolding, but there is also a constant run upon the neighbors. 
and upon church and state, and to cherish and maintain this, in a great measure, the fire is kept burning, and the dinner provided. There will be neighbors, parties to a very genuine, even romantic friendship, whose whole audible salutation and intercourse, abstaining from the usual cordial expressions, grasping of hands, or affectionate farewells, consists in the mutual play and interchange of a genial and healthy humor, which accepts nothing, not even themselves, in its lawless range. The child plays continually, if you will let it, and all its life is a sort of practical humor of a very pure kind, often of so fine and ethereal a nature, that its parents, its uncles and cousins, can in no wise participate in it, but must stand aloof in sit and admiration, and reverence even. The more quiet the more profound it is. Even nature is observed to have her playful moods or aspects, of which man seems sometimes to be the sport. But, after all, we could sometimes dispense with the humor, though unquestionably incorporated in the blood, if it were replaced by this author's gravity. We should not apply to himself, without qualification, his remarks on the humor of Richter. With more repose in his inmost being, his humor would become more thoroughly genial and placid. Humor is apt to imply but a half-satisfaction at best. In his pleasantest and most genial hour, man smiles but as the globe smiles, and the works of nature. The fruits dry ripe, and much as we relish some of them in their green and pulpy state, we lay up for our winter store, not out of these, but the rustling autumnal harvests. Though we never weary of this vivacious wit, while we are perusing its work, yet when we remember it from afar, we sometimes feel balked and disappointed, missing the security, the simplicity, and frankness, even the occasional magnanimity of acknowledged dullness and bungling. This never-failing success and brilliant talent become a reproach. To the most practical reader the humor is certainly too obvious and constant a quality. When we are to have dealings with a man, we prize the good faith and valor of soberness and gravity. There is always a more impressive statement than consists with these victorious comparisons. Besides, humor does not wear well. It is commonly enough said, that a joke will not bear repeating. The deepest humor will not keep. Humors do not circulate but stagnate, or circulate partially. In the oldest literature, in the Hebrew, the Hindu, the Persian, the Chinese, it is rarely humor, even the most divine, which still survives, but the most sober and private. Painful or joyous thoughts, maxims of duty, to which the life of all men may be referred. After time has sifted the literature of a people, there is left only their scripture, for that is writing, par excellence. This is as true of the poets, as of the philosophers and moralists by profession, for what subsides in any of these is the moral only, to reappear as dry land at some remote epoch. We confess that Carlyle's humor is rich, deep, and variegated, in direct communication with the backbone and risible muscles of the globe, and there is nothing like it. But much as we relish this jovial, this rapid and detergious way of conveying one's views and impressions, when we would not converse but meditate, we pray for a man's diamond edition of his thought. Without the colored illuminations in the margin, the fishes and dragons, and unicorns, the red or the blue ink, but its initial letter in distinct skeleton type. And the whole so clipped and condensed down to the very essence of it, that time will have little to do. We know not but we shall immigrate soon, and would fain take with us all the treasures of the East. And all kinds of dry, portable soups, in small tin canisters, which contain whole herds of English beeves, boiled down, will be acceptable. The difference between this flashing, fitful writing and pure philosophy is the difference between flame and light. The flame, indeed, yields light. But when we are so near as to observe the flame, we are apt to be incommoded by the heat and smoke. But the sun, that old Platonist, is set so far off in the heavens, that only a genial summer heat and ineffable daylight can reach us. But many a time, we confess, in wintry weather, we have been glad to forsake the sunlight, and warm us by these Promethean flames. Carlyle must undoubtedly plead guilty to the charge of mannerism. He not only has his vein, but his peculiar manner of working it. 
He has a style which can be imitated, and sometimes is an imitator of himself. Every man, though born and bred in the metropolis of the world, will still have some provincialism adhering to him. But in proportion as his aim is simple and earnest, he approaches at once the most ancient and the most modern men. There is no mannerism in the scriptures. The style of Proverbs, and indeed of all maxims, whether measured by sentences of by chapters, if they may be said to have any style, is one, and as the expression of one voice. Merely an account of the matter by the latest witness. It is one advantage enjoyed by men of science, that they use only formulas which are universal. The common language and the common sense of mankind, it is most uncommon to meet with in the individual. Yet liberty of thought and speech is only a liberty to think the universal thought, and speak the universal language of men, instead of being enslaved to a particular mode. Of this universal speech there is very little. It is equable and sure, from a depth within man which is beyond education and prejudice. Certainly, no critic has anywhere said what is more to the purpose, than this which Carlyle's own writings furnish, which we quote, as well for its intrinsic merit as for its pertinence here. It is true, says he, thinking of Richter, the beaten paths of literature lead the safeliest to the goal. And the talent pleases us most which submits to shine with new gracefulness through old forms. Nor is the noblest and most peculiar mind too noble or peculiar for working by prescribed laws. Sophocles, Shakespeare, Cervantes, and in Richter's own age, Goethe, how little did they innovate on the given forms of composition, how much in the spirit they breathed into them. All this is true. And Richter must lose of our esteem in proportion. And again, in the chapter on Goethe, we read Goethe for years before we come to see wherein the distinguishing peculiarity of his understanding, of his disposition, even of his way of writing, consists. It seems quite a simple style, that of his, remarkable chiefly for its calmness, its perspicuity, in short, its commonness, and yet it is the most uncommon of all styles. And this, too, translated for us by the same pen from Schiller, which we will apply not merely to the outward form of his works, but to their inner form and substance. He is speaking of the artist. Let some beneficent divinity snatch him, when a suckling, from the breast of his mother, and nurse him with the milk of a better time. That he may ripen to his full stature beneath a distant Grecian sky. And having grown to manhood, let him return, a foreign shape, into his century, not, however, to delight it by his presence, but, dreadful, like the son of Agamemnon, to purify it. The matter of his works he will take from the present, but their form he will derive from a nobler time, nay, from beyond all time, from the absolute unchanging unity of his own nature. But enough of this. Our complaint is already out of all proportion to our discontent. Carlyle's works, it is true, have not the stereotyped success which we call classic. They are a rich but inexpensive entertainment, at which we are not concerned lest the host has strained or impoverished himself to feed his guests. It is not the most lasting word, nor the loftiest wisdom, but rather the word which comes last. For his genius it was reserved to give expression to the thoughts which were throbbing in a million breasts. He has plucked the ripest fruit in the public garden. But this fruit already least concerned the tree that bore it, which was rather perfecting the bud at the foot of the leaf's talk. His works are not to be studied, but read with a swift satisfaction. Their flavor and gust is like what poets tell of the froth of wine, which can only be tasted once and hastily. On a review we can never find the pages we had read. The first impression is the truest and the deepest, and there is no reprint, no double entendre, so to speak, for the alert reader. Yet they are in some degree true natural products in this respect. All things are but once, and never repeated. The first faint blushes of the morning, gilding the mountain tops. The pale phosphor and saffron colored clues do verily transport us to the morning of creation, but what avails it to travel eastward or look again there an hour hence? We should be as far in the day ourselves, mounting towards our meridian. These works were designed for such complete success that they serve but for a single occasion. 
It is the luxury of art, when its own instrument is manufactured for each particular and present use. The knife which slices the bread of Jove ceases to be a knife when this service is rendered. But he is willfully and pertinaciously unjust, even scurrilous, impolite, ungentlemanly, calls us imbeciles, dilettantes, philistines, implying sometimes what would not sound well expressed. If he would adopt the newspaper style, and take back these hard names, but where is the reader who does not derive some benefit from these epithets, applying them to himself? Think not that with each repetition of them there is a fresh overflowing of bile, oh no! Perhaps none at all after the first time, only a faithfulness, the right name being found. To apply it, they are the same ones we meant before, and oft times with a genuine sympathy and encouragement expressed. Indeed, there appears in all his writings a hearty and manly sympathy with all misfortune and wretchedness, and not a weak and sniveling one. They who suspect a Mephistopheles, or sneering, satirical devil, under all, have not learned the secret of true humor, which sympathizes with the gods themselves, in view of their grotesque, half-finished creatures. He is, in fact, the best-tempered, and not the least impartial of reviewers. He goes out of his way to do justice to profligates and quacks. There is somewhat even Christian, in the rarest and most peculiar sense, in his universal brotherliness, his simple, childlike endurance, and earnest, honest endeavor, with sympathy for the like. And this fact is not insignificant, that he is almost the only writer of biography, of the lives of men, in modern times. So kind and generous a tribute to the genius of Burns cannot be expected again, and is not needed. We honor him for his noble reverence for Luther, and his patient, almost reverent study of Goethe's genius, anxious that no shadow of his author's meaning escape him for want of trustful attention. There is nowhere else, surely, such determined and generous love of whatever is manly in history. His just appreciation of any, even inferior talent, especially of all sincerity, under whatever guise, and all true men of endeavor, must have impressed every reader. Witness the chapters on Werner, Hain, even Cagliostro, and others. He is not likely to underrate his man. We are surprised to meet with such a discriminator of kingly qualities in these republican and democratic days, such genuine loyalty all thrown away upon the world. Carlyle, to adopt his own classification, is himself the hero as literary man. There is no more notable working man in England, in Manchester, or Birmingham, or the mines roundabout. We know not how many hours a day he toils, nor for what wages, exactly, we only know the results for us. We hear through the London fog and smoke the steady systole, diastole, and vibratory hum, from, somebody's works, there, the, print works, say some, the, chemicals, say others. Where something, at any rate, is manufactured which we remember to have seen in the market. This is the place, then. Literature has come to mean, to the ears of laboring men, something idle, something cunning and pretty merely because the 999 really write for fame or for amusement. But as the laborer works, and soberly by the sweat of his brow earns bread for his body, so this man works anxiously and sadly, to get bread of life, and dispense it. We cannot do better than quote his own estimate of labor from Sardar re Sardis. Two men I honor and no third. First. The toil-worn craftsman that with earth-made implement laboriously conquers the earth, and makes her man's. Venerable to me is the hard hand. Crooked, coarse, wherein, notwithstanding, lies a cunning virtue, indefeasibly royal, as of the scepter of this planet. Venerable, too, is the rugged face, all weather tanned, besoiled, with its rude intelligence, for it is the face of a man living manlike. Oh, but the more venerable for thy rudeness, and even because we must pity as well as love thee. Hardly entreated brother. For us was thy back so bent, for us were thy straight limbs and fingers so deformed, thou wert our conscript, on whom the lot fell, and fighting our battles wert so marred. For in thee, too, lay a God-created form, but it was not to be unfolded, encrusted must it stand with the thick adhesions and defacements of labor. And thy body, like thy soul, was not to know freedom. 
Yet toil on, toil on, thou art in thy duty, be out of it who may, thou twallest for the altogether indispensable, for daily bread. A second man I honour, and still more highly, him who is seen toiling for the spiritually indispensable, not daily bread, but the bread of life. Is not he, too, in his duty, endeavouring toward inward harmony, revealing this, by act or by word, through all his outward endeavours, be they high or low? Highest of all, when his outward and his inward endeavour are one, when we can name him artist. Not earthly craftsman only, but inspired thinker, that with heaven-made implement conquers heaven for us. If the poor and humble toil that we have food, must not the high and glorious toil for him in return, that he have light, have guidance, freedom, immortality? These two in all their degrees, I honour. All else is chaff and dust, which let the wind blow whither it listeth. Unspeakably touching is it, however, when I find both dignities united. And he that must toil outwardly for the lowest of man's wants, is also toiling inwardly for the highest. Sublimer in this world know I nothing than a peasant saint, could such now anywhere be met with. Such a one will take thee back to Nazareth itself. Thou wilt see the splendour of heaven spring forth from the humblest depths of earth, like a light shining in great darkness. Notwithstanding the very genuine, admirable, and loyal tributes to Burns, Schiller, Goethe, and others, Carlyle is not a critic of poetry. In the Book of Heroes, Shakespeare, the hero as poet, comes off rather slimly. His sympathy, as we said, is with the men of endeavour, not using the life got, but still bravely getting their life. In fact, as he says of Cromwell, everywhere we have to notice the decisive practical eye of this man, how he drives toward the practical and practicable, has a genuine insight into what is fact. You must have very stout legs to get noticed at all by him. He is thoroughly English in his love of practical men, and dislike for Kant, and ardent enthusiastic heads that are not supported by any legs. He would kindly knock them down that they may regain some vigour by touching their mother earth. We have often wondered how he ever found out Burns, and must still refer a good share of his delight in him to neighbourhood and early association. The Lycidas and Comus, appearing in Blackwood's magazine, would probably go unread by him, nor lead him to expect a paradise lost. The condition of England question is a practical one. The condition of England demands a hero, not a poet. Other things demand a poet, the poet answers other demands. Carlyle in London, with this question pressing on him so urgently, sees no occasion for minstrels and rhapsodists there. Kings may have their bards when there are any kings. Homer would certainly go a begging there. He lives in Chelsea, not on the plains of Hindostan, nor on the prairies of the West, where settlers are scarce, and a man must at least go whistling to himself. What he says of poetry is rapidly uttered, and suggestive of a thought, rather than the deliberate development of any. He answers your question, what is poetry? By writing a special poem, as that Norse one, for instance, in the Book of Heroes, altogether wild and original, answers your question, what is light? By kindling a blaze which dazzles you, and pale sun and moon, and not as a peasant might, by opening a shutter. And, certainly, you would say that this question never could be answered but by the grandest of poems. Yet he has not dull breath and stupidity enough, perhaps, to give the most deliberate and universal answer, such as the fates ring from illiterate and unthinking men. He answers like Thor, with a stroke of his hammer, whose dint makes a valley in the earth's surface. Carlyle is not a seer, but a brave looker-on and reviewer. Not the most free and Catholic observer of men and events, for they are likely to find him preoccupied, but unexpectedly free and Catholic when they fall within the focus of his lens. He does not live in the present hour, and read men and books as they occur for his theme, but having chosen this, he directs his studies to this end. But if he supplies us with arguments and illustrations against himself, we will remember that we may perhaps be convicted of error from the same source, stalking on these lofty reviewers stilts so far from the green pasturage around. If we look again at his page, we are apt to retract somewhat that we have said. Often a genuine poetic feeling dawns through it, 
like the texture of the earth seen through the dead grass and leaves in the spring. There is indeed more poetry in this author than criticism on poetry. He often reminds us of the ancient skald, inspired by the grimmer features of life, dwelling longer on Dante than on Shakespeare. We have not recently met with a more solid and unquestionable piece of poetic work than that episode of The Ancient Monk, in past and present, at once idyllic, narrative, heroic. A beautiful restoration of a past age. There is nothing like it elsewhere that we know of. The history of the French Revolution is a poem, at length translated into prose, an Iliad, indeed, as he himself has it, the destructive wrath of Sansculatism, this is what we speak. Having unhappily no voice for singing. One improvement we could suggest in this last, as indeed in most epics, that he should let in the sun oftener upon his picture. It does not often enough appear, but it is all revolution, the old way of human life turned simply bottom upward, so that when at length we are inadvertently reminded of the breast shipping, st. Domingo colony, and that anybody thinks of owning plantations, and simply turning up the soil there, and that now at length, after some years of this revolution, there is a falling off in the importation of sugar, we feel a queer surprise. Had they not sweetened their water with revolution then? It would be well if there were several chapters headed, Work for the Month, Revolution Work Inclusive, of course, Altitude of the Sun, State of the Crops and Markets. Meteorological Observations, Attractive Industry, Day Labor, etc. Just to remind the reader that the French peasantry did something beside go without breeches, burn chateaus, get ready knotted cords, and embrace and throttle one another by turns. These things are sometimes hinted at, but they deserve a notice more in proportion to their importance. We want not only a background to the picture, but a ground under the feet also. We remark, too, occasionally, an unphilosophical habit, common enough elsewhere, in Allison's history of modern Europe, for instance, of saying, undoubtedly with effect, that if a straw had not fallen this way or that, why then, but, of course, it is as easy in philosophy to make kingdoms rise and fall as straws. The old adage is as true for our purpose, which says that a miss is as good as a mile. Who shall say how near the man came to being killed who was not killed? If an apple had not fallen then we had never heard of Newton and the law of gravitation, as if they could not have contrived to let fall a pair as well. The poet is blithe and cheery ever, and as well as nature. Carlyle has not the simple Homeric health of Wordsworth, nor the deliberate philosophic turn of Coleridge, nor the scholastic taste of Landor, but, though sick and under restraint, the constitutional vigor of one of his old Norse heroes, struggling in a lurid light, with Jodan still, striving to throw the old woman. And, she was time, striving to lift the big cat, and that was, the great world serpent, which, tail in mouth, girds and keeps up the whole created world. The smith, though so brawny and tough, I should not call the healthiest man. There is too much shop work, too great extremes of heat and cold, an incessant ten pound ten and thrashing of the anvil, in his life. But the haymakers is a true sunny perspiration, produced by the extreme of summer heat only, and conversant with the blast of the zephyr, not of the forge bellows. We know very well the nature of this man's sadness, but we do not know the nature of his gladness. There sits Bull in the court all the year round, with his hoarse bark and discontented growl, not a cross dog, only a canine habit. Verging to madness some think, now separated from the shuddering travellers only by the paling, now heard afar in the horizon, even melodious there. Baying the moon o' oh, nights, baying the sun by day, with his mastiff mouth. He never goes after the cows, nor stretches in the sun, nor plays with the children. Pray give him a longer rope, ye gods, or let him go at large, and never taste raw meat more. The poet will maintain serenity in spite of all disappointments. He is expected to preserve an unconcerned and healthy outlook over the world, while he lives. Philosophia practica est eruditionis meta, philosophy practiced is the goal of learning. And for that other, oratoris est solare artem, we might read, herois est solare pugnam, the hero will conceal his struggles. 
Poetry is the only life got, the only work done, the only pure product and free labor of man, performed only when he has put all the world under his feet and conquered the last of his foes. Carlyle speaks of nature with a certain unconscious pathos for the most part. She is to him a receded but ever memorable splendor, casting still a reflected light over all his scenery. As we read his books here in New England, where there are potatoes enough, and every man can get his living peacefully and sportively as the birds and bees, and need think no more of that. It seems to us as if by the world he often meant London, at the head of the tide upon the Thames, the sorest place on the face of the earth, the very citadel of conservatism. Possibly a South African village might have furnished a more hopeful, and more exacting audience, or in the silence of the wilderness and the desert. He might have addressed himself more entirely to his true audience posterity. In his writings, we should say that he, as conspicuously as any, though with little enough expressed or even conscious sympathy, represents the reformer class. And all the better for not being the acknowledged leader of any. In him the universal plaint is most settled, unappeasable and serious. Until a thousand named and nameless grievances are righted, there will be no repose for him in the lap of nature, or the seclusion of science and literature. By foreseeing it he hastens the crisis in the affairs of England, and is as good as many years added to her history. As we said, we have no adequate word from him concerning poets, Homer, Shakespeare, nor more, we might of saints, Jesus, nor philosophers, Socrates, Plato, nor mystics, Swedenborg. He has no articulate sympathy at least such as these as yet. Odin, Muhammad, Cromwell, will have justice at his hands, and we would leave him to write the eulogies of all the giants of the will, but the kings of men. Whose kingdoms are holy in the hearts of their subjects, strictly transcendent in moral greatness, what is highest and worthiest in character, he is not inclined to dwell upon or point to. To do himself justice, and set some of his readers right, he should give us some transcendent hero at length, to rule his demigods and titans. Develop, perhaps, his reserved and dumb reverence for Christ, not speaking to a London or Church of England audience merely. Let not sacred silence meditate that sacred matter forever, but let us have sacred speech and sacred scripture thereon. True reverence is not necessarily dumb, but ofttimes prattling and hilarious as children in the spring. Every man will include in his list of worthies those whom he himself best represents. Carlyle, and our countryman Emerson, whose place and influence must ere long obtain a more distinct recognition, are, to a certain extent, the complement of each other. The age could not do with one of them, it cannot do with both. To make a broad and rude distinction, to suit our present purpose, the former, as critic, deals with the men of action, Muhammad, Luther, Cromwell. The latter with the thinkers, Plato, Shakespeare, Goethe, for, though both have written upon Goethe, they do not meet in him. The one has more sympathy with the heroes, or practical reformers, the other with the observers, or philosophers. Put their worthies together, and you will have a pretty fair representation of mankind, yet with one or more memorable exceptions. To say nothing of Christ, who yet awaits a just appreciation from literature, the peacefully practical hero, whom Columbus may represent, is obviously slighted. But above and after all, the man of the age, come to be called working men, it is obvious that none yet speaks to his condition, for the speaker is not yet in his condition. There is poetry and prophecy to cheer him, and advice of the head and heart to the hands. But no very memorable cooperation, it must be confessed, since the Christian era, or rather since Prometheus tried it. It is even a noteworthy fact, that a man addresses effectually in another only himself still, and what he himself does and is, alone can he prompt the other to do and to become. Like speaks to like only, labor to labor, philosophy to philosophy, criticism to criticism, poetry to poetry, etc. Literature speaks how much still to the past, how little to the future, how much to the East, how little to the West. In the East fames are won. In the West deeds are done. One merit in Carlyle, let the subject be what it may, is the freedom of prospect he allows, the entire absence of cant and dogma. 
He removes many cartloads of rubbish, and leaves open a broad highway. His writings are all unfenced on the side of the future and the possible. He does not place himself across the passage out of his books, so that none may go freely out, but rather by the entrance, inviting all to come in and go through. No gins, no network, no pickets here, to restrain the free-thinking reader. In many books called philosophical, we find ourselves running hither and thither, under and through, and sometimes quite unconsciously straddling some imaginary fence-work. Which in our clairvoyance we had not noticed, but fortunately, not with such fatal consequences as happen to those birds which fly against a whitewashed wall, mistaking it for fluid air. As we proceed the wreck of this dogmatic tissue collects about the organs of our perception, like cobwebs about the muzzles of hunting dogs in dewy mornings. If we look up with such eyes as these authors furnish, we see no heavens, but a low pent roof of straw or tiles, as if we stood under a shed, with no skylight through which to glimpse the blue. Carlyle, though he does but inadvertently direct our eyes to the open heavens, nevertheless he lets us wander broadly underneath, and shows them to us reflected in innumerable pools and lakes. We have from him, occasionally, some hints of a possible science of astronomy even, and revelation of heavenly arcana, but nothing definite hitherto. These volumes contain not the highest, but a very practicable wisdom, which startles and provokes, rather than informs us. Carlyle does not oblige us to think. We have thought enough for him already, but he compels us to act. We accompany him rapidly through an endless gallery of pictures, and glorious reminiscences of experiences unimproved. Have you not had Moses and the prophets? Neither will ye be persuaded if one should rise from the dead. There is no calm philosophy of life here, such as you might put at the end of the almanac, to hang over the farmer's hearth, how men shall live in these winter, in these summer days. No philosophy, properly speaking, of love, or friendship, or religion, or politics, or education, or nature, or spirit. Perhaps a nearer approach to a philosophy of kingship, and of the place of the literary man, than of anything else. A rare preacher, with prayer, and psalm, and sermon, and benediction, but no contemplation of man's life from the serene oriental ground, nor yet from the stirring occidental. No thanksgiving sermon for the holy days, or the Easter vacations, when all men submit to float on the full currents of life. When we see with what spirits, though with little heroism enough, woodchoppers, drovers, and apprentices take and spend life, playing all day long, sunning themselves, shading themselves, eating, drinking, sleeping, we think that the philosophy of their life written would be such a level natural history as the gardener's calendar and the works of the early botanists. Inconceivably slow to come to practical conclusions. Its premises away off before the first morning light, ere the heather was introduced into the British Isles, and no inferences to be drawn during this noon of the day. Not till after the remote evening shadows have begun to fall around. There is no philosophy here for philosophers, only as every man is said to have his philosophy. No system but such as is the man himself, and, indeed, he stands compactly enough. No progress beyond the first assertion and challenge, as it were, with trumpet blast. One thing is certain, that we had best be doing something in good earnest henceforth forever. That's an indispensable philosophy. The before impossible precept, know thyself, he translates into the partially possible one, know what thou canst work at. Sarda Resartus is, perhaps, the sunniest and most philosophical, as it is the most autobiographical of his works, in which he drew most largely on the experience of his youth. But we miss everywhere a calm depth, like a lake, even stagnant, and must submit to rapidity in whirl, as on skates, with all kinds of skillful and antic motions, sculling, sliding, cutting punch bowls and rings, forward and backward. The talent is very nearly equal to the genius. Sometimes it would be preferable to wade slowly through a Serbonian bog, and feel the juices of the meadow. We should say that he had not speculated far, but faithfully, living up to it. He lays all the stress still on the most elementary and initiatory maxims, introductory to philosophy. 
it is the experience of the religionist. He pauses at such a quotation as, it is only with renunciation that life, properly speaking, can be said to begin. Or, doubt of any sort cannot be removed except by action, or, do the duty which lies nearest thee. The chapters entitled, The Everlasting No, and The Everlasting Yea, contain what you might call the religious experience of his hero. In the latter, he assigns to him these words, brief, but as significant as any we remember in this author, one Bible I know, of whose plenary inspiration doubt is not such much as possible. Nay, with my own eyes I saw the God's hand writing it, thereof all other Bibles are but leaves. This belongs to the everlasting yea. Yet he lingers unaccountably in the everlasting no, under the negative pole. Truth, he still cries with Tuffelsdrock, though the heavens crush me for following her, no falsehood. Though a whole celestial luberland were the price of apostasy. Again, living without God in the world, of God's light I was not utterly bereft. If my as yet sealed eyes, with their unspeakable longing, could nowhere see him, nevertheless, in my heart he was present, and his heaven-written law still stood legible and sacred there. Again, ever from that time, the era of his protest, the temper of my misery was changed, not fear or whining sorrow was it, but indignation and grim, fire-eyed defiance. And in the center of indifference, as editor, he observes, that, it was no longer a quite hopeless unrest, and then proceeds, not in his best style, for the fire-baptized soul. Long so scathed and thunder-riven, here feels its own freedom, which feeling is its baphometic baptism, the citadel of its whole kingdom it has thus gained by assault, and will keep inexpungable. Outward from which the remaining dominions, not, indeed, without hard battling, will doubtless by degrees by conquered and pacific ated. Beside some philosophers of larger vision, Carlyle stands like an honest, half-despairing boy, grasping at some details only of their world systems. Philosophy, certainly, is some account of truths, the fragments and very insignificant parts of which man will practice in this workshop, truths infinite and in harmony with infinity. In respect to which the very objects and ends of the so-called practical philosopher will be mere propositions, like the rest. It would be no reproach to a philosopher, that he knew the future better than the past, or even than the present. It is better worth knowing. He will prophesy, tell what is to be, or in other words, what alone is, under appearances, laying little stress on the boiling of the pot, or the condition of England question. He has no more to do with the condition of England than with her national debt, which a vigorous generation would not inherit. The philosopher's conception of things will, above all, be truer than other men's, and his philosophy will subordinate all the circumstances of life. To live like a philosopher is to live, not foolishly, like other men, but wisely and according to universal laws. In this, which was the ancient sense, we think there has been no philosopher in modern times. The wisest and most practical men of recent history, to whom this epithet has been hastily applied, Ave lived comparatively meager lives, of conformity and tradition. Such as their fathers transmitted to them. But a man may live in what style he can. Between earth and heaven, there is room for all kinds. If he take counsel of fear and prudence, he has already failed. One who believed, by his very constitution, some truth which a few words express, would make a revolution never to be forgotten in this world. For it needs but a fraction of truth to found houses and empires on. However, such distinctions as poet and philosopher do not much assist our final estimate of a man. We do not lay much stress on them. A man's a man for a that. If Carlyle does not take two steps in philosophy, are there any who take three? Philosophy having crept clinging to the rocks, so far, puts out its feelers many ways in vain. It would be hard to surprise him by the relation of any important human experience, but in some nook or corner of his works you will find that this, too, was sometimes dreamed of in his philosophy. To sum up our most serious objections in a few words, we should say that Carlyle indicates a depth, and we mean not impliedly, but distinctly, which he neglects to fathom. 
we want to know more about that which he wants to know as well. If any luminous star or undissolvable nebula is visible from his station which is not visible from ours, the interests of science require that the fact be communicated to us. The universe expects every man to do his duty in his parallel of latitude. We want to hear more of his inmost life, his hymn and prayer, more, his elegy and eulogy, less. That he should speak more from his character, and less from his talent, communicate centrally with his readers, and not by a side. That he should say what he believes, without suspecting that men disbelieve it, out of his never misunderstood nature. Homer and Shakespeare speak directly and confidently to us. The confidence implied in the unsuspicious tone of the world's worthies, is a great and encouraging fact. Dig up some of the earth you stand on, and show that. If he gave us religiously the meager results of his experience, his style would be less picturesque and diversified, but more attractive and impressive. His genius can cover all the land with gorgeous palaces, but the reader does not abide in them, but pitches his tent rather in the desert and on the mountain peak. When we look about for something to quote, as the fairest specimen of the man, we confess that we labor under an unusual difficulty. For his philosophy is so little of the proverbial or sentential kind, and opens so gradually, rising insensibly from the reviewer's level, and developing its thought completely and in detail. That we look in vain for the brilliant passages, forepoint and antithesis, and must end by quoting his works entire. What in a writer of less breadth would have been the proposition which would have bounded his discourse, his column of victory, his pillar of Hercules, and any plus ultra? Is in Carlyle frequently the same thought unfolded? No pillar of Hercules, but a considerable prospect, north and south, along the Atlantic coast. There are other pillars of Hercules, like beacons and lighthouses, still further in the horizon, toward Atlantis, set up by a few ancient and modern travelers. But, so far as this traveler goes, he clears and colonizes, and all the surplus population of London is bound thither at once. What we would quote is, in fact, his vivacity, and not any particular wisdom or sense, which last is ever synonymous with sentence, sententia, as in his contemporaries Coleridge, Landor, and Wordsworth. We have not attempted to discriminate between his works, but have rather regarded them all as one work, as is the man himself. We have not examined so much as remembered them. To do otherwise would have required a more indifferent, and perhaps even less just review, than the present. The several chapters were chankfully received, as they came out, and now we find it impossible to say which was best, perhaps each was best in its turn. They do not require to be remembered by chapters, that is a merit, but are rather remembered as a well-known strain, reviving from time to time, when it had nearly died away. And always inspiring us to worthier and more persistent endeavors. In his last work, The Letters and Speeches of Oliver Cromwell, Carlyle has added a chapter to the history of England, has actually written a chapter to the history of England. Has actually written a chapter of her history, and, in comparison with this, there seems to be no other, this, and the 30,000 or 300,000 pamphlets in the British Museum. And that is all. This book is a practical comment on universal history. What if there were a British Museum in Athens and Babylon, and nameless cities? It throws light on the history of the Iliad and the labors of Pisistratus. History is, then, an account of memorable events that have sometime transpired, and not incredible and confused fable, quarters for scholars merely, or a gymnasium for poets and orators. We may say that he has dug up a hero, who was buried alive in his battlefield, hauled him out of his cairn, on which every passer had cast a pamphlet. We had heard of their digging up Arthur's before to be sure they were there, and, to be sure they were there, their bones, seven feet of them, but they had to bury them again. Others have helped to make known Shakespeare, Milton, Herbert, to give a name to such treasures as we all possessed. But, in this instance, not only a lost character has been restored to our imaginations, but palpably a living body, as it were, to our senses, to wear and sustain the former. His Cromwell's restoration, if England will read it faithfully, and addressed to New England, too. 
every reader will make his own application. To speak deliberately, we think that in this instance, vague rumor and a vague history have for the first time been subjected to a rigid scrutiny, and the wheat, with at least novel fidelity, sifted from the chaff. So that there remain for result, first, letters and speeches of Oliver Cromwell, now for the first time read or readable, and well nigh as complete as the fates will permit. Secondly, deeds, making an imperfect and fragmentary life, which may, with probability, be fathered upon him. Thirdly, this wreck of an ancient picture, the present editor has, to the best of his ability, restored, sedulously scraping away the dobings of successive bunglers. And endeavoring to catch the spirit of the artist himself. Not the worst, nor a barely possible, but for once the most favorable construction has been put upon this evidence of the life of a man, and the result is a picture of the ideal Cromwell. The perfection of the painter's art. Possibly this was the actual man. At any rate, this only can contain the actual hero. We confess that when we read these letters and speeches, unquestionably Cromwell's, with open and confident mind, we get glimpses occasionally of a grandeur and heroism which even this editor has not proclaimed. His speeches make us forget modern orators, and might go right into the next edition of the Old Testament, without alteration. Cromwell was another sort of man than we had taken him to be. These letters and speeches have supplied the lost key to his character. Verily another soldier than Bonaparte, rejoicing in the triumph of a psalm. To whom psalms were for Magna Carta and Herald's book, and whose victories were, crowning mercies. For stern, antique, and practical religion, a man unparalleled, since the Jewish dispensation, in the line of kings. An old Hebrew warrior, indeed, and last right-hand man of the Lord of hosts, that has blown his ram's horn about Jericho. Yet, with a remarkable common sense and unexpected liberality, there was joined in him, too, such a divine madness, though with large and sublime features, as that of those dibblers of beans honesty. George's Hill, whom Carlyle tells of. He still listened to ancient and decaying oracles. If his actions were not always what Christianity or the truest philosophy teaches, still they never fail to impress us as noble, and however violent. Will always be pardoned to the great purpose and sincerity of the man. His unquestionable hardness, not to say willfulness, not prevailing by absolute truth and greatness of character, but honestly striving to bend things to his will, is yet grateful to consider in this or any age. As John Maidstone said, he was a strong man in the dark perils of war, in the high places of the field, hope shone in him like a pillar of fire, when it had gone out in the others. And as Milton sang, whose least testimony cannot be spared. Our chief of men, guided by faith and matchless fortitude. None ever spake to Cromwell before, sending a word of cheer across the centuries, not the, here. Here, of modern parliaments, but the congratulation and sympathy of a brother soul. The letters and speeches owe not a little to the, intercalations, and, annotations, of the, latest of the commentators. The reader will not soon forget how like a happy Merchong in the crowd, listening to his favorite speaker, he is all on the alert and sympathetic, nudging his neighbors from time to time, and throwing in his responsive or interrogatory word. All is good, both that which he didn't hear, and that which he did. He not only makes him speak audibly, but he makes all parties listen to him, all England sitting round, and given their comments, groans, or blushes, or assent. Indulging sometimes in triumphant malicious applications to the present day, when there is a palpable hit. Supplying the look and attitude of the speaker, and the tone of his voice, and even rescuing his unutterable. Wrecked and submerged thought, for this orator begins speaking anywhere within sight of the beginning, and leaves off when the conclusion is visible. Our merchant listens, restless, meanwhile, encouraging his fellow auditors, when the speech grows dim and involved, and pleasantly congratulating them, when it runs smoothly. Or, in touching soliloquy, he exclaims, Poor Oliver, noble Oliver, courage, my brave one. And all along, between the letters and speeches, as readers well remember, 
he has ready such a fresh top of the morning salutation as conjures up the spirits of those days. And men go marching over English sward, not wired skeletons, but with firm, elastic muscles, and clang of armor on their thighs, if they wore swords. Or the twang of psalms and canticles on their lips. His blunt, Who are you, put to the shadowy ghosts of history, they vanish into deeper obscurity than ever. Vivid phantasmagorian pictures of what is transpiring in England in the meanwhile, there are, not a few, better than if you had been there to see. All of Carlyle's works might well enough be embraced under the title of one of them, A Good Specimen Brick, On Heroes, Hero Worship, and The Heroic in History. Of this department he is the chief professor in the world's university, and even leaves Plutarch behind. Such intimate and living, such loyal and generous sympathy with the heroes of history, not one in one age only, but forty in forty ages, such an unparalleled reviewing and greeting of all past worth. With exceptions, to be sure, but exceptions were the rule before, it was, indeed, to make this the age of review writing, as if now one period of the human story were completing itself. And getting its accounts settled. This soldier has told the stories with new emphasis, and will be a memorable hander down of fame to posterity. And with what wise discrimination he has selected his men, with reference both to his own genius and to theirs, Muhammad, Dante, Cromwell, Voltaire, Johnson, Burns, Goethe, Kichter, Schiller. Mirabeau, could any of these have been spared? These we wanted to hear about. We have not as commonly the cold and refined judgment of the scholar and critic merely, but something more human and affecting. These eulogies have the glow and warmth of friendship. There is sympathy, not with mere fames, and formless, incredible things, but with kindred men, not transiently, but lifelong he has walked with them. The attitude of some, in relation to Carlyle's love of heroes, and men of the sword, reminds us of the procedure at the anti-slavery meetings, when some member, being warmed, begins to speak with more latitude than usual of the Bible or the Church, for a few prudent and devout ones to spring a prayer upon him, as the saying is. That is, propose suddenly to unite in prayer, and so solemnize the minds of the audience, or dismiss them at once, which may oftener be to interrupt a true prayer by most gratuitous profanity. But the spring of this trap, we are glad to learn, has grown somewhat rusty, and is not so sure of late. No doubt, some of Carlyle's worthies, should they ever return to earth, would find themselves unpleasantly put upon their good behavior, to sustain their characters. But if he can return a man's life more perfect to our hands than it was left at his death, following out the design of its author, we shall have no great cause to complain. We do not want a daguerreotype likeness. All biography is the life of Adam, a much experienced man, and time withdraws something partial from the story of every individual, that the historian may supply something general. If these virtues were not in this man, perhaps they are in his biographer, no fatal mistake. Really, in any other sense, we never do, nor desire to, come at the historical man, unless we rob his grave, that is the nearest approach. Why did he die, then? He is with his bones, surely. No doubt Carlyle has a propensity to exaggerate the heroic in history, that is, he creates you an ideal hero rather than another thing, he has most of that material. This we allow in all its senses, and in one narrower sense it is not so convenient. Yet what were history if he did not exaggerate it? How comes it that history never has to wait for facts, but for a man to write it? The ages may go on forgetting the facts never so long, he can remember too for every one forgotten. The musty records of history, like the catacombs, contain the perishable remains, but only in the breast of genius are embalmed the souls of heroes. There is very little of what is called criticism here, it is love and reverence, rather, which deal with qualities not relatively, but absolutely great. For whatever is admirable in a man is something infinite, to which we cannot set bounds. These sentiments allow the mortal to die, the immortal and divine to survive. There is something antique, even, in his style of treating his subject, reminding us that heroes and demigods, fates and furies, still exist. 
The common man is nothing to him, but after death the hero is apotheosized and has a place in heaven, as in the religion of the Greeks. Exaggeration Was ever any virtue attributed to a man without exaggeration? Was ever any vice, without infinite exaggeration? Do we not exaggerate ourselves to ourselves, or do we recognize ourselves for the actual men we are? Are we not all great men? Yet what are we actually to speak of? We live by exaggeration, what else is it to anticipate more than we enjoy? The lightning is an exaggeration of the light. Exaggerated history is poetry, and truth referred to a new standard. To a small man every greater is an exaggeration. He who cannot exaggerate is not qualified to utter truth. No truth, we think, was ever expressed but with this sort of emphasis, so that for the time there seemed to be no other. Moreover, you must speak loud to those who are hard of hearing, and so you acquire a habit of shouting to those who are not. By an immense exaggeration we appreciate our Greek poetry and philosophy, and Egyptian ruins, our Shakespeare's and Milton's, our liberty and Christianity. We give importance to this hour over all other hours. We do not live by justice, but by grace. As the sort of justice which concerns us in our daily intercourse is not that administered by the judge, so the historical justice which we prize is not arrived at by nicely balancing the evidence. In order to appreciate any, even the humblest man, you must first, by some good fortune, have acquired a sentiment of admiration, even of reverence, for him. And there never were such exaggerators as these. Simple admiration for a hero renders a juster verdict than the wisest criticism, which necessarily degrades what is high to its own level. There is no danger in short of saying too much in praise of one man, provided you can say more in praise of a better man. If by exaggeration a man can create for us a hero, where there was nothing but dry bones before, we will thank him, and let dry as dust administer historical justice. This is where a true history properly begins, when some genius arises, who can turn the dry and musty records into poetry. As we say, looking to the future, that what is best is truest, so, in one sense, we may say looking into the past, for the only past that we are to look at, must also be future to us. The great danger is not of excessive partiality or sympathy with one, but of a shallow justice to many, in which, after all, none gets his deserts. Who has not experienced that praise is truer than naked justice? As if man were to be the judge of his fellows, and should repress his rising sympathy with the prisoner at the bar, considering the many honest men abroad, whom he had never countenanced. To try him by the German rule of referring an author to his own standard, we will quote the following from Carlyle's remarks on history. And leave the reader to consider how far his practice has been consistent with his theory. Truly, if history is philosophy teaching by experience, the writer fitted to compose history is hitherto an unknown man. The experience itself would require all knowledge to record it, were the all wisdom needful for such philosophy as would interpret it to be had for asking. Better were it that mere earthly historians should lower such pretensions, more suitable for omniscience than for human science. And aiming only at some picture of the things acted, which picture itself will at best be a poor approximation, leave the inscrutable purport of them an acknowledged secret. Or, at most, in reverent faith, far different from that teaching of philosophy, pause over the mysterious vestiges of him whose path is in the great deep of time, whom history indeed reveals. But only all history, and in eternity, will clearly reveal. Who lives in London to tell this generation who have been the great men of our race? We have read that on some exposed place in the city of Geneva, they have fixed a brazen indicator for the use of travellers, with the names of the mountain summits in the horizon marked upon it. So that by taking sight across the index you can distinguish them at once. You will not mistake Mont Blanc, if you see him, but until you get accustomed to the panorama, you may easily mistake one of his court for the king. It stands there a piece of mute brass, that seems nevertheless to know in what vicinity it is, and there perchance it will stand, when the nation that placed it there has passed away. Still in sympathy with the mountains, forever discriminating in the desert. So, we may say, 
stands this man, pointing as long as he lives, in obedience to some spiritual magnetism, to the summits in the historical horizon, for the guidance of his fellows. Truly, our greatest blessings are very cheap. To have our sunlight without paying for it, without any duty levied, to have our poet there in England, to furnish us entertainment, and, what is better provocation, from year to year. All our lives long, to make the world seem richer for us, the age more respectable, and life better worth the living, all without expense of acknowledgement even. But silently accepted out of the East, like morning light as a matter of course. On the duty of civil disobedience. From lectures delivered at the Concord Lyceum on January 26, 1848, first published as Resistance to Civil Government in the Anthology Aesthetic Papers in 1849. I heartily accept the motto, that government is best which governs least, and I should like to see it acted up to more rapidly and systematically. Carried out, it finally amounts to this, which also I believe, that government is best which governs not at all. And when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government which they will have. Government is at best but an expedient. But most governments are usually, and all governments are sometimes, inexpedient. The objections which have been brought against a standing army, and they are many and weighty, and deserve to prevail, may also at last be brought against a standing government. The standing army is only an arm of the standing government. The government itself, which is only the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will, is equally liable to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it. Witness the present Mexican War, the work of comparatively a few individuals using the standing government as their tool, for, in the outset, the people would not have consented to this measure. This American government, what is it but a tradition, though a recent one, endeavoring to transmit itself unimpaired to posterity, but each instant losing some of its integrity. It has not the vitality and force of a single living man, for a single man can bend it to his will. It is a sort of wooden gun to the people themselves. And, if ever they should use it in earnest as a real one against each other, it will surely split. But it is not the less necessary for this. For the people must have some complicated machinery or other, and here it's din, to satisfy that idea of government which they have. Governments show thus how successfully men can be imposed on, even impose on themselves, for their own advantage. It is excellent, we must all allow. Yet this government never of itself furthered any enterprise, but by the alacrity with which it got out of its way. It does not keep the country free. It does not settle the West. It does not educate. The character inherent in the American people has done all that has been accomplished, and it would have done somewhat more, if the government had not sometimes got in its way. For government is an expedient, by which men would fain succeed in letting one another alone, and, as has been said, when it is most expedient, the governed are most let alone by it. Trade and commerce, if they were not made of India rubber, would never manage to bounce over obstacles which legislators are continually putting in their way. And, if one were to judge these men wholly by the effects of their actions, and not partly by their intentions, they would deserve to be classed and punished with those mischievous persons who put obstructions on the railroads. But, to speak practically and as a citizen, unlike those who call themselves no government men, I ask for, not at once no government, but at once a better government. Let every man make known what kind of government would command his respect, and that will be one step toward obtaining it. After all, the practical reason why, when the power is once in the hands of the people, a majority are permitted, and for a long period continue, to rule, is not because they are most likely to be in the right, nor because this seems fairest to the minority, but because they are physically the strongest. But a government in which the majority rule in all cases cannot be based on justice, even as far as men understand it. Can there not be a government in which the majorities do not virtually decide right and wrong, but conscience? In which majorities decide only those questions to which the rule of expediency is applicable? Must the citizen ever for a moment, or in the least degree, resign his conscience to the legislator? Why has every man a conscience, then? 
I think that we should be men first, and subjects afterward. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law, so much as for the right. The only obligation which I have a right to assume, is to do at any time what I think right. It is truly enough said that a corporation has no conscience. But a corporation of conscientious men is a corporation with a conscience. Law never made men a whit more just. And, by means of their respect for it, even the well-disposed are daily made the agents of injustice. A common and natural result of an undue respect for the law is, that you may see a file of soldiers, colonel, captain, corporal, privates, powder monkeys and all. Marching in admirable order over hill and dale to the wars, against their wills, aye, against their common sense and consciences, which makes it very steep marching indeed. And produces a palpitation of the heart. They have no doubt that it is a damnable business in which they are concerned, they are all peaceably inclined. Now, what are they? Men at all? Or small movable forts and magazines, at the service of some unscrupulous man in power? Visit the navy yard, and behold a marine, such a man as an American government can make, or such as it can make a man with its black arts, a mere shadow and reminiscence of humanity. A man laid out alive and standing, and already, as one may say, buried under arms with funeral accompaniment, though it may be. Not a drum was heard, not a funeral note. As his course to the ramparts we hurried. Not a soldier discharged his farewell shot. O'er the grave where our hero we buried. The mass of men serve the state thus, not as men mainly, but as machines, with their bodies. They are the standing army, and the militia, jailers, constables, posse comitatus, etc. In most cases there is no free exercise whatever of the judgment or of the moral sense. But they put themselves on a level with wood and earth and stones, and wooden men can perhaps be manufactured that will serve the purpose as well. Such command no more respect than men of straw, or a lump of dirt. They have the same sort of worth only as horses and dogs. Yet such as these even are commonly esteemed good citizens. Others, as most legislators, politicians, lawyers, ministers, and officeholders, serve the state chiefly with their heads. And, as they rarely make any moral distinctions, they are as likely to serve the devil, without intending it, as God. A very few, as heroes, patriots, martyrs, reformers in the great sense, and men, serve the state with their consciences also, and so necessarily resist it for the most part. And they are commonly treated by it as enemies. A wise man will only be useful as a man, and will not submit to be clay, and stop a hole to keep the wind away. But leave that office to his dust at least. I am too highborn to be propertied. To be a secondary at control. Or useful serving man and instrument. To any sovereign state throughout the world. He who gives himself entirely to his fellow men appears to them useless and selfish, but he who gives himself partially to them is pronounced a benefactor and philanthropist. How does it become a man to behave toward the American government today? I answer that he cannot without disgrace be associated with it. I cannot for an instant recognize that political organization as my government which is the slave's government also. All men recognize the right of revolution. That is, the right to refuse allegiance to and to resist the government, when its tyranny or its inefficiency are great and unendurable. But almost all say that such is not the case now. But such was the case, they think, in the revolution of 75. If one were to tell me that this was a bad government because it taxed certain foreign commodities brought to its ports, it is most probable that I should not make an ado about it. For I can do without them, all machines have their friction. And possibly this does enough good to counterbalance the evil. At any rate, it is a great evil to make a stir about it. But when the friction comes to have its machine, and oppression and robbery are organized, I say, let us not have such a machine any longer. In other words, when a sixth of the population of a nation which has undertaken to be the refuge of liberty are slaves, and a whole country is unjustly overrun and conquered by a foreign army, and subjected to military law, 
I think that it is not too soon for honest men to rebel and revolutionize. What makes this duty the more urgent is the fact that the country so overrun is not our own, but ours is the invading army. Paley, a common authority with many on moral questions, in his chapter on the duty of submission to civil government, resolves all civil obligation into expediency. And he proceeds to say, that so long as the interest of the whole society requires it, that is, so long as the established government cannot be resisted or changed without public inconveniency. It is the will of God that the established government be obeyed, and no longer. This principle being admitted, the justice of every particular case of resistance is reduced to a computation of the quantity of the danger and grievance on the one side, and of the probability and expense of redressing it on the other. Of this, he says, every man shall judge for himself. But Paley appears never to have contemplated those cases to which the rule of expediency does not apply, in which a people, as well as an individual, must do justice, cost what it may. If I have unjustly wrested a plank from a drowning man, I must restore it to him though I drown myself. This, according to Paley, would be inconvenient. But he that would save his life, in such a case, shall lose it. This people must cease to hold slaves, and to make war on Mexico, though it cost them their existence as a people. In their practice, nations agree with Paley, but does anyone think that Massachusetts does exactly what is right at the present crisis? A drab of state, a clotho silver slut. To have her train borne up, and her soul trail in the dirt. Practically speaking, the opponents to a reform in Massachusetts are not a hundred thousand politicians at the South, but a hundred thousand merchants and farmers here. Who are more interested in commerce and agriculture than they are in humanity, and are not prepared to do justice to the slave and to Mexico, cost what it may. I quarrel not with far-off foes, but with those who, near at home, cooperate with, and do the bidding of those far away, and without whom the latter would be harmless. We are accustomed to say, that the mass of men are unprepared, but improvement is slow, because the few are not materially wiser or better than the many. It is not so important that many should be as good as you, as that there be some absolute goodness somewhere, for that will leaven the whole lump. There are thousands who are in opinion opposed to slavery and to the war, who yet in effect do nothing to put an end to them. Who, esteeming themselves children of Washington and Franklin, sit down with their hands in their pockets, and say that they know not what to do, and do nothing. Who even postpone the question of freedom to the question of free trade, and quietly read the prices current along with the latest advices from Mexico, after dinner, and, it may be, fall asleep over them both. What is the price current of an honest man and patriot today? They hesitate, and they regret, and sometimes they petition, but they do nothing in earnest and with effect. They will wait, well disposed, for others to remedy the evil, that they may no longer have it to regret. At most, they give only a cheap vote, and a feeble countenance and Godspeed, to the right, as it goes by them. There are 999 patrons of virtue to one virtuous man. But it is easier to deal with the real possessor of a thing than with the temporary guardian of it. All voting is a sort of gaming, like checkers or backgammon, with a slight moral tinge to it, a playing with right and wrong, with moral questions, and betting naturally accompanies it. The character of the voters is not staked. I cast my vote, perchance, as I think right, but I am not vitally concerned that that right should prevail. I am willing to leave it to the majority. Its obligation, therefore, never exceeds that of expediency. Even voting for the right is doing nothing for it. It is only expressing to men feebly your desire that it should prevail. A wise man will not leave the right to the mercy of chance, nor wish it to prevail through the power of the majority. There is but little virtue in the action of masses of men. When the majority shall at length vote for the abolition of slavery, it will be because they are indifferent to slavery, or because there is but little slavery left to be abolished by their vote. They will then be the only slaves. Only his vote can hasten the abolition of slavery who asserts his own freedom by his vote. I hear of a convention to be held at Baltimore, or elsewhere, 
for the selection of a candidate for the presidency, made up chiefly of editors, and men who are politicians by profession. But I think, what is it to any independent, intelligent, and respectable man what decision they may come to, shall we not have the advantage of his wisdom and honesty, nevertheless? Can we not count upon some independent votes? Are there not many individuals in the country who do not attend conventions? But no, I find that the respectable man, so called, has immediately drifted from his position, and despairs of his country, when his country has more reasons to despair of him. He forthwith adopts one of the candidates thus selected as the only available one, thus proving that he is himself available for any purposes of the demagogue. His vote is of no more worth than that of any unprincipled foreigner or hireling native, who may have been bought. Oh for a man who is a man, and, as my neighbor says, has a bone in his back which you cannot pass your hand through. Our statistics are at fault, the population has been returned too large. How many men are there to a square thousand miles in the country? Hardly one. Does not America offer any inducement for men to settle here? The American has dwindled into an odd fellow, one who may be known by the development of his organ of gregariousness, and a manifest lack of intellect and cheerful self-reliance. Whose first and chief concern, on coming into the world, is to see that the almshouses are in good repair. And, before yet he has lawfully donned the virile garb, to collect a fund for the support of the widows and orphans that may be. Who, in short, ventures to live only by the aid of the mutual insurance company, which has promised to bury him decently. It is not a man's duty, as a matter of course, to devote himself to the eradication of any, even the most enormous wrong, he may still properly have other concerns to engage him. But it is his duty, at least, to wash his hands of it, and, if he gives it no thought longer, not to give it practically his support. If I devote myself to other pursuits and contemplations, I must first see, at least, that I do not pursue them sitting upon another man's shoulders. I must get off him first, that he may pursue his contemplations too. See what gross inconsistency is tolerated. I have heard some of my townsmen say, I should like to have them order me out to help put down an insurrection of the slaves, or to march to Mexico, see if I would go. And yet these very men have each, directly by their allegiance, and so indirectly, at least, by their money, furnished a substitute. The soldier is applauded who refuses to serve in an unjust war by those who do not refuse to sustain the unjust government which makes the war. Is applauded by those whose own act and authority he disregards and sets at naught. As if the state were penitent to that degree that it hired one to scourge it while it sinned, but not to that degree that it left off sinning for a moment. Thus, under the name of order and civil government, we are all made at last to pay homage to and support our own meanness. After the first blush of sin, comes its indifference. And from immoral it becomes, as it were, unmoral, and not quite unnecessary to that life which we have made. The broadest and most prevalent error requires the most disinterested virtue to sustain it. The slight reproach to which the virtue of patriotism is commonly liable, the noble are most likely to incur. Those who, while they disapprove of the character and measures of a government, yield to it their allegiance and support, are undoubtedly its most conscientious supporters. And so frequently the most serious obstacles to reform. Some are petitioning the state to dissolve the union, to disregard the requisitions of the president. Why do they not dissolve it themselves, the union between themselves and the state, and refuse to pay their quota into its treasury? Do not they stand in same relation to the state, that the state does to the union? And have not the same reasons prevented the state from resisting the union, which have prevented them from resisting the state? How can a man be satisfied to entertain an opinion merely, and enjoy it? Is there any enjoyment in it, if his opinion is that he is aggrieved? If you are cheated out of a single dollar by your neighbor, you do not rest satisfied with knowing you are cheated, or with saying that you are cheated. Or even with petitioning him to pay you your due. But you take effectual steps at once to obtain the full amount, and see that you are never cheated again. Action from principle the perception and the performance of right, changes things and relations, 
it is essentially revolutionary, and does not consist wholly with anything which was. It not only divided states and churches, it divides families, I, it divides the individual, separating the diabolical in him from the divine. Unjust laws exist, shall we be content to obey them, or shall we endeavor to amend them, and obey them until we have succeeded, or shall we transgress them at once? Men generally, under such a government as this, think that they ought to wait until they have persuaded the majority to alter them. They think that, if they should resist, the remedy would be worse than the evil. But it is the fault of the government itself that the remedy is worse than the evil. It makes it worse. Why is it not more apt to anticipate and provide for reform? Why does it not cherish its wise minority? Why does it cry and resist before it is hurt? Why does it not encourage its citizens to be on the alert to point out its faults, and do better than it would have them? Why does it always crucify Christ, and excommunicate Copernicus and Luther, and pronounce Washington and Franklin rebels? One would think that a deliberate and practical denial of its authority was the only offense never contemplated by government. Else, why has it not assigned its definite, its suitable and proportionate penalty? If a man who has no property refuses but wants to earn nine shillings for the state, he is put in prison for a period unlimited by any law that I know. And determined only by the discretion of those who placed him there. But if he should steal ninety times nine shillings from the state, he is soon permitted to go at large again. If the injustice is part of the necessary friction of the machine of government, let it go, let it go, perchance it will wear smooth, certainly the machine will wear out. If the injustice has a spring, or a pulley, or a rope, or a crank, exclusively for itself, then perhaps you may consider whether the remedy will not be worse than the evil. But if it is of such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then, I say, break the law. Let your life be a counter-friction to stop the machine. What I have to do is to see, at any rate, that I do not lend myself to the wrong which I condemn. As for adopting the ways which the state has provided for remedying the evil, I know not of such ways. They take too much time, and a man's life will be gone. I have other affairs to attend to. I came into this world, not chiefly to make this a good place to live in, but to live in it, be it good or bad. A man has not everything to do, but something. And because he cannot do everything, it is not necessary that he should do something wrong. It is not my business to be petitioning the governor or the legislature any more than it is theirs to petition me, and, if they should not hear my petition, what should I do then? But in this case the state has provided no way, its very constitution is the evil. This may seem to be harsh and stubborn and unconciliatory. But it is to treat with the utmost kindness and consideration the only spirit that can appreciate or deserves it. So is all change for the better like birth and death which convulse the body. I do not hesitate to say, that those who call themselves abolitionists should at once effectually withdraw their support, both in person and property, from the government of Massachusetts. And not wait till they constitute a majority of one, before they suffer the right to prevail through them. I think that it is enough if they have God on their side, without waiting for that other one. Moreover, any man more right than his neighbors constitutes a majority of one already. I meet this American government, or its representative, the state government, directly, and face to face, once a year, no more, in the person of its tax gatherer. This is the only mode in which a man situated as I am necessarily meets it, and it then says distinctly, recognize me. And the simplest, the most effectual, and, in the present posture of affairs, the indispensablest mode of treating with it on this head, of expressing your little satisfaction with and love for it, is to deny it then. My civil neighbor, the tax-gatherer, is the very man I have to deal with, for it is, after all, with men and not with parchment that I quarrel, and he has voluntarily chosen to be an agent of the government. How shall he ever know well what he is and does as an officer of the government, or as a man, until he is obliged to consider whether he shall treat me, his neighbor, for whom he has respect. As a neighbor and well-disposed man, or as a maniac and disturber of the peace. 
and see if he can get over this obstruction to his neighborliness without a ruder and more impetuous thought or speech corresponding with his action? I know this well, that if one thousand, if one hundred, if ten men whom I could name, if ten honest men only, I, if one honest man, in this state of Massachusetts, ceasing to hold slaves, were actually to withdraw from this copartnership, and be locked up in the county jail therefore, it would be the abolition of slavery in America. For it matters and not how small the beginning may seem to be, what is once well done is done forever. But we love better to talk about it, that we say is our mission. Reform keeps many scores of newspapers in its service, but not one man. If my esteemed neighbor, the state's ambassador, who will devote his days to the settlement of the question of human rights in the council chamber, instead of being threatened with the prisons of Carolina, were to sit down the prisoner of Massachusetts. That state which is so anxious to foist the sin of slavery upon her sister, though at present she can discover only an act of inhospitality to be the ground of a quarrel with her, the legislature would not wholly waive the subject of the following winter. Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also a prison. The proper place today, the only place which Massachusetts has provided for her freer and less desponding spirits, is in her prisons, to be put out and locked out of the state by her own act. As they have already put themselves out by their principles. It is there that the fugitive slave, and the Mexican prisoner on parole, and the Indian come to plead the wrongs of his race, should find them. On that separate, but more free and honorable ground, where the state places those who are not with her but against her, the only house in a slave state in which a free man can abide with honor. If any think that their influence would be lost there, and their voices no longer afflict the ear of the state, that they would not be as an enemy within its walls. They do not know by how much truth is stronger than error, nor how much more eloquently and effectively he can combat injustice who has experienced a little in his own person. Cast your whole vote, not a strip of paper merely, but your whole influence. A minority is powerless while it conforms to the majority, it is not even a minority then. But it is irresistible when it clogs by its whole weight. If the alternative is to keep all just men in prison, or give up war and slavery, the state will not hesitate which to choose. If a thousand men were not to pay their tax bills this year, that would not be a violent and bloody measure, as it would be to pay them. And enable the state to commit violence and shed innocent blood. This is, in fact, the definition of a peaceable revolution, if any such is possible. If the tax-gatherer, or any other public officer, asks me, as one has done, but what shall I do? My answer is, if you really wish to do anything, resign your office. When the subject has refused allegiance, and the officer has resigned his office, then the revolution is accomplished. But even suppose blood should flow. Is there not a sort of blood shed when the conscience is wounded? Through this wound a man's real manhood and immortality flow out, and he bleeds to an everlasting death. I see this blood flowing now. I have contemplated the imprisonment of the offender, rather than the seizure of his goods, though both will serve the same purpose, because they who assert the purest right, and consequently are most dangerous to a corrupt state, commonly have not spent much time in accumulating property. To such the state renders comparatively small service, and a slight tax is wont to appear exorbitant, particularly if they are obliged to earn it by special labor with their hands. If there were one who lived wholly without the use of money, the state itself would hesitate to demand it of him. But the rich man, not to make any invidious comparison, is always sold to the institution which makes him rich. Absolutely speaking, the more money, the less virtue. For money comes between a man and his objects, and obtains them for him, it was certainly no great virtue to obtain it. It puts to rest many questions which he would otherwise be taxed to answer. While the only new question which it puts is the hard but superfluous one, how to spend it. Thus his moral ground is taken from under his feet. The opportunities of living are diminished in proportion as what are called the means, are increased. The best thing a man can do for his culture when he is rich is to endeavor to carry out those schemes which he entertained when he was poor. 
Christ answered the Herodians according to their condition. Show me the tribute money, said he, and one took a penny out of his pocket. If you use money which has the image of Caesar on it, and which he has made current and valuable, that is, if you are men of the state, and gladly enjoy the advantages of Caesar's government. Then pay him back some of his own when he demands it. Render therefore to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God those things which are God's, leaving them no wiser than before as to which was which, for they did not wish to know. When I converse with the freest of my neighbors, I perceive that, whatever they may say about the magnitude and seriousness of the question, and their regard for the public tranquillity. The long and the short of the matter is, that they cannot spare the protection of the existing government, and they dread the consequences of disobedience to it to their property and families. For my own part, I should not like to think that I ever rely on the protection of the state. But, if I deny the authority of the state when it presents its tax bill, it will soon take and waste all my property, and so harass me and my children without end. This is hard. This makes it impossible for a man to live honestly and at the same time comfortably in outward respects. It will not be worth the while to accumulate property, that would be sure to go again. You must hire or squat somewhere, and raise but a small crop, and eat that soon. You must live within yourself, and depend upon yourself, always tucked up and ready for a start, and not have many affairs. A man may grow rich in Turkey even, if he will be in all respects a good subject of the Turkish government. Confucius said, if a state is governed by the principles of reason, poverty and misery are subjects of shame. If a state is not governed by the principles of reason, riches and honors are the subjects of shame. No, until I want the protection of Massachusetts to be extended to me in some distant southern port, where my liberty is endangered. Or until I am bent solely on building up an estate at home by peaceful enterprise, I can afford to refuse allegiance to Massachusetts, and her right to my property and life. It costs me less in every sense to incur the penalty of disobedience to the state, than it would to obey. I should feel as if I were worth less in that case. Some years ago, the state met me in behalf of the church, and commanded me to pay a certain sum toward the support of a clergyman whose preaching my father attended, but never I myself. Pay it, it said, or be locked up in the jail. I declined to pay. But, unfortunately, another man saw fit to pay it. I did not see why the schoolmaster should be taxed to support the priest, and not the priest the schoolmaster. For I was not the state's schoolmaster, but I supported myself by voluntary subscription. I did not see why the Lyceum should not present its tax bill, and have the state to back its demand, as well as the church. However, at the request of the selectmen, I condescended to make some such statement as this in writing, Know all men by these presents, that I, Henry Thoreau, do not wish to be regarded as a member of any incorporated society which I have not joined. This I gave to the town clerk, and he has it. The state, having thus learned that I did not wish to be regarded as a member of that church, has never made a like demand on me since. Though it said that it must adhere to its original presumption that time. If I had known how to name them, I should then have signed off in detail from all the societies which I never signed on to. But I did not know where to find such a complete list. I have paid no poll tax for six years. I was put into a jail once on this account, for one night. And, as I stood considering the walls of solid stone, two or three feet thick, the door of wood and iron, a foot thick, and the iron grating which strained the light. I could not help being struck with the foolishness of that institution which treated me as if I were mere flesh and blood and bones, to be locked up. I wondered that it should have concluded at length that this was the best use it could put me to, and had never thought to avail itself of my services in some way. I saw that, if there was a wall of stone between me and my townsmen, there was a still more difficult one to climb or break through, before they could get to be as free as I was. I did nor for a moment feel confined, and the walls seemed a great waste of stone and mortar. I felt as if I alone of all my townsmen had paid my tax. They plainly did not know how to treat me, but behaved like persons who are underbred. 
In every threat and in every compliment there was a blunder. For they thought that my chief desire was to stand the other side of that stone wall. I could not but smile to see how industriously they locked the door on my meditations, which followed them out again without let or hindrance, and they were really all that was dangerous. As they could not reach me, they had resolved to punish my body, just as boys, if they cannot come at some person against whom they have a spite, will abuse his dog. I saw that the state was half-witted, that it was timid as a lone woman with her silver spoons, and that it did not know its friends from its foes, and I lost all my remaining respect for it. And pitted it. Thus the state never intentionally confronts a man's sense, intellectual or moral, but only his body, his senses. It is not armed with superior wit or honesty, but with superior physical strength. I was not born to be forced. I will breathe after my own fashion. Let us see who is the strongest. What force has a multitude? They only can force me who obey a higher law than I. They force me to become like themselves. I do not hear of men being forced to live this way or that by masses of men. What sort of life were that to live? When I meet a government which says to me, your money or your life, why should I be in haste to give it my money? It may be in a great strait, and not know what to do, I cannot help that. It must help itself, do as I do. It is not worth the while to snivel about it. I am not responsible for the successful working of the machinery of society. I am not the son of the engineer. I perceive that, when an acorn and a chestnut fall side by side, the one does not remain inert to make way for the other, but both obey their own laws. And spring and grow and flourish as best they can, till one, perchance, overshadows and destroys the other. If a plant cannot live according to its nature, it dies, and so a man. The night in prison was novel and interesting enough. The prisoners in their shirt sleeves were enjoying a chat and the evening air in the doorway, when I entered. But the jailer said, Come, boys, it is time to lock up. And so they dispersed, and I heard the sound of their steps returning into the hollow apartments. My roommate was introduced to me by the jailer as a first rate fellow and a clever man. When the door was locked, he showed me where to hang my hat, and how he managed matters there. The rooms were whitewashed once a month. And this one, at least, was the whitest, most simply furnished, and probably the neatest apartment in town. He naturally wanted to know where I came from, and what brought me there. And, when I had told him, I asked him in my turn how he came there, presuming him to be an honest man, of course, and, as the world goes, I believe he was. Why, said he, they accuse me of burning a barn, but I never did it. As near as I could discover, he had probably gone to bed in a barn when drunk, and smoked his pipe there. And so a barn was burnt. He had the reputation of being a clever man, had been there some three months waiting for his trial to come on, and would have to wait as much longer. But he was quite domesticated and contented, since he got his board for nothing, and thought that he was well treated. He occupied one window, and I the other. And I saw, that, if one stayed there long, his principal business would be to look out the window. I had soon read all the tracks that were left there, and examined where former prisoners had broken out, and where a grate had been sawed off. And heard the history of the various occupants of that room. For I found that even here there was a history and a gossip which never circulated beyond the walls of the jail. Probably this is the only house in the town where verses are composed, which are afterward printed in a circular form, but not published. I was shown quite a long list of verses which were composed by some young men who had been detected in an attempt to escape, who avenged themselves by singing them. I pumped my fellow prisoner as dry as I could, for fear I should never see him again, but at length he showed me which was my bed, and left me to blow out the lamp. It was like travelling into a far country, such as I had never expected to behold, to lie there for one night. It seemed to me that I never had heard the town clock strike before, nor the evening sounds of the village, for we slept with the windows open, which were inside the grating. It was to see my native village in the light of the Middle Ages, and our concord was turned into a Rhine stream, 
and visions of knights and castles passed before me. They were the voices of old burghers that I heard in the streets. I was an involuntary spectator and auditor of whatever was done and said in the kitchen of the adjacent village inn, a wholly new and rare experience to me. It was a closer view of my native town. I was fairly inside of it. I never had seen its institutions before. This is one of its peculiar institutions, for it is a shire town. I began to comprehend what its inhabitants were about. In the morning, our breakfasts were put through the hole in the door, in small oblong square tin pans, made to fit, and holding a pint of chocolate, with brown bread, and an iron spoon. When they called for the vessels again, I was green enough to return what bread I had left, but my comrade seized it, and said that I should lay that up for lunch or dinner. Soon after, he was let out to work at haying in a neighboring field, whither he went every day, and would not be back till noon. So he bade me good day, saying that he doubted if he should see me again. When I came out of prison, for someone interfered, and paid the tax, I did not perceive that great changes had taken place on the common, such as he observed who went in a youth. And emerged a grey-headed man. And yet a change had to my eyes come over the scene, the town, and state, and country, greater than any that mere time could effect. I saw yet more distinctly the state in which I lived. I saw to what extent the people among whom I lived could be trusted as good neighbors and friends, that their friendship was for summer weather only, that they did not greatly purpose to do right. That they were a distinct race from me by their prejudices and superstitions, as the Chinamen and Malays are, that, in their sacrifices to humanity they ran no risks, not even to their property. That, after all, they were not so noble but they treated the thief as he had treated them, and hoped, by a certain outward observance and a few prayers. And by walking in a particular straight though useless path from time to time, to save their souls. This may be to judge my neighbors harshly, for I believe that most of them are not aware that they have such an institution as the jail in their village. It was formerly the custom in our village, when a poor debtor came out of jail, for his acquaintances to salute him, looking through their fingers. Which were crossed to represent the grating of a jail window, how do you do? My neighbors did not thus salute me, but first looked at me, and then at one another, as if I had returned from a long journey. I was put into jail as I was going to the shoemakers to get a shoe which was mended. When I was let out the next morning, I proceeded to finish my errand, and, having put on my mended shoe, joined a huckleberry party, who were impatient to put themselves under my conduct. And in half an hour, for the horse was soon tackled, was in the midst of a huckleberry field, on one of our highest hills, two miles off, and then the state was nowhere to be seen. This is the whole history of my prisons. I have never declined paying the highway tax, because I am as desirous of being a good neighbor as I am of being a bad subject. And, as for supporting schools, I am doing my part to educate my fellow countrymen now. It is for no particular item in the tax bill that I refuse to pay it. I simply wish to refuse allegiance to the state, to withdraw and stand aloof from it effectually. I do not care to trace the course of my dollar, if I could, till it buys a man, or a musket to shoot one with, the dollar is innocent, but I am concerned to trace the effects of my allegiance. In fact, I quietly declare war with the state, after my fashion, though I will still make use and get what advantages of her I can, as is usual in such cases. If others pay the tax which is demanded of me, from a sympathy with the state, they do but what they have already done in their own case. Or rather they abet injustice to a greater extent than the state requires. If they pay the tax from a mistaken interest in the individual taxed, to save his property or prevent his going to jail. It is because they have not considered wisely how far they let their private feelings interfere with the public good. This, then, is my position at present. But one cannot be too much on his guard in such a case, lest his actions be biased by obstinacy, or an undue regard for the opinions of men. Let him see that he does only what belongs to himself and to the hour. I think sometimes, why, this people mean well, they are only ignorant. They would do better if they knew how, 
why give your neighbors this pain to treat you as they are not inclined to? But I think, again, this is no reason why I should do as they do, or permit others to suffer much greater pain of a different kind. Again, I sometimes say to myself, when many millions of men, without heat, without ill will, without personal feeling of any kind, demand of you a few shillings only, without the possibility. Such is their constitution, of retracting or altering their present demand, and without the possibility, on your side, of appeal to any other millions. Why expose yourself to this overwhelming brute force? You do not resist cold and hunger, the winds, and the waves, thus obstinately, you quietly submit to a thousand similar necessities. You do not put your head into the fire. But just in proportion as I regard this as not wholly a brute force, but partly a human force, and consider that I have relations to those millions as to so many millions of men. And not of mere brute or inanimate things, I see that appeal is possible, first and instantaneously, from them to the maker of them, and, secondly, from them to themselves. But, if I put my head deliberately into the fire, there is no appeal to fire or to the maker of fire, and I have only myself to blame. If I could convince myself that I have any right to be satisfied with men as they are, and to treat them accordingly, and not according, in some respects, to my requisitions and expectations of what they and I ought to be, then, like a good Mussulman and fatalist, I should endeavor to be satisfied with things as they are, and say it is the will of God. And, above all, there is this difference between resisting this and a purely brute or natural force, that I can resist this with some effect. But I cannot expect, like Orpheus, to change the nature of the rocks and trees and beasts. I do not wish to quarrel with any man or nation. I do not wish to split hairs, to make fine distinctions, or set myself up as better than my neighbors. I seek rather, I may say, even an excuse for conforming to the laws of the land. I am but too ready to conform to them. Indeed, I have reason to suspect myself on this head. And each year, as the tax-gatherer comes round, I find myself disposed to review the acts and position of the general and state governments. And the spirit of the people to discover a pretext for conformity. We must affect our country as our parents. And if at any time we alienate. Out love of industry from doing it honor. We must respect effects and teach the soul. Matter of conscience and religion and not desire of rule or benefit. I believe that the state will soon be able to take all my work of this sort out of my hands, and then I shall be no better patriot than my fellow countrymen. Seen from a lower point of view, the constitution, with all its faults, is very good, the law and the courts are very respectable. Even this state and this American government are, in many respects, very admirable and rare things, to be thankful for, such as a great many have described them. But seen from a point of view a little higher, they are what I have described them. Seen from a higher still, and the highest, who shall say what they are, or that they are worth looking at or thinking of at all? However, the government does not concern me much, and I shall bestow the fewest possible thoughts on it. It is not many moments that I live under a government, even in this world. If a man is thought free, fancy free, imagination free, that which is not never for a long time appearing to be to him, unwise rulers or reformers cannot fatally interrupt him. I know that most men think differently from myself, but those whose lives are by profession devoted to the study of these or kindred subjects content me as little as any. Statesmen and legislators, standing so completely within the institution, never distinctly and nakedly behold it. They speak of moving society, but have no resting place without it. They may be men of a certain experience and discrimination, and have no doubt invented ingenious and even useful systems, for which we sincerely thank them. But all their wit and usefulness lie within certain not very wide limits. They are wont to forget that the world is not governed by policy and expediency. Webster never goes behind government, and so cannot speak with authority about it. His words are wisdom to those legislators who contemplate no essential reform in the existing government. But for thinkers, and those who legislate for all time, he never once glances at the subject. 
I know of those whose serene and wise speculations on this theme would soon reveal the limits of his mind's range and hospitality. Yet, compared with the cheap professions of most reformers, and the still cheaper wisdom and eloquence of politicians in general, his are almost the only sensible and valuable words. And we thank heaven for him. Comparatively, he is always strong, original, and, above all, practical. Still his quality is not wisdom, but prudence. The lawyer's truth is not truth, but consistency, or a consistent expediency. Truth is always in harmony with herself, and is not concerned chiefly to reveal the justice that may consist with wrongdoing. He well deserves to be called, as he has been called, the defender of the Constitution. There are really no blows to be given by him but defensive ones. He is not a leader, but a follower. His leaders are the men of 87. I have never made an effort, he says, and never proposed to make an effort. I have never countenanced an effort, and never mean to countenance an effort, to disturb the arrangement as originally made, by which the various states came into the Union. Still thinking of the sanction which the Constitution gives to slavery, he says, because it was part of the original compact, let it stand. Notwithstanding his special acuteness and ability, he is unable to take a fact out of its merely political relations, and behold it as it lies absolutely to be disposed of by the intellect, what? For instance, it behoves a man to do here in America today with regard to slavery, but ventures, or is driven, to make some such desperate answer as the following. While professing to speak absolutely, and as a private man, from which what new and singular code of social duties might be inferred? The manner, says he, in which the governments of those states where slavery exists are to regulate it, is for their own consideration, under the responsibility to their constituents. To the general laws of propriety, humanity, and justice, and to God. Associations formed elsewhere, springing from a feeling of humanity, or any other cause, have nothing whatever to do with it. They have never received any encouragement from me and they never will. 7. They who know of no purer sources of truth, who have traced up its stream no higher, stand, and wisely stand, by the Bible and the Constitution, and drink at it there with reverence and humanity. But they who behold where it comes trickling into this lake or that pool, gird up their loins once more, and continue their pilgrimage toward its fountainhead. No man with a genius for legislation has appeared in America. They are rare in the history of the world. There are orators, politicians, and eloquent men, by the thousand. But the speaker has not yet opened his mouth to speak who is capable of settling the much vexed questions of the day. We love eloquence for its own sake, and not for any truth which it may utter, or any heroism it may inspire. Our legislators have not yet learned the comparative value of free trade and of freedom, of union, and of rectitude, to a nation. They have no genius or talent for comparatively humble questions of taxation and finance, commerce and manufactures and agriculture. If we were left solely to the wordy wit of legislators in Congress for our guidance, uncorrected by the seasonable experience and the effectual complaints of the people, America would not long retain her rank among the nations. For eighteen hundred years, though perchance I have no right to say it, the New Testament has been written. Yet where is the legislator who has wisdom and practical talent enough to avail himself of the light which it sheds on the science of legislation? The authority of government, even such as I am willing to submit to, for I will cheerfully obey those who know and can do better than I. And in many things even those who neither know nor can do so well, is still an impure one, to be strictly just, it must have the sanction and consent of the governed. It can have no pure right over my person and property but what I concede to it. The progress from an absolute to a limited monarchy, from a limited monarchy to a democracy, is a progress toward a true respect for the individual. Even the Chinese philosopher was wise enough to regard the individual as the basis of the empire. Is a democracy, such as we know it, the last improvement possible in government? Is it not possible to take a step further towards recognizing and organizing the rights of man? There will never be a really free and enlightened state, 
until the state comes to recognize the individual as a higher and independent power, from which all its own power and authority are derived, and treats him accordingly. I please myself with imagining a state at last which can afford to be just to all men, and to treat the individual with respect as a neighbor. Which even would not think it inconsistent with its own repose, if a few were to live aloof from it, not meddling with it, nor embraced by it. Who fulfilled all the duties of neighbors and fellow men. A state which bore this kind of fruit, and suffered it to drop off as fast as it ripened, would prepare the way for a still more perfect and glorious state, which also I have imagined. But not yet anywhere seen. Sir Walter Raleigh. Apparently written over a period of several years in the 1840s, but only edited and published posthumously, in 1905. Perhaps no one in English history better represents the heroic character than Sir Walter Raleigh, for Sidney has got to be almost as shadowy as Arthur himself. Raleigh's somewhat antique and Roman virtues appear in his numerous military and naval adventures, in his knightly conduct toward the Queen, in his poems and his employments in the Tower. And not least in his death, but more than all in his constant soldier-like bearing and promise. He was the Bayard of peaceful as well as warlike enterprise, and few lives which are the subject of recent and trustworthy history are so agreeable to the imagination. Notwithstanding his temporary unpopularity, he especially possessed the prevalent and popular qualities which command the admiration of men. If an English Plutarch were to be written, Raleigh would be the best Greek or Roman among them all. He was one whose virtues if they were not distinctively great yet gave to virtues a current stamp and value as it were by the very grace and loftiness with which he carried them. One of nature's noblemen who possessed those requisites to true nobility without which no heraldry nor blood can avail. Among savages he would still have been chief. He seems to have had, not a profounder or grander but, so to speak, more nature than other men, a great, irregular, luxuriant nature, fit to be the darling of a people. The enthusiastic and often extravagant, but always hearty and emphatic, tone in which he is spoken of by his contemporaries is not the least remarkable fact about him. And it does not matter much whether the current stories are true or not, since they at least prove his reputation. It is not his praise to have been a saint or a seer in his generation, but one of the gallantiest worthies that ever England bred. The stories about him testify to a character rather than a virtue. As, for instance, that, he was damnable proud. Old Sir Robert Harley of Brampton Bryan Castle, who knew him, would say, T was a great question, who was the proudest, Sir Walter or Sir Thomas Overbury, but the difference that was. Was judged on Sir Thomas's side. That, in his youth his companions were boisterous blades, but generally those that had wit. That on one occasion he beats one of them for making a noise in a tavern, and seals up his mouth, his upper and nether beard, with hard wax. A young contemporary says, I have heard his enemies confess that he was one of the weightiest and wisest men that the island ever bred. And another gives this character of him, who hath not known or read of this prodigy of wit and fortune, Sir Walter Raleigh. A man unfortunate in nothing else but in the greatness of his wit and advancement, whose eminent worth was such, both in domestic policy, foreign expeditions, and discoveries, in arts and literature both practic and contemplative, that it might seem at once to conquer example and imitation. And what we are told of his personal appearance is accordant with the rest, that, he had in the outward man a good presence, in a handsome and well-compacted person. That, he was a tall, handsome, and bold man, and his, was thought a very good face, though, his countenance was somewhat spoiled by the unusual height of his forehead. He was such a person, every way, that, as King Charles I says of the Lord Strafford, a prince would rather be afraid of, than ashamed of. And had an, awfulness and ascendancy in his aspect over other mortals. And we are not disappointed to learn that he indulged in a splendid dress, and, notwithstanding his so great mastership in style, and his conversation with the learnedest and politest persons. Yet he spake broad Devonshire to his dying day. 8. Such a character as this was well suited to the time in which he lived. His age was an unusually stirring one. 
The discovery of America and the successful progress of the Reformation opened a field for both the intellectual and physical energies of his generation. The fathers of his age were Calvin and Knox, and Cranmer, and Pizarro, and Garcilaso. And its immediate forefathers were Luther and Raphael, and Bayard and Angelo, and Ariosto, and Copernicus, and Machiavel, and Erasmus, and Cabot, and Ziminish, and Columbus. Its device might have been an anchor, a sword, and a quill. The Pizarro laid by his sword at intervals and took to his letters. The Columbus set sail for newer worlds still, by voyages which needed not the patronage of princes. The Bayard alighted from his steed to seek adventures no less arduous than heretofore upon the ocean and in the western world. And the Luther who had reformed religion began now to reform politics and science. In Raleigh's youth, however it may have concerned him, Camoens was writing a heroic poem in Portugal, and the arts still had their representative in Paul Veronese of Italy. He may have been one to welcome the works of Tasso and Montaigne to England, and when he looked about him he might have found such men as Cervantes and Sidney. Men of like pursuits and not altogether dissimilar genius from himself, for his contemporaries, a Drake to rival him on the sea, and a Hudson in western adventure. A Halley, a Galileo, and a Kepler, for his astronomers, a Bacon, a Bayman, and a Burton, for his philosophers, and a Johnson, a Spencer, and a Shakespeare, his poets for refreshment and inspiration. But that we may know how worthy he himself was to make one of this illustrious company, and may appreciate the great activity and versatility of his genius. We will glance hastily at the various aspects of his life. He was a proper knight, a born cavalier, who in the intervals of war betook himself still to the most vigorous arts of peace, though as if diverted from his proper aim. He makes us doubt if there is not some worthier apology for war than has been discovered, for its modes and manners were an instinct with him. And though in his writings he takes frequent occasion sincerely to condemn its folly, and show the better policy and advantage of peace, yet he speaks with the uncertain authority of a warrior still. To whom those juster wars are not simply the dire necessity he would imply. In whatever he is engaged we seem to see a plume waving over his head, and a sword dangling at his side. Born in 1552, the last year of the reign of Edward VI, we find that not long after, by such instinct as makes the young crab seek the seashore, he has already marched into France. As one of, a troop of a hundred gentlemen volunteers, who are described as, a gallant company, nobly mounted and accoutred, having on their colors the motto, Finum det mihi virtus, let valor be my aim. And so in fact he marched on through life with this motto in his heart always. All the peace of those days seems to have been but a truce, or casual interruption of the order of war. War with Spain, especially, was so much the rule rather than the exception that the navigators and commanders of these two nations, when abroad, acted on the presumption that their countries were at war at home, though they had left them at peace. And their respective colonies in America carried on war at their convenience, with no infraction of the treaties between the mother countries. Raleigh seems to have regarded the Spaniards as his natural enemies, and he was not backward to develop this part of his nature. When England was threatened with foreign invasion, the Queen looked to him especially for advice and assistance, and none was better able to give them than he. We cannot but admire the tone in which he speaks of his island, and how it is to be best defended, and the navy, its chief strength, maintained and improved. He speaks from England as his castle, and his, as no other man's, is the voice of the state. For he does not assert the interests of an individual but of a commonwealth, and we see in him revived a Roman patriotism. His actions, as they were public and for the public, were fit to be publicly rewarded. And we accordingly read with equanimity of gold chains and monopolies and other emoluments conferred on him from time to time for his various services, his military successes in Ireland. That commonweal of common woe, as he even then described it. His enterprise in the harbour of Cadiz, his capture of Fayal from the Spaniards, and other exploits which perhaps, more than anything else, got him fame and a name during his lifetime. If war was his earnest work, it was his pastime too. 
for in the peaceful intervals we hear of him participating heartily and bearing off the palm in the birthday tournaments and tilting matches of the queen. Where the combatants vied with each other mainly who should come on to the ground in the most splendid dress and equipments. In those tilts it is said that his political rival, Essex, whose wealth enabled him to lead the costliest train, but who ran very ill and was thought the poorest knight of all, was wont to change his suit from orange to green, that it might be said that, there was one in green who ran worse than one in orange. None of the worthies of that age can be duly appreciated if we neglect to consider them in their relation to the new world. The stirring spirits stood with but one foot on the land. There were Drake, Hawkins, Hudson, Frobisher, and many others, and their worthy companion was Raleigh. As a navigator and naval commander he had few equals, and if the reader who has attended to his other actions inquires how he filled up the odd years, he will find that they were spent in numerous voyages to America for the purposes of discovery and colonization. He would be more famous for these enterprises if they were not overshadowed by the number and variety of his pursuits. His persevering care and oversight as the patron of Virginia, discovered and planted under his auspices in 1584, present him in an interesting light to the American reader. The work of colonization was well suited to his genius. And if the necessity of England herself had not required his attention and presence at this time, he would possibly have realized some of his dreams in plantations and cities on our coast. England has since felt the benefit of his experience in naval affairs. For he was one of the first to assert their importance to her, and he exerted himself especially for the improvement of naval architecture, on which he has left a treatise. He also composed a discourse on the art of war at sea, a subject which at that time had never been treated. We can least bear to consider Raleigh as a courtier. Though the court of England at that time was a field not altogether unworthy of such a courtier. His competitors for fame and favor there were Burley, Leicester, Sussex, Buckingham, and, be it remembered, Sir Philip Sidney, whose Arcadia was just finished when Raleigh came to court. Sidney was his natural companion and other self, as it were, as if nature, in her anxiety to confer one specimen of a true knight and courtier on that age, had cast two in the same mold. Lest one should miscarry. These two kindred spirits are said to have been mutually attracted toward each other. And there, too, was Queen Elizabeth herself, the center of the court and of the kingdom. To whose service he consecrates himself, not so much as a subject to his sovereign, but as a knight to the service of his mistress. His intercourse with the queen may well have begun with the incident of the cloak, for such continued to be its character afterward. It has in the description an air of romance, and might fitly have made a part of his friend Sidney's Arcadia. The tale runs that the queen, walking one day in the midst of her courtiers, came to a miry place, when Raleigh, who was then unknown to her, taking off his rich plush cloak, spread it upon the ground for a footcloth. We are inclined to consider him as some knight, and a knight-errant, too, who had strayed into the precincts of the court, and practiced there the arts which he had learned in bower and hall and in the lists. Not but that he knew how to govern states as well as queens, but he brought to the task the gallantry and graces of chivalry, as well as the judgment and experience of a practical modern Englishman. The queen, says one, began to be taken with his elocution, and loved to hear his reasons to his demands, and the truth is she took him for a kind of oracle, which nettled them all. He rose rapidly in her favor, and became her indispensable counselor in all matters which concerned the state, for he was minutely acquainted with the affairs of England. And none better understood her commercial interests. But notwithstanding the advantage of his wisdom to England, we had rather think of him taking counsel with the winds and breakers of the American coast and the roar of the Spanish artillery, than with the Queen. But though he made a good use of his influence, for the most part, when obtained, he could descend to the grossest flattery to obtain this, and we could wish him forever banished from the court, whose favors he so earnestly sought. Yet that he who was one while the Queen of England's poor captive, could sometimes assume a manly and independent tone with her, appears from his answer when she once exclaimed. On his asking a favor for a friend, when, Sir Walter, will you cease to be a beggar? 
when your gracious majesty ceases to be a benefactor. His court life exhibits him in mean and frivolous relations, which make him lose that respect in our eyes which he had acquired elsewhere. The base use he made of his recovered influence, after having been banished from the court, and even suffered imprisonment in consequence of the queen's displeasure, to procure the disgrace and finally the execution of his rival Essex, who had been charged with treason, is the foulest stain upon his escutcheon. The one which it is hardest to reconcile with the nobleness and generosity which we are inclined to attribute to such a character. Revenge is most unheroic. His acceptance of bribes afterwards for using his influence in behalf of the Earl's adherents is not to be excused by the usage of the times. The times may change, but the laws of integrity and magnanimity are immutable. Nor are the terms on which he was the friend of Cecil, from motives of policy merely, more tolerable to consider. Yet we cannot but think that he frequently travelled a higher, though a parallel, course with the mob, and though he had their suffrages. To some extent deserves the praise which Johnson applies to another. That to the vulgar canst thyself apply. Treading a better path not contrary. We gladly make haste to consider him in what the world calls his misfortune, after the death of Elizabeth and the accession of James I. When his essentially nobler nature was separated from the base company of the court and the contaminations which his loyalty could not resist, though tested by imprisonment and the scaffold. His enemies had already prejudiced the king against him before James's accession to the throne, and when at length the English nobility were presented to his majesty, who, it will be remembered, was a Scotchman, and Raleigh's name was told, Raleigh. Exclaimed the king, O my soul, Mon, I have heard Raleigh of thee. His efforts to limit the king's power of introducing Scots into England contributed to increase his jealousy and dislike. And he was shortly after accused by Lord Cobham of participating in a conspiracy to place the Lady Arabella Stuart Nine on the throne. Owing mainly, it is thought, to the king's resentment, he was tried and falsely convicted of high treason. Though his accuser retracted in writing his whole accusation before the conclusion of the trial. In connection with his earlier behavior to Essex, it should be remembered that by his conduct on his own trial he in a great measure removed the ill will which existed against him on that account. At his trial, which is said to have been most unjustly and insolently conducted by Sir Edward Coke on the part of the Crown, he answered, says one, with that temper, wit, learning, courage, and judgment that, save that it went with the hazard of his life, it was the happiest day that ever he spent. The first two that brought the news of his condemnation to the king were Roger Ashton and a Scotsman, whereof one affirmed that never any man spake so well in times past, nor would in the world to come. And the other said, that whereas when he saw him first, he was so led with the common hatred that he would have gone a hundred miles to have seen him hanged, he would, ere he parted, have gone a thousand to have saved his life. Another says, he behaved himself so worthily, so wisely, and so temperately, that in half a day the mind of all the company was changed from the extremest hate to the extremest pity. And another said, to the lords he was humble, but not prostrate, to the jury affable, but not fawning. To the king's counsel patient, but not yielding to the imputations laid upon him, or neglecting to repel them with the spirit which became an injured and honorable man. And finally he followed the sheriff out of court in the expressive words of Sir Thomas Overbury, with admirable erection, but yet in such sort as became a man condemned. Raleigh prepared himself for immediate execution, but after his pretended accomplices had gone through the ceremony of a mock execution and been pardoned by the king. It satisfied the policy of his enemies to retain him a prisoner in the tower for thirteen years, with the sentence of death still unrevoked. In the meanwhile he solaced himself in his imprisonment with writing a history of the world and cultivating poetry and philosophy as the noblest deeds compatible with his confinement. It is satisfactory to contrast with his mean personal relations while at court his connection in the tower with the young Prince Henry, whose tastes and aspirations were of a stirring kind. As his friend and instructor. He addresses some of his shorter pieces to the prince, and in some instances they seem to have been written expressly for his use. He preaches to him as he was well able, from experience, 
a wiser philosophy than he had himself practiced, and was particularly anxious to correct in him a love of popularity which he had discovered. And to give him useful maxims for his conduct when he should take his father's place. He lost neither health nor spirits by thirteen years of captivity, but after having spent this, the literary era of his life, as in the retirement of his study. And having written the history of the old world, he began to dream of actions which would supply materials to the future historian of the new. It is interesting to consider him, a close prisoner as he was. Preparing for voyages and adventures which would require him to roam more broadly than was consistent with the comfort or ambition of his freest contemporaries. Already in 1595, eight years before his imprisonment, it will be remembered he had undertaken his first voyage to Guiana in person. Mainly, it is said, to recover favor with the queen, but doubtless it was much more to recover favor with himself, and exercise his powers in fields more worthy of him than a corrupt court. He continued to cherish this his favorite project though a prisoner. And at length in the thirteenth year of his imprisonment, through the influence of his friends and his confident assertions respecting the utility of the expedition to the country. He obtained his release, and set sail for Guiana with twelve ships. But unfortunately he neglected to procure a formal pardon from the king, trusting to the opinion of Lord Bacon that this was unnecessary. Since the sentence of death against him was virtually annulled, by the lives of others being committed to his hands. Acting on this presumption, and with the best intentions toward his country, and only his usual jealousy of Spain, he undertook to make good his engagements to himself and the world. It is not easy for us at this day to realize what extravagant expectations Europe had formed respecting the wealth of the New World. We might suppose two whole continents, with their adjacent seas and oceans, equal to the known globe, stretching from pole to pole, and possessing every variety of soil, climate, and productions. Lying unexplored today, what would now be the speculations of Broadway and State Street? The few travelers who had penetrated into the country of Guiana, whither Raleigh was bound, brought back accounts of noble streams flowing through majestic forests. And a depth and luxuriance of soil which made England seem a barren waste in comparison. Its mineral wealth was reported to be as inexhaustible as the cupidity of its discoverers was unbounded. The very surface of the ground was said to be resplendent with gold, and the men went covered with gold dust, as hottentots with grease. Raleigh was informed while at Trinidad, by the Spanish governor, who was his prisoner, that Juan Juan Martinez had at length penetrated into this country. And the stories told by him of the wealth and extent of its cities surpass the narratives of Marco Polo himself. He is said in particular to have reached the city of Manoa, to which he first gave the name of El Dorado, or, the Gilded, the Indians conducting him blindfolded. Not removing the veil from his eyes till he was ready to enter the city. It was at noon that he passed the gates, and it took him all that day and the next, walking from sunrise to sunset, before he arrived at the palace of Inga, where he resided for seven months. Till he had made himself master of the language of the country. These and even more fanciful accounts had Raleigh heard and pondered, both before and after his first visit to the country. No one was more familiar with the stories, both true and fabulous, respecting the discovery and resources of the New World. And none had a better right than he to know what great commanders and navigators had done there, or anywhere. Such information would naturally flow to him of its own accord. That his ardor and faith were hardly cooled by actual observation may be gathered from the tone of his own description. He was the first Englishman who ascended the Orinoco, and he thus describes the adjacent country, on the banks were divers sorts of fruits good to eat. Besides flowers and trees of that variety as were sufficient to make ten volumes of herbals. We relieved ourselves many times with the fruits of the country, and sometimes with fowl and fish, we saw birds of all colors, some carnation, some crimson, orange tawny, purple, green. Watched, watch it, and of all other sorts, both simple and mixed. As it was unto us a great good passing of the time to behold them, besides the relief we found by killing some store of them with our fowling pieces, without which, having little or no bread. And less drink, but only the thick and troubled water of the river, 
we had been in a very hard case. The following is his description of the waterfalls in the province of Kanuri, through which last the river runs. When we run to the tops of the first hills of the plains adjoining to the river, we beheld that wonderful breach of waters which ran down Caroli, and might from that mountain see the river how it ran in three parts above twenty miles off. There appeared some ten or twelve overfalls in sight, every one as high over the other as a church tower, which fell with that fury. That the rebound of waters made it seem as if it had been all covered over with a great shower of rain, and in some places we took it at the first for a smoke that had risen over some great town. For mine own part, I was well persuaded from thence to have returned, being a very ill footman. But the rest were all so desirous to go near the said strange thunder of waters, as they drew me on by little and little, into the next valley, where we might better discern the same. I never saw a more beautiful country, nor more lively prospects, hills so raised here and there over the valleys, the river winding into diverse branches, the plains adjoining without bush or stubble. All fair green grass, the ground of hard sand, easy to march on either for horse or foot, the deer crossing in every path. The birds towards the evening singing on every tree with a thousand several tunes, cranes and herons of white, crimson, and carnation perching on the river's side, the air fresh. With a gentle easterly wind. And every stone that we stopped to take up promised either gold or silver by his complexion. In another place he says, to conclude, Guiana is a country never sacked, turned, nor wrought. The face of the earth hath not been torn, nor the virtue and salt of the soil spent by manurance. To the fabulous accounts of preceding adventurers Raleigh added many others equally absurd and poetical, as, for instance, of a tribe with eyes in their shoulders and their mouths in the middle of their breasts, but, it seems to us, with entire good faith, and no such flagrant intent to deceive as he has been accused of. Weak policy it would be in me, says he, to betray myself or my country with imaginations. Neither am I so far in love with that lodging, watching, care, peril, diseases, ill savors, bad fare, and many other mischiefs that accompany these voyages, as to woo myself again into any of them. Were I not assured that the sun covereth not so much riches in any part of the earth? Some portion of this so prevalent delusion respecting the precious metals is no doubt to be referred to the actual presence of an abundance of mica, slate, and talc and other shining substances in the soil. We may judge, says Macaulay, of the brilliancy of these deceptious appearances. From learning that the natives ascribed the luster of the Magellanic clouds or nebulae of the southern hemisphere to the bright reflections produced by them. So he was himself most fatally deceived, and that too by the strength and candor no less than the weakness of his nature, for, generally speaking, such things are not to be disbelieved as task our imaginations to conceive of, but such rather as are too easily embraced by the understanding. It is easy to see that he was tempted, not so much by the luster of the gold, as by the splendor of the enterprise itself. It was the best move that peace allowed. The expeditions to Guiana and the ensuing golden dreams were not wholly unworthy of him. Though he accomplished little more in the first voyage than to take formal possession of the country in the name of the Queen, and in the second, of the Spanish town of San Tomé. As his enemies would say, in the name of himself. Perceiving that the Spaniards, who had been secretly informed of his designs through their ambassador in England, were prepared to thwart his endeavors, and resist his progress in the country. He procured the capture of this their principal town, which was also burnt, against his orders. But it seems that no particular exception is to be taken against these high-handed measures, though his enemies have made the greatest handle of them. His behavior on this occasion was part and parcel of his constant character. It would not be easy to say when he ceased to be an honorable soldier and became a freebooter. Nor indeed is it of so much importance to inquire of a man what actions he performed at one and what at another period, as what manner of man he was at all periods. It was after all the same Raleigh who had won so much renown by land and sea, at home and abroad. It was his forte to deal vigorously with men, whether as a statesman, a courtier, 
a navigator, a planter of colonies, an accused person, a prisoner, an explorer of continents. Or a military or naval commander. And it was a right hero's maxim of his, that good success admits of no examination, which, in a liberal sense, is true conduct. That there was no cant in him on the subject of war appears from his saying, which indeed is very true, that the necessity of war, which among human actions is most lawless, hath some kind of affinity and near resemblance with the necessity of law. It is to be remembered, too, that if the Spaniards found him a restless and uncompromising enemy, the Indians experienced in him a humane and gentle defender. And on his second visit to Guiana remembered his name and welcomed him with enthusiasm. We are told that the Spanish ambassador, on receiving intelligence of his doings in that country, rushed into the presence of King James, exclaiming, Piratas, Piratas! Pirates, Pirates! And the king, to gratify his resentment, without bringing him to trial for this alleged new offence. With characteristic meanness and pusillanimity caused him to be executed upon the old sentence soon after his return to England. The circumstances of his execution and how he bore himself on that memorable occasion. When the sentence of death passed fifteen years before was revived against him, after as an historian in his confinement he had visited the old world in his free imagination. And as an unrestrained adventurer the new, with his fleets and in person, are perhaps too well known to be repeated. The reader will excuse our hasty rehearsal of the final scene. We can pardon, though not without limitations, his supposed attempt at suicide in the prospect of defeat and disgrace. And no one can read his letter to his wife, written while he was contemplating this act, without being reminded of the Roman Cato, and admiring while he condemns him. I know, says he, that it is forbidden to destroy ourselves, but I trust it is forbidden in this sort, that we destroy not ourselves despairing of God's mercy. Though his greatness seems to have forsaken him in his feigning himself sick, and the base methods he took to avoid being brought to trial, yet he recovered himself at last. And happily withstood the trials which awaited him. The night before his execution, besides writing letters of farewell to his wife, containing the most practical advice for the conduct of her life. He appears to have spent the time in writing verses on his condition, and among others this couplet, on the snuff of a candle. Cowards may fear to die, but courage stout. Rather than live in snuff, will be put out. And the following verses, perhaps, for an epitaph on himself. Even such is time, that takes on trust. Our youth, our joys, are all we have. And pays us but with earth and dust who in the dark and silent grave, when we have wandered all our ways, shuts up the story of our days. But from this earth, this grave, this dust, the Lord shall raise me up, I trust. His execution was appointed on Lord Mayor's Day, that the pageants and shows might divert the attention of the people. But those pageants have long since been forgotten, while this tragedy is still remembered. He took a pipe of tobacco before he went to the scaffold, and appeared there with a serene countenance, so that a stranger could not have told which was the condemned person. After exculpating himself in a speech to the people, and without ostentation having felt the edge of the axe, and disposed himself once as he wished to lie, he made a solemn prayer. And being directed to place himself so that his face should look to the east, his characteristic answer was, it mattered little how the head lay provided the heart was right. The executioner being overawed was unable at first to perform his office, when Raleigh, slowly raising his head, exclaimed, Strike away, man, don't be afraid. He was the most fearless of death, says the bishop ten who attended him, that ever was known, and the most resolute and confident, yet with reverence and conscience. But we would not exaggerate the importance of these things. The death scenes of great men are agreeable to consider only when they make another and harmonious chapter of their lives, and we have accompanied our hero thus far because he lived, so to speak, unto the end. In his history of the world occurs this sentence, O eloquent, just, and mighty death! Whom none could advise, thou hast persuaded, what none hath dared, thou hast done. And whom all the world hath flattered, 
Thou only hast cast out of the world and despised, Thou hast drawn together all the far-stretched greatness, all the pride, cruelty, and ambition of man. And covered it all over with those two narrow words, Hick Iaset. Perhaps Raleigh was the man of the most general information and universal accomplishment of any in England. Though he excelled greatly in but few departments, yet he reached a more valuable mediocrity in many. He seemed, said Fuller, to be like Cato Eudicensis, born to that only which he was about, he said he had been, a soldier, a sea captain, and a courtier, but he had been much more than this. He embraced in his studies music, ornamental gardening, painting, history, antiquities, chemistry, and many arts beside. Especially he is said to have been a great chemist, and studied most in his sea voyages, when he carried always a trunk of books along with him, and had nothing to divert him. And when also he carried his favorite pictures. In the tower, too, says one, he doth spend all the day in distillations. And that this was more than a temporary recreation appears from the testimony of one who says he was operator to him for twelve years. Here also, he conversed on poetry, philosophy, and literature with Hoskins, his fellow prisoner, whom Ben Jonson mentions as the person who had polished him. He was a political economist far in advance of his age, and a sagacious and influential speaker in the House of Commons. Science is indebted to him in more ways than one. In the midst of pressing public cares he interested himself to establish some means of universal communication between men of science for their mutual benefit, and actually set up what he termed an office of address for this purpose. As a mathematician, he was the friend of Harriet, D., and the Earl of Northumberland. As an antiquarian, he was a member of the first antiquarian society established in England, along with Spellman, Selden, Cotton, Camden, Seville, and Stowe. He is said to have been the founder of the Mermaid Club, which met in Fleet Street, to which Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, Fletcher, Beaumont, Carew, Don, etc., belonged. He has the fame of having first introduced the potato from Virginia and the cherry from the Canaries into Ireland, where his garden was. And his manor of Sherburne eleven he beautified with gardens, and orchards, and groves of much variety and delight. And this fact, evincing his attention to horticulture, is related, that once, on occasion of the Queen's visiting him, he artificially retarded the ripening of some cherries by stretching a wet canvas over the tree, and removed it on a sunny day, so as to present the fruit ripe to the Queen a month later than usual. Not to omit a more doubtful but not less celebrated benefit, it is said that on the return of his first colonists from Virginia in 1586 tobacco was first effectually introduced into England. And its use encouraged by his influence and example. And finally, not to be outdone by the quacks, he invented a cordial which became very celebrated, bore his name, and was even administered to the Queen, and to the Prince Henry in his last illness. One Febure writes that, Sir Walter, being a worthy successor of Mithridates, Mathielus, Basil Valentine, Paracelsus, and others, has, he affirms, selected all that is choicest in the animal, vegetable, and mineral world, and moreover manifested so much art and experience in the preparation of this great and admirable cordial as will of itself render him immortal. We come at last to consider him as a literary man and a writer, concerning which aspect of his life we are least indebted to the historian for our facts. As he was heroic with the sword, so was he with the pen. The history of the world, the task which he selected for his prison hours, was heroic in the undertaking and heroic in the achievement. The easy and cheerful heart with which he endured his confinement, turning his prison into a study, a parlor, and a laboratory, and his prison yard into a garden. So that men did not so much pity as admire him. The steady purpose with which he set about fighting his battles, prosecuting his discoveries, and gathering his laurels, with the pen. If he might no longer with regiments and fleets, is itself an exploit. In writing the history of the world he was indeed at liberty. For he who contemplates truth and universal laws is free, whatever walls immure his body, though to our brave prisoner thus employed, mankind may have seemed but his poor fellow prisoners still. Though this remarkable work interests us more, on the whole, 
as a part of the history of Raleigh than as the history of the world, yet it was done like himself, and with no small success. The historian of Greece and Rome is usually unmanned by his subject, as a peasant crouches before lords. But Raleigh, though he succumbs to the imposing fame of tradition and antediluvian story, and exhibits unnecessary reverence for a prophet or patriarch, from his habit of innate religious courtesy, has done better than this whenever a hero was to be dealt with. He stalks down through the aisles of the past, as through the avenues of a camp, with poets and historians for his heralds and guides. And from whatever side the faintest trump reaches his ear, that way does he promptly turn, though to the neglect of many a gaudy pavilion. From a work so little read in these days we will venture to quote as specimens the following criticisms on Alexander and the character of Epaminandus. They will, at any rate, teach our lips no bad habits. There is a natural emphasis in his style, like a man's tread, and a breathing space between the sentences, which the best of more modern writing does not furnish. His chapters are like English parks, or rather like a western forest, where the larger growth keeps down the underwood, and one may ride on horseback through the openings. 12. Certainly the things that this king did were marvelous, and would hardly have been undertaken by any man else, and though his father had determined to have invaded the lesser Asia. It is like enough that he would have contented himself with some part thereof, and not have discovered the river of Indus, as this man did. The swift course of victory, wherewith he ran over so large a portion of the world, in so short a space, may justly be imputed unto this, that he was never encountered by an equal spirit, concurring with equal power against him. Hereby it came to pass, that his actions, being limited by no greater opposition than desert places, and the mere length of tedious journeys could make, were like the Colossus of Rhodes. Not so much to be admired for the workmanship, though therein also praiseworthy, as for the huge bulk. For certainly the things performed by Xenophon, discover as brave a spirit as Alexander's, and working no less exquisitely, though the effects were less material. As were also the forces and power of command, by which it wrought. But he that would find the exact pattern of a noble commander, must look upon such as Epaminandus, that encountering worthy captains, and those better followed than themselves, have by their singular virtue overtopped their valiant enemies, and still prevailed over those that would not have yielded one foot to any other. Such as these are do seldom live to obtain great empires. For it is a work of more labor and longer time to master the equal forces of one hardy and well-ordered state, than to tread down and utterly subdue a multitude of servile nations, compounding the body of a gross unwieldy empire. Wherefore these parvo potentes, men that with little have done much upon enemies of like ability, are to be regarded as choice examples of worth. But great conquerors, to be rather admired for the substance of their actions, than the exquisite managing, exactness and greatness concurring so seldom, that I can find no instance of both in one save only that brave Roman, Caesar. Of Epaminandus he says, so died Epaminandus, the worthiest man that ever was bred in that nation of Greece, and hardly to be matched in any age or country. For he equaled all others in the several virtues, which in each of them were singular. His justice, and sincerity, his temperance, wisdom, and high magnanimity, were no way inferior to his military virtue. In every part whereof he so excelled, that he could not properly be called a wary, a valiant, a politic, a bountiful, or an industrious, and a provident captain. All these titles, and many others being due unto him, which with his notable discipline, and good conduct, made a perfect composition of an heroic general. Neither was his private conversation unanswerable to those high parts, which gave him praise abroad. For he was grave, and yet very affable and courteous. Resolute in public business, but in his own particular easy, and of much mildness. A lover of his people, bearing with men's infirmities, witty and pleasant in speech, far from insolence, master of his own affections, and furnished with all qualities that might win and keep love. To these graces were added great ability of body, much eloquence and very deep knowledge of philosophy and learning, wherewith his mind being enlightened. 
rested not in the sweetness of contemplation, but broke forth into such effects as gave unto Thebes which had ever been an underling, a dreadful reputation among all people adjoining. And the highest command in Greece. For the most part an author only writes history, treating it as a dead subject, but Raleigh tells it like a fresh story. A man of action himself, he knew when there was an action coming worthy to be related, and does not disappoint the reader, as is too commonly the case. By recording merely the traditionary admiration or wonder. In commenting upon the military actions of the ancients, he easily and naturally digresses to some perhaps equal action of his own, or within his experience. And he tells how they should have drawn up their fleets or men, with the authority of an admiral or general. The alacrity with which he adverts to some action within his experience, and slides down from the dignified impersonality of the historian into the familiarity and interest of a party and eyewitness, is as attractive as rare. He is often without reproach the Caesar of his own story. He treats Scipio, Pompey, Hannibal, and the rest quite like equals, and he speaks like an eyewitness, and gives life and reality to the narrative by his very lively understanding and relating of it. Especially in those parts in which the mere scholar is most likely to fail. Every reader has observed what a dust the historian commonly raises about the field of battle, to serve as an apology for not making clear the disposition and maneuvering of the parties. So that the clearest idea one gets is of a very vague counteraction or standing over against one another of two forces. In this history we, at least, have faith that these things are right. Our author describes an ancient battle with the vivacity and truth of an eyewitness, and perhaps, in criticizing the disposition of the forces, saying they should have stood thus or so. Sometimes enforces his assertions in some such style as, I remember being in the harbor of Cadiz, etc. So that, as in Herodotus and Thucydides, we associate the historian with the exploits he describes. But this comes not on account of his fame as a writer, but from the conspicuous part he acted on the world stage, and his name is of equal mark to us with those of his heroes. So in the present instance, not only his valor as a writer, but the part he acted in his generation, the life of the author, seems fit to make the last chapter in the history he is writing. We expect that when his history is brought to a close it will include his own exploits. However, it is hardly a work to be consulted as authority nowadays, except on the subject of its author's character. The natural breadth and grasp of the man is seen in the preface itself, which is a sermon with human life for its text. In the first books he discusses with childlike earnestness, and an ingenuity which they little deserved, the absurd and frivolous questions which engaged the theology and philosophy of his day. But even these are recommended by his sincerity and fine imagination, while the subsequent parts, or story itself, have the merit of being far more credible and lifelike than is common. He shows occasionally a poet's imagination, and the innocence and purity of a child, as it were, under a knight's dress, such as were worthy of the friend of Spencer. The nobleness of his nature is everywhere apparent. The gentleness and steady heart with which he cultivates philosophy and poetry in his prison. Dissolving in the reader's imagination the very walls and bars by his childlike confidence in truth and his own destiny, are affecting. Even astrology, or, as he has elsewhere called it, star learning, comes recommended from his pen, and science will not refuse it. And certainly it cannot be doubted, says he, but the stars are instruments of far greater use, than to give an obscure light, and for men to gaze on after sunset, it being manifest. That the diversity of seasons, the winters and summers, more hot and cold, are not so uncertain by the sun and moon alone, who always keep one and the same course. But that the stars have also their working therein. And if we cannot deny, but that God hath given virtues to springs and fountains, to cold earth, to plants and stones, minerals, and to the excremental parts of the basest living creatures. Why should we rob the beautiful stars of their working powers? For seeing they are many in number, and of eminent beauty and magnitude, we may not think, that in the treasury of his wisdom, who is infinite, there can be wanting, even for every star, a peculiar virtue and operation. As every herb, 
plant, fruit, and flower adorning the face of the earth, hath the like. For as these were not created to beautify the earth alone, and to cover and shadow her dusty face, but otherwise for the use of man and beast, to feed them and cure them. So were not those uncountable glorious bodies set in the firmament, to no other end, than to adorn it. But for instruments and organs of his divine providence, so far as it hath pleased his just will to determine. Origen upon this place of Genesis, let there be light in the firmament, etc. Affirmeth, that the stars are not causes, meaning perchance binding causes, but are as open books, wherein are contained and set down all things whatsoever to come. But not to be read by the eyes of human wisdom, which latter part one believe well, and the saying of suicides withal. That there are hid yet greater things than these be, and we have seen but a few of his works. And though, for the capacity of men, we know somewhat, yet in the true and uttermost virtues of herbs and plants, which ourselves sow and set, and which grow under our feet, we are in effect ignorant. Much more in the powers and working of celestial bodies. But in this question of fate, the middle course is to be followed, that as with the heathen we do not bind God to his creatures, in this supposed necessity of destiny. And so on the contrary we do not rob those beautiful creatures of their powers and offices. And that they wholly direct the reasonless mind, I am resolved, for all those which were created mortal. As birds, beasts, and the like, are left to their natural appetites. Over all which, celestial bodies, as instruments and executioners of God's providence, have absolute dominion. And St. Augustine says, Deus regit inferiora corpora per superiora. God ruleth the bodies below by those above. It was therefore truly affirmed, Sapiens ad iuvabit opus astrorum, quam admitum agricola terrae naturum. A wise man assisteth the work of the stars, as the husbandman helpeth the nature of the soil. Lastly, we ought all to know, that God created the stars as he did the rest of the universal. Whose influences may be called his reserved and unwritten laws. But it was well said of Plotinus, that the stars were significant, but not efficient. Giving them yet something less than their due, and therefore as I do not consent with them. Who would make those glorious creatures of God virtuous, so I think that we derogate from his eternal and absolute power and providence. To ascribe to them the same dominion over our immortal souls, which they have over all bodily substances, and perishable natures, for the souls of men loving and fearing God. Receive influence from that divine light itself, whereof the sun's clarity, and that of the stars, is by Plato called but a shadow, lumen est umbra dei, ed deus est lumen luminous. Light is the shadow of God's brightness, who is the light of light. We are reminded by this of Du Bartas's poem on the probability of the celestial orbs being inhabited. Translated by Sylvester, 13. I'll ne'er believe that the arch-architect. With all these fires the heavenly arches decked. Only for show. And with their glistering shields. T. Amaze poor shepherds, watching in the fields. I'll ne'er believe that the least flow are that pranks. Our garden borders, or the common banks. And the least stone, that in her warming lap. Our kind nurse earth doth covetously wrap. Hath some peculiar virtue of its own. And that the glorious stars of heaven have none. Nor is the following brief review and exaltation of the subject of all history unworthy of a place in this history of the world. Man, thus compounded and formed by God, was an abstract or model, or brief story in the universal, for out of the earth and dust was formed the flesh of man, and therefore heavy and lumpish. The bones of his body we may compare to the hard rocks and stones, and therefore strong and durable. Of which Ovid. In genus durum summus experience globorum. Eti documenta demus, qua simus origin nati. From thence our kind hard hearted is. Enduring pain and care. Approving, that our bodies of a stony nature are his blood, which disperseth itself by the branches of veins through all the body, may be resembled to those waters, which are carried by brooks and rivers over all the earth. 
his breath to the air, his natural heat to the enclosed warmth which the earth hath in itself, which, stirred up by the heat of the sun, assisteth nature in the speedier procreation of those varieties, which the earth bringeth forth. Our radical moisture, oil or balsamum, whereon the natural heat feedeth and is maintained, is resembled to the fat and fertility of the earth. The hairs of man's body, which adorns, or overshadows it, to the grass, which covereth the upper face and skin of the earth, our generative power, to nature, which produceth all things. Our determinations, to the light, wandering, and unstable clouds, carried everywhere with uncertain winds, our eyes to the light of the sun and moon. And the beauty of our youth, to the flowers of the spring, which, either in a very short time, or with the sun's heat, dry up and wither away, or the fierce puffs of wind blow them from the stalks. The thoughts of our mind, to the motion of angels. And our pure understanding, formerly called men's, and that which always looketh upwards, to those intellectual natures, which are always present with God. And lastly, our immortal souls, while they are righteous, are by God himself beautified with the title of his own image and similitude. But man is not in all things like nature, for this tide of man's life, after it once turneth and declineth, ever runneth with a perpetual ebb and falling stream, but never floweth again. Our leaf once fallen, springeth no more. Neither doth the sun or the summer adorn us again with the garments of new leaves and flowers. There is a flowing rhythm in some of these sentences like the rippling of rivers, hardly to be matched in any prose or verse. The following is his poem on the decay of oracles and pantheism. The fire which the Chaldeans worshipped for a god, is crept into every man's chimney, which the lack of fuel starveth. Water quencheth, and want of air suffocateth, Jupiter is no more vexed with Juno's jealousies. Death hath persuaded him to chastity, and her to patience, and that time which hath devoured itself, hath also eaten up both the bodies and images of him and his. Yeah, their stately temples of stone and duraful marble. The houses and sumptuous buildings erected to Baal, can nowhere be found upon the earth. Nor any monument of that glorious temple consecrated to Diana. There are none now in Phoenicia, that lament the death of Adonis. Nor any in Libya, Creta, Thessalia, or elsewhere, that can ask counsel or help from Jupiter. The great god Pan hath broken his pipes, Apollo's priests are become speechless. And the trade of riddles in oracles, with the devils telling men's fortunes therein, is taken up by counterfeit Egyptians, and cousining astrologers. In his discourse of war in general, commencing with almost a heroic verse, the ordinary theme and argument of history is war, are many things well thought, and many more well said. He thus expands the maxim that corporations have no soul, but no senate nor civil assembly can be under such natural impulses to honor and justice as single persons. For a majority is nobody when that majority is separated. And a collective body can have no synteresis, or divine ray, which is in the mind of every man, never assenting to evil. But upbraiding and tormenting him when he does it, but the honor and conscience that lies in the majority is too thin and diffusive to be efficacious. For a number can do a great wrong, and call it right, and not one of that majority blush for it. Hence it is, that though a public assembly may lie under great censures, yet each member looks upon himself as little concerned, this must be the reason why a Roman senate should act with less spirit and less honor than any single Roman would do. He then in the same treatise leaps with easy and almost merry elasticity from the level of his discourse to the heights of his philosophy, and it is more plain there is not in nature a point of stability to be found. Everything either ascends or declines, when wars are ended abroad, sedition begins at home, and when men are freed from fighting for necessity, they quarrel through ambition. And he thus concludes this discourse we must look a long way back to find the Romans giving laws to nations, and their consuls bringing kings and princes bound in chains to Rome in triumph. To see men go to Greece for wisdom, or Ophir for gold, when now nothing remains but a poor paper remembrance of their former condition. It would be an unspeakable advantage, both to the public and private, if men would consider that great truth, 
that no man is wise or safe, but he that is honest. All I have designed is peace to my country, and may England enjoy that blessing when I shall have no more proportion in it than what my ashes make. If his philosophy is for the most part poor, yet the conception and expression are rich and generous. His maxims are not true or impartial, but are conceived with a certain magnanimity which was natural to him. As if a selfish policy could easily afford to give place in him to a more universal and true. As a fact evincing Raleigh's poetic culture and taste, it is said that, in a visit to the poet Spencer on the banks of the Mulla, which is described in Colin Clout's Come Home Again, he anticipated the judgment of posterity with respect to the fairy queen, and by his sympathy and advice encouraged the poet to go on with his work, which by the advice of other friends, among whom was Sidney, he had laid aside. His own poems, though insignificant in respect to number and length, and not yet collected into a separate volume, or rarely accredited to Raleigh, deserve the distinct attention of the lover of English poetry, and leave such an impression on the mind that this leaf of his laurels, for the time, well nigh overshadows all the rest. Fourteen in these few rhymes, as in that country he describes, his life naturally culminates and his secret aspirations appear. They are in some respects more trustworthy testimonials to his character than state papers or tradition. For poetry is a piece of very private history, which unostentatiously lets us into the secret of a man's life, and is to the reader what the eye is to the beholder. The characteristic feature which cannot be distorted or made to deceive. Poetry is always impartial and unbiased evidence. The whole life of a man may safely be referred to a few deep experiences. When he only sings a more musical line than usual, all his actions have to be retried by a newer and higher standard than before. The pleasing poem entitled, A Description of the Country's Recreations, 15 also printed among the poems of Sir Henry Wotton, is well known. The following, which bears evident marks of his pen, we will quote, from its secure and continent rhythm. False love and true love. As you came from the holy land. Of Walsingham. Met you not with my true love. By the way as you came? How shall I know your true love? That have met many one. As I went to the holy land. That have come, that have gone. She is neither white nor brown. But as the heavens fair. There is none hath a form so divine. In the earth or the air. Such a one did I meet, good sir. Such an angelic face. Who like a queen, like a nymph did appear. By her gait, by her grace. She hath left me here all alone. All alone as unknown. Who sometimes did me lead with herself. And me loved as her own. What's the cause that she leaves you alone? And a new way doth take. Who loved you once as her own? And her joy did you make? I have loved her all my youth. But now, old as you see, love likes not the falling fruit. From the withered tree. Know that love is a careless child. And forgets promise past. He is blind, he is deaf, when he list. And in faith never fast. His desire is a durless content. And a trustless joy. He is one with a world of despair. And is lost with a toy. Of womankind such indeed is the love. Or the word love abused. Under which, many childish desires. And conceits are excused. But true love is a durable fire. In the mind ever burning. Never sick, never old, never dead. From itself never turning. The following will be new to many of our readers. The Shepherd's Praise of His Sacred Diana Praised be Diana's fair and harmless light. Praised be the dews, wherewith she moists the ground. Praised be her beams, the glory of the night. Praised be her power, by which all powers abound. Praised be her nymphs, with whom she decks the woods. Praised be her knights, in whom true honor lives. Praised be that force by which she moves the floods. Let that Diana shine, 
which all these gives. In heaven, queen she is among the spheres. She mistress-like, makes all things to be pure. Eternity in her oft change she bears. She, beauty is, by her, the fair endure. Time wears her not, she doth his chariot guide. Mortality below her orb is placked. By her the virtues of the stars down slide. In her is virtue's perfect image cast. A knowledge pure it is her worth to know. With Circe's let them dwell that think not so. Though we discover in his verses the vices of the courtier, and they are not equally sustained, as if his genius were warped by the frivolous society of the court. He was capable of rising to unusual heights. His genius seems to have been fitted for short flights of unmatched sweetness and vigor, but by no means for the sustained loftiness of the epic poet. One who read his verses would say that he had not grown to be the man he promised. They have occasionally a strength of character and heroic tone rarely expressed or appreciated. And powers and excellences so peculiar, as to be almost unique specimens of their kind in the language. Those which have reference to his death have been oftenest quoted, and are the best. The soul's errand, sixteen deserves to be remembered till her mission is accomplished in the world. We quote the following, not so well known, with some omissions, from the commencement of his pilgrimage. Give me my scallop shell of quiet. My staff of faith to walk upon. My scrip of joy, immortal diet. My bottle of salvation. My gown of glory, hope's true gauge. And thus I'll take my pilgrimage. Blood must be my body's balmer. No other balm will here be given. Whilst my soul, like quiet palmer, travels to the land of heaven. Over all the silver mountains. Where do spring those nectar fountains? And I there will sweetly kiss. The happy bowl of peaceful bliss. Drinking mine eternal fill. Flowing on each milky hill. My soul will be a dry before. But after, it will thirst no more. In that happy, blissful day. More peaceful pilgrims I shall see. That have cast off their rags of clay. And walk apparelled fresh like me. But he wrote his poems, after all, rather with ships and fleets, and regiments of men and horse. At his bidding, navies took their place in the channel, and even from prison he fitted out fleets with which to realize his golden dreams, and invited his companions to fresh adventures. Raleigh might well be studied if only for the excellence of his style, for he is remarkable even in the midst of so many masters. All the distinguished writers of that period possess a greater vigor and naturalness than the more modern, and when we read a quotation from one of them in the midst of a modern authority, we seem to have come suddenly upon a greener ground and greater depth and strength of soil. It is as if a green bough were laid across the page, and we are refreshed as if by the sight of fresh grass in midwinter or early spring. You have constantly the warrant of life and experience in all you read. The little that is said is supplied by implication of the much that was done. The sentences are verdurous and blooming as evergreen and flowers, because they are rooted in fact and experience. But our false and florid sentences have only the tints of flowers without their sap or roots. Where shall we look for standard English but to the words of a standard man? The word which is best said came very near not being spoken at all, for it is cousin to a deed which would have been better done. It must have taken the place of a deed by some urgent necessity, even by some misfortune, so that the truest writer will be some captive knight after all. And perhaps the fates had such a design, when, having stored Raleigh so richly with the substance of life and experience, they made him a fast prisoner, and compelled him to make his words his deeds. And transfer to his expression the emphasis and sincerity of his action. The necessity of labor, and conversation with many men and things, to the scholar, is rarely well remembered. Steady labor with the hands, which engrosses the attention also, is the best method of removing palaver out of one style both of talking and writing. If he has worked hard from morning till night, though he may have grieved that he could not be watching the train of his thoughts during that time. 
yet the few hasty lines which at evening record his day's experience will be more musical and true, than his freest but idle fancy could have furnished. He will not lightly dance at his work who has wood to cut and cord before nightfall in the short days of winter, but every stroke will be husband and ring soberly through the wood. Seventeen and so will the stroke of that scholar's pen, when at evening this records the story of the day, ring soberly on the ear of the reader long after the echoes of his acts have died away. The scholar may be sure he writes the tougher truths for the calluses on his palms. They give firmness to the sentence. We are often astonished at the force and precision of style to which hard-working men unpractised in writing easily attain, when required to make the effort. As if sincerity and plainness, those ornaments of style, were better taught on the farm or in the workshop than in the schools. The sentences written by such rude hands are nervous and tough, like hardened thongs, the sinews of the deer, or the roots of the pine. The scholar might frequently emulate the propriety and emphasis of the farmer's call to his team, and confess, if that were written, it would surpass his labored sentences. From the weak and flimsy periods of the politician and literary man we are glad to turn even to the description of work, the simple record of the month's labor in the farmer's almanac. To restore our tone and spirits. We like that a sentence should read as if its author, had he held a plow instead of a pen, could have drawn a furrow deep and straight to the end. The scholar requires hard labor to give an impetus to his thought, he will learn to grasp the pen firmly so, and wield it gracefully and effectually as an axe or sword. When we consider the weak and nerveless periods of some literary men, who perchance in feet and inches come up to the standard of their race, and are not deficient in girth also, we are amazed at the immense sacrifice of thews and sinews. What? These proportions, these bones, and this their work. Hands which could have felled an ox have hewed this fragile matter which would not have tasked a lady's fingers. Can this be a stalwart man's work, who has a marrow in his back and a tendon Achilles in his heel? They who set up Stonehenge did somewhat, if they only laid out their strength for once, and stretched themselves. Yet after all the truly efficient laborer will be found not to crowd his day with work, but will saunter to his task, surrounded by a wide halo of ease and leisure. And then do but what he likes best. He is anxious only about the kernels of time. Though the hen should set all day she could lay only one egg, and besides, she would not have picked up the materials for another. A perfectly healthy sentence is extremely rare. But for the most part we miss the hue and fragrance of the thought. As if we could be satisfied with the dews of the morning or evening without their colors, or the heavens without their azure. The most attractive sentences are perhaps not the wisest, but the surest and soundest. They are spoken firmly and conclusively, as if the author had a right to know what he says. And if not wise, they have at least been well learned. At least he does not stand on a rolling stone, but is well assured of his footing. And if you dispute their doctrine, you will yet allow that there is truth in their assurance. Raleigh's are of this sort, spoken with entire satisfaction and heartiness. They are not so much philosophy as poetry. With him it was always well done and nobly said. His learning was in his hand, and he carried it by him and used it as adroitly as his sword. Aubrey says, he was no slug, without doubt had a wonderful waking spirit, and great judgment to guide it. He wields his pen as one who sits at ease in his chair, and has a healthy and able body to back his wits, and not a torpid and diseased one to fetter them. In whichever hand is the pen we are sure there is a sword in the other. He sits with his armor on, and with one ear open to hear if the trumpet sound, as one who has stolen a little leisure from the duties of a camp. And we are confident that the whole man, as real and palpable as an Englishman can be, sat down to the writing of his books, and not some curious brain only. Such a man's mere daily exercise in literature might well attract us, and Cecil has said, he can toil terribly. Raleigh seems to have been too genial and loyal a soul to resist the temptations of a court. But if to his genius and culture could have been added the temperament of George Fox or Oliver Cromwell, perhaps the world would have had reason longer to remember him. He was, however, 
the most generous nature that could be drawn into the precincts of a court. And carried the courtier's life almost to the highest pitch of magnanimity and grace of which it was capable. He was liberal and generous as a prince, that is, within bounds, brave, chivalrous, heroic, as a knight in armor, but not as a defenseless man. His was not the heroism of a Luther, but of a Bayard, and had more of grace than of honest truth in it. He had more taste than appetite. There may be something petty in a refined taste, it easily degenerates into effeminacy. It does not consider the broadest use, and is not content with simple good and bad, but is often fastidious, and curious, or nice only. His faults, as we have hinted before, were those of a courtier and a soldier. In his counsels and aphorisms we see not unfrequently the haste and rashness of the soldier, strangely mingled with the wisdom of the philosopher. Though his philosophy was not wide nor profound, it was continually giving way to the generosity of his nature, and he was not hard to be won to the right. What he touches he adorns by a greater humanity and native nobleness, but he touches not the truest nor deepest. He does not in any sense unfold the new, but embellishes the old, and with all his promise of originality he never was quite original, or steered his own course. He was of so fair and susceptible a nature, rather than broad or deep, that he delayed to slake his thirst at the nearest and most turbid wells of truth and beauty. And his homage to the least fair and noble left no room for homage to the all-fair. The misfortune and incongruity of the man appear in the fact that he was at once the author of the maxims of state and the soul's errand. When we reconsider what we have said in the foregoing pages, we hesitate to apply any of their eulogy to the actual and historical Raleigh, or any of their condemnation to that ideal Raleigh which he suggests. For we must know the man of history as we know our contemporaries, not so much by his deeds, which often belie his real character, as by the expectation he begets in us, and there is a bloom and halo about the character of Raleigh which defies a close and literal scrutiny, and robs us of our critical acumen. With all his heroism, he was not heroic enough, with all his manliness, he was servile and dependent, with all his aspirations, he was ambitious. He was not upright nor constant, yet we would have trusted him, he could flatter and cringe, yet we should have respected him. And he could accept a bribe, yet we should confidently have appealed to his generosity. Such a life is useful for us to contemplate as suggesting that a man is not to be measured by the virtue of his described actions, or the wisdom of his expressed thoughts merely. But by that free character he is, and is felt to be, under all circumstances. Even talent is respectable only when it indicates a depth of character unfathomed. Surely it is better that our wisdom appear in the constant success of our spirits than in our business, or the maxims which fall from our lips merely. We want not only a revelation, but a nature behind to sustain it. Many silent, as well as famous, lives have been the result of no mean thought, though it was never adequately expressed nor conceived. And perhaps the most illiterate and unphilosophical mind may yet be accustomed to think to the extent of the noblest action. We all know those in our own circle who do injustice to their entire character in their conversation and in writing, but who, if actually set over against us, would not fail to make a wiser impression than many a wise thinker and speaker. We are not a little profited by any life which teaches us not to despair of the race, and such effect has the steady and cheerful bravery of Raleigh. To march sturdily through life, patiently and resolutely looking grim defiance at one's foes, that is one way. But we cannot help being more attracted by that kind of heroism which relaxes its brows in the presence of danger, and does not need to maintain itself strictly, but by a kind of sympathy with the universe, generously adorns the scene and the occasion, and loves valor so well that itself would be the defeated party only to behold it. Which is as serene and as well pleased with the issue as the heavens which look down upon the field of battle. It is but a lower height of heroism when the hero wears a sour face. We fear that much of the heroism which we praise nowadays is dyspeptic. When we consider the vast Xerxian army of reformers in these days, we cannot doubt that many a grim soul goes silent, the hero of some small intestine war. 
and it is somewhat to begin to live on cornbread solely, for one who has before lived on bolted wheat, but of this sort surely are not the deeds to be sung. These are not the Arthurs that inflame the imaginations of men. All fair action is the product of enthusiasm, and nature herself does nothing in the prose mood, though sometimes grimly with poetic fury, and at others humorously. There is enthusiasm in the sunrise and the summer, and we imagine that the shells on the shore take new layers from year to year with such rapture as the bard writes his poems. We would fain witness a heroism which is literally illustrious, whose daily life is the stuff of which our dreams are made, so that the world shall regard less what it does than how it does it. And its actions unsettle the common standards, and have a right to be done, however wrong they may be to the moralist. Mere gross health and cheerfulness are no slight attraction, and some biographies have this charm mainly. For the most part the best man's spirit makes a fearful sprite to haunt his grave, and it adds not a little therefore to the credit of Little John, the celebrated follower of Robin Hood. Reflecting favorably on the character of his life, that his grave was long celebrous for the yielding of excellent whetstones. A great cheerfulness indeed have all great wits and heroes possessed, almost a profane levity to such as understood them not, but their religion had the broader basis of health and permanence. For the hero, too, has his religion, though it is the very opposite to that of the ascetic. It demands not a narrower cell but a wider world. He is perhaps the very best man of the world. The poet active, the saint willful, not the most godlike, but the most manlike. There have been souls of a heroic stamp for whom this world seemed expressly made. As if this fair creation had at last succeeded, for it seems to be thrown away on the saint. Such seem to be an essential part of their age if we consider them in time, and of the scenery if we consider them in nature. They lie out before us ill-defined and uncertain, like some scraggy hillside or pasture, which varies from day to day and from hour to hour, with the revolutions of nature so that the eye of the forester never rests twice upon the same scene. One knows not what may occur, he may hear a fox bark or a partridge drum. They are planted deep in nature and have more root than others. They are earth-born, gamma eta gamma epsilon upsilon epsilon, as was said of the titans. They are brothers of the sun and moon, they belong, so to speak, to the natural family of man. Their breath is a kind of wind, their step like that of a quadruped, their moods the seasons, and they are as serene as nature. Their eyes are deep set like moles or glowworms, they move free and unconstrained through nature as her guests, their motions easy and natural as if their course were already determined for them. As of rivers flowing through valleys, not as somewhat finding a place in nature, but for whom a place is already found. We love to hear them speak though we do not hear what they say. The very air seems forward to modulate itself into speech for them, and their words are of its own substance, and fall naturally on the ear, like the rustling of leaves and the crackling of the fire. They have the heavens for their abettors, for they never stood from under them, and they look at the stars with an answering ray. The distinctions of better and best, sense and nonsense, seem trivial and petty, when such great healthy indifferences come along. We lay aside the trick of thinking well to attend to their thoughtless and happy natures, and are inclined to show a divine politeness and heavenly good breeding, for they compel it. They are great natures. It takes a good deal to support them. Theirs is no thin diet. The very air they breathe seems rich, and, as it were, perfumed. They are so remarkable as to be least remarked at first, since they are most in harmony with the time and place, and if we wonder at all it will be at ourselves and not at them. Mountains do not rise perpendicularly, but the lower eminences hide the higher, and we at last reach their top by a gentle acclivity. We must abide a long time in their midst and at their base, as we spend many days at the notch of the white mountains in order to be impressed by the scenery. Let us not think that Alexander will conquer Asia the first time we are introduced to him, though smaller men may be in haste to re-enact their exploits then. Would you have such an Herculean actor in the scene? And not his hydra? They must sweat no less to fit their properties than to express their parts. 
the presence of heroic souls enhances the beauty and ampleness of nature herself. Where they walk, as Virgil says of the abodes of the blessed. Larger hic campos ether et lumen vestit. Perperio, solemc sum, sua sidera norent.18. But, alas! What is truth? That which we know not. What is beauty? That which we see not. What is heroism? That which we are not. It is in vain to hang out flags on a day of rejoicing, fresh bunting, bright and whole. Better the soiled and torn remnant which has been born in the wars. We have considered a fair specimen of an Englishman in the sixteenth century. But it behoves us to be fairer specimens of American men in the nineteenth. The gods have given man no constant gift, but the power and liberty to act greatly. How many wait for health and warm weather to be heroic and noble? We are apt to think there is a kind of virtue which need not be heroic and brave, but in fact virtue is the deed of the bravest. And only the hardy souls venture upon it, for it deals in what we have no experience, and alone does the rude pioneer work of the world. In winter is its campaign, and it never goes into quarters. Sit not down, said Sir Thomas Brown, in the popular seats and common level of virtues, but endeavor to make them heroical. Offer not only peace offerings, but holocausts, unto God. In our lonely chambers at night we are thrilled by some far-off serenade within the mind, and seem to hear the clarion sound and clang of corslet and buckler from many a silent hamlet of the soul. Though actually it may be but the rattling of some farmer's wagon rolling to market against the Morrow Point 19. Slavery in Massachusetts Delivered at an anti-slavery celebration on July 4, 1854, first published in The Liberator, July 21, 1854. I lately attended a meeting of the citizens of Concord, expecting, as one among many, to speak on the subject of slavery in Massachusetts. But I was surprised and disappointed to find that what had called my townsmen together was the destiny of Nebraska, and not of Massachusetts and that what I had to say would be entirely out of order. I had thought that the house was on fire, and not the prairie. But though several of the citizens of Massachusetts are now in prison for attempting to rescue a slave from her own clutches, not one of the speakers at that meeting expressed regret for it. Not one even referred to it. It was only the disposition of some wild lands a thousand miles off, which appeared to concern them. The inhabitants of Concord are not prepared to stand by one of their own bridges, but talk only of taking up a position on the highlands beyond the Yellowstone River. Our buttricks and devices and hosmers are retreating thither, and I fear that they will leave no Lexington common between them and the enemy. There is not one slave in Nebraska. There are perhaps a million slaves in Massachusetts. They who have been bred in the school of politics fail now and always to face the facts. Their measures are half-measures and makeshifts merely. They put off the day of settlement indefinitely, and meanwhile the debt accumulates. Though the fugitive slave law had not been the subject of discussion on that occasion, it was at length faintly resolved by my townsmen, at an adjourned meeting, as I learn. That the Compromise Compact of 1820 having been repudiated by one of the parties, therefore, the fugitive slave law of 1850 must be repealed. But this is not the reason why an iniquitous law should be repealed. The fact which the politician faces is merely, that there is less honor among thieves than was supposed, and not the fact that they are thieves. As I had no opportunity to express my thoughts at that meeting, will you allow me to do so here? Again it happens that the Boston courthouse is full of armed men, holding prisoner and trying a man, to find out if he is not really a slave. Does anyone think that justice or God awaits Mr. Loring's decision? For him to sit there deciding still, when this question is already decided from eternity to eternity, and the unlettered slave himself. And the multitude around have long since heard and assented to the decision, is simply to make himself ridiculous. We may be tempted to ask from whom he received his commission, and who he is that received it, what novel statutes he obeys, and what precedents are to him of authority. Such an arbiter's very existence is an impertinence. 
We do not ask him to make up his mind, but to make up his pack. I listen to hear the voice of a governor, commander-in-chief of the forces of Massachusetts. I hear only the creaking of crickets and the hum of insects which now fill the summer air. The governor's exploit is to review the troops on muster days. I have seen him on horseback, with his hat off, listening to a chaplain's prayer. It chances that that is all I have ever seen of a governor. I think that I could manage to get along without one. If he is not of the least use to prevent my being kidnapped, pray of what important use is he likely to be to me. When freedom is most endangered, he dwells in the deepest obscurity. A distinguished clergyman told me that he chose the profession of a clergyman, because it afforded the most leisure for literary pursuits. I would recommend to him the profession of a governor. Three years ago, also, when the Sims tragedy was acted, I said to myself, there is such an officer, if not such a man, as the governor of Massachusetts, what has he been about the last fortnight? Has he had as much as he could do to keep on the fence during this moral earthquake? It seemed to me that no keener satire could have been aimed at, no more cutting insult have been offered to that man, than just what happened, the absence of all inquiry after him in that crisis. The worst and the most I chance to know of him is, that he did not improve that opportunity to make himself known, and worthily known. He could at least have resigned himself into fame. It appeared to be forgotten that there was such a man or such an office. Yet no doubt he was endeavoring to fill the gubernatorial chair all the while. He was no governor of mine. He did not govern me. But at last, in the present case, the governor was heard from. After he and the United States government had perfectly succeeded in robbing a poor innocent black man of his liberty for life, and, as far as they could, of his creator's likeness in his breast. He made a speech to his accomplices, at a congratulatory supper. I have read a recent law of this state, making it penal for any officer of the commonwealth to detain or aid in the detention anywhere within its limits of any person for the reason that he is claimed as a fugitive slave. Also, it was a matter of notoriety that a writ of replevin to take the fugitive out of the custody of the United States Marshal could not be served, for want of sufficient force to aid the officer. I had thought that the governor was, in some sense, the executive officer of the state, that it was his business, as a governor, to see that the laws of the state were executed. While, as a man, he took care that he did not, by so doing, break the laws of humanity. But when there is any special important use for him, he is useless, or worse than useless, and permits the laws of the state to go unexecuted. Perhaps I do not know what are the duties of a governor. But if to be a governor requires to subject oneself to so much ignominy without remedy, if it is to put a restraint upon my manhood, I shall take care never to be governor of Massachusetts. I have not read far in the statutes of this commonwealth. It is not profitable reading. They do not always say what is true, and they do not always mean what they say. What I am concerned to know is, that that man's influence and authority were on the side of the slaveholder, and not of the slave, of the guilty, and not of the innocent, of injustice. And not of justice. I never saw him of whom I speak, indeed, I did not know that he was governor until this event occurred. I heard of him and Anthony Burns at the same time, and thus, undoubtedly, most will hear of him. So far am I from being governed by him. I do not mean that it was anything to his discredit that I had not heard of him, only that I heard what I did. The worst I shall say of him is, that he proved no better than the majority of his constituents would be likely to prove. In my opinion, he was not equal to the occasion. The whole military force of the state is at the service of a Mr. Suttle, a slaveholder from Virginia, to enable him to catch a man whom he calls his property. But not a soldier is offered to save a citizen of Massachusetts from being kidnapped. Is this what all these soldiers, all this training, has been for these seventy-nine years past? Have they been trained merely to rob Mexico and carry back fugitive slaves to their masters? These very nights, I heard the sound of a drum in our streets. There were men training still. And for what? I could with an effort pardon the cockerels of Concord for crowing still, 
for they, perchance, had not been beaten that morning, but I could not excuse this rub-a-dub of the trainers. The slave was carried back by exactly such as these, i.e. by the soldier, of whom the best you can say in this connection is, that he is a fool made conspicuous by a painted coat. Three years ago, also, just a week after the authorities of Boston assembled to carry back a perfectly innocent man, and one whom they knew to be innocent, into slavery. The inhabitants of Concord caused the bells to be rung and the cannons to be fired, to celebrate their liberty, and the courage and love of liberty of their ancestors who fought at the bridge. As if those three millions had fought for the right to be free themselves, but to hold in slavery three millions others. Nowadays, men wear a fool's cap, and call it a liberty cap. I do not know but there are some, who, if they were tied to a whipping post, and could but get one hand free, would use it to ring the bells and fire the cannons to celebrate their liberty. So some of my townsmen took the liberty to ring and fire. That was the extent of their freedom, and when the sound of the bells died away, their liberty died away also. When the powder was all expended, their liberty went off with the smoke. The joke could be no broader, if the inmates of the prisons were to subscribe for all the powder to be used in such salutes, and hire the jailers to do the firing and ringing for them. While they enjoyed it through the grating. This is what I thought about my neighbors. Every humane and intelligent inhabitant of Concord, when he or she heard those bells and those cannons, thought not with pride of the events of the 19th of April 1775. But with shame of the events of the 12th of April 1851. But now we have half buried that old shame under a new one. Massachusetts sat waiting Mr. Loring's decision, as if it could in any way affect her own criminality. Her crime, the most conspicuous and fatal crime of all, was permitting him to be the umpire in such a case. It was really the trial of Massachusetts. Every moment that she hesitated to set this man free, every moment that she now hesitates to atone for her crime, she is convicted. The commissioner on her case is God, not Edward G. God, but simple God. I wish my countrymen to consider, that whatever the human law may be, neither an individual nor a nation can ever commit the least act of injustice against the obscurest individual. Without having to pay the penalty for it. A government which deliberately enacts injustice, and persists in it, will at length ever become the laughingstock of the world. Much has been said about American slavery, but I think that we do not even yet realize what slavery is. If I were seriously to propose to Congress to make mankind into sausages, I have no doubt that most of the members would smile at my proposition, and if any believed me to be in earnest. They would think that I proposed something much worse than Congress had ever done. But if any of them will tell me that to make a man into a sausage would be much worse, would be any worse, than to make him into a slave, than it was to enact the fugitive slave law. I will accuse him of foolishness, of intellectual incapacity, of making a distinction without a difference. The one is just as sensible a proposition as the other. I hear a good deal said about trampling this law underfoot. Why, one need not go out of his way to do that. This law rises not to the level of the head or the reason, its natural habitat is in the dirt. It was born and bred, and has its life, only in the dust and mire, on a level with the feet. And he who walks with freedom, and does not with Hindu mercy avoid treading on every venomous reptile, will inevitably tread on it, and so trample it underfoot, and Webster, its maker, with it. Like the dirt bug and its ball. Recent events will be valuable as a criticism on the administration of justice in our midst, or, rather, as showing what are the true resources of justice in any community. It has come to this, that the friends of liberty, the friends of the slave, have shuddered when they have understood that his fate was left to the legal tribunals of the country to be decided. Free men have no faith that justice will be awarded in such a case, the judge may decide this way or that, it is a kind of accident, at best. It is evident that he is not a competent authority in so important a case. It is no time, then, to be judging according to his precedents, but to establish a precedent for the future. I would much rather trust to the sentiment of the people. 
In their vote, you would get something of some value, at least, however small. But in the other case, only the trammeled judgment of an individual, of no significance, be it which way it might. It is, to some extent, fatal to the courts, when the people are compelled to go behind them. I do not wish to believe that the courts were made for fair weather. And for very civil cases merely, but think of leaving it to any court in the land to decide whether more than three millions of people, in this case, a sixth part of a nation, have a right to be freemen or not. But it has been left to the courts of justice, so called, to the Supreme Court of the land, and, as you all know, recognizing no authority but the Constitution. It has decided that the three millions are, and shall continue to be, slaves. Such judges as these are merely the inspectors of a picklock and murderer's tools, to tell him whether they are in working order or not, and there they think that their responsibility ends. There was a prior case on the docket, which they, as judges appointed by God, had no right to skip, which having been justly settled, they would have been saved from this humiliation. It was the case of the murderer himself. The law will never make men free, it is men who have got to make the law free. They are the lovers of law and order, who observe the law when the government breaks it. Among human beings, the judge whose words seal the fate of a man furthest into eternity is not he who merely pronounces the verdict of the law, but he, whoever he may be, who, from a love of truth, and unprejudiced by any custom or enactment of men, utters a true opinion or sentence concerning him. He it is that sentences him. Whoever has discerned truth has received his commission from a higher source than the chiefest justice in the world, who can discern only law. He finds himself constituted judge of the judge, strange that it should be necessary to state such simple truths. I am more and more convinced that, with reference to any public question, it is more important to know what the country thinks of it, than what the city thinks. The city does not think much. On any moral question, I would rather have the opinion of Boxborough than of Boston and New York put together. When the former speaks, I feel as if somebody had spoken, as if humanity was yet. And a reasonable being had asserted its rights, as if some unprejudiced men among the country's hills had at length turned their attention to the subject. And by a few sensible words redeemed the reputation of the race. When, in some obscure country town, the farmers come together to a special town meeting, to express their opinion on some subject which is vexing the land, that, I think, is the true Congress. And the most respectable one that is ever assembled in the United States. It is evident that there are, in this commonwealth at least, two parties, becoming more and more distinct, the party of the city, and the party of the country. I know that the country is mean enough, but I am glad to believe that there is a slight difference in her favor. But as yet, she has few, if any organs, through which to express herself. The editorials which she reads, like the news, come from the seaboard. Let us, the inhabitants of the country, cultivate self-respect. Let us not send to the city for aught more essential than our broadcloths and groceries, or, if we read the opinions of the city, let us entertain opinions of our own. Among measures to be adopted, would suggest to make as earnest and vigorous an assault on the press as has already been made, and with effect, on the church. The church has much improved within a few years, but the press is almost, without exception, corrupt. I believe that, in this country, the press exerts a greater and a more pernicious influence than the church did in its worst period. We are not a religious people, but we are a nation of politicians. We do not care for the Bible, but we do care for the newspaper. At any meeting of politicians, like that at Concord the other evening, for instance, how impertinent it would be to quote from the Bible. How pertinent to quote from a newspaper or from the Constitution. The newspaper is a Bible which we read every morning and every afternoon, standing and sitting, riding and walking. It is a Bible which every man carries in his pocket, which lies on every table and counter, and which the mail, and thousands of missionaries, are continually dispersing. It is, in short, the only book which America has printed, and which America reads. So wide is its influence. 
The editor is a preacher whom you voluntarily support. Your tax is commonly one cent daily, and it costs nothing for pew hire. But how many of these preachers preach the truth? I repeat the testimony of many an intelligent foreigner, as well as my own convictions, when I say, that probably no country was ever ruled by so mean a class of tyrants as. With a few noble exceptions, are the editors of the periodical press in this country. And as they live and rule only by their servility, and appealing to the worse, and not the better, nature of man, the people who read them are in the condition of the dog that returns to his vomit. The Liberator and the Commonwealth were the only papers in Boston, as far as I know, which made themselves heard in condemnation of the cowardice and meanness of the authorities of that city. As exhibited in 51. The other journals, almost without exception, by their manner of referring to and speaking of the fugitive slave law, and the carrying back of the slave sims, insulted the common sense of the country, at least. And, for the most part, they did this, one would say, because they thought so to secure the approbation of their patrons. Not being aware that a sounder sentiment prevailed to any extent in the heart of the Commonwealth. I am told that some of them have improved of late, but they are still eminently time serving. Such is the character they have won. But, thank fortune, this preacher can be even more easily reached by the weapons of the reformer than could the recreant priest. The free men of New England have only to refrain from purchasing and reading these sheets, have only to withhold their sense, to kill a score of them at once. One whom I respect told me that he purchased Mitchell's citizen in the cars, and then threw it out the window. But would not his contempt have been more fatally expressed if he had not bought it? Are they Americans? Are they New Englanders? Are they inhabitants of Lexington and Concord and Framingham, who read and support the Boston Post, Mail, Journal, Advertiser, Courier, and Times? Are these the flags of our union? I am not a newspaper reader, and may omit to name the worst. Could slavery suggest a more complete servility than some of these journals exhibit? Is there any dust which their conduct does not lick, and make fouler still with its slime? I do not know whether the Boston Herald is still in existence, but I remember to have seen it about the streets when Sims was carried off. Did it not act its part well, serve its master faithfully? How could it have gone lower on its belly? How can a man stoop lower than he is low? Do more than put his extremities in the place of the head he has? Then make his head his lower extremity? When I have taken up this paper with my cuffs turned up, I have heard the gurgling of the sewer through every column. I have felt that I was handling a paper picked out of the public gutters, a leaf from the gospel of the gambling house, the groggery, and the brothel. Harmonizing with the gospel of the merchant's exchange. The majority of the men of the North, and of the South and East and West, are not men of principle. If they vote, they do not send men to Congress on errands of humanity. But while their brothers and sisters are being scourged and hung for loving liberty. While, I might here insert all that slavery implies and is, it is the mismanagement of wood and iron and stone and gold which concerns them. Do what you will, O government. With my wife and children, my mother and brother, my father and sister, I will obey your commands to the letter. It will indeed grieve me if you hurt them, if you deliver them to overseers to be hunted by hounds or to be whipped to death. But, nevertheless, I will peaceably pursue my chosen calling on this fair earth, until perchance, one day, when I have put on mourning for them dead, I shall have persuaded you to relent. Such is the attitude, such are the words of Massachusetts. Rather than do thus, I need not say what match I would touch, what system endeavor to blow up, but as I love my life, I would side with the light, and let the dark earth roll from under me. Calling my mother and my brother to follow. I would remind my countrymen, that they are to be men first, and Americans only at a late and convenient hour. No matter how valuable law may be to protect your property, even to keep soul and body together, if it do not keep you and humanity together. I am sorry to say, that I doubt if there is a judge in Massachusetts who is prepared to resign his office, and get his living innocently. Whenever it is required of him to pass sentence under a law which is merely contrary to the law of God. 
I am compelled to see that they put themselves, or rather, are by character, in this respect, exactly on a level with the marine who discharges his musket in any direction he is ordered to. They are just as much tools, and as little men. Certainly, they are not the more to be respected, because their master enslaves their understandings and consciences, instead of their bodies. The judges and lawyers, simply as such, I mean, and all men of expediency, try this case by a very low and incompetent standard. They consider, not whether the fugitive slave law is right, but whether it is what they call constitutional. Is virtue constitutional, or vice? Is equity constitutional, or iniquity? In important moral and vital questions like this, it is just as impertinent to ask whether a law is constitutional or not, as to ask whether it is profitable or not. They persist in being the servants of the worst of men, and not the servants of humanity. The question is not whether you or your grandfather, seventy years ago, did not enter into an agreement to serve the devil, and that service is not accordingly now due. But whether you will not now, for once and at last, serve God, in spite of your own past recreancy, or that of your ancestor, by obeying that eternal and only just constitution, which he, and not any Jefferson or Adams, has written in your being. The amount of it is, if the majority vote the devil to be God, the minority will live and behave accordingly, trusting that some time or other, by some speaker's casting vote, perhaps, they may reinstate God. This is the highest principle I can get out or invent for my neighbors. These men act as if they believed that they could safely slide down a hill a little way, or a good way, and would surely come to a place, by and by, where they could begin to slide up again. This is expediency, or choosing that course which offers the slightest obstacles to the feet, that is, a downhill one. But there is no such thing as accomplishing a righteous reform by the use of expediency. There is no such thing as sliding uphill. In morals, the only sliders are backsliders. Thus we steadily worship mammon, both school and state and church, and on the seventh day curse God with a tintamar from one end of the union to the other. Will mankind never learn that policy is not morality, that it never secures any moral right, but considers merely what is expedient? Chooses the available candidate, who is invariably the devil, and what right have his constituents to be surprised, because the devil does not behave like an angel of light? What is wanted is men, not of policy, but of probity, who recognize a higher law than the constitution, or the decision of the majority. The fate of the country does not depend on how you vote at the polls, the worst man is as strong as the best at that game. It does not depend on what kind of paper you drop into the ballot box once a year, but on what kind of man you drop from your chamber into the street every morning. What should concern Massachusetts is not the Nebraska bill, nor the fugitive slave bill, but her own slaveholding and servility. Let the state dissolve her union with the slaveholder. She may wriggle and hesitate, and ask leave to read the Constitution once more, but she can find no respectable law or precedent which sanctions the continuance of such a union for an instant. Let each inhabitant of the state dissolve his union with her, as long as she delays to do her duty. The events of the past month teach me to distrust fame. I see that she does not finely discriminate, but coarsely hurrahs. She considers not the simple heroism of an action, but only as it is connected with its apparent consequences. She praises till she is hoarse the easy exploit of the Boston Tea Party, but will be comparatively silent about the braver and more disinterestedly heroic attack on the Boston courthouse. Simply because it was unsuccessful. Covered with disgrace, the state has sat down coolly to try for their lives and liberties the men who attempted to do its duty for it. And this is called justice. They who have shown that they can behave particularly well may perchance be put under bonds for their good behavior. They whom truth requires at present to plead guilty are, of all the inhabitants of the state, preeminently innocent. While the governor, and the mayor, and countless officers of the commonwealth are at large, the champions of liberty are imprisoned. Only they are guiltless, who commit the crime of contempt of such a court. It behooves every man to see that his influence is on the side of justice, 
and let the courts make their own characters. My sympathies in this case are wholly with the accused, and wholly against their accusers and judges. Justice is sweet and musical, but injustice is harsh and discordant. The judge still sits grinding at his organ, but it yields no music, and we hear only the sound of the handle. He believes that all the music resides in the handle, and the crowd toss him their coppers the same as before. Do you suppose that that Massachusetts which is now doing these things, which hesitates to crown these men, some of whose lawyers, and even judges, perchance, may be driven to take refuge in some poor quibble, that they may not wholly outrage their instinctive sense of justice, do you suppose that she is anything but base and servile? That she is the champion of liberty? Show me a free state, and a court truly of justice, and I will fight for them, if need be. But show me Massachusetts, and I refuse her my allegiance, and express contempt for her courts. The effect of a good government is to make life more valuable, of a bad one, to make it less valuable. We can afford that railroad, and all merely material stock, should lose some of its value, for that only compels us to live more simply and economically. But suppose that the value of life itself should be diminished. How can we make a less demand on man and nature, how live more economically in respect to virtue and all noble qualities, than we do? I have lived for the last month, and I think that every man in Massachusetts capable of the sentiment of patriotism must have had a similar experience, with the sense of having suffered a vast and indefinite loss. I did not know at first what ailed me. At last it occurred to me that what I had lost was a country. I had never respected the government near to which I lived, but I had foolishly thought that I might manage to live here, minding my private affairs, and forget it. For my part, my old and worthiest pursuits have lost I cannot say how much of their attraction. And I feel that my investment in life here is worth many percent less since Massachusetts last deliberately sent back an innocent man, Anthony Burns, to slavery. I dwelt before, perhaps, in the illusion that my life passed somewhere only between heaven and hell, but now I cannot persuade myself that I do not dwell wholly within hell. The sight of that political organization called Massachusetts is to me morally covered with volcanic scoriae and cinders, such as Milton describes in the infernal regions. If there is any hell more unprincipled than our rulers, and we, the ruled, I feel curious to see it. Life itself being worth less, all things with it, which minister to it, are worth less. Suppose you have a small library, with pictures to adorn the walls, a garden laid out around, and contemplate scientific and literary pursuits, and discover all at once that your villa, with all its contents, is located in hell, and that the justice of the peace has a cloven foot and a forked tail, do not these things suddenly lose their value in your eyes? I feel that, to some extent, the state has fatally interfered with my lawful business. It has not only interrupted me in my passage through Court Street on errands of trade, but it has interrupted me and every man on his onward and upward path, on which he had trusted soon to leave Court Street far behind. What right had it to remind me of Court Street? I have found that hollow which even I had relied on for solid. I am surprised to see men going about their business as if nothing had happened. I say to myself, unfortunates. They have not heard the news. I am surprised that the man whom I just met on horseback should be so earnest to overtake his newly bought cows running away, since all property is insecure, and if they do not run away again, they may be taken away from him when he gets them. Fool! Does he not know that his seed corn is worth less this year, that all beneficent harvests fail as you approach the empire of hell? No prudent man will build a storehouse under these circumstances, or engage in any peaceful enterprise which it requires a long time to accomplish. Art is as long as ever, but life is more interrupted and less available for a man's proper pursuits. It is not an era of repose. We have used up all our inherited freedom. If we would save our lives, we must fight for them. I walk toward one of our ponds, but what signifies the beauty of nature when men are base? We walk to lakes to see our serenity reflected in them. When we are not serene, we go not to them. 
who can be serene in a country where both the rulers and the ruled are without principle? The remembrance of my country spoils my walk. My thoughts are murder to the state, and involuntarily go plotting against her. But it chanced the other day that I scented a white water lily, and a season I had waited for had arrived. It is the emblem of purity. It bursts up so pure and fair to the eye, and so sweet to the scent, as if to show us what purity and sweetness reside in, and can be extracted from, the slime and muck of earth. I think I have plucked the first one that has opened for a mile. What confirmation of our hopes is in the fragrance of this flower? I shall not so soon despair of the world for it, notwithstanding slavery, and the cowardice and want of principle of northern men. It suggests what kind of laws have prevailed longest and widest, and still prevail, and that the time may come when man's deeds will smell as sweet. Such is the odor which the plant emits. If nature can compound this fragrance still annually, I shall believe her still young and full of vigor, her integrity and genius unimpaired, and that there is virtue even in man, too. Who is fitted to perceive and love it? It reminds me that nature has been partner to no Missouri compromise. I sent no compromise in the fragrance of the water lily. It is not an impia de glacii. In it, the sweet, and pure, and innocent are wholly sundered from the obscene and baleful. I do not scent in this the time-serving irresolution of a Massachusetts governor, nor of a Boston mayor. So behave that the odor of your actions may enhance the general sweetness of the atmosphere, that when we behold or scent a flower, we may not be reminded how inconsistent your deeds are with it. For all odor is but one form of advertisement of a moral quality, and if fair actions had not been performed, the lily would not smell sweet. The foul slime stands for the sloth and vice of man, the decay of humanity, the fragrant flower that springs from it, for the purity and courage which are immortal. Slavery and servility have produced no sweet-scented flower annually, to charm the senses of men, for they have no real life, they are merely a decaying and a death. Offensive to all healthy nostrils. We do not complain that they live, but that they do not get buried. Let the living bury them, even they are good for manure. Life without principle. Derived from a lecture titled, What Shall It Profit?, delivered at Providence, Rhode Island, December 6, 1854, first published in the present form in the Atlantic Monthly, Volume 12, No. 71, October 1863. At a lyceum, not long since, I felt that the lecturer had chosen a theme too foreign to himself, and so failed to interest me as much as he might have done. He described things not in or near to his heart, but toward his extremities and superficies. There was, in this sense, no truly central or centralizing thought in the lecture. I would have had him deal with his privatist experience, as the poet does. The greatest compliment that was ever paid me was when one asked me what I thought, and attended to my answer. I am surprised, as well as delighted, when this happens, it is such a rare use he would make of me, as if he were acquainted with the tool. Commonly, if men want anything of me, it is only to know how many acres I make of their land, since I am a surveyor, or, at most, what trivial news I have burdened myself with. They never will go to law for my meat they prefer the shell. A man once came a considerable distance to ask me to lecture on slavery. But on conversing with him, I found that he and his clique expected seven-eighths of the lecture to be theirs, and only one-eighth mine, so I declined. I take it for granted, when I am invited to lecture anywhere, for I have had a little experience in that business, that there is a desire to hear what I think on some subject. Though I may be the greatest fool in the country, and not that I should say pleasant things merely, or such as the audience will assent to. And I resolve, accordingly, that I will give them a strong dose of myself. They have sent for me, and engaged to pay for me, and I am determined that they shall have me, though I bore them beyond all precedent. So now I would say something similar to you, my readers. Since you are my readers, and I have not been much of a traveller, I will not talk about people a thousand miles off, but come as near home as I can. As the time is short, I will leave out all the flattery, and retain all the criticism. 
let us consider the way in which we spend our lives. This world is a place of business. What an infinite bustle. I am awaked almost every night by the panting of the locomotive. It interrupts my dreams. There is no Sabbath. It would be glorious to see mankind at leisure for once. It is nothing but work, work, work. I cannot easily buy a blank book to write thoughts in, they are commonly ruled for dollars and cents. An Irishman, seeing me making a minute in the fields, took it for granted that I was calculating my wages. If a man was tossed out of a window when an infant, and so made a cripple for life, or scared out of his wits by the Indians, it is regretted chiefly because he was thus incapacitated for business. I think that there is nothing, not even crime, more opposed to poetry, to philosophy, I, to life itself, than this incessant business. There is a coarse and boisterous money-making fellow in the outskirts of our town, who is going to build a bank wall under the hill along the edge of his meadow. The powers have put this into his head to keep him out of mischief, and he wishes me to spend three weeks digging there with him. The result will be that he will perhaps get some more money to hoard, and leave for his heirs to spend foolishly. If I do this, most will commend me as an industrious and hard-working man. But if I choose to devote myself to certain labors which yield more real profit, though but little money, they may be inclined to look on me as an idler. Nevertheless, as I do not need the police of meaningless labor to regulate me, and do not see anything absolutely praiseworthy in this fellow's undertaking. Any more than in many an enterprise of our own or foreign governments, however amusing it may be to him or them, I prefer to finish my education at a different school. If a man walk in the woods for love of them half of each day, he is in danger of being regarded as a loafer. But if he spends his whole day as a speculator, shearing off those woods and making earth bald before her time, he is esteemed an industrious and enterprising citizen. As if a town had no interest in its forests but to cut them down. Most men would feel insulted, if it were proposed to employ them in throwing stones over a wall, and then in throwing them back, merely that they might earn their wages. But many are no more worthily employed now. For instance, just after sunrise, one summer morning, I noticed one of my neighbors walking beside his team, which was slowly drawing a heavy hewn stone swung under the axle. Surrounded by an atmosphere of industry, his day's work begun, his brow commenced to sweat, a reproach to all sluggards and idlers, pausing abreast the shoulders of his oxen. And half turning round with a flourish of his merciful whip, while they gained their length on him. And I thought, such is the labor which the American Congress exists to protect, honest, manly toil, honest as the day is long, that makes his bread taste sweet. And keep society sweet, which all men respect and have consecrated, one of the sacred band, doing the needful but irksome drudgery. Indeed, I felt a slight reproach, because I observed this from a window, and was not abroad and stirring about a similar business. The day went by, and at evening I passed the yard of another neighbor, who keeps many servants, and spends much money foolishly, while he adds nothing to the common stock. And there I saw the stone of the morning lying beside a whimsical structure intended to adorn this Lord Timothy Dexter's premises, and the dignity forthwith departed from the teamster's labor. In my eyes. In my opinion, the sun was made to light worthier toil than this. I may add, that his employer has since run off, in debt to a good part of the town, and, after passing through chancery, has settled somewhere else, there to become once more a patron of the arts. The ways by which you may get money almost without exception lead downward. To have done anything by which you earned money merely is to have been truly idle or worse. If the laborer gets no more than the wages which his employer pays him, he is cheated, he cheats himself. If you would get money as a writer or lecturer, you must be popular, which is to go down perpendicularly. Those services which the community will most readily pay for, it is most disagreeable to render. You are paid for being something less than a man. The state does not commonly reward a genius any more wisely. Even the poet laureate would rather not have to celebrate the accidents of royalty. He must be bribed with a pipe of wine. 
and perhaps another poet is called away from his muse to gauge that very pipe. As for my own business, even that kind of surveying which I could do with most satisfaction my employers do not want. They would prefer that I should do my work coarsely and not too well, I, not well enough. When I observe that there are different ways of surveying, my employer commonly asks which will give him the most land, not which is most correct. I once invented a rule for measuring cordwood, and tried to introduce it in Boston. But the measurer there told me that the sellers did not wish to have their wood measured correctly, that he was already too accurate for them. And therefore they commonly got their wood measured in Charlestown before crossing the bridge. The aim of the laborer should be, not to get his living, to get, a good job, but to perform well a certain work. And, even in a pecuniary sense, it would be economy for a town to pay its laborers so well that they would not feel that they were working for low ends, as for a livelihood merely. But for scientific, or even moral ends. Do not hire a man who does your work for money, but him who does it for love of it. It is remarkable that there are few men so well employed, so much to their minds, but that a little money or fame would commonly buy them off from their present pursuit. I see advertisements for active young men, as if activity were the whole of a young man's capital. Yet I have been surprised when one has with confidence proposed to me, a grown man, to embark in some enterprise of his, as if I had absolutely nothing to do. My life having been a complete failure hitherto. What a doubtful compliment this is to pay me. As if he had met me halfway across the ocean beating up against the wind, but bound nowhere, and proposed to me to go along with him. If I did, what do you think the underwriters would say? No, no. I am not without employment at this stage of the voyage. To tell the truth, I saw an advertisement for able-bodied seamen, when I was a boy, sauntering in my native port, and as soon as I came of age I embarked. The community has no bribe that will tempt a wise man. You may raise money enough to tunnel a mountain, but you cannot raise money enough to hire a man who is minding his own business. An efficient and valuable man does what he can, whether the community pay him for it or not. The inefficient offer their inefficiency to the highest bidder, and are forever expecting to be put into office. One would suppose that they were rarely disappointed. Perhaps I am more than usually jealous with respect to my freedom. I feel that my connection with and obligation to society are still very slight and transient. Those slight labors which afford me a livelihood, and by which it is allowed that I am to some extent serviceable to my contemporaries, are as yet commonly a pleasure to me. And I am not often reminded that they are a necessity. So far I am successful. But I foresee, that, if my wants should be much increased, the labor required to supply them would become a drudgery. If I should sell both my forenoons and afternoons to society, as most appear to do, I am sure that for me there would be nothing left worth living for. I trust that I shall never thus sell my birthright for a mess of pottage. I wish to suggest that a man may be very industrious, and yet not spend his time well. There is no more fatal blunderer than he who consumes the greater part of his life getting his living. All great enterprises are self-supporting. The poet, for instance, must sustain his body by his poetry, as a steam planing mill feeds its boilers with the shavings it makes. You must get your living by loving. But as it is said of the merchants that ninety-seven in a hundred fail, so the life of men generally, tried by this standard, is a failure, and bankruptcy may be surely prophesied. Merely to come into the world the heir of a fortune is not to be born, but to be stillborn, rather. To be supported by the charity of friends, or a government pension, provided you continue to breathe, by whatever fine synonyms you describe these relations, is to go into the almshouse. On Sundays the poor debtor goes to church to take an account of stock, and finds, of course, that his outgoes have been greater than his income. In the Catholic Church, especially, they go into chancery, make a clean confession, give up all, and think to start again. Thus men will lie on their backs, talking about the fall of man, and never make an effort to get up. As for the comparative demand which men make on life, it is an important difference between two, that the one is satisfied with a level success, 
that his marks can all be hit by point-blank shots. But the other, however low and unsuccessful his life may be, constantly elevates his aim, though at a very slight angle to the horizon. I should much rather be the last man, though, as the Orientals say, greatness doth not approach him who is forever looking down, and all those who are looking high are growing poor. It is remarkable that there is little or nothing to be remembered written on the subject of getting a living, how to make getting a living not merely honest and honorable, but altogether inviting and glorious. For if getting a living is not so, then living is not. One would think, from looking at literature, that this question had never disturbed a solitary individual's musings. Is it that men are too much disgusted with their experience to speak of it? The lesson of value which money teaches, which the author of the universe has taken so much pains to teach us, we are inclined to skip altogether. As for the means of living, it is wonderful how indifferent men of all classes are about it, even reformers, so called, whether they inherit, or earn, or steal it. I think that society has done nothing for us in this respect, or at least has undone what she has done. Cold and hunger seem more friendly to my nature than those methods which men have adopted and advised to ward them off. The title wise is, for the most part, falsely applied. How can one be a wise man, if he does not know any better how to live than other men, if he is only more cunning and intellectually subtle? Does wisdom work in a treadmill? Or does she teach how to succeed by her example? Is there any such thing as wisdom not applied to life? Is she merely the miller who grinds the finest logic? It is pertinent to ask if Plato got his living in a better way or more successfully than his contemporaries, or did he succumb to the difficulties of life like other men? Did he seem to prevail over some of them merely by indifference, or by assuming grand airs? Or find it easier to live, because his aunt remembered him in her will? The ways in which most men get their living, that is, live, are mere makeshifts, and a shirking of the real business of life, chiefly because they do not know, but partly because they do not mean. Any better. The rush to California, for instance, and the attitude, not merely of merchants, but of philosophers and prophets, so called, in relation to it, reflect the greatest disgrace on mankind. That so many are ready to live by luck, and so get the means of commanding the labor of others less lucky, without contributing any value to society. And that is called enterprise. I know of no more startling development of the immorality of trade, and all the common modes of getting a living. The philosophy and poetry and religion of such a mankind are not worth the dust of a puffball. The hog that gets his living by rooting, stirring up the soil so, would be ashamed of such company. If I could command the wealth of all the worlds by lifting my finger, would not pay such a price for it. Even Muhammad knew that God did not make this world in jest. It makes God to be a money gentleman who scatters a handful of pennies in order to see mankind scramble for them. The world's raffle. A subsistence in the domains of nature a thing to be raffled for. What a comment, what a satire, on our institutions. The conclusion will be, that mankind will hang itself upon a tree. And have all the precepts in all the Bibles taught men only this? And is the last and most admirable invention of the human race only an improved muckrake? Is this the ground on which Orientals and Occidentals meet? Did God direct us so to get our living, digging where we never planted, and He would, perchance, reward us with lumps of gold? God gave the righteous man a certificate entitling him to food and raiment, but the unrighteous man found a facsimile of the same in God's coffers, and appropriated it. And obtained food and raiment like the former. It is one of the most extensive systems of counterfeiting that the world has seen. I did not know that mankind were suffering for want of gold. I have seen a little of it. I know that it is very malleable, but not so malleable as wit. A grain of gold will gild a great surface, but not so much as a grain of wisdom. The gold digger in the ravines of the mountains is as much a gambler as his fellow in the saloons of San Francisco. What difference does it make, whether you shake dirt or shake dice? If you win, society is the loser. 
The gold digger is the enemy of the honest laborer, whatever checks and compensations there may be. It is not enough to tell me that you worked hard to get your gold. So does the devil work hard. The way of transgressors may be hard in many respects. The humblest observer who goes to the mine sees and says that gold digging is of the character of a lottery, the gold thus obtained is not the same thing with the wages of honest toil. But, practically, he forgets what he has seen, for he has seen only the fact, not the principle, and goes into trade there, that is, buys a ticket in what commonly proves another lottery. Where the fact is not so obvious. After reading Howitt's account of the Australian gold diggings one evening, I had in my mind's eye, all night, the numerous valleys, with their streams, all cut up with foul pits. From ten to one hundred feet deep, and half a dozen feet across, as close as they can be dug. And partly filled with water, the locality to which men furiously rush to probe for their fortunes, uncertain where they shall break ground, not knowing but the gold is under their camp itself, sometimes digging 160 feet before they strike the vein. Or then missing it by a foot, turned into demons, and regardless of each other's rights, in their thirst for riches, whole valleys, for thirty miles, suddenly honeycombed by the pits of the miners. So that even hundreds are drowned in them, standing in water, and covered with mud and clay, they work night and day, dying of exposure and disease. Having read this, and partly forgotten it, I was thinking, accidentally, of my own unsatisfactory life, doing as others do. And with that vision of the digging still before me, I asked myself, why I might not be washing some gold daily. Though it were only the finest particles, why I might not sink a shaft down to the gold within me, and work that mine. There is a Ballarat, a Bendigo for you, what though it were a sulky gully? At any rate, I might pursue some path, however solitary and narrow and crooked, in which I could walk with love and reverence. Wherever a man separates from the multitude, and goes his own way in this mood, there indeed is a fork in the road, though ordinary travellers may see only a gap in the paling. His solitary path across lots will turn out the higher way of the two. Men rush to California and Australia as if the true gold were to be found in that direction. But that is to go to the very opposite extreme to where it lies. They go prospecting farther and farther away from the true lead, and are most unfortunate when they think themselves most successful. Is not our native soil auriferous? Does not a stream from the Golden Mountains flow through our native valley? And has not this for more than geologic ages been bringing down the shining particles and forming the nuggets for us? Yet, strange to tell, if a digger steal away, prospecting for this true gold, into the unexplored solitudes around us, there is no danger that any will dog his steps and endeavor to supplant him. He may claim and undermine the whole valley even, both the cultivated and the uncultivated portions, his whole life long in peace, for no one will ever dispute his claim. They will not mind his cradles or his toms. He is not confined to a claim twelve feet square, as at Ballarat, but may mine anywhere, and wash the whole wide world in his tom. How it says of the man who found the great nugget which weighed twenty-eight pounds, at the Bendigo diggings in Australia, he soon began to drink got a horse, and rode all about, generally at full gallop, and, when he met people, called out to inquire if they knew who he was. And then kindly informed them that he was the bloody wretch that had found the nugget. At last he rode full speed against a tree, and nearly knocked his brains out. I think, however, there was no danger of that, for he had already knocked his brains out against the nugget. How it adds, he is a hopelessly ruined man but he is a type of the class. They are all fast men. Here some of the names of the places where they dig, Jackass Flat, Sheep's Head Gully, Murderer's Bar, etc. Is there no satire in these names? Let them carry their ill-gotten wealth where they will, I am thinking it will still be, Jackass Flat, if not, Murderer's Bar, where they live. The last resource of our energy has been the robbing of graveyards on the Isthmus of Darien, an enterprise which appears to be but in its infancy. For, according to late accounts, an act has passed its second reading in the legislature of New Granada, 
regulating this kind of mining. And a correspondent of the Tribune writes, in the dry season, when the weather will permit of the country being properly prospected, no doubt other rich guacas, that is, graveyards, will be found. To emigrants he says, do not come before December, take the Isthmus route in preference to the Boca del Toro one, bring no useless baggage, and do not cumber yourself with a tent. But a good pair of blankets will be necessary, a pick, shovel, an axe of good material will be almost all that is required, advice which might have been taken from the Burker's Guide. And he concludes with this line in italics and small capitals, if you are doing well at home, stay there, which may fairly be interpreted to mean. If you are getting a good living by robbing graveyards at home, stay there. But why go to California for a text? She is the child of New England, bred at her own school and church. It is remarkable that among all the preachers there are so few moral teachers. The prophets are employed in excusing the ways of men. Most reverend seniors, the Illuminati of the age, tell me, with a gracious, reminiscent smile, betwixt an aspiration and a shudder, not to be too tender about these things, to lump all that, that is. Make a lump of gold of it. The highest advice I have heard on these subjects was groveling. The burden of it was, it is not worth your while to undertake to reform the world in this particular. Do not ask how your bread is buttered, it will make you sick, if you do, and the like. A man had better starve at once than lose his innocence in the process of getting his bread. If within the sophisticated man there is not an unsophisticated one, then he is but one of the devil's angels. As we grow old, we live more coarsely, we relax a little in our disciplines, and, to some extent, cease to obey our finest instincts. But we should be fastidious to the extreme of sanity, disregarding the jibes of those who are more unfortunate than ourselves. In our science and philosophy, even, there is commonly no true and absolute account of things. The spirit of sect and bigotry has planted its hoof amid the stars. You have only to discuss the problem, whether the stars are inhabited or not, in order to discover it. Why must we daub the heavens as well as the earth? It was an unfortunate discovery that Dr. Cain was a mason, and that Sir John Franklin was another. But it was a more cruel suggestion that possibly that was the reason why the former went in search of the latter. There is not a popular magazine in this country that would dare to print a child's thought on important subjects without comment. It must be submitted to the DDS. I would it were the chickadee -dees. You come from attending the funeral of mankind to attend to a natural phenomenon. A little thought is sexton to all the world. I hardly know an intellectual man, even, who is so broad and truly liberal that you can think aloud in his society. Most with whom you endeavor to talk soon come to a stand against some institution in which they appear to hold stock, that is, some particular, not universal, way of viewing things. They will continually thrust their own low roof, with its narrow skylight, between you and the sky, when it is the unobstructed heavens you would view. Get out of the way with your cobwebs, wash your windows, I say. In some lyceums they tell me that they have voted to exclude the subject of religion. But how do I know what their religion is, and when I am near to or far from it? I have walked into such an arena and done my best to make a clean breast of what religion I have experienced, and the audience never suspected what I was about. The lecture was as harmless as moonshine to them. Whereas, if I had read to them the biography of the greatest scamps in history, they might have thought that I had written the lives of the deacons of their church. Ordinarily, the inquiry is, where did you come from? Or, where are you going? That was a more pertinent question which I overheard one of my auditors put to another once, what does he lecture for? It made me quake in my shoes. To speak impartially, the best men that I know are not serene, a world in themselves. For the most part, they dwell in forms, and flatter and study effect only more finely than the rest. We select granite for the underpinning of our houses and barns, we build fences of stone. But we do not ourselves rest on an underpinning of granitic truth, the lowest primitive rock. Our sills are rotten. 
What stuff is the man made of who is not coexistent in our thought with the purest and subtlest truth? I often accuse my finest acquaintances of an immense frivolity. For, while there are manners and compliments we do not meet, we do not teach one another the lessons of honesty and sincerity that the brutes do, or of steadiness and solidity that the rocks do. The fault is commonly mutual, however, for we do not habitually demand any more of each other. That excitement about Kasuth, consider how characteristic, but superficial, it was. Only another kind of politics or dancing. Men were making speeches to him all over the country, but each expressed only the thought, or the want of thought, of the multitude. No man stood on truth. They were merely banded together, as usual, one leaning on another, and all together on nothing. As the Hindus made the world rest on an elephant, the elephant on a tortoise, and the tortoise on a serpent, and had nothing to put under the serpent. For all fruit of that stir we have the Kasuth hat. Just so hollow and ineffectual, for the most part, is our ordinary conversation. Surface meets surface. When our life ceases to be inward and private, conversation degenerates into mere gossip. We rarely meet a man who can tell us any news which he has not read in a newspaper, or been told by his neighbor. And, for the most part, the only difference between us and our fellow is, that he has seen the newspaper, or been out to tea, and we have not. In proportion as our inward life fails, we go more constantly and desperately to the post office. You may depend on it, that the poor fellow who walks away with the greatest number of letters, proud of his extensive correspondence, has not heard from himself this long while. I do not know but it is too much to read one newspaper a week. I have tried it recently, and for so long it seems to me that I have not dwelt in my native region. The sun, the clouds, the snow, the trees say not so much to me. You cannot serve two masters. It requires more than a day's devotion to know and to possess the wealth of a day. We may well be ashamed to tell what things we have read or heard in our day. I do not know why my news should be so trivial, considering what one's dreams and expectations are, why the developments should be so paltry. The news we hear, for the most part, is not news to our genius. It is the stalest repetition. You are often tempted to ask, why such stress is laid on a particular experience which you have had, that, after twenty-five years, you should meet Hobbins, Registrar of Deeds, again on the sidewalk. Have you not budged an inch, then? Such is the daily news. Its facts appear to float in the atmosphere, insignificant as the sporules of fungi, and impinge on some neglected thallus, or surface of our minds, which affords a basis for them. And hence a parasitic growth. We should wash ourselves clean of such news. Of what consequence, though our planet explode, if there is no character involved in the explosion? In health we have not the least curiosity about such events. We do not live for idle amusement. I would not run round a corner to see the world blow up. All summer, and far into the autumn, perchance, you unconsciously went by the newspapers and the news, and now you find it was because the morning and the evening were full of news to you. Your walks were full of incidents. You attended, not to the affairs of Europe, but to your own affairs in Massachusetts fields. If you chance to live and move and have your being in that thin stratum in which the events that make the news transpire, thinner than the paper on which it is printed, then these things will fill the world for you. But if you soar above or dive below that plane, you cannot remember nor be reminded of them. Really to see the sun rise or go down every day, so to relate ourselves to a universal fact, would preserve us sane forever. Nations. What are nations? Tartars, and Huns, and Chinamen. Like insects, they swarm. The historian strives in vain to make them memorable. It is for want of a man that there are so many men. It is individuals that populate the world. Any man thinking may say with the spirit of Loden. I look down from my height on nations. And they become ashes before me. Calm is my dwelling in the clouds. Pleasant are the great fields of my rest. 
Pray, let us live without being drawn by dogs, Eskimo fashion, tearing over hill and dale, and biting each other's ears. Not without a slight shudder at the danger, I often perceive how near I had come to admitting into my mind the details of some trivial affair, the news of the street. And I am astonished to observe how willing men are to lumber their minds with such rubbish, to permit idle rumors and incidents of the most insignificant kind to intrude on ground which should be sacred to thought. Shall the mind be a public arena, where the affairs of the street and the gossip of the tea-table chiefly are discussed? Or shall it be a quarter of heaven itself, an hypothral temple, consecrated to the service of the gods? I find it so difficult to dispose of the few facts which to me are significant that I hesitate to burden my attention with those which are insignificant, which only a divine mind could illustrate. Such is, for the most part, the news in newspapers and conversation. It is important to preserve the mind's chastity in this respect. Think of admitting the details of a single case of the criminal court into our thoughts, to stalk profanely through their very sanctum sanctorum for an hour, for many hours. To make a very barroom of the mind's inmost apartment, as if for so long the dust of the street had occupied us, the very street itself, with all its travel, its bustle, and filth, had passed through our thoughts shrine. Would it not be an intellectual and moral suicide? When I have been compelled to sit spectator and auditor in a courtroom for some hours, and have seen my neighbors, who were not compelled, stealing in from time to time, and tiptoeing about with washed hands and faces, it has appeared to my mind's eye, that, when they took off their hats, their ears suddenly expanded into vast hoppers for sound, between which even their narrow heads were crowded. Like the veins of windmills, they caught the broad, but shallow stream of sound, which, after a few titillating gyrations in their coggy brains, passed out the other side. I wondered if, when they got home, they were as careful to wash their ears as before their hands and faces. It has seemed to me, at such a time, that the auditors and the witnesses, the jury and the counsel, the judge and the criminal at the bar, if I may presume him guilty before he is convicted, were all equally criminal and a thunderbolt might be expected to descend and consume them all together. By all kinds of traps and signboards, threatening the extreme penalty of the divine law, exclude such trespassers from the only ground which can be sacred to you. It is so hard to forget what it is worse than useless to remember. If I am to be a thoroughfare, I prefer that it be of the mountain brooks, the Parnassian streams, and not the town sewers. There is inspiration, that gossip which comes to the ear of the attentive mind from the courts of heaven. There is the profane and stale revelation of the barroom and the police court. The same ear is fitted to receive both communications. Only the character of the hearer determines to which it shall be open, and to which closed. I believe that the mind can be permanently profaned by the habit of attending to trivial things, so that all our thoughts shall be tinged with triviality. Our very intellect shall be macadamized, as it were, its foundation broken into fragments for the wheels of travel to roll over. And if you would know what will make the most durable pavement, surpassing rolled stones, spruce blocks, and asphaltum, you have only to look into some of our minds which have been subjected to this treatment so long. If we have thus desecrated ourselves, as who has not, the remedy will be by wariness and devotion to reconsecrate ourselves, and make once more a fane of the mind. We should treat our minds, that is, ourselves, as innocent and ingenuous children, whose guardians we are, and be careful what objects and what subjects we thrust on their attention. Read not the times. Read the eternities. Conventionalities are at length as bad as impurities. Even the facts of science may dust the mind by their dryness, unless they are in a sense effaced each morning, or rather rendered fertile by the dews of fresh and living truth. Knowledge does not come to us by details, but in flashes of light from heaven. Yes, every thought that passes through the mind helps to wear and tear it, and to deepen the ruts, which, as in the streets of Pompeii, evince how much it has been used. How many things there are concerning which we might well deliberate whether we had better know them, had better let their peddling carts be driven, even at the slowest trot or walk. 
over that bridge of glorious span by which we trust to pass at last from the farthest brink of time to the nearest shore of eternity. Have we no culture, no refinement, but skill only to live coarsely and serve the devil? To acquire a little worldly wealth, or fame, or liberty, and make a false show with it, as if we were all husk and shell, with no tender and living kernel to us? Shall our institutions be like those chestnut burrs which contain abortive nuts, perfect only to prick the fingers? America is said to be the arena on which the battle of freedom is to be fought. But surely it cannot be freedom in a merely political sense that is meant. Even if we grant that the American has freed himself from a political tyrant, he is still the slave of an economical and moral tyrant. Now that the Republic, the Res Publica, has been settled, it is time to look after the res privata, the private state, to see, as the Roman Senate charged its consuls. Any quid res privata detrimenti capret, that the private state receive no detriment. Do we call this the land of the free? What is it to be free from King George and continue the slaves of King Prejudice? What is it to be born free and not to live free? What is the value of any political freedom, but as a means to moral freedom? Is it a freedom to be slaves, or a freedom to be free, of which we boast? We are a nation of politicians, concerned about the outmost defenses only of freedom. It is our children's children who may perchance be really free. We tax ourselves unjustly. There is a part of us which is not represented. It is taxation without representation. We quarter troops, we quarter fools and cattle of all sorts upon ourselves. We quarter our gross bodies on our poor souls, till the former eat up all the latter's substance. With respect to a true culture and manhood, we are essentially provincial still, not metropolitan, mere Jonathans. We are provincial, because we do not find at home our standards, because we do not worship truth. But the reflection of truth, because we are warped and narrowed by an exclusive devotion to trade and commerce and manufactures and agriculture and the like, which are but means, and not the end. So is the English Parliament provincial. Mere country bumpkins, they betray themselves, when any more important question arises for them to settle, the Irish question, for instance, the English question why did I not say? Their natures are subdued to what they work in. Their good breeding respects only secondary objects. The finest manners in the world are awkwardness and fatuity, when contrasted with a finer intelligence. They appear but as the fashions of past days, mere courtliness, knee buckles and small clothes, out of date. It is the vice, but not the excellence of manners, that they are continually being deserted by the character. They are cast off clothes or shells, claiming the respect which belonged to the living creature. You are presented with the shells instead of the meat, and it is no excuse generally, that, in the case of some fishes, the shells are of more worth than the meat. The man who thrusts his manners upon me does as if he were to insist on introducing me to his cabinet of curiosities, when I wished to see himself. It was not in this sense that the poet Decker called Christ the first true gentleman that ever breathed. I repeat, that in this sense the most splendid court in Christendom is provincial, having authority to consult about Transalpine interests only, and not the affairs of Rome. A praetor or proconsul would suffice to settle the questions which absorbed the attention of the English Parliament and the American Congress. Government and Legislation These I thought were respectable professions. We have heard of heaven-born Numas, Lyurguses, and Solons, in the history of the world, whose names at least may stand for ideal legislators. But think of legislating to regulate the breeding of slaves, or the exportation of tobacco. What have divine legislators to do with the exportation or the importation of tobacco? What humane ones with the breeding of slaves? Suppose you were to submit the question to any son of God, and has he no children in the nineteenth century? Is it a family which is extinct? In what condition would you get it again? What shall a state like Virginia say for itself at the last day, in which these have been the principal, the staple productions? What ground is there for patriotism in such a state? I derive my facts from statistical tables which the states themselves have published. 
a commerce that whitens every sea in quest of nuts and raisins, and makes slaves of its sailors for this purpose. I saw, the other day, a vessel which had been wrecked, and many lives lost, and her cargo of rags, juniper berries, and bitter almonds were strewn along the shore. It seemed hardly worth the while to tempt the dangers of the sea between Leghorn and New York for the sake of a cargo of juniper berries and bitter almonds. America sending to the old world for her bitters. Is not the sea brine, is not shipwreck, bitter enough to make the cup of life go down here? Yet such, to a great extent, is our boasted commerce. And there are those who style themselves statesmen and philosophers who are so blind as to think that progress and civilization depend on precisely this kind of interchange and activity, the activity of flies about a molasses hogshead. Very well, observes one, if men were oysters. And very well, answer I, if men were mosquitoes. Lieutenant Herndon, whom our government sent to explore the Amazon, and, it is said, to extend the area of slavery, observed that there was wanting there an industrious and active population. Who know what the comforts of life are, and who have artificial wants to draw out the great resources of the country. But what are the artificial wants to be encouraged? Not the love of luxuries, like the tobacco and slaves of, I believe, his native Virginia, nor the ice and granite and other material wealth of our native New England. Nor are the great resources of a country that fertility or barrenness of soil which produces these. The chief want, in every state that I have been into, was a high and earnest purpose in its inhabitants. This alone draws out the great resources of nature, and at last taxes her beyond her resources, for man naturally dies out of her. When we want culture more than potatoes, and illumination more than sugar plums, then the great resources of a world are taxed and drawn out, and the result, or staple production, is, not slaves. Nor operatives, but men, those rare fruits called heroes, saints, poets, philosophers, and redeemers. In short, as a snowdrift is formed where there is a lull in the wind, so, one would say, where there is a lull of truth, an institution springs up. But the truth blows right on over it, nevertheless, and at length blows it down. What is called politics is comparatively something so superficial and inhuman, that, practically, I have never fairly recognized that it concerns me at all. The newspapers, I perceive, devote some of their columns specially to politics or government without charge, and this, one would say, is all that saves it. But, as I love literature, and, to some extent, the truth also, I never read those columns at any rate. I do not wish to blunt my sense of right so much. I have not got to answer for having read a single president's message. A strange age of the world this, when empires, kingdoms, and republics come a begging to a private man's door, and utter their complaints at his elbow. I cannot take up a newspaper but I find that some wretched government or other, hard pushed, and on its last legs, is interceding with me, the reader. To vote for it, more importunate than an Italian beggar. And if I have a mind to look at its certificate, made, perchance, by some benevolent merchant's clerk, or the skipper that brought it over, for it cannot speak a word of English itself. I shall probably read of the eruption of some Vesuvius, or the overflowing of some Pa, true or forged, which brought it into this condition. I do not hesitate, in such a case, to suggest work, or the almshouse, or why not keep its castle in silence, as I do commonly. The poor president, what with preserving his popularity in doing his duty, is completely bewildered. The newspapers are the ruling power. Any other government is reduced to a few marines at Fort Independence. If a man neglects to read the Daily Times, government will go down on its knees to him, for this is the only treason in these days. Those things which now most engage the attention of men, as politics and the daily routine, are, it is true, vital functions of human society, but should be unconsciously performed. Like the corresponding functions of the physical body. They are infrahuman, a kind of vegetation. I sometimes awake to a half-consciousness of them going on about me, 
as a man may become conscious of some of the processes of digestion in a morbid state, and so have the dyspepsia, as it is called. It is as if a thinker submitted himself to be rasped by the great gizzard of creation. Politics is, as it were, the gizzard of society, full of grit and gravel, and the two political parties are its two opposite halves, sometimes split into quarters, it may be, which grind on each other. Not only individuals, but states, have thus a confirmed dyspepsia, which expresses itself, you can imagine by what sort of eloquence. Thus our life is not altogether a forgetting, but also, alas, to a great extent, a remembering, of that which we should never have been conscious of, certainly not in our waking hours. Why should we not meet, not always as dyspeptics, to tell our bad dreams, but sometimes as eupeptics, to congratulate each other on the ever-glorious morning? I do not make an exorbitant demand, surely.